companies went ahead to say, okay, we need to now start bringing in the parts, and then overnight, you have policy somersault. And so you realize that it's also difficult to plan for the long term. Mm. So I think what, one of the things we need to do in terms of leadership is to say, this is where we want to be in 10 years, this is where we want to be in 20 years. Mm. And we need to run away. One thing I love about Ninja is that really, really, our parties don't have philosophies, whether it's APC or PDP or HLP. Really, really, we don't really stand for policies. Uh, we don't really stand for philosophy. philosophies. Philosophy. So I think it's also a time for us to say, how do we actually set a long term? This is where we want to be. And everybody should align with it. This is a whole journey we all need to come together and begin to build. We need to get our policies right. Okay. We need to get our monetary policies and our fiscal policies aligned. You know, there are things that get people to say, I can invest in this place. I can, I can go to sleep. Today, you see a number of people going to, when you look at Dubai, look at what has happened in Dubai over the last 20, 30 years. They created an enabling environment. Wow, that has been some exciting conversation. I like that we're still hopeful on this table, mm -hmm. and we definitely hope to stay hopeful, right? And I like some of the points that you've raised. I particularly like um, in terms of leadership. So, you know how we say leadership, and we're just thinking of government, but I like what you said, talk about in terms of leadership, even at the business level, mm -hmm. right? And leadership, I also dare to say, at the community level, mm -hmm. and leadership even at the family level, right? So yeah, this has been very interesting. We still have a lot of work to do in terms of our policy design and of course policy implementation, but we will get there. Nigeria will grow. I am hopeful. Who would have thought that money talk and hope can sit side by side? Keep listening. Shola is up next. For decades, the Niger Delta oil producing region has suffered losses from oil theft and pipeline vandalism, which has led to Nigeria losing billions of foreign exchange worth of crude. But with the engagement of Tantita Security Services, pipeline vandalism and oil theft has reduced significantly. Tantita Security Services is an internationally recognized security outfit based in Delta State. Tantita specializes in providing professional security solutions to the oil and gas industry through a strategic partnership with the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited NNPCL. With over 1,000 plus field agents, 30 plus operational and combat boats, 10 ground to air drones, Tantita is changing the narrative around security in the Niger Delta. Tantita Security Services, dedicated to putting an end to oil theft in the Niger Delta. We are rich when we are poor. Nigeria is a poor country. The problem is that most of us think and act like we are a rich country. Our governance structure, our mindsets, our constitution, all have to the fact that we are a rich nation. It's a cap flight in and out of Nigeria as our business class and first class segments fully booked. In March 2023, business day reports that champion sales have such the highest level in eight years. A look at the 2024 budget shows critical spend, such as international travels, motor vehicle purchases, the government convoy, foreign trips, and all these contribute to this illusion that we are a rich nation. We send our children to the best schools, we live in big houses, even outside of Nigeria. And yet, despite our incessant international travel, we still have no international carrier. We import large numbers of cars, and yet, no major manufacturing brand or plant. We produce over about 1.5 million barrels of crude oil per day. Yet, until recently, with the launch of the Dangto refinery, we lacked the capacity to, to refine crude. In the 2023 financial year, whilst the big banks, First Bank, Zenith, and the likes, were recognizing enormous amount of FX gains, the manufacturing and producing companies, such as Nestle, Guinness, MTN, and the likes, were reporting losses at unprecedented levels. We are basically a market and a place where materials are taken. 
our focus therefore needs to shift to value creation. We need to ask ourselves, how do we create value? How do we create the shared prosperity we need as a nation? Not one that is unevenly distributed so that Leki Koi and Ajegune are worlds apart. It's time to see prosperity from a productive, value-adding perspective rather than from a consumption perspective. We need to invest in skills and empowerment for our people that enable large population to be part of our value creation process. We need bricklayers. We need fashion designers, mechanics, plumbers, doctors, scientists. We need to raise an army of creatives in every aspect of our economy. We need to create an enabling environment for entrepreneurs. And we need to patronize homemade goods, even when they are not the highest quality. We need to give our support. Rather than forever waiting for the government, we as Nigerians need to take it upon ourselves and forge ahead and create a better future for ourselves. We hold it to ourselves and we hold it to our children. While, while you're speaking, I was just thinking about uh, the, the, the new conversation from the presidential villa today that says um, the president said uh, people should be patronizing locally made things and um, um, start thinking around local product and, and, and what have you. But some of your statements are statements that said even if um, they are not in good shape, we should still go ahead and do it. So over time, I have been someone that have been following up project and what have you. And I, I, I will tell you, if you check the uh, gender responsive public service, or let me say gender responsiveness of our project, you will understand with me that most of the project we have in the Ministry of Women Affairs has always been um, go and produce skill acquisition, go and produce SOP that your neighbor cannot use or you cannot use on your skin. So mm. it's made me wonder, I don't know, there are ladies on the table, maybe they can say something. Is it a crime to accept the Ministry of Women Affairs? Women could have been in every part of everything, every ministry, rather than just relegating them to one particular ministry, like what our political parties have torn women to be. Treasurer and free nomination form is sure for every woman. And so when the election happens, she might, not, she might end up getting one vote. Women are... I be productive. Yes. We are so productive. Um, yes, I know there are things around perhaps what the Ministry of um, Women Affairs is doing. However, if you actually look, I mean, because our population states that is almost a 50-50. So you can imagine if women were not productive, what we would, where we would be in the country, right? I also like um, that shift from consumption to production. And interestingly, um, during the week, um, I was at a session where NBS, our National Bureau of Statistics, were looking at the unemployment numbers. And I was pushing that we need to look beyond unemployment to how productive are we as a nation, right? Because production and value creation is more important than people just working and all, right? And you would see in many developed countries, they are producing things. They are not just leaving things at raw levels and, imp and exporting them, but they are actually producing, adding value to it mm. and exporting. And that's why they are able to earn more and of course do more in their country. The question is how do we create value, right? How do we ensure the productivity? Um, when Shola was speaking, he spoke about the likes of Unilever, Guinness declaring losses. I think that is even fair. Right? Because sometimes business declare losses. But what is unthinkable is the fact that people like Procter and Gamble packed their bags and left. Mm. That means mm. it got to a point that they just thought this is um, a hopeless situation. Mm. Many years ago, maybe around 2007, 2006, thereabout, I was working in the UK. And that time, during the time of uh, President of Asajo, um, there was a company called Careers in Africa, and what they did was they came to the UK to employ Nigerians to come back home. And a few of my friends got jobs in KPMG, Procter & Gamble, Shell, Mobile. Some of them are still working there today. But it's painful to see that an organization like Procter & Gamble, who at that time was so bullish, was coming to employ Nigerians in the UK, has now decided that, you know, there's no hope. So I think, what is the way forward? If we're saying we need to be productive, we know that. But how do we keep those who are already doing it to continue to do it and not feel like, you know, we can't continue with this? Is a point that we need to really think about. Yes, we talk about power, 
you know, but I think it's beyond power. People living is beyond power. It's just there are too many frustrations. If you're a business person, I tell people all the time, I said doing business in Nigeria is an extreme sport because, <laughs> you know, it's a full contact extreme sport. You wake up on Monday, you don't know what's going to hit you by 12 noon. You sort out what happens on Monday. By Tuesday, just expect another hit. Yeah. You know, by the end of the week, you're working with a broken leg. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we need to think about how do we keep the businesses in business? Yeah. You know, Tope, um, you were talking and, you know, first of all, Shola, you said, you know, we're poor, even though we think we're rich. And, and one of the things I wanted to say is that it's so hard for us as a people. We're such a proud people. <laughs> so it's difficult for us to admit that we are poor. Uh, but I dare say the reason why we talk about ourselves as being a rich nation is talking about the potential that we have. And we have a huge potential in our population, our human capital. We also have a huge potential in our resources. So when you're trying to answer the question which mm. you aptly ask, how do we create that value? It's in tapping into those things that we have intrinsically, um, our human capital. You mentioned training and skills acquisition. How well are we doing that? Um, are we doing it maybe for a subset of the population? Are we able to reach those who are in the more remote areas? Um, how do we reach people who are not as skilled or as not, are not as um, uh, educationally uh, sound as others. You know, there's so many of those things that I think that we need to be more deliberate about, which would allow us to tap into um, where we have value within oh, ourselves, good. you know, as, as a people. And, you know, creating value says, I can do this well, or I specialize in this area, or I'm better at this than anybody else. And then, getting someone else to appreciate that, to need that, and to patronize that. It's in that exchange that we're able to actually gain from value creation. I, I would like to add something to that, and it's about what's our competitive advantage or our comparative advantage as a nation. Today, we can pick our numbers. We have over 200 million people. We have a youthful population. Think about it. Today, we have a very low amount of vocational skills. Here in the construction space, people are going to hire bricklayers from outside of Nigeria. That's a shame. Mm. Today, you have an, a plumbing issue in your house. You can't beat your chest that you pick up your phone. You have three plumbers that know their job very well. Mm. So I think we need to also begin as a people. And yeah, the government needs to do it on the policy side. But we also need to change our mindsets. We need to begin to tell our young people, rather than just being an Okada rider and just aim in the short term, mm. There are skills that if you develop, you are always going to be useful. You're always going to be able to be a part of the productive, the creative economy, either in the next five years, 10 years, and all of that. I'm a hands-on type of guy. Mukta says he's all in, hands and feet. Let's find out what he's campaigning for. Up next. You've reached the stars, now let's see you conquer galaxies. You've gone for gold, let's show you two more treasure chests. And Your story doesn't have to end with you. As a matter of fact, it can continue into the next generation. The only way to move is up the way to go. And the generation after that. Don't stop. After all, you've worked hard to get to where you are. Why should your wealth end with you? Let your story continue. Ham, let's grow wealth for you. Transparency and accountability in governance. I am Mukhtar Modibo. I am the Secretary General of Follow the Money International, a unit of connected development, and I have been given a place at the table, and it wordly of note that today, we stand at the vouch of monumental change, and addressing the country's challenges requires a multifaceted approach that transits solve. Firstly, we must prioritize transparency and accountability in governance. This involves strengthening anti-corruption agencies, ensuring their independence, 
and prosecuting corrupt officials regardless of their status while implementing governance system that help reduce illicit and corrupt practice in the same way enhancing a systemic check and balances in governance across all level of government intentionally investing in education is paramount for long-term development improving the quality of education and making it more accessible to all will install the skill needed to drive innovation and economic growth in line with the change in times, a shift towards voting for more vocational training programs relevant in the 21st century can also well equip individuals with practical skills for, the, for employment. Nigeria and Nigerians must collectively recognize addressing the country's infrastructural deficit as imperative. Investing in renewable and reliable energy supply, enhancing transportation network and expanding access to clean water and sanitation are crucial for fostering economic development and enhancing the quality of life for Nigerians. Permit me to suggest that promoting entrepreneurship and supporting small and medium-sized entrepreneurs can not only create jobs and reduce poverty but also stimulate economic growth. Providing access to financing, mentorship and market opportunity empower entrepreneurs to thrive and significantly contribute to Nigeria's economy. In the midst of this, effort fostering unity and inclusiveness is vital for national development. By embracing diversity, facilitating dialogue among different ethnic and religious groups, and ensuring equal representation in decision-making process are essential steps towards building a more conducive and prosperous society, anchoring in commitment and dedication to a bright future for all its citizens. I really think that we also need to look at the demand side, right? Um, and there's a role we all have to play. There's the role the civil societies need to play. We see the media playing an active role in terms of demanding for governance. A lot has happened in the last couple of months, right, after subsidy was removed. And what we've seen is that the allocations going to the states and to the local governments have increased drastically. Yet, if I ask us, who is our local government chairman, <laughs> we'll look at ourselves and smile. Because many of us don't know. Many of us are not bothered to demand for accountability from them. So I think that that's something as citizens, we need to begin to demand mm. accountability at the grassroots at the local level and also at the state level. The work that determines who represents us, a lot of it is done at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. How many of us are card-carrying members of political parties? You know, sometimes I have a couple of friends who have said when you go to the world meetings, you will be shocked at the people who make decisions mm -hmm. at those meetings. Uh, and you know, the funny thing about democracy is that it's one man, one vote. Whether you have a PhD or you didn't go to school at all, and so I think the elites, the educated ones among us, we need to take that step back and say, at the grassroots level, you know, our mindset around politics needs to change. We need to start saying, we need to lay the demand. You know, we need to check the budget. You know, what's in the budget? What, what's going into health? Yes. When we get to the hospitals tomorrow, do we see the impact of the allocation of the budget? How do we expect to see it? How do we see it in education? How do we see security? So I think a lot of time we're just so distracted. We just look at the government, just do their own thing, and then we just say, you know, God will take care of us all. I think that needs to change. You know, when you were listening to some of the ideas, you spoke about vocational schools. And that links very well with what Shola said about where our plumbers, where our, you know, artisans, what is going on? We used to have all these vocational schools. A few years ago, I, been in the construction industry, I was curious because it's challenging to have, you know, skilled artisans. So I went to some vocational schools in, um, in the FCT. Um, it was a sorry site. They were dead. All the equipment were, you know, rusted, you know. And I started thinking, what is the way forward to this? And that goes to investments in education, but not just in, um, you know, the formal, typical education. Um, we need to spread that down. And that also goes to the grassroots because... Mm -hmm. You know, that is how you empower young people who might not be interested or wanting to go to formal education. But, if you, you know, you learn a skill. Um, in Europe, people who are 
Today, people who are plumbers, people who are carpenters, are able to earn enough to own their houses, you know, to have a good life. And I think we need to try and get there. Now. While we're looking at the vocational aspect of it, uh, what you would typically refer to as your blue-collar workers, Correct. Um, I was thinking also from the perspective of your professional um, white-collar um, workers as well. Uh, because if they're going to get involved, so everybody needs to get involved at the grassroots level, um, whether you are um, you know, a bricklayer or you are a management consultant, everybody does need to get involved in governance. We look at the content um, of our curriculum. When we talk about investing in education, I think it's important to look at the content of our educational curriculum and make sure that it's relevant for the 21st century. Right? Um, very important. Uh, when you hear um, words like artificial intelligence and machine learning, these are things that some of us would rather put away because we don't understand the nitty gritty. But it really needs to get to be things that we understand at our fingertips. And when you talk about the size of our population, there's a lot that needs to understand what this is because this is the future. This is actually now. So I think that's important when you talk about um, um, investing in education. I think that um, jobs such as cybersecurity and investing in robotics. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing is, we think of these things as high and maybe difficult to understand, but you apply robotics in agriculture. You apply robotics in health mm -hmm. management and health services. You can apply robotics even in bricklaying um, and in construction. There are so many ways in which these things are applicable. So I, I think you've touched on a very, very great subject, and it's one that um, hopefully We'll see policies coming out and enabling environment to help champion some of the ideas that we're sharing around this table. So I think we really need to talk about, um, um, as people, we need to talk about the independency of our anti-corruption agency, the independency of our judicial system, as well as the independency of, 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 every, of every agency of government to work hand in, in hand with other agencies so that we can have so, that dividend of democracy. So maybe this is, this is us looking at, back at the manifestos when people want to come into government. You know, sometimes we're just so fixated, this guy yeah. is from my tribe, you know, you are states, you yeah. say this person is from this place or from this political party. I think we begin, need to begin to listen more yeah. to our politicians, the people who want to take electoral offices. What do you have in store? And when they run this government, let's actually do proper reviews. What did you do? What did you tell us we were going to do? We've laid out our steel, and all that is left is to put talk into action. Tobe is up next, and like me, he's an action man. For decades, the Niger Delta oil producing region has suffered losses from oil theft and pipeline vandalism, which has led to Nigeria losing billions of foreign exchange worth of crude. But with the engagement of Tantita Security Services, pipeline vandalism and oil theft has reduced significantly. Tantita Security Services is an internationally recognized security outfit based in Delta State. Tantita specializes in providing professional security solutions to the oil and gas industry through a strategic partnership with the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited NNPCL. With over 1,000 plus field agents, 30 plus operational and combat boats, 10 ground to air drones, Tantita is changing the narrative around security in the Niger Delta. Tantita Security Services, dedicated to putting an end to oil theft in the Niger Delta. We'll get used to being called an action man. However, things I speak of are not reactionary, but tried and tested. Transforming Nigeria's construction landscape, tackling challenges for progress. In the third quarter of 2023, construction services raked in 5.7 trillion naira. 
while real estate contributed 3.1 trillion naira to Nigeria's GDP. Despite this, in Nigeria's construction sector, challenges like regulatory hurdles and infrastructure deficiencies are sitting, stifling growth and excavating the country's economic woes. These problems are so fundamental that they not only hinder the construction sector's growth, but also contribute to the ongoing recession and stagnation the country is currently facing. Everyone in the industry, including frontliners like myself, face these challenges. However, despite these obstacles, there's immense potential for positive change. But to unlock this potential, we must confront these issues head on. I've remained deeply invested in the industry due to its undeniable potential for impact and growth. Also, I am dedicated to overcoming these challenges and realizing the sector's immense potential for both personal and collective prosperity. From my experience in the industry, I believe solving these problems necessitates a comprehensive approach that addresses the root causes. This will mean implementing reforms to streamline regulatory processes, enhancing transparency, and reducing bureaucratic bottlenecks. We all see bottlenecks in almost all the sectors. It is also very important to prioritize investment in critical infrastructure projects, such as roads, power, and water supply, as this will create a solid foundation for the industry's expansion. The industry must also embrace technological innovations and adapt to best practices in project management and construction methods that can enhance efficiency and productivity. Also, we must incentivize key stakeholders, including the government, to embrace a real estate revolution in Nigeria. That is talking about housing. By demonstrating economic benefits, such as advocating for policy reforms, enhancing infrastructural development, and promoting public-private partnerships. This is very important because um, the government cannot pay for it all, and substantial financial investment is needed to fund infrastructural development projects, including transportation networks, utilities, and affordable housing initiatives, which serve as the backbone of the real estate growth. This revolution will benefit the average Nigerian in many ways, including increased job opportunities, improve living standards, and enhance access to quality housing and essential services. The industry can achieve the envisioned beautiful state if major actions are taken towards the above and significant push for investment in the industry is made. Today we know that there is really not so much mortgages available. So if you want to get a house in Mowe, mm. for example, how many real estate companies are saying, okay, let's develop for those people in that area? We keep hearing people developing in the highbrow areas. And interestingly, I think occupancy in those, level, in those areas are low. If you go to Lekki today, you see a lot of empty properties. And you still see a lot of developers still moving in uh, the construction workers and materials and still constructing. I think that's one issue we need to look at. How do we begin to say support? Is it a government thing? Is it the, the financing sector? Is it the banks need to begin to look in that direction to say, are we going to use policies to force the financiers to say some part of your money should go? I remember this thing the Lagos State government did a, a, a few years back. I think it was doing Hambody, where there was some development for, and they sold these houses quite cheap to typical people, 10 million, Ogba, Ikeja, and those areas. And you saw people embracing it. I think we need to look in that direction. Second thing I would like you to look at is, sometimes you're, you're having a mismatch between the rental value of properties and the prices of this property. So mm -hmm. when you look at a property, they tell you this property is 50 million era. You look at the rental value. The rental value is 1 million. And you're asking yourself, mm -hmm. is it 50 years that the person is going to recover the money? And is it, that, is it a balloon of cost? Is there a mismatch there? Thank you. I, I can tell you half of Abuja estates and almost maybe 30% or 70% of those estates are not occupied. Mm. Now, I, I, a question was thrown to me by, by a colleague that came in from Zambia. And he said there are two things when he got into, the, when he got into Abuja from the airport to um, his hotel. The two billboards he keeps seeing is estate <laughs> and church. Real estate <laughs> and church. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? And now the question comes to me in, in, in the sense that I live close to an estate that there are only, and I pray in the mocks of the estate, there are only six occupants in almost mm. a thousand um, 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 space of, of that estate. So I keep asking, how can you, how, how can that, you know, help in, um, in, in development? Now, if you ask me, I know of someone that told me that his dad is planning to buy a house of 400 million, right? And they will be renting it out. So I'm questioning myself, how much will that rent be, mm -hmm. right? That he, in one way or the other, recover that thing. So the, 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 the question will come into, when will someone like me that earn less than $200, right, afford to buy a house? Because... Maybe that's the last thing I'll say. If you look at the analogy of how we're living in this country, maybe I earn $200. Earning $200 is barely maybe less than 500000 If I'm going to do mortgage, it will take me almost 11 years if I don't touch one nera mm. from that money. It will take me 11 mm. years to meet up to some certain level of benchmark mm. for me to access that um, level of thing. So the reality is we need that to get our... Our, our, our government move, but how can we improvise for people at low income, right? People at communities, people at um, people that are not in that level of going to like billionaires. Yes, <laughs> to access this kind of um, this kind of resources and then mm. own a house um, with a decent uh, job that they are. Doing. And I was just thinking, one of the things you recommended was the private partner private-public partnerships. Right. Yeah. Um, I recall very recently I was driving and I pointed to one of our national assets and I saw that there was some refurbishment work that was going on. And I was pleasantly surprised to be told that it was being sponsored by a private company. I think we probably need more of those. Yeah. Like you said, the government cannot sponsor mm. everything. They can't pay for everything. So where you have companies that have to um, give back to mm. the communities in which they um, they employ from and, and they, get, uh, they get to enjoy the benefits of, I think it's important to leverage that, you know? They should be able to um, commit to some of these projects and private enterprises can partner with the government to build some of this infrastructure that we find to be limiting today and are causing some of the hurdles that you talked about. Yeah, I want to take you back to the really importance of the construction sector. Right? And I think many times we forget this, but it was just good to hear the numbers around the contribution to GDP, right? And also the number of people that construction actually employs is massive. Mm. Um, yeah, even though you would say it's seasonal, but it's actually massive. These are people that are able to work for a period of time and actually feed their families, right? So number of people the sector is able to employ also is very key in development. And we've said it, right, just in terms of what it does ease of doing business in the country. Mm. Um, just look at Lagos State, quite impressive. I mean, a lot of the construction work that's been going on in terms of infrastructure, the rail we see. What if we could see this across other states, even if, of course, it needs to be at a smaller scale. I mean, not everybody needs as much, right? I think that if we see more of it across different states, different regions in the country, it will significantly impact Nigeria's development. So construction certainly is very key for Nigeria's growth. It's important to know that no economy in the world grows without low-cost mm. housing. And the way it works is that government is deliberate about it. Mm. Um, because sometimes you have to subsidize certain things. Um, in some cases, like some states are doing, you could say the land is free. Um, you do that, the cost, the, the cost comes down. Um, you could say we, we would pay for um, you know, cement, we'll pay for infrastructure, we'll subsidize this just to bring, because you have to be deliberate. So that is on the supply side. Housing, there's a supply side, there's a demand side. We need to be able to deliver the houses as low as possible. Mm -hmm. And then on the demand side, which is where mortgages come in, is that financial institutions need to be incentivized to provide mortgages, just like what Mukta said. If you're going to um, need to work for 11 years just to be able to get in. Um, when are you going to finish paying for it? So it is something that has to be deliberate, government, and then public-private. That's why I talked about uh, public-private partnerships. Yeah. Government and private individuals. And the knock-on effect that the job creation will have. And when we add it to Shola's Made in Nigeria proposition, if we have more developers who are Nigerian companies, more construction companies, we employ people. If you, if you give 
our, our company a job. We're not going to, you know, take the money and move it to Europe. Uh, the money is going to stay in the system. Mm. And those are the things that, you know, um, could propagate our economic development. Anyway, transformation takes vision. Um, having framed what beautiful looks like, Ruby has promised to lay the foundations. And she's up next. Banking and technology, twin pillars that are vital to our development. You didn't know? Keep listening. But first, reminding you that this Easter special edition of A Place at the Table is proudly sponsored by Meristem Securities Limited. You've reached the stars, now let's see you conquer galaxies. You've gone for gold, let's show you two more treasure chests. And Your story doesn't have to end with you. As a matter of fact, it can continue into the next generation. And the generation after that. After all, you've worked hard to get to where you are. Why should your wealth end with you? Let your story continue. Let's grow wealth for you. What is the impact of banking and technology on our development? One of the strengths of our great nation is our numbers. Foreign investors flock into the country on a daily basis, looking to take advantage of the population size to grow their profits. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, the population of Nigeria in 2022 was about 216.8 million of which the youth population aged 29 and below constitutes roughly 68% of the population. Take that up a notch, we have a whopping 80% of the population, that's 174.4 million people, below the age of 40 years. I'll let that sink in for a moment. What is the significance of this? What are the implications for the Nigerian economy? There's a saying, I don't mind, is the devil's workshop. What this implies is that if not properly engaged, a youth population of this magnitude could quite easily become vulnerable to social ills such as high dependency ratios and increased unemployment, thereby eroding the very potential that could be realized from this population. On the upside, if properly harnessed, it can contribute to what is referred to as a demographic dividend, potentially leading to increased productivity, innovation, and economic growth. Technology can empower a youthful population in several ways to boost economic development. For instance, it can provide access to education through online learning platforms, enhance skills development, and future readiness in the wake of artificial intelligence and machine learning through digital training programs. It can create opportunities for entrepreneurship and innovation through digital platforms and marketplaces. It can also improve access to markets and financial services through digital banking and e-commerce platforms. Additionally, technology can facilitate efficient resource allocation. It can streamline our business processes and even foster collaboration and networking among young people, thereby accelerating economic growth and development. The application of technology in finance can assist Nigeria in overcoming its developmental challenges, and it does so in several ways. One, enhancing financial inclusion, improving efficiency and transparency, encouraging savings and investment, stimulating entrepreneurship, for which Nigerians are well known, facilitating government services, combating fraud, and improving security. What am I trying to say? Overall, the application of technology in finance has the potential to catalyze economic development in Nigeria by promoting financial inclusion, efficiency, transparency, entrepreneurship, and good governance. I will talk about how I see technology changing a couple of things over the last couple of years. 
And of course, if we have to look at banking, you know, banking is that place where a lot of us have seen the use cases of technology impact on a lot of us uh, the most. I remember when I was in university, uh, there was practically one or two banks in this town. And when your money is sent, your monthly allowance is sent, you basically wait for a week, five days, you're basically going to the bank and going to check out is the money here. Mm. But today, all of, that, all of that has changed. And I think it's giving a lot of youth in Nigeria opportunity. Uh, for example, we have uh, Bill, uh, which is a digital bank. We're doing things that uh, maybe 10 years ago was almost impossible. And even the regulator, the central bank of Nigeria, they are beginning to give a lot of attention to the digital space. And the young people are uniquely positioned to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. You see digital natives. You know, the younger people are digital natives. So they're able to see it differently. Look at cryptocurrency, for example. I know a lot of young people who were able to step forward, take the risk. Mm -hmm. Something the older people are say, saying, we're still trying to understand. <laughs> Boom. They've taken advantage of it. And they've been able to build some, you know, some financial resources for themselves. So I think we need to continue to encourage our young people to embrace technology. Uh, technology we, we give a, a front leap, a leverage, a quantum leap to our young people. And it also give us better services. Now today you can open a bank account from the comfort of your home. I, for most people here, yeah, I don't know the last time you actually entered mm -hmm. a bank. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because now you, have, you can do everything. You can open a bank account just Indeed. on your phone and you yes. do great things. When they refer to countries like Nigeria, you hear things like um, developing country. And technology has the capacity to create that leapfrog effect. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, instead of, you know, the industrial stuff, you know, you need to build a factory, you need to get it to work, you're waiting one year, two years, three years. Technology, I mean, in a couple of months, you've created a solution and, you know, these young Just guys are... You know, I have a few of these uh, young friends who got on fintech and all of these things. Mm -hmm. The next thing, ah, my guy is worth uh, uh, $10 million. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, how many houses am I going to build to <laughs> get right, $10 million? Dollars. It's making me think, look, we need to be thinking about this thing, the leapfrog effect. And of course, that has a ripple effect on the economy because mm -hmm. now they're employing people, they're paying taxes, and that gets the economy going. So I think it's an important area we need to look at. If you look at what um, NIDA, an agency that is regulating some level of um, what the technology is doing, it, you, you could understand that they, there has been that level of gap, right? Now, if I ask you, if you all ask us here, the most whooping, like the, most, the industry that is really working in this country is the music industry, mm. right? And if you add, is the technology industry that has no government intervention inside. Mm. Why do I say there is no government intervention? A lot of young people work for this fintech, like he mentioned, mm. and other things in, in dollars, right? But you know the funniest thing? Our card, you cannot pay anything with our card out there. Okay. So all they need to do is to approach their bookman that is collecting Forex, collect the money, travel with it, and then invest it in another person's economy without having the money being part of our economy. And just so you know, you go to Zone 4, the Abuja, I know, right? You could ask for $10 million, right? I don't want to mention, don't want to be this. Someone can provide it. And he is not from, he's not taking it from the bank. Mm. It's something that he has Cash. kept. You, <laughs> yes. you get my point. Yes. So the reality is, I think our government need to be systematic and need to be deliberate in knowing how to get into the technological aspect I am very optimistic about what the new government is trying to do with having someone in the private sector as well as the civil society sector be the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy. But the question of, of what I mentioned earlier will come back. How independent that person is? How deliberate is he trying to make efforts in, in that thing? So maybe government need to really invest in looking at what young people are doing not necessarily cutting their wings from, look at what is happening on social media, everybody is talking about regulating it. It's, it's a normal thing, but I mean, what will happen after that? Yeah. The cryptocurrency we just mentioned, there are a lot of things that is happening to the crypto um, world in Nigeria. So if the government really understood this kind of a thing, I tell you, maybe with technology, the biggest thing we didn't even talk about is the people in diaspora that are using technology and how they are boosting our economy back here. 
and nothing is being done for them, guess what? They don't even vote. Mm. If they're not back here, they don't even vote. Maybe but, that's but a I, conversation. I, 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 think, I think the government has really supported the, 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 the technology financial sector in Nigeria, and I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with you a bit. And first and foremost is when you look at the policies the Central Bank of Nigeria has rolled out over the last couple of years. In fact, you know, financial services sector needs to be regulated because there's trust. You are giving people your money. Mm. So it's not an industry like music that we're just singing mm. and, you know, whatever you like, you mm. know. So the government always needs to step in. And I, and I think we need to give credit. That's why today you will be shocked that some financial services you enjoy in Nigeria are not even available in the United States. Absolutely. You cannot send money Absolutely. from Chase Absolutely. to Bank of America and get it instantly. Mm. You can do that in Nigeria. Yeah. So I think we should. Yes, there is more the government should do, and they are working at it. Uh, even look at the current, even crypto technology and all of that. I think we can do more, but I think the government, they've done some, and we should give it. Shola, would you want to say something <laughs> about the email? <laughs> well, I, I think that just to, just to buttress your point, and I was waiting for Mukhtar to land, because I actually wanted to make that point as well. Um, is there much more to do? Absolutely. And there's a word you mentioned, you called it optimism. So I think we're all very optimistic around this table. Uh, but the truth, like you said, is to give credit where credit is due. And there have been some enabling, um, enablers that have been put into place to, to get our technology industry working. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at some of the regulations around data protection, data privacy, very yeah. important. If you're going to be using digital platforms, it's important to be able to secure the data of the people who are using those platforms. Uh, you also have NITDA, you mentioned, and you have um, the likes of um, CBN's IT standards blueprint, which they put in place for financial services yeah. providers to ensure that we uphold or the banks uphold um, the industry or global best practice when yeah. it comes Even to the sandboxes. Yeah, building, and then the sandboxes. So, so they have done quite a bit. Um, and we're hopeful that um, yeah. they will continue along those lines. I mean, I really like what technology has done in the financial sector. It's been massive, to be honest. If you really look at it in terms of financial inclusion, right, it has really impacted, I mean, that. Nigeria financial inclusion has grown, still has, there's still work to do, like you said. And of course, in countries like Kenya, and we've seen them use, I mean, technology massively just to close that gap in terms of financial inclusion. I also like how it's promoted efficiency and the competition that has also come into the yeah. financial Indeed. sector. Yeah. Yes. Indeed, technology is a game changer in the financial sector, and it would be great to see us utilize it across other sectors. So much to discuss and so little time. I get to say it's a wrap on this special edition. Glad you could join us at the table. Till this time next week, same channel, when we'll have more issues to lay out for interrogation. It's goodbye from all of us and happy, happy Easter. Easter.
Hello, good evening. Welcome to Secure the Continent. I am Dakbo Adigboye. This is where you get to know all the security situations across the African continent. But before today's discussion, let's take a look at some of the top security headlines across Africa. Now, Delta State Monarch wanted over the death of military personnel turns self into police. And also gunmen abduct Christian worshippers in Ogun State Church. And a security humanitarian crisis worsening in Eastern DRC as M23 rebels continue to make gains. And also International Court of Justice orders Israel to allow aid into Gaza. Don't go anywhere. I will be right back. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every raise, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, and a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. of insecurity in Nigeria is troubling, raising concerns for uh, the nation as it battles not only kidnapping but also unjustifiable killings and attacks. We have more for you in this intro package. Take a listen. Nigeria is going through disturbing phases of insecurity, ranging from terrorist attacks, militancy, abductions, armed robbery, banditry, and then the unjustifiable murder and mutilation of members of the armed forces. The spate of kidnappings for ransom has become very troubling as children have become soft targets for these abductors. The undeserved murder and mutilation of military men pushes civilians to wonder about their own personal safety. There is a need for urgent excision of this tumor. There are differing schools of thoughts on addressing the issue of insecurity, while the president of Nigeria, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, declared that individuals involved in these despicable crimes such as kidnapping, must be treated as terrorists. Some others think a different approach would be better. The former Minister of Communications, Adebayo Shitu, believes a non-kinetic approach should be explored, meaning the bandits should be negotiated with, resettled, rehabilitated, and retrained. The masses are expectantly awaiting an end to all the insecurity, irrespective of the approach. The masses want an urgent end to the loss of lives, fear and tremor, hanging over terrorists hit communities, grief in the hearts of those who lost their husbands that soul to protect their nation, abductions of the fragile children who are supposed to be leaders of tomorrow, and its resultant traumatic effects. I mean, really, really tragic what is going on around parts of Nigeria. But to make sense of this, I am joined on the program by Salahuddin Ashim, Program Director, Clean Foundation, who joins from uh, Kaduna, and also Olu Muywa, that's Akinyele, retired military personnel and security expert joining from Lagos. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. All right, uh, let me start off with you, uh, Olu Muywa. I mean, uh, what would you, I mean, from your own perspective, what would you consider, you know, uh, the background for all of what we are seeing in Nigeria. Okay, I understand that Muywa is not on yet, so we have Salahuddin. Salahuddin, I mean, what, what do you make of uh, the ongoing or the spate of kidnappings and attacks that we see in spite 
of the efforts of uh, the Nigerian government and also the military to sort of abate the situation. All right, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. I think I'll begin by first of all quoting uh, the late uh, elder statesman, uh, the sage uh, uh, Obafemi Olowo, when he mentioned that the children uh, of those who are left behind are really going to hunt down your own children. Uh, if you do not find uh, the whole of uh, government and the whole of society approach uh, to development. And that in itself uh, is actually confronting us in the face currently, uh, where we have some level uh, of failure of governance uh, over the years, translating into what we now currently see uh, as some level of government incapacitation uh, to be able to tame this whole uh, situation. Uh, as we all know, uh, that uh, the country uh, engaged a new wave of paradigm as relates to security uh, in 20, uh, 2009, uh, when we saw uh, the emergence of uh, Jamal Tunasur, uh, also known as Boko Haram, uh, that then uh, started their onslaught uh, in the Northeast. And all of these things were on uh, three strategic fragility. Uh, one is political, uh, the other is economic, and of course the most important one is social. Uh, we have had fragile components uh, relating to these three elements uh, for the past, uh, since independence as a matter of fact. Uh, but again, we have continued to ignore it. Uh, those confrontations uh, have continued to uh, emerge, uh, but again, successive governments and administration have not seen the need uh, to deal with uh, this strategic uh, uh, tripod. And if you look at the human security pyramid, uh, it actually looked at the issue of uh, personal security, economic security, environmental security, and all of this security, particularly political, as part of the entire framework that build a strong and resilient uh, society. But we failed in successive administration to be able to deliver this uh, to Nigerians. And then, of course, the monster uh, then emerged, and then, of course, started confronting us. And again, we didn't learn uh, by providing some level of soft approach in terms of providing the carrot and stick. Uh, that would allow for government uh, to take control of the whole situation. And then, of course, the aspect of commercializing the entire security system then came in. And then, of course, we have the merchants. Uh, the merchants, uh, those within the system and outside the system, saw it as an opportunity to enrich themselves. Uh, the presidential report on arms procurement can actually give you that additional detail. But most importantly is that uh, we fail to provide political infrastructure that will deliver governance and development to us as a nation. And that also has actually wiped and continue to threaten the entire society. Okay, one, one, one thing I, I think I noticed job. that you have done, Salahuddin, is try to give some sort of uh, overview of uh, the root cause and also uh, the motivation of many of uh, these uh, groups and attacks that we've seen. Uh, according to it, borders around the political, you know, economic and also social enclave as a uh, the motivation for many of these attacks and, of course, at the root cause. But um, I, I, I would still like to go back a bit in terms of how this issue itself has been tackled. Some have said that if Nigeria had been decisive from its foundation, right? You said 2009 when, of course, we had that case. Nigeria had, you know, made a strong statement. Maybe it would not have escalated into, uh, in your words, uh, an economic, uh, what I call it, network right now, where uh, we see a lot of people or we see a lot of individuals who are into it and s seem to be getting away with it and make making huge sums of money. Now, that takes me to a video I recently saw. I mean, the, the recent attack in Russia, where the suspects that were caught, you know, linked to the, the, the ISIL, uh, many of them, even though, you know, their approach has been condemned, when they were brought to court, they were, they were beaten to a pulp. I mean, some will tell you that it's to send a strong message that, look, in this part of town, in this part of the world, we don't tolerate, you know, uh, uh, instances like this. Now, my question to you is this. Do you think Nigeria, from the onset, you know, has handled this issue the way it ought to be before it escalated to where it is right now? 
Uh, unfortunately, we have not. Uh, and of course, I'll give you instances. Uh, justice sector system has remained very weak uh, at Benicio. And that is, of course, because of the entire uh, situation uh, that has also confronted that particular sector. Uh, our justice sector value chain, uh, even from the uh, time of arrest by the law enforcement, uh, to the time when uh, you have been processed through uh, the judicial system uh, up to the custodial facilities, there has been a lot of malhandling, and the management has also uh, been very poor. Uh, so poor, poor management of the entire system uh, has also contributed to the uh, challenges that we currently have. I'll give you an instance. Currently, the chief of defense staff had actually told the National Assembly and said, look, uh, the custodial facility workers are actually helping to facilitate new crimes by providing logistic support uh, to those who are currently in detention and using their phones, bank accounts, and all of those details to facilitate uh, some level of additional attack, coordinate crimes, and all of those. And again, this is the chief of defense staff who is making the same allegation. I was waiting to see if there is going to be uh, a translation of this into a query and find some level of additional investigation into this. But this is not happening. It tells you very clearly that there are those who are merchants who actually benefit from the entire situation. And that is one. Two is the fact that um, the presidential arms procurement had actually told us how much money, running into billions of US dollars, that we have lost into the entire system because there are interested parties who are within the statecraft and and of course, the elite capture of the society has also contributed to this. So there are the issue of absence of patriotism uh, that has contributed and found the embers of insecurity uh, in this particular country. Uh, thirdly is the fact that we have policies, beautiful ones written, but unfortunately, poor implementation has always been an issue. The national security strategy currently is like the Bible that helps us to implement a coordinated security response to every form of threat in the society. But unfortunately, we don't even implement it. It gives to the whole of government and the whole of society approach and offers a non-kinetic approach that will help you to have a more sustainable response to issues that borders around it. But that is not the case. And mm. if you recall, I do a retrospect of what has happened in the past. We saw a case of how we have consistently negotiated from the point of weakness. We saw how Kanu Zafara state government at some point negotiated with bandit and of course we're giving them huge sums of money we saw it in katsina we saw this happening in different states and this also further emboldened uh, these renegades in the forest to continue to threaten the entire atmosphere Mm. But again, it is about how political stakeholders have also consistently uh, used and managed this guy uh, before, after, and during the elections. Okay, and so, 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 so I'm sorry, uh, I might just need to have also mm. helped to facilitate some level of political interest. And of course, when the elections are over, there's a need to find a way to keep them in business until the next election comes in. So management has been poor. It has been very acavarian. It has not been modern. And that in itself has actually brought us to where we are today. All right, Salahuddin, I apologize. I might just need to, of course, I'll stop you for now to hear from uh, our second guest, Olumuywa Aki Yale, a retired military personnel and also security expert. Thank you for joining uh, Secure the Continent. Uh, just thank, thank you. All right, great. Now, um, I mean, your profile actually has it that uh, you uh, were once, you know, uh, of course, uh, an officer. So uh, we believe that uh, you would also bring in maybe some personal experiences into the conversation. Um, what the first speaker, Salaudin, said, it tried to robe, uh, uh, talking about the root causes of what we are seeing right now in terms of insecurity around political, uh, economic, and social factors as being mitigators of uh, the very unfortunate incidences that we are seeing right now in Nigeria. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, what's your take concerning many of the root causes and motivation of these attacks, and what would you say has been uh, the approach of the government from inception so far? Has it been commendable? Thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. yes. Great. Okay, I want to thank you for inviting me to this program, and I also appreciate the other guests on the program. Well, I would like to come in from the background uh, of uh, security and uh, 
we've laid a lot of emphasis on the role of the military. I want to say that uh, security is beyond merely kinetic. Security is wider than just uh, sending soldiers on ground. And uh, like he also had identified, there are so many aspects that we need to bring to play to ensure that we are able to overcome the challenges that we have. I'm sure we know Nigeria is not peculiar to these challenges. Many other countries are facing even worse challenges. However, we need to come out with a holistic approach. We need to be sincere. We need to be decisive. We need to have the will to confront the problems. I will say successive governments have not uh, handled the situation the same way. And uh, for us to begin to witness a decline in uh, terrorism, banditry, kidnapping, the government must be seen to be serious. The government, many people do not trust the government. Many people do not have the confidence in the government. And uh, when the government says something and people believe another, uh, there is a, a discord. There has to be a perfect harmony between what the government is okay, planning. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to doing. cut in here, Olumuyawa. You said that many people do not believe the government, they don't trust the government, and the government oh, yes. must be seen to be serious. Why do you think that is? Okay. When we have different arms of government singing different things, maybe the office of the uh, National Security Advisor will say something, the governor of the affected state may say another thing, and uh, the facts on ground differs from what uh, we are hearing from official sources. So this leads to a lack of confidence and you see, military or the police alone, they cannot solve the problem. We need the goodwill of the people, the locals, the communities, the leaders, because they know the terrain much more than the soldiers and the, the police. But so there, there have also been cases where maybe uh, the locals, you know, the community members, are either too scared to come forward to talk, or they feel some sort of affinity or loyalty to this insurgents, right? Maybe because uh, they're, they're being paid or they feel that, you know what, uh, their ideology seems to resonate with the community in situations like that. I mean, th that's a difficult one. Yes, it goes back to the issue of trusting the government. Because when people feel that the terrorists, the bandits, they are more powerful, they are more relevant, they are more on ground than the government. And they see a situation where previous people who tried to cooperate with the law enforcement, they were left in the cold. So people are not willing to come out and put their necks on the block because to do so, you must trust the government. You must trust the system. You must believe they will watch your back. And that if you volunteer information, let me give you an example. There was a time there were high level security consultations to carry out an operation. Decisions were taken at high level. By the following day, when the uh, situation, the, the decisions were to be implemented, the supposed bandits, they had the information. So how do you expect people to trust the government when they know information they pass across, confidential facts they release to government, they are, they are compromised. So these are the issues. Until people begin to believe that the government is sincere, that the government will protect identities of uh, informants, and that the government is really determined to solve the problem.
we will, we will dance, be dancing around mm. on the same spot. Uh, all right, let me leave you for now, Ulumuywa. Let me move to Salauddin. Let's look at the modus operandi of many of these uh, terrorists and even kidnappers. Now, they use gadgets. They use devices like mobile phones. And, you know, even during, well, I say exchange and all of that, you know, they're, 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 some even do transfers, some it's physical cash. They ask for physical items. And the questions are quite a lot of people are asking is, for instance, when you use mobile phones, you have a digital footprint. An average Nigerian is believed to have the uh, NIN, that's the national identification number. You have the BVN, you have all sorts to identify yourselves. I mean, an average Nigerian has about three to four means of identification, right? And then all of this happens and it looks like it's either they are not uh, used or they are not able to use these platforms to track this guy. So my question to you is this. What do you perceive? I mean, you are a policy expert and you are also privy to you know, security uh, details. What do you perceive as being an entrance to this? Because sometimes it beats imagination that these guys use technology, yet... They even break into the, sometimes, they, they, like what, uh, of course, uh, well, this one of our speakers said, sometimes they, they, they intercept, you know, technology of, you know, uh, the government. But it appears like when it comes to the reverse, nothing really happens there. So what, what do you think could be the issue? Okay, I, I think first of all is the fact that we have an absence uh, in data infrastructure uh, that we? helps us to harmonize and keep a tab on do, citizens. Do we have an absence, uh, so absence in data infrastructure? Because, I, I mean, an average Nigerian for now has, I mean, for you to be able to have access to your bank account, uh, you must have a BVN, you must have a NIN, you must have a, I mean, all sorts, right? So is it, is it absence yeah. to data infrastructure, really? Yeah, the, the infrastructure here is actually looking at the issue of coordination mm. uh, because if, the, if you have an infrastructure that helps you to have a centralized data system uh, that drives uh, every other aspect of uh, social, political, and economic, and even cultural lifestyle, uh, it helps you to be able to contain and, of course, to be able to produce. Uh, any form of uh, antecedent. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, some of those quick uh, captures were made in Russia for 9-11 is because, again, everything that you, they used uh, from, de from uh, a driver, driver's license and all of the data uh, were very quick to trace. Uh, but unfortunately for us, that infrastructure for coordination and that infrastructure to collaborate and sync every form of data collection management system has actually been lost. Uh, you take your BVN, you do biometrics, uh, you do uh, uh, international passports, you do your biometrics, uh, you do for your driver's license, you do your biometrics. And one of the things that I have actually advocated uh, for over 10 years is for us to have a harmonized data bank where every citizen can then use it as a repository uh, to inform the kind of security planning uh, that we can have. But unfortunately, like we said, there is an elite capture of the society uh, who parallelly are uh, particularly enjoying the largesse uh, that is coming uh, to this issue that borders around security. Uh, on another basis, uh, we lost 242 billion naira uh, to the issue of a security vote. Who takes this money? It is actually taken by the political class. This is actually even despite uh, underfunding the conventional uh, security system. But we still spend that much on, on political elites who are doing security votes. And for me, for God's sake, how do you want to just oppose all of these things? A governor, for instance, takes as much as one billion on a monthly basis. And if you take this money for four years and you take it for eight years, you know what that actually translates into. And this in sorry, itself- Sorry, you said a governor, I'm sorry to cut you there. You said a governor- not takes as much as one billion for what? For security vote. It's a product of research. It's actually not just say here, say. Uh, they take this money as much uh, on a monthly basis. And of course, what they have done is that they have even gone further uh, to actually, because of pressure and plenty of external oversight uh, and external incursion, they have changed it to service wide votes. Pick any state budget, for instance, and you will see that line. Either you find it 
service-wide votes or you find security votes, it is actually money that is not accounted for. Most governors take this money, and a lot of government agencies and parastatals at all levels also take this amount of money. Put that money together, it is actually 70% of the entire national budget, annual budget of the Nigerian police. It is mm. actually higher than the budget of the Air Force and Navy if you combine them together. Okay. And you ask me, the, which serious government does this kind of situation? And when we know where our challenges currently truly lies. Look, let me tell you, Nigeria is currently saddled between two axes of evil. One is the Sahel, and the second one is the Gulf of Guinea. We know where the problem okay. is. We um, have the border management challenge. I'm, have sorry. Issue I'm sorry to cut in. We, we have a commercial break now. When we return, you pick up from uh, where you start. Please stay with us. Africa needs its own storytellers, people who understand the continent because they're from it. People who know that news is more than just a conversation starter, it's our stories. Because these stories run deeper than headlines and segments. It's about digging deeper to get the facts and telling the human side of every single story. Not just the echoes from foreign headlines and perspectives. It's time to take back our narratives and share them in our voices. The birth of Africa's new age reporting. And this is where it begins. Right here at New Central TV. The stories that put Africa first. Thanks for staying with us. If, of course, you're just joining the program, this is a Secure the Continent on New Central Television. And, of course, we have been examining uh, matters arising concerning the security situation across uh, Nigeria, particularly as it has to do with uh, kidnapping and abduction. We still have, uh, for now, uh, Olumuyua, uh, that's Akinyele, a retired military personnel and security expert from Lagos. Initially, we had Salaudin. Uh, Hashim, Program Director, Clean Foundation, uh, joining from Kaduna. Let me, of course, uh, direct my next question to you, uh, Olumuyua. Now, um, before we went on that break, Salahuddin was trying to give, you know, an overview concerning what he feels might be uh, the reason why Nigeria cannot leverage enough on technology to sort of combat uh, or fight this uh, very, very daunting challenge. I mean, you are a retired military personnel. How does this even work? And why do you think that, I mean, the phones cannot be traced or maybe another uh, might not be traced or some of the gadgets, you know, and modus operandi, uh, this uh, individual's use cannot be, uh, you know, unnest using technology to, to nip at uh, these issues in the bud? Okay, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, let me say something very clearly. The Nigerian military, the Nigerian police, the security forces, our SSS and DSS, these are well-trained officers, trained in the most modern art of our profession. However, we must remember that we are not the ones taking the decisions. The military are subject to the political powers. The police are subject to them. Like the other guests said, we have a number of data that is available. But the question is, are the political leaders, are they willing, are they ready? They know all these people, they know them, but they are not willing. So until our political leaders at the executive, uh, legislature and the ruling class until they are ready. We have well-trained police, we have well-trained military who know what to do, but we don't take action on our own. We do only what we are allowed to do. We are governed by 
laws, laws of war, rules of engagement, and uh, we are very professional. We are blessed with well-trained people. But the result we have does not justify the capability of our security services, unfortunately. Okay, so, do, but do you also think that uh, security, uh, the security apparatus is well-funded in this uh, fight? Well, I would say yes and no. One, in terms of training, our personnel are well-trained. In terms of funding uh, to acquire the hardware, yes, sometimes there are limitations. Maybe we were all in the nation recently when we had a budget pattern. We are all witnesses to what happens. Many times they will make provision in the budget to purchase hardware, to purchase platforms. But how many of these are actually uh, purchased? How many are made available? We see our troops out there. They are not given all that they require. You know, it's, it's unfortunate. And, but I believe that as more and more sensitization, like we are doing now, are carried out, I believe the silver lining is, uh, is near. Very soon, I believe Nigeria will not be business as usual. Mm. I believe the government will be more accountable and they will be more responsible. Uh, but I know we are a nation blessed with wonderful resources, human and material. It's just a question of uh, the leadership taking the right decisions. And uh, we will be out of the woods. That's my humble uh, take. So, All right. uh, I mean, talking about uh, being out of the woods, um, there's also the issue of... You know, you mentioned it at your in your intro uh, uh, statement that inconsistency in policy. Uh, at some point, uh, for maybe certain states, how they tackle these issues vary. So it seems like there's no uniform, uh, uniform or unified approach. You know, in tackling many of these instances, a typical one, uh, for instance, has to do with say maybe the non-kinetic approach to addressing these issues, where we've seen cases of where some of these uh, 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 individuals that are you know, branded terrorists are forgiven and then reintegrated back into society, right? And then uh, the issue of justice you know, comes to the fore. I mean, I, I just want to know your take on this, particularly on the issue of repentant, so-called repentant terrorists? Well, like we said, there is uh, inconsistency in government policies. That's number one. Then number two, there is insincerity. Because you see a situation where the populace do not believe the government is sincere. Because the way they tackle a set of uh, suspects differs from the way they tackle another set of suspects. So there is no consistency. And this leads to a loss of confidence in the system. And when you, on one hand, some people are treated with very, uh, with soft kid gloves. On another hand, you have situations where people who have even committed worse crimes are treated with uh, heavy hands iron hands. So there is no consistency. So until we begin to hold the government to account for what they are doing, not to take us for granted. We are not fools. I mean, Nigerians are very knowledgeable people across the spectrum. We are knowledgeable. We can see what goes on in other parts of the world. Our security forces are trained. Our youths are very, very aware. So Government has no hiding place. And mm. the earlier they accept that, the better for us. I mean, uh, to, you, you talked about individuals. Some individuals, you know, appear to be give, uh, being given some sort of preferential treatment. That, that takes me to Shea oh, yes. Kumi. Uh, uh, I mean, we've seen where personalities like his kind have advocated time and time again that the government, you know, negotiates, you know, with, with, with terrorists, you know, in, in resolving matters. And... People have asked that, why has he never been invited? Even though recently we understand that, you know, he was invited 
uh, to, 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 to speak, you know, and of course debriefed and all of that. But before now, I mean, he has made statements like that on multiple occasions, multiple platforms, advocating that terrorists be treated with some sort of kid glove, you know, negotiate with them, don't go all out offensive and all. Whereas maybe somewhere else, an individual just makes that kind of statement and is picked up. So my question to you again is this. What do you think uh, is the way forward or out of this? Or what does this reflect of our kind of society and this fight against, you know, uh, terrorists and insurgents in, in, in our society? Thank you. You see, as long as terrorists, as long as they see that they can get away with whatever they do, they will continue. You see, human nature is basically the same, whether they are Nigerians or Americans or Europeans. We are all human beings. We all think the same way. Now, a few years ago, there was a, a blackout in New York City. Ordinarily, New York is a place where there is law and order. But within a few hours, when there was no electricity, people were looting shops, removing the valuables everywhere because they knew they would not be caught. So in Nigeria, when criminals know that there are people, whether religious leaders or political leaders or whoever they are, that will be covering their back, protecting their interests, ensuring they get away with their loot. We saw on social media a few days ago a criminal showing heaps of money that he made from uh, kidnapping. As long as we have that, more and more people will go into, into crime. They see it as profitable. It's more profitable than doing a business in Nigeria. So government must come out clearly. It's good President Tinobu said recently that uh, bandits will be treated as terrorists. It's a wonderful idea because the legal implication is different. The way the law treats a terrorist is different from the way the law treats a bandit. A bandit is treated as a normal thief. He can be taken to magistrate court. Whereas a terrorist is treated as a high-class criminal that is only federal high court that can try him. Terrorism is punishable with life imprisonment. Whereas banditry, you can slap the person on the back and say, don't sin anymore. Take two months imprisonment. So they continue. So we need to harmonize all this uh, situation so that the people know we are serious. The nation knows the government is sincere. And the criminals, too, they too, they have uh, social media. They watch news. They will know that, yes, no more hiding place. Until we do that, we will continue to have a repeat. So are you, saying, are you saying that we do not have strong, unified legislations uh, on ground to uh, create or serve as some sort of preventive, will I call it a, a measure, so people don't get, get into this uh, particular uh, space. Are you saying that in terms of the policy uh, arrangements on ground, it's not strong enough to deter people? Yes, the legislation is reasonable, but the enforcement, the is where the issue is. Aspect, yes, that's where the problem lies. Because okay. our laws, you know, it takes time to make laws, but the leaders we have been having, they have not been, they implement the law to suit their own uh, situation. And that makes uh, nonsense of the whole thing. Mm. So okay. when the government, so in my opinion, the starting point is in the leadership. Every nation rises and falls by the leaders they have. We have a new government. They have the opportunity now to open a new page. That, okay, this government is serious. We want to tackle this problem. It's leaking our economy, the problem in Niger Delta, in Northwest, in Northeast. We want to tackle it. We have enough expertise to come together and provide solutions. But the government must be willing. They must be sincere. They must be ready that, OK, we want to implement what the experts But I, I, I want to ask you a direct question right now. I mean. Do you, what would you suggest, or which approach would you suggest 
we use more in this fight? The kinetic or more of the non-kinetic? Okay, we've been using kinetic largely. Unfortunately, the kinetic is not well coordinated, like I said. You know, the military, they are well trained, but they have a lot of limitations. To operate successfully kinetic force, the military will require cooperation from the local populace, will require cooperation from the intelligent uh, uh, arms of government, the SSPs, the local communities, the vigilantes, the religious groups, the youth organizations. So it's a coordinated uh, approach I will recommend. The military are doing well, but we need more from the local community. And government must be spent in the fall, leading a determined drive to bring an end to all these uh, criminal activities. So when everybody sees the government is taking the bulls by the horns, the military, like I said, they are well trained. We now need to harness the local uh, situation, the traditional rulers, religious bodies, the youth, because they know where the criminals are. They, are, they live in the community. They have girlfriends there. They have friends. They have colleagues. People know them. The military do not know them. So we need to now gather all this information together. And when they are presented to the military forces, the government needs to ensure that there will be uh, a protection of the identity, of the source mm. of information. Mm. So people are encouraged to come up with uh, necessary information for the security force. And those that are arrested, they must be pay for their crimes. Okay, the so, so, so the issue of uh, repentant terrorists and forgiveness shouldn't even arise? I don't think so. I think we need to have more and more people paying for what they have done. Once we have more and more of that, those who are, who are in, the, in, the, in, the, in the making, the factory, they, they will change their minds. Mm. Now, crime is seen as profitable. That's why we're having more and more of it. Yeah, so talking about profitability. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about profitability, I, we need to go on a break. When we, of course, return, uh, we will be talking about the naughty issue of ransom, mm. which have, has, of course, uh, stirred quite a number of reactions. But we'll talk about that when we return. Stay with us. We go where the market demands, as business, trade and market analysis are the core of our reports. Nigerians are beginning to speculate that the price of premium motor spirit might increase. If it's breaking, we got it. If it affects you, your business and your pocket, we're on it. We connect the dots of business so you understand what it all means. It is our hope that the efforts of the federal government to tame inflation yields desired results as soon as possible. I am Perpetua Fasami Peter. You're watching News Central. We're still watching Secure the Continent on New Central Television. And of course, we are looking at matters arising concerning uh, security concerns in Nigeria. Well, I still have with me a retired military personnel, Olumu Yua, who is also a security expert from Lagos. Thank you for hanging on. Um, let's uh, talk about uh, one very, very, uh, well, I call it sensitive issue right now, which is ransom payment. Uh, now, let me just uh, read out uh, 
uh, an interesting excerpt to you. Now, uh, the Senate had passed the Terrorism Prevention Act of 2013 uh, Amendment Bill, uh, which of course uh, has it concerning the issue of ransom that, that's uh, particularly amended Section 14. It says that anyone who transfers funds, makes payment or collides with an abductor, uh, kidnapper or terrorist to receive any ransom for the release of anyone uh, who has been wrongfully confined, imprisoned and kidnapped is guilty of a felony and is liable to, on conviction to a term of imprisonment of not less than 15 years. Now, my question is this. Now, most people that, or some people that are caught in this, what I call it, uh, situation, are usually caught between whether to pay ransom or not, and how best to go about it. My question to you is this. What's your take on the idea of ransom payment, number one? And do you think that, number one, the Nigerian government has the capacity to secure the release of any abducted individual without the payment of ransom? And um, how best to go about this? Okay. Uh, many of uh, what I will say, I've said before, I will just rephrase them. One, our government has made it clear no payment of ransom. Paying ransom is a crime under our laws. A governor of Kaduna State said recently they will not pay ransom. The president said we will not pay ransom. So let us do what we have said. But lives are at stake. They... Sir? Lives are at stake. They... Lives are at stake. I know. Lives are at stake, yes, I know that. But you see, you have to balance so many things. The state and the entirety of the rest of us, we are more important than one or two individuals. When the government comes out firm, sincerely, strongly, and people know that we will not pay ransom, we will, we will see an end to all this nonsense. Government knows where these criminals stay. They know. The communities, they know where they are. They buy food. They take things to them. People go and meet them. So we know. It's just a question, are we ready to take the bulls by the own? The day the presidents, the governors decide that enough is enough, you will see a change. Mm. They, are, they have not made up their minds. That's my own sincere take on this matter. All right, the uh, day we decide we are not doing it, that marks the end of it. All right, uh, thank you so much for your time. Olumu, you are... Aki Yale, that's a retired military personnel and also security expert, joining from Lagos. And earlier we had Salahuddin Hashim, program director, Clean Foundation, who joined from Kaduna. Once again, thank you for your uh, contribution on the program. Thank you. All right. On that note, before I go, I would like to say stay safe. And it's also important that I state that the opinions of our guests remain theirs and not that of New Central. My name is Dakpo Adigboye. Bye for now. from the news of yet another harrowing kidnapping of school children in Kaduna State. A stark reminder of the persistent danger posed by armed groups targeting vulnerable communities. Under my leadership, no child will be left behind. All of them will come back home by the grace of These events coupled with the ambush and killing of several soldiers by unidentified gunmen in Delta State has amplified concerns about the effectiveness of the administration security apparatus. President Bola Tinubu, who campaigned on promises to enhance national security, has faced criticism for the continued prevalence of such high-profile attacks within the first few months of his tenure. Security and politics. We've brought in, you know, non-state actors into this country. The most important thing is to implement the revived National Security Strategy 2019. Uh, 
change the current state-centric approach to security to a human-centered approach. The citizens' patience is wearing thin as they demand immediate and visible changes. Community leaders and civil society organizations have called for more proactive measures, including the need for collaboration with local stakeholders to strengthen on-the-ground intelligence and preemptive actions against potential threats. If we honestly investigate uh, this issue, you'll find that it's an issue of uh, attack and counter-attack, attack and reprisal. What policies, what, uh, uh, what relationships, what uh, expressions did we not make that has brought this thing on our faces? We've seen cases where villagers harbor criminals, offer them food, give them water, welcome them. It's not helping us in any way. Yet you're not going to inform the, the police or any security agency. It's very easy for us to blame people, you know, very, very easy. But when you go through what they've gone through, when they reported incidents, and then those they report to went to the, to the bad guys and said, these are people who reported it to us. And then the bad guys went back to the village and sacked, burned everything, and threw everybody away. So why should people want to tell you what, what they see? The administration has pledged to prioritize intelligence gathering, bolster the capacity of the armed forces to address the root causes of insecurity. The dynamic of the security challenges we are facing require corresponding strategies that incorporate a holistic and integrated approach to warfare where synergy among our services is paramount. We must treat them equally as terrorists. The pervasive sense of insecurity has also affected economic activities, with businesses and investors being wary of the risk associated with operating in certain regions. This situation has led to further calls for a comprehensive approach that integrates economic development initiatives to address the socio-economic factors contributing to criminality. As the second quarter of the 2024 approaches, Nigerians are looking for concrete progress and a significant downturn in the frequency and severity of security breaches. In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omoni.
something new is about to hit your imagination of TV. A brand new sundial with Star Times inbuilt technology. New TV innovation with an inbuilt decoder that connects you to both Star Times antenna and satellite signal. Star Times Sundial TV, you can enjoy over 300 local and international channels, one month Star Times highest bouquet for free, automatic system update. More benefits, more affordable. Star Times Sundial TV is available in all Star Times branches and dealers countrywide. Star Times Inside, entertainment inbuilt. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every race, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, and a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. For decades, the Niger Delta oil producing region has suffered losses from oil theft and pipeline vandalism, which has led to Nigeria losing billions of foreign exchange worth of crude. But with the engagement of Tantita Security Services, pipeline vandalism and oil theft has reduced significantly. Tantita Security Services is an internationally recognized security outfit based in Delta State. Tantita specializes in providing professional security solutions to the oil and gas industry through a strategic partnership with the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited NNPCL. With over 1,000 plus field agents, 30 plus operational and combat boats, 10 ground to air drones, Tantita is changing the narrative around security in the Niger Delta. Tantita Security Services, dedicated to putting an end to oil theft in the Niger Delta.
Hello and welcome to watching News Central Television. I'm Kofi Bartels. Let's begin the news of this hour with a look at the top stories. Christians across uh, the globe have celebrated Easter amid calls for hope and unity. Fire left two dead and about 2,000 homeless in South Africa. And Somalia's Portland shuns federal institutions over vote reform. Those are the headlines. We have details of those and other stories ahead on the news. Welcome. Let's begin the news tonight by telling you the chairman of the All Progressives Congress Caretaker Committee in River State, Chief Tony Okocha, has knocked some chieftains of the People's Democratic Party in the state over their recent celebration, or rather declaration, of support for President Bola Tidubu and the governor of River State, Simonala Ifubara. Now, this came as a direct reaction to a press conference by the former national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Uche Sakondas, uh, the former Minister of Transportation, Abiyah Sekibo, among others, who declared their support for Tinubu and Fubara. While addressing a press conference at the National Secretariat of the Party in Abuja, Okocha said most of those PDP elements are still in the camp of former Vice President Atiku Abubakar. He also faulted the declaration of support for President Tinubu while saying that they are the ones giving Governor Fubara what he called the confidence to challenge the resolution of Mr. President Bola Tinubu on the political crisis in River State. If the midnight pseudo lovers of Mr. President today as shown in their test on that critique, if they are now convinced that Mr. President is abundantly fit and proper to preside over Nigeria, and that his 10 months in office has provided renewed hope for an El Dorado for Nigerians, and choose to recant their hitherto unsavory and un unprintable tussocks against Mr. President, they should follow the proper channels allowed for putting or the campaign to a new political party. This approach of browbeating and blackmailing they intend to use is not fashionable at all. No sane host tolerates a guest who attempts to enter his or her house through the window when the doors are wide open. If there are six out of eight, why are the other two difficult? What are the two? Go and conduct local government election. And if you are governor, you are almost there for one year, and every day you think you are carrying crowd, you should just test the waters and find out that those crowds you are carrying are rented. When a man is hungry and you say, hey, enter the bus, we are going for somewhere, I will give you 5,000, they will push each other to enter the bus. That's the kind of crowd he has. He doesn't have the people. I'm River. That's in River State, where the State House of Assembly has accused the governor of dishonesty, threatening to resume impeachment proceedings against him if he continues to breach the Constitution in their opinion. Martin Amehule, the Speaker of the House of Assembly, made this known on Saturday during a press briefing in Port Hackett, the capital of River State. Amehule, who was accompanied by 26 members of the Assembly, read out a communique issued after the briefing. The lawmakers accused Governor Fubara of refusing to hold up to his end of the presidential peace accord, which they say he willfully signed without coercion. Well, let's discuss this some more. Uh, we're joined by Nelson Nekujimi. He is a political analyst. Good evening to you, Nelson, and a very happy Easter. <laughs> Nelson Nekujimi, can you hear me, please? Good evening. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Um, Nelson Nekujimi, is there a chance that um, the latest statement and move coming from the River State House of Assembly, we just 
you just said the words of uh, Martin Zameh, who later speaker, is more of a um, political than about governance and even about the Constitution. Well, the truth of the matter is that um, I can't hear your question very well. The truth of the matter is that uh, in governance, there's a little bit of politicking involved. So one expects that uh, the governor should uh, place politics right, even though we know governors, you know, take precedence over every other thing. But like we all know that politics is life. So one expects that the governor should get his acts right with regards to how he governs the state and uh, the stakeholders involved. Because uh, whatever we do, we, we cannot run away from politics, even in a family setting. So uh, you cannot run away from the fact that uh, there's a bit of politics involved in this impeachment uh, threats by the uh, River State House of Assembly. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it cannot be isolated or it cannot be you know, removed from it. Now, so what are the potential consequences for Governor Fuller and indeed for River State if uh, this impeachment proceedings resume? We seem to have an issue there with Nelson and Kujimi, uh, public affairs analyst. We will hope to have this discussion some other time. But we're moving on to another story, uh, to our Easter update. And Nigeria's President Bola Tinbu has felicitated uh, Christians in the country and around the world as they celebrate the Easter season. Easter is an event that commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is also a symbol of Christ's victory over death and sin. To mark the day, the Nigerian president in a statement called on Christians to imbibe the virtues of love, sacrifice, and compassion associated with the season. Since resuming office, or assuming office rather, in May, Nigeria's president has embarked on several policies that have had an effect on the masses and the economy. Well, in his Easter message, the Nigerian president hailed the resilience and sacrifice of Nigerians, saying it is necessary for economic recovery. Easter is one of the most significant festivals for Christians. It is a time of profound spiritual and renewal and joy, marking the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday following the full moon after the spring equinox in Nigeria. This year's celebrations seem rather different with citizens contending with the rising cost of living. With more, here's New Central's Bettina Willy. Whether through solemn rituals or joyful gatherings, Easter is a time when Christians reflect on life's blessings and spread love and good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection. However, in many places, most people concentrate more on the celebration than the reason for the season. Easter is simply about the reason for why we are Christians. I mean, um, without um, Easter, basically, the whole essence of our faith is not there. I think the present generation has lost it. And sometimes I look at it like maybe we should be blamed. Um, because um, the essence of Easter is for us to look at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what he really stood for and what he did for us, and then lend our life, give ourselves to him, and be obedient unto him. But what we see is that people are now celebrating, dancing, jumping, drinking, doing things. Instead of having been a sober time where you look at your life and you dedicate yourself to Christ. Usually a time to merry and jolly, especially after the long fast. This year, the economic hardship in Nigeria seems to be biting harder than ever, leaving the faithful clinging to nothing but their faith and hope for a better tomorrow. In our own little way, we do our bits. I mean, uh, a few weeks ago, in our neighborhood here, the whole of the jack on the here got pulled down. Of course, who, who, who takes the blunt is the church. This uh, church where they come. We've had to do 
we have to to support them with funds to relocate we every sunday we are giving people food stuff so we are doing the bit we expect the government to do their bit this is how it's okay for the economic uh, it's only it's, it's only by god grace for everything the hardship is too much this time of easter there's so much customer in doing our work and everything the economy has nothing to do with my easter because i'm of christ and because i belong to christ nigeria's economy has nothing whatsoever to do with my easter Christians in Nigeria are having a low-key Easter celebration this year. No thanks to the current economic hardship in the country that has triggered high cost of foodstuff as well as the soaring cost of transportation for holiday travelers amongst other factors. It is hoped that just like the seasons, this too shall pass. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili. In Umuahia, the Abbey State capital, Christians trooped out in their numbers to celebrate Easter in commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The central message by the Catholic Bishop of Umuahia, Right Reverend Michael Upong, focused on forgiveness, sacrifice, and endurance. He also enjoined Christians to emulate all the virtues of Christ, which he exhibited while on earth to help them advance their heavenly race. Also, the Bishop of the Umwahia Diocese of the Methodist Church in Nigeria, Right Reverend Ikechuku Emezi Nkulo, called on the government to make people oriented policies and fix the nation's infrastructure. The resurrection of Jesus gives us the firm hope and faith that resurrection from the dead, as he promised us, is a reality, not just fiction. The lesson it is teaching us that is that goodness has always the upper hand will always triumph over evil because jesus was crucified out of hatred and it's also telling us that no matter what we suffer as long as we are suffering innocently then you have nothing to regret at the end of the day god will vindicate you and so we shouldn't see every suffering as evil. And it should encourage us to be bold in doing the right thing always, even when everybody is persecuting us, remembering that Jesus was crucified for doing good. To actually rise with Christ. But in my own uh, understanding, I want to rise living off whatever that is against the wish of Christ. Whatever is sinful, whatever is harmful to humanity, I leave it away and then decide to live a brand new life, emulating Christ in all I do. This is my main aspiration, particularly during. As Nigerians continue to groan over the nation's worsening economy and insecurity, the Christians remain optimistic that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead guarantees a better tomorrow. These were the crux of Christian faithful in Asaba, Delta State, Nigeria, as they joined their counterparts all over the world to celebrate this year's Easter Sunday. At various church services held in the state capital to herald the celebration, Nigerians' leaders, uh, rather, were urged to be willing to make sacrifices for greater unity, peace, and progress of the country. Christians reminded that having gone through 40 days of fasting and prayer, Easter remains the most appropriate time for them to purge themselves of weights that have impeded the progress of the country by demonstrating love in its fullness and purity, not only to one another, but to others in society. One must rise. They must embrace the rising of Jesus and make this nation rise because it has been placed in our hands and the hands of the politicians to make it work. They should make it work. We cannot remain in darkness when Jesus has risen. That there is difficulty, but because of the resilience of Nigerians, that they are forging ahead with happiness. His love over us supersedes what we are going through, supersedes the hardship that we are going through. So I think today, is, um, no matter what you are going through, you come out and celebrate. You don't have to cook. Just celebrate his grace, celebrate his power, celebrate his passion to die for mankind. We continue to pray. 
but my message to political class is for them to do the right thing. It is just very good that we do things that will uplift the people, not, you know, tormenting people, putting them into bondage. So I'm expecting that the celebration of Jesus Christ will bring upon us, the Nigerians, every good... And still in the spirit of Easter, we head to South Africa, where millions of Christians around the world today celebrated Easter, also known as Resurrection Sunday, a Christian day that celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is one of the most important holidays in the Christian calendar. In Johannesburg, at the Cathedral of Christ the King, the congregates uh, celebrates, so congregants celebrated the day at a Mass and took Holy Communion. New Central's, New Central's Mbongani Ziziba has more. Harmonious praises all to exalt the glory of God. A Sunday Mass gathering to commemorate the most profound event in their faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From readings from the scriptures to recounting the story of Jesus' crucifixion and miraculous resurrection, each word spoken carries the weight of centuries of faith and tradition, uniting the congregation in a shared sense of purpose and belief. Many facets of the faith, especially this one, that of the resurrection, which in the minds of many people is difficult to fathom. For Christians, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of their belief. It signifies the victory of life over death, hope over despair, and light over darkness. A testament to the power of divine love that transcends all human boundaries. It also offers believers the promise of eternal life and the assurance that even in the face of adversity, there is always hope of renewal and redemption. Time to partake in a ritual known as the Holy Communion. Congregates take turns around the altar with their faces showing gratitude and devotion for the sacrifice that Jesus made for their salvation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is more than a historic event for many here. They are reminded that his victory over death is a source of hope and inspiration for believers around the world. We need to take this time and remind ourselves where we're coming from and where we're going. Who are we and um, our journey in Christ Jesus Christ. We must repent and we must go back to our Savior. I feel happy that he rose from the dead and he died for our sins. I'm also happy because he did so much for us and he was nailed to the cross. He bled and died, and some people on this earth do not really know who he is. So I want them to know that Jesus died for our sins, and he loves all of us. It's a blessing to have him being resurrected for us during this Easter. Resurrection Day, a day where many Christians across the globe celebrate and reflect and take a new leaf on their Christianity, a day that they believe Jesus died and rose and washed their sins away. In Johannesburg, for News Central, Bongani Siziba. Well, let's come back to West Africa. In other news, the Muslim faithful in Johannesburg, Tata State, in northern Nigeria have urged the federal government to wade into the economic crisis that has called cost rather untold hardship to the citizens. Uh, this was made known when New Central's Chizoba and Yowie sought to find out how they are coping with the economic meltdown even as they perform their Ramadan rite. <laughs> Ramadan is one of the most spiritual exercises within Islam. It is a period of fasting where believers abstain from as much as carnal acts as possible, give alms to the less privileged, and above all, abstain from food from 6 o'clock in the morning till same time in the evening when a call for the closing prayer for the day's fast is heard. Allah Akbar Allah Sana 
Sunny Moazu, his wife and children have just concluded prayers to end the day's fast. It is now time for the breaking of fast with different dishes to choose from. They spoke on the essence of Ramadan. Fasting is um, not just an, a way of nourishment to the soul. It is also, you know, a shield, you know, for the Muslim. Shield from uh, committing all kinds of um, uh, atrocities or, you know, unruly behaviors. It's not the much that you give, but it's the little that you are able to give. There's a hadith that the Prophet said that even if it is half a date, share one date, give your neighbor half. It gives me a chance personally to reconnect with my religion, to put this uh, hustle and grind to the side just for a little while and focus on what is important. Especially us as youths, you know, coming from the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you interact with people. Behind me here is the Masalichin Juma in Jos. It is the biggest and the main worship centre for the Muslim faithful here on the plateau. However, I am here to ascertain from the Muslim faithful how they cope with the hardship of the economy as they celebrate the month of Ramadan in Jos. We are trying our best to cope with the economy because this, uh, this our fasting is a sacrifice that we must do it. When um, doing um, fasting, I have um, camu, I drink. Nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. this, con this condition is very high. Well. It's very high. We need government to do something about this. Behind the sharing of this palliative is Pam Watcom, the senator representing Plateau North senatorial district. As we can see today, people are suffering. People are stopping you from the road, begging you, or asking you for assistance or help. So I think this can go a long way in touching the lives of some people. I want to appreciate the senator for remembering the Muslims for the palliative. By the next nine days, when Ramadan will come to an end, it is expected that the fruits of the month-long fast and lengthy supplication to the Almighty will be evident in the commitment of everyone to making the country a better place for all. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba Anui. Up next, we have a break in. When we return, we have more stories. Please stay with us. decades, the Niger Delta oil producing region has suffered losses from oil theft and pipeline vandalism which has led to Nigeria losing billions of foreign exchange worth of crude. But with the engagement of Tantita Security Services, pipeline vandalism and oil theft has reduced significantly. Tantita Security Services is an internationally recognized security outfit based in Delta State. Tantita specializes in providing professional security solutions to the oil and gas industry through a strategic partnership with the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited NNPCL. With over 1,000 plus field agents, 30 plus operational and combat boats, 10 ground-to-air drones, Tantita is changing the narrative around security in the Niger Delta. Tantita Security Services, dedicated to putting an end to oil theft in the Niger Delta. Welcome back. And now to more stories. Uh, agricultural revolution through food production is what many administrations in the past and present Nigeria seek to explore for food security. In this report, New Central's Omar Kirawa assesses the food production in the first quarter of the year. The prevailing economic situation in Nigeria 
has made millions of people struggle to survive. Farmers in recent times in the northeastern part of the country have been in the middle of this and even worse. This is as a result of attack by insurgents marauding the region and shows of the lake chart. Although there is no available data on the number of farmers affected, 12 farmers were murdered early this year in Gatamarwa and Sia communities of Chubok local government. 13 farmers also paid the spring price along Pulka and Frigi Road in Goza in late January. This has somewhat disrupted food production and supply chains, contributing to food shortages and inflation. In the past three months, if you look at it, there is bus, that is massive improvement in production. But the challenge there is, cost of production, if you look at it now, is very high. Then, with much encouragement, encouragement from the government, we can aspire to go produce more. Cost of food is still not affordable compared to uh, last year or years to years when you look at the purchasing power of the ordinary Nigerian. So to me, yes, we are producing, but it's not good enough to beat the price. Farmers seem optimistic and determined to rebuild their lives and communities through their vocation. Sustained efforts by the federal and state government yielded immense results in the first quarter of this year. Many families have been resettled to their ancestral home to resume their trade, farming. Former fighters are being de-radicalized leading to significantly less security concerns in many parts of the Northeast. Some parts of northern Borno, like uh, Mwabar, they've started producing both food and cash crop. I can say they have reached about 40% compared to the loss and then the recovery target in ratio of 100. You will see that we have recorded about 40%. Rural livelihoods are being revived, particularly in the tail end of the first quarter of 2024. Agribusiness must be introduced and then value addition to agricultural produce must also be encouraged. These are capital intensive issues and activities that ordinary peasant farmer cannot afford to do it. Borno State is pioneering sustainable food production by providing improved seeds, fertilizers and adopting solar powered water pumps to enhance their irrigation systems. We are also trying to shift from the utilization of fossil fuel to green energy with a view to reducing carbon emission and reducing cost also. The visit by the United Nations Secretary General earlier to Borno State re-energized the government as it is said there is still hope for the better. The Borno I found today is a Borno of hope, is a Borno with future. And I was very impressed to see the policy that is being applied here recognizing that you don't fight terrorism just by military means, you fight terrorism addressing the root causes of terrorism. As government continues efforts to reverse some of the negative trends, like the extreme upper hand of the dollar against the Naira, it is hoped that by the second quarter of this year, food will not just be available, but affordable to every Nigerian. In Maiduguri for News Central, Omori Kirawa. Thank you, Maru. Let's move to other reports. Uh, the persons living with disabilities in Abuja, Nigeria's capital, has called the performance of the current government high in reaching out to members of the disabled community. Now, this was as they converged on the Unity Fountain to mark the Easter and celebrate the birth of birthday rather of President Bola Tidbo. With more, here's our correspondent, Amadine Wee. They converged on the Unity Fountain in Abuja. <laughs> Members of the disability community from across the federal capital say it is a double celebration, the Easter celebration and the birthday of President Bola Tinubu. Some of them say the current government has been fair to Nigeria's disability community. This administration does not check the persons with disabilities. And they just started. They are not even up to one year. In two months, they're going to be one year. So imagine another seven years to go. So much. For others, it was an opportunity to read the performance of government. I am really happy for the president in the aspect of including persons with disabilities. Like myself, 
for the first time of being interviewed as a coming out in the midst of people, I think it's a privilege. We are happy and we, we said we must celebrate him because he has done what others cannot do for us. Uh, he has included it in so many things that we are expecting. And we are also expecting that he uh, will do more for us. The government has the interest of persons with disability in mind. And the Lagos State, when the president was the governor, Lagos was the first state to pass the disability law in this country. Persons with disability, we have not had it so good like this before. Since uh, President uh, Tinobu took over power, he has uh, created an enabling environment. The first thing he did was to appoint uh, the senior special assistant to the president of special needs and equal opportunity. They are also calling for more funding for the National Disability Commission and more intervention programs for members of their community. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi. The Delta State Governor, Sheriff Oberewori, has been urged to prevail on President Bola Tidabu and the Chairman of the Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency to rescue the Omoniria families, his second son, Eromo Sele, from total blindness on their stray bullets from the guns of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency operatives are said to have shattered the left eye of the boy in his mother's shop during a raid on Okapanam in Delta State on July 13, 2023. The same street bullets took the life of his elder brother, Ivan Omonria, during the incident. Uh, his New Central's correspondent, Austin Azul, visited the family in Okapanam Road, a suburb of Asaba, the Delta State capital and now reports. It has been eight months and 13 days after the accident that took place here in Asaba that led to the early death of a two-year-old boy who was caught short by a straight bullet of NDLA. Eight months and 13 days thereafter. The younger brother of Ivan, who was caught short by the NDLA bullet, has been battling for his health. I'm here at his father's house, Fidelis Omoria, to seek what has happened so far about the younger brother who has been ill for some time now. On the 13th of December, I have to go and bury my son at the mortuary. Since the chairman has come, that there's no issue and all that. So when I buried my son, they now told us that since we have buried my son, the one, the, my first son, that we should not worry, within a short while, they will get the visa and the expedited date for us. With the chairman, NDLA, I was in communication with him. He was assuring me every day that he would do the needful, that I should not worry. The father, who explained the various stages gone through after the promise made by the NDLA chairman, including securing a traveling visa that was unsuccessful, said in spite of the urgency that the trip requires, the family regrets that little or nothing is being done to expedite action. He said the family not only battled with the irreversible damage that was done to their psyche, but they were also saddled with the burden of paying the enormous hospital bills that come with treating the child. Governor Sheriff Oboriwari, to help me prevail on the federal government and the NDLA to help me save my son. I don't want him to die again. At least I've lost one. It's okay. Let's see how we can pull us together to rescue, to save this one. The son's mother, who couldn't hold back her tears, said they can't watch their only son losing his sight after losing their first son. She lamented the sleepless nights they have been experiencing the cause of the deteriorating health of the child, saying they can no longer wait till 2025 before the visa approval to take the child abroad for surgery. I'm begging the governor, please help us speak to Marua, the president, has amend Sinubu. Please come to our aid. Come to our aid. I cannot lose a child. And I have a child lose an eye. The whole reason for those surgery is to help to get his side back intact. Efforts to reach out to the NDLA chairman were unsuccessful. Eight months and 13 days thereafter. This young boy here is still battling for his eyesight who was wounded by the straight bullet from the NDLA. They are all appealing to the federal government and relevant stakeholders to come to their rescue to enable this young boy regain his sight. 
In Asaba, for News Central, I'm Austin Azu. Since its establishment in 1949, the Lagos Country Club has been known for its tranquility, but now it's facing an internal conflict. The club's management council is reportedly at odds with the recently appointed interim management board. Let's take that to report from correspondent Chilima Ona. Do not have the support of the members of the club and are to be withdrawn. The bone of contention is the registered trustee's decision to suspend the management council of the Lagos Country Club. In a recent statement by the management council, described the registered trustee's decision to suspend them and establish an interim board as illegal. This move has sparked outrage among a significant portion of the membership, prompting an extraordinary general meeting for a peaceful resolution and voting. This is very, very disagreeable to the members. So we insisted we must have an EGM and bring the club back to a peaceful situation, whereby all petitions are dropped, the interim management council set up by the trustees is cancelled, and we pass a vote of confidence on the management committee that was sacked by the trustees. There's been a lot of things happening in the club that has been very, very shameful to us. And we needed to quickly uh, come together to be able to see a way to resolve this peacefully and to be able to make sure that we bring back the sanctity of the club back again. We have a lot of issues where the trustees of the club are taking the dissolving the management council, which is out of the constitution of Lagos Country Club, and imposing an interim board on the management council that were duly elected. Members of the prestigious club are urging the registered trustees to lessen its interference in the matters of the club. Their interferences over the years started creating uh, unnecessary conflict that now accumulated to this climax that we are having now. So for us members, we decided that this kind of interferences must stop. The trustees must stop uh, exercising the powers that the constitution did not give them. They must stop issuing directive to the management council that is charged with the responsibility of running the club. In fact, the management council nominates them to be appointed as trustees. So there is no way they can even be above the management council because in the years past, they've played elderly roles, they've played fatherly roles, uh, mediating in conflicts and uh, achieving peaceful resolutions to conflicts that have happened in the club. The Oust Management Council has appealed for calm and returned to the supremacy of the Lagos Country Club's constitution. They say they are committed to resolving the issue swiftly to ensure a safe and welcoming environment for members. Coming up, Somalia's Portland shuns federal institutions over vote for a reform. We have details of that story and others when we return from the break. Stay with us. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every raise, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. Welcome back. The news continues in South Africa. Two people died and almost 2,000 were left homeless when fires engulfed hundreds of shacks in three separate incidents. 
in South Africa's Cape Town. In Johannesburg, at least 60 shacks have been destroyed, leaving hundreds homeless. It is understood the blaze swept through the informal settlement early on Sunday at Commissioner Street in Fairview. Johannesburg's emergency services spokesperson, Nana Radebe, said firefighters managed to contain the blaze. In the southern continent, Somali's state of Pontland, or Somalia's state of Pontland, has announced on Sunday it will no longer recognize federal institutions after Parliament backed a plan for one person, one vote election system. It was the latest move in a long running, sometimes tense saga, with Pontland repeatedly issuing similar declarations in recent years to express its disagreement with the central government in Mogadishu. As a result, Pondland says it will have its own comprehensive government authority until a federal government system is put in place with a mutually accepted Somali constitution that is subject to a public referendum. Authorities in the region oppose the adoption by Parliament of a plan to reintroduce universal suffrage and end the complex clan-based indirect voting system which has been in place for more than half a century in the troubled Horn of Africa nation. Somalia <laughs> Let's join our business desk for the latest from the world of business. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Nigerian never appreciated significantly against the US dollar throughout March 2024. Official figures indicate that the Naira closed the month at 8,309 Naira per dollar on the last trading day, up from 1,595 Naira 11 Kaba per dollar at the end of February 2024. In a parallel market, the Naira saw an even more pronounced recovery. The exchange rate improved from 1,600 Naira per dollar in February to 1,250 Naira per dollar in March, representing a 28% gain in one month. The gains in the official and parallel market at the largest scene in over five years. Rice Farmers Association of Nigeria, Rifan, has called on the federal government to restart the Anchor Borrowers Program, ABP, and address insecurity across the country as a measure to stem the ever-increasing rice prices. This was stated by the vice president of the group, Nina Ejim, in an interview with the news agency of Nigeria, NAN. Recall that Rifan, a top beneficiary of the ABP, with 1,518,603 members benefiting from the borrowing program, is currently grappling with a repayment shortfall. From the total principle of 283.01 billion naira that was allocated to Rifan, there has been a repayment of 137.24 billion naira. This leaves an outstanding principal balance of 145.77 billion naira, which is considered as past due. And finally, Every Coast's president, Alassane Watara, will raise the official farm gate price of cocoa from the current 1,000 sefer francs per kilogram to 1,500 sefer francs on Tuesday. This is based on information from sources at five distinct export companies. The sources, who pleaded anonymity, stated that they were referring to a decision made on Saturday at a government meeting. The official farm gate price that growers in Ivory Coast, a key producer, can charge for their beans, has not yet reflected the more than threefold increase in cocoa prices over the past year as disease and unfavorable weather sent the world market to a third consecutive deficit. And that's business news at this hour. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasami Peter. The news continues shortly. Bye for now. Let's take some sports stories now. Rivers United got a crucial 1-0 victory over USNOJ 
of Algeria in the first leg of the CAF Confederation Cup quarterfinal clash in Nigeria on Sunday. Augustin Okpejefa broke the deadlock in the 10th minute with a crucial strike from the edge of the box at Godzilla Pabio Stadium. The Nigerian team's fiscal dominance it proved to be a major factor throughout the game. The second leg comes up in Algiers on the 7th of April and the North Africans will battle to overturn the deficit and secure passage to the semi-finals. The stakes are high for USM Algier with qualification to the next round offering an opportunity to continue their title defense. Let's now join our sports desk for both stories in sport. Nigerian athletes Akiro Duye Samuel, better known as Coach Dre, took on a remarkable challenge on Saturday morning, March 30th, 2024. He swam the entire 11.8 kilometers across the Lagos Third Milan Bridge to raise awareness about mental health. Coach Dre, CEO of Ocean 28 Swimming Academy, embarked on the impressive feat from Oro Shoki on the mainland to Adeniji Adinli on the island. The professional swimmer completed the journey in a commendable time of 2 hours and 33 minutes, with his friends and colleagues cheering him on throughout the way. Coach Dre affirmed his 10-year career as a swimmer could help him do anything and become anything. He added that taking care of mental health is so important that when life throws curveballs, there's support available. The defending champions of the Lewis Edem Invitational Basketball Championship, Rivers Hoopers, have arrived in Lagos for the third edition of the tournament. Having clinched the 2023 Nigerian Premier Basketball League title, Rivers Hoopers find themselves in a challenging group alongside Ebun Comets, Hoops and Reed, Quara Falcons and the Braves of Ghana. In the previous edition, the King's men emerged victorious with a dominant 74-56 triumph over the Spintex Knights of Ghana, and they are now aiming for consecutive titles. Additionally, Rivers Hoopers view the Lewis Edem tournament as a vital opportunity to prepare for Season 4 of the Basketball African League, underscoring their commitment to maintaining their competitive edge on the continental stage. Jürgen Klopp's Red Army is hell-bent on making sure that the German football legend ends his tenure at Merseyside with a major trophy as they overcame a 1-0 deficit against Brighton to keep their title hopes alive. Despite being the second-best defensive side in the EPL, Liverpool conceded a goal in the second minute after a clearance by Virgil van Dijk felt perfectly for Danny Welbeck to fire in a volley that gave Brighton the lead at Anfield. However, as they have done in previous games this season, the 2024 Carabao Cup champions came from behind to defeat the Seagulls. Luis Diaz equalized in the first half while Liverpool's top scorer, Mo Salah, netted his 22nd goal of the season in all competitions. The win puts Liverpool on top of the Premier League table with 67 points ahead of Arsenal and Manchester City. Fashion and arts enthusiasts in Nigeria have called on the government to invest in the fashion and arts subsector, saying it can help solve Nigeria's unemployment challenges. They say the sector has the potential to help Nigeria and the much-needed foreign exchange generate revenue for the country and make the youth more productive. Here's Amadinui with more. In attendance were fashion and arts enthusiasts, entrepreneurs, designers and makers of African crafts. We are the creative industry. We believe that over 70% in the continent and even the country is of youth within the ages of 12 to 35 years. So this is the age bracket for creativity. So this summit is for us to converge in one space. Both the creatives, the emerging fashion and art entrepreneurs, successful business owners in the private sector, the public sector leaders. We need to hear from the mouth of authority. We need to hear from the mouth of people who lead the creative industry. Participants at the summit say the African fashion and art subsector remains untapped, and through investment from government can live up to its potentials. They say through collaboration, creatives, including fashion and arts lovers, can become a force for good in the country. Together we can create a vibrant ecosystem that foster creativity promote sustainability and drives economic growth across the continent. Today we invite you to join us 
in this remarkable journey. Together, let us celebrate the richness and diversity of African fashion and art. The, the movie industry is generating over $600 million. You know, not talk about the comedy, not talk about the music, Afro is getting popularity uh, across the continent. And I, I bet you this is one thing uh, I always look at, the government should invest in things like this that not only promotes young people, but brings about productivity. Experts here are saying that investment in the fashion and art subsector can help Nigeria harness available potential and solve the nation's unemployment challenge. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. And that's all at this hour. Before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories tonight. We brought you news that Christians across the globe have celebrated Easter amid calls for hope and unity. Fires left about two dead and 2,000 homeless in South Africa. Somalia's Puntland has shunned federal institutions in that country over a vote reform. We'd like to hear from you. Please send us your eyewitness reports. You can use the WhatsApp number and email address showing on your screen. Also, social media, we're at New Central Television. Give us a photo on the major platforms. And you can watch us live on any of these channels or platforms. Many thanks for your time tonight. My name is Kofi Bartels. Have a lovely Easter. It was a capacity building session for select senior cadre of the Nigeria Police Force with focus on spokespersons across the country and deputy commissioners of police. The objective is to improve the efficiency of the police, increasing public trust and hoping it will translate to better service delivery. Many Nigerians do not trust their police for reasons that are linked to the origin of the police. You cannot wish it away. The police we have was not built by Nigerians. It was built by colonial masters to subdue Nigerians. Carried out assessments and discovered that there's a need to increase awareness and do a lot of sensitization around the Police Act 2020, both among police officers, particularly the pub police public relations officers, and then the public. The training focused on the Police Act 2020 and how through effective implementation it can catalyze transformation within the force, creating the much needed police reforms. The Act lays out the rights and privileges of the citizens and also makes provisions for what the police need to do their job. So I think there's a common ground somewhere where some of the frustrations that security officers face that actually, you know, have a hangover in the way they engage with the public have already been addressed by the Act. So if these resourcing areas are addressed, the police will better serve the public. And that deficit, that trust deficit that we see in terms of that relationship will be better. It's a work uh, in progress. And the Act mentions so many things about human rights of Nigerians. It's an act to make sure that police works in line with the fundamental human rights of Nigeria because the main job of police is to promote and protect democracy. Experts here law the act, but believe that through implementation of many of its statutes, the police can achieve its obligation, which is curbing crime in the society with the collaboration of the public. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi.
the team had visited from the Center for Media and Society in Abuja. After commending the Minister of Information and National Orientation for visible reforms in the ministry and amongst its agencies, they made several key demands, including creating a conducive environment for the press to thrive by pushing for amendment of available laws relating to press freedom. We request that you also push for amendment of section 39, which provides for freedom of expression to include specifically, why that section remains, but to include specifically freedom of the press. This has come from the challenges we have seen even in the courts that what we have in section 39 is a right you know, that goes to all citizens and does not specifically, not specifically for the press. Honorable Minister, sir, colonial era laws such as those on sedition and criminal defamation should be removed from the static books. They have no place in today's international standards. Indeed, the court, or since 1982, the Court of Appeal already expunged, already struck the laws of sedition dead, but it remains in our static books and no efforts has been made you know, to remove it from there. The Minister of Information and National Orientation assured them of government's commitments to ensure press freedom in the country. I want to reiterate the commitment of government to ensure that there is press freedom in this country. Uh, the press is even freer. But like I always say, uh, freedom is not free if it does not have responsibility. So as you have press freedom, you also have responsibility. He says President Bola Tinubu has given his word to Nigerians and will not renege on his promises. His message consistently to Nigerians is that uh, everyone will breathe. The poor, the rich, everyone will have to breathe. And it is the media that will create that env environment uh, for that uh, uh, freedom to, to... The minister, however, urged citizens and members of the press to practice their profession responsibly. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. A warm welcome. We appreciate that you're here. I'm Felicity Ezewike. Our slot topic for this segment has been described as the eighth most common cause of cancer-related deaths among women. Cases are predicted to increase by 42% globally and by 86% in Africa alone by 2040. And there is real fear a diagnosis is as good as a death sentence. But should it be? I'm talking about ovarian cancer. While the rate has significantly reduced globally in the last 20 years, recent trends suggest a rise, especially in Africa, with the possibility of figures doubling by 2040. As of 2020, over 17,000 women had died in Africa due to ovarian cancer. The death toll is predicted to increase by 51% in the world and 92.3% in Africa also by 2040. This means that by that year, around 15,694 more women who could be dead, almost double the present figures. Should an ovarian cancer diagnosis be feared as a death sentence for women in Africa? To help us with some perspective about the cancer, awareness level, challenges and treatment options are the joined after the short break by Dr. Noye Okoye. Do stay with us.
Thank you for staying with us. I'm now joined live in the studio by Noni Okoye, consultant, obstetrician, gynecologist. She joins us from Lagos. She's here with me. Thank you very much yeah. for giving us your time. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a basic understanding of what ovarian cancer is and why this seemingly palpable fear that a diagnosis is synonymous with being given a death sentence. Yeah, I think, um, thank you so much. I think it's really um, applaudable that you're, you're bringing into fore this kind of talk. So um, ovarian cancer, as um, you may know, it's a cancer that affects the ovary. So the ovary are just, you know, structures. If you see, if you watch on Instagram, you see people, when they see babies, they say, oh, my <laughs> ovaries, yes. <laughs> they say my ovaries because, you know, it's, it's because of, it's, uh, it's, it's there for reproduction. So you have actually two, you know, ovaries seated in the pelvis. That's just down um, around between your thighs. That's where the pelvis is. So ovarian cancer affects the ovaries. And it's, um, there is a palpable fear. Yes, it's true. But you have to ask some questions. Why is there a palpable fear? Is it because um, people have lack of information, awareness? Do they have relatives that probably the present leads to the hospital? And how do they feel? How are they managed? What is the information that they have? Could it be because of affordability, accessibility? So all of those things could contribute to why there might be a fear for ovarian cancer. I guess we will come back to that. Like every other when cancer. We, okay, yeah. when we have maybe a little bit of uh, understanding of mm. um, where we are at. So you, you highlighted a couple of things that could trigger people thinking that a diagnosis is a death sentence. One mm -hmm. of them is awareness. What would you say we are in Africa, mm -hmm. and specifically in Nigeria, um, mm -hmm. this is where we're domiciled? Yes, so um, coming to the awareness aspect of it, if you do look at, like, like in Nigeria here, where I, I'm in Africa, if you do look at um, the awareness, the awareness in Nigeria, uh, even in African countries, is like low to average. People don't really, um, they, yes, they, they do know that there is cancer, there is ovarian cancer, but most of them don't even have the knowledge of the symptoms, of the risk factors. So even in developed countries, you see that um, one of the challenges in managing this condition has to do with presentation. So that's, that's, the, 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 that's the, the, the main challenge we have, which is linked to awareness and knowledge. And so it's really a good thing because if you're talking about prevention of medical conditions, even cancer, one key in management of these conditions, it would really be attributed to creating more awareness. So people could have more knowledge about this, what causes this, the risk factors, how can this be prevented, how can this be managed, and then you, you could see that you would ultimately reduce the death rate or fatality rate. Um, I know there's a couple of issues associated with this. I'm not, um, yeah, yeah. I was just basically from the little things I've read. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, risk factors. Uh, before we talk about prevention, mm -hmm. what I did see was that the, it's not quite easy to mm -hmm. identify when someone has ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hear is it, it, is, it mimics other symptoms. Mm -hmm. It is not just one thing that maybe you have headache or you feel feverish, people automatically just diagnose themselves with malaria, for instance. So um, is that true, that the symptoms may make different ailments that you might not be able to pinpoint that you have ovarian cancer? And if yes, are there specific tests maybe that can um, show you that you have this cancer? Yeah, so I'll just take these questions one at a time. So you're asking about the, the symptoms. Yes, one of the problems, one of the challenges we do have, um, from my experience with management of ovarian cancer, it has a lot to do with um, the symptoms. Now, if you, if you also know that um, just if you compare that to um, other cancers, like ovarian cancer is the second most common gynecological cancer. I don't mean overall it's like the seventh, but I'm talking about genital cancer. After cervical cancer, you have, genet uh, you have um, ovarian cancer. Then firstly, apart from that, um, overall for women, the commonest is breast cancer. Now, the difference between ovarian cancer and these other two cancers I mentioned has to do with, you know, accessibility. The organs like the breast is easily accessible. You could easily, if you have a lump, you could easily feel that. Even at such, like, for instance, I went for a program um, like two weeks back on a modern Sunday, and I had to talk to a population of women about breast and um, cervical cancer. So after that, I had to screen some women, and I just choose five, chose five. And out of those five women, like three women had lumps on their breasts. And, and one of those three women, I'm coming, one of those three women, she had um, a family history of 
breast cancer. So it, does it make a sense? So that's where awareness comes in. And this is about, you know, organs that are accessible. Even the cervix, which is the neck of the womb, is quite accessible as well. Yet there are issues with presentation. Talk more of ovaries that are located, you know, in the pelvis. So that is the, the issue. And adding to that, the, you, we have um, concerns about the symptoms are vague. Um, so most of the times women could, sometimes women would even have no symptoms. Some would present with symptoms like abdominal pain, abdominal discomfort, bloating. Some women would present with satiety. That means early satiety. That means you eat a little um, kind of food and mm -hmm. you feel, you know, full and bloated. Some women could have pelvic pain. And at the late stages, they could have weight loss. So when they do have these early symptoms, over the past, in the past few years, they, they did say that um, these symptoms of ovarian cancer is really present when it's advanced. But it has changed because even in early stages, these symptoms are there. So um, that is where the issues are with regards to knowledge, awareness. You see some of these so as, as a doctor, as a doctor, yeah. what, would, what would make you ask somebody to go um, have a test, maybe, to right. confirm if they have ovarian cancer? And um, are there, that's part of the question I asked earlier, mm, okay, are there yeah. specific tests that will confirm that somebody has it? Definitely, there are some um, diagnostic tests for that. But the, but the thing about ovarian cancer is that, you know, we are talking about um, screening. Like um, other health conditions, other cancers, there could be a pathway to screen for, <coughs> sorry, these health conditions. For ovarian cancer, it depends on what the patient presents with. Like I said, these patients could present late. So when they present late, by the time you subject them to have some tests, you know, some scans, special kind of scans, MRI, most times it may be too late. So when the patient comes to me, I would first of all ask the patient a couple of questions, ask them about their history, what they're presenting with, ask them about risk factors. Now, if you do tell me that you have a family history, if you know about um, a celebrity, Angelina Jolie, you know about her? Yes, the, yes, yes. The, the breast cancer. Yes, not just that. She didn't have breast cancer. She had a family history of that. Her oh, mother okay. died of breast cancer. She had a her grandmother was affected. So she just went to the, uh, you know, she was just being assessed. That was about 2015. And she had a couple of tests done and a genetic test done, which um, one of it is called, we call it BRCA gene, which is an abnormal kind of gene that if you do have that, there could be a high chance that the person could have an ovarian or breast cancer. So because of that, she was offered some treatment options, which included to remove, you know, her breast, breast and, and the ovaries. I think that's, that's the part that I'm yeah. aware of, that she removed her breast. Yes. So part of it, it will be assessing you, asking you a couple of questions based on your symptoms, based on your family history, some kind of lifestyle measures that you have. And then based on that, the, the doctor would refer you to do some couple of tests. And then from there, you could make the diagnosis and offer treatments to the yeah, patient. You, you talk about family history, um, yeah. um, uh, life experiences. What mm -hmm. are these factors, aside the two, that increases a woman's um, probability of getting ovarian cancer. Yeah, so surely, so for every um, kind of cancer, really the cause is not clear, but yeah, like every woman, as long as you have an ovary, you have a lifetime risk. predisposition. Yes. So there is a one in 70 background risk that every woman would have ovarian cancer um, as, she, as, a, as she's advancing in age. But then there are some things that increases a woman's risk. First has to do with um, some, like I've mentioned about genetic factors, which is very, very necessary, family factor, familiar factors. Now, 10 to 15% of ovarian cancers could be linked to this. So you and I, every human being has, you know, you have trillions of cells, you have genes that carry the information about how your cells work. So for any reason, if there is an abnormality or a damage to any of these genes, actually these genes should protect someone. But if there is a damage to any of these genes, and this gene is being inherited from either of the parents, then you stand to have a risk of having ovarian or breast cancer. So we call some of these genes, one is BRCA gene, there is BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. So those are, in, they, those are you, know, you know, they are implicated in such cancers. Then other things have to do with, you know, having someone being on the, you know, having a high BMI, body mass index, obesity. So um, also, early, some things that can be modified, like your age, as someone is advancing in age, there is a risk to that. Then um, elements, when a woman sees elements, because what happens is that the ovaries are egg baskets, they release eggs every month. 
So the, some theories, when this kind of thing happens, you know, researchers tend to, you know, research to find yes, what are the likely yeah, factors. Yeah. And then the factors that have been there has to do with what we call incessant ovulation. When a woman keeps on releasing eggs, now when you release eggs every month, there are some damages that could occur to the lining of the cell. Ah, it sounds really complicated. I'm sure somebody <laughs> watching for the first time might be wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, this sounds really scary. So we've yeah. talked about the risk, the factors that may make somebody predisposed to ovarian cancer. So what are those factors or those lifestyle changes that could the woman should the risk. maintain Good. to reduce the risk yes. of ovarian cancer? Fine. The, 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 the reason is not to scare anyone. Uh, that's the, the, the issue is that you need to give people the information yes. so that they make informed choices. So it's not about scaring people. It's just to give you the right information. Now, um, there are some things that you cannot change, like your age. You can't change that. If you do have a family history of breast cancer, that can be changed. If you have a sister or a brother, uh, or if a sister that had a breast cancer or ovarian cancer or a mother, you can't change that. But what you could do is that what are those risk reducing strategies? So now coming to generally, like I said, lifestyle measures. If you do go to developed countries, if someone has any medical condition, the first thing they talk to you is about diet and exercise. So those are very important. So you have to watch what you eat. And that's where you have to go to maybe dietitians. They talk to you about if you have issues with maybe weight gain, exercise. It helps. It helps in the functioning of the body. Then for women, it's, it's you advise them to breastfeed. Breastfeeding is good because when you, there are some factors that interrupt ovulation process. So when you're pregnant, you have a lot of time. The ovaries are not releasing eggs. So it keeps the ovaries to some kind of resting phase. And that reduces the risk of ovarian cancer. So you exclusively breastfeed. If you are a woman and you, you have babies, so if you don't... So have... let, let's pause and emphasize it. If you're a woman <laughs> and you are having babies, please, mm. please do exclusive if you can. Mm. If you don't have any reason mm -hmm. not to or you don't have any medical challenges, if you can, please. Mm -hmm. So those are, those, are, um, those are the ones that... Then contraception, those, some, some women... Like um, if you do use some kind of contraceptive pill, like if you use combined contraceptive pills, yeah, they I, have, I read that as well. Yes, yes, it does. If you use that for over five years, five to um, ten years, so studies have shown that it could reduce the risk of ovarian cancer to over twenty percent. But then you have to be careful because the COCP as well would increase the risk of you know cervical cancer. <laughs> so you have to <laughs> balance all of that the, and the get the, um, the right yeah. information. And then there are some factors like um, you know some endometriosis which is when you have an abnormal cells that is meant to be in the lining of the womb, it's, um, you know, in the ovaries, and use of some fertility drugs. So these are, you know, modifiable risk factors. So when you are exposed to such kind of risk factors, of course, you need to pay more attention to your health. You need, you need to think more of, if you have symptoms like bloating, abdominal pain, Repeat you know, insistently, symptoms, right? insistently, like you're having three or four episodes of that in a month, of course, you should be able to, go and see a doctor. Don't right. go over the counter, take some medications. Uh, by doing so, because part of, you know, reduction of this risk will be early detection and treatment. I was just about to go there. So that's that. the, the, at mm -hmm. the beginning, we talked mm -hmm. about uh, the fear that once you get an ovarian cancer uh, diagnosis, you're almost as yeah. good as dead. No. And then there is the prediction that you, the, the, you have like a five years um, survival rate, survival rate mm -hmm. and all of that. So, um, no, no, let me what? come to that. People read a lot of things in the internet. Now, it, it, now, no, but there are research that I, yeah, that, yeah. I understand that, that gives you... So, okay, I, basically what I want to ask is, is it treatable? And uh, is there a possibility that after treatment, the person can go on to live uh, the, the full span of their life? And... What's, at what stage? Because I know it's in stages. Mm -hmm. stage yeah, one, stage one two, two, three, four, yeah. What stage is it? Um, if you catch it, what stage will you catch it and you can have that chance? Yes, for every cancer, once it's um, the cancer, most of the, all the cancer stages usually are from the way it's being um, called. We have what we international staging system, we call FIGO, is from stage one to stage four, right? So for every cancer, once you come around, once you're in stage one, it's an early cancer. So those are really. Uh, amenable to treatment, cure, and the survival rates are higher. So when you do, when you're making all those um, research work, works like in Africa, we do have survival rates for stage one cancer. That's the early cancer. It's over 80 to 90 percent because most of these researches they don't go further than five years, right? 
So overall, it's about 40%. So that means that if these women, they have the treatment, they are staying in five years during the research period, they are doing fine as long as there are a lot of factors that affect the treatment. It's not just about treatment, it's about the age of the patient. Does the patient have any medical condition? What are the kind of risk factors the patient has? At what time is she presenting? What the team of experts managing the patient? What kind of facilities do they have? Those are the questions that you have to ask, and yeah. those are the factors that affect the treatment outcome for every kind of cancer. Okay. And of course, the patient's outlook. Yes, yeah. that's the mental state as well. Very that's important. why you always harp on mental health and Very how important. it impacts on healing. Yes. I, I want you to yes. speak on. Uh, we talked about, I asked you at the beginning about awareness. What level of awareness do we have? Um, how do you think we can improve on awareness? Because when we do that, the diagnosis might become easier. More women will be more conscious of needing to check themselves and know that there's a likelihood you could have this. What can we do to improve? What you're doing now. <laughs> But this is, yes, New Central is Pan-African, yes, but yeah. there could be more. It's not everybody that has a television. Now, let me tell you something. There was a study that was done in Luth, I think 2018, and they tried to assess the knowledge of the participants, over 400, and to find out the knowledge and awareness of, you know, they have about what, well, um, um, ovarian cancer. It was done in Nigeria. So about 19% of women had the knowledge, you could see how poor it was, had the knowledge of the risk factors and symptoms of ovarian cancer, and then the sources of the knowledge. Like about 33% of such women had the knowledge from mass media. Okay. Television. So we're doing a work. Instagram, work we're doing a good work. So <laughs> it's like, um, you, know, you know, Instagram, social media. And about, I think, a, a, about 30% also had knowledge from just discussion with their... Fellow women. Fellow, no, doctors. Oh, okay. So they come to the hospital, ask a couple of questions, they talk to them about... Um, ovarian cancer and they get to know about that or from relatives you know just social media they have a relative that had this kind of condition they had to read it up but mostly from health professionals just like i'm doing now so that's a, a very important way of spreading awareness you just have to go through a mass media disseminate the information and, and and also if you do have survivors you know because there is this stigma people have about social cultural region, region, um, you know factors that could affect them you know some people when you have a family history of cancer they, they don't want to talk about it. So if we do have uh, like celebrity survivors, people that people look up onto and they have this kind of condition or they have a relative, they could just, you know, do a campaign. Do we talk actually about still it. have cultural stigma about things like this? Absolutely, we do have. We may not be in some parts of, um, you know, African countries, even in Nigeria, like in remote, in the northern countries. Yeah, yeah, we Why have, is that? What, what do you think? Yeah, it has to do with development. Okay, it has to do with education. A lot of things that has to do with socio-cultural factors has to do with education. You, although if, if you do conduct a study in cities like Lagos, where I stay, you would find out that over 50% or 70% of women, they have tertiary education. And those are people that have less chances of having this condition. Now, if you get to the north, southern part of Nigeria, you, you will find out that a lot of women, there is this issue of you know, patriarchy where they have to uh, they have to take permission from their partners to come to the hospital. Even now, you would see women who have medical conditions. They do not have money. They are not working. The poverty, it plays a huge role. It works hand in hand with sociocultural factors. Some people, okay, talking about um, these um, factors as well. Some people who have this condition, you would see some women who are learned, they get to the church. They believe, they, they, they keep on praying. No, I'm, I'm telling you what I, I see from experience. They get to the church, they keep praying, they, this happens for like a year, the letter comes to you, some would take some supplements, GN, G, GNLD, GNLD products, because some would go to take over-the-counter medications, treating ulcer and all of those symptoms. By the time they come to the hospital, it's, it's really, you know, too late. What more can we do? What more can we do? How can we reach these people in the hinterlands who might not have better access? Is it maybe, you, you talked about something about husbands who stop there, who might not mm -hmm. give permission. Is it not possible to also educate the men to be aware that if you have a spouse who might not be as, um, as exposed as you, you need to help them to make these checks? Yes, what we can do generally, like you said, for um, every medical condition, like you will start, you could start from the grassroots. If you have the information about any condition, you educate somebody with uh, around you. The person educates somebody around him or her, and then we have we have issues with um, you know I, political. I, I, I was actually looking more specifically at spouses, partners, men, men in in particular who may have 
um, partners who are not as enlightened as they are. Uh, yeah. So what can be done to those? What, like, how can we educate these people? Because sometimes some men don't know about this thing. Why yeah. others educate themselves? There are those who don't. Yeah, the only the, what we can do is that we try as much as possible to involve men in issues of women. Like when you are a woman, they, like you see some women, they, um, when they come to me, they have a health condition or even pregnant women or any issue. They want you to their husbands they don't want to come with them. So you have to actively get the husband involved. You have to tell the person, or you have to take the phone. Um, you tell the husband, see, your wife, she has a serious condition. I want you to come. And when they listen to your voice, they come. So in any way you can, you just actively get their partners involved. involved. Okay. And then we need, and then political will is also very important because one challenge that we also have has to do, now if we do have, um, you know, politicians, you know, because a lot of, they are so distracted with a lot of things happening. The um, issues about security, political instability, and less attention is paid to, um, you know, cancer. So if we do have them trying to, or even NGOs sponsoring campaigns to enlighten people, even in such remote areas, it will go a long way to drastically reduce the burden of... I wish I could continue the conversation. <laughs> so yes, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give you like 30 minutes yeah, to... Yeah. Um, it's okay. What would be the key reminders you would want our viewers to take away from this conversation as we wrap up? Yeah, the key reminders I would want them to take away is simply that, you know, health is wealth. Um, you have to be healthy to live long. You, you have to be healthy to achieve anything you want to, to be in life. Ovarian cancer is real and is becoming a scourge. And um, patients are being lost because of lack of awareness, um, lack of knowledge. And so trying to educate patients, anybody who is listening to me, um, try to um, pay more attention to your health. If you do have um, such kind of symptoms or if you do have a risk factor, we even have genetic testing where you could approach the oncologist and they could talk to you about you know, genetic testing where um, you could be tested to find out if you have these abnormal genes that could increase the risk of you having a cancer. Yeah, yeah. So, and the heart um, of it is try as much as you we, can to be aware uh, yeah, and yeah. live a healthy life. Yeah. Thank you very much. For <laughs> Thank you. Your Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. All right, thank you for staying with us this long. We're not done yet. We'll go for a very short break. And when we come back, we'll be going to security matters, taking on the situation in Niger and the U.S. concerns about a recent decision by the junta. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. So, on Saturday, the Niger Republic junta announced it is suspending military cooperation with Washington and that U.S. flights over the country's territory in recent weeks were illegal. It's been a marathon of discussion since, as Niger plays a central role in the U.S. military operations in Africa's Sahel region and is home to a major air base. Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh said Monday that the U.S. officials had lengthy and direct discussions with the junta officials that were also in part spurred by concerns over Niger's potential relationships with Russia and Iran. According to her, the U.S. is troubled on the part that Niger is on. In October, the U.S. officially designated the military takeover in Niger as a coup, which triggered laws restricting the military support and aid that is, it can provide to Niger. But in December, the top U.S. envoy for Africa, Molly Fee, said the U.S. was willing to restore aid and security ties if Niger met certain conditions. But the Niger Junta spokesman said the U.S. tone was condescending and threatened the uh, Niger Republic sovereignty. Since the July coup, the country has ended its security partnerships with the European Union and France, and had they have withdrawn and have withdrawn their troops from the country. 
to share informed views on this. I am joined by David Otter, Director, Geneva Center for Africa's Security and Strategic Studies, Nigeria. It's good to have you on one slot. Thank you for giving us your time. It seems Niger oh, for having me. It, it seems Niger does not want the U.S. military on its soil. Summarize for us your view of Saturday's events and why it is significant. Well, I think from what we know so far, uh, the Nigerian junta has revoked uh, the military accord, uh, which was signed uh, between 2012 and 2014. Um, effectively, that accord allowed uh, the United States to build one of its most valuable, uh, from a U.S. perspective, uh, military base, um, which, of course, uh, this is a military base that focuses on intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, it's a base that, you know, can fly C-19 uh, cargo jets, you know, uh, I mean, I'm talking about very large uh, military aircraft. Uh, but it's also one of the very few bases uh, that the U.S. deploys, you know, what we call armed drones um, that are remotely controlled. So the U.S. had struggled uh, initially to find any country that would allow, and I'm talking about the uh, U.S. African Command, the U.S. African Command, they call it U.S. AFRICOM. They had actually struggled to find any African country that would allow them to have this military base, and they struck gold. Uh, in 2012 and 2014, when the then uh, Nigerian government allowed them to build that military base. This is a base that uh, is estimated to cost about 110 uh, to 120 million US dollars. And it's, it's about uh, the equivalent of uh, 13 million uh, being spent on a daily, sorry, on a, on a yearly basis to uh, actually keep this base running. So for the United States, um, you know, this was one of the most uh, valuable base, you know, it actually uh, uses that to conduct strikes uh, around Niger, um, as far as Somalia, Libya, uh, but even as close to Nigeria. So it actually targets seven terrorist organizations, including the likes of Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, uh, the Islamic State of the, the Greater Sahel, um, you know, uh, Islamic State in Libya. So there are more than seven terrorist designated organizations that the U.S you know, um, goes after using this military base. So fast forward, uh, the, the military coup that occurred uh, in, in Niger. Initially, the U.S. distanced itself uh, from the, the French, you know, because, of course, the toxicity that the French brand uh, in terms of uh, its uh, uh, neo-colonial and, you know, uh, you know, during the colonial period, that uh, rhetoric of uh, the French has to go um, was something which, you know, the U.S. tried to distance itself from. Um, when the French and the Nigerian uh, were having issues and the French were pushing for some kind of uh, an intervention through ECOWAS, um, the U.S., you know, tried to, first of all, did not acknowledge uh, that uh, this was a military coup. Um, it waited until, you know, very, I think, I think it was December or something, that's when the U.S. said, uh, you know, did ag agree. Uh, that uh, this was a military coup. So effectively, the U.S. you know wanted to continue to do business uh, with Niger because, of course, that's a very expensive military base. But it does appear uh, that the conditions uh, under which you know the U.S. has set, you know, has some kind of you know triggered um, you know this uh, uh, the military junta to say to the U.S. that of course um, you know this is not going to happen, uh, and it has given them the ammunition. Uh, to say to the U.S. that it has threatened its territorial integrity. Perhaps the U.S. may have suggested uh, that uh, the Nigerian uh, junta should uh, discontinue any relationship with um, other strategic partners, for example, Russia. And maybe the Nigerian saw this as some kind of condescending in, in the terms that they described. Okay. So um, here we are uh, in a position where, um, you know, the Nigerian have kicked out the French, uh, they've kicked out... Uh, the, uh, you know, the, well, the, the, you know, actually established what you call the Alliance of Sahelian States. All right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, 
You, you've clearly established that it is a significant development that we're dealing with, and that's why everyone is talking about it. But before we move on, let me quickly um, clarify something you said. You, you, you were a bit unsure if it was December or October. I think it was in October that they accepted that it was a coup, and then in December they said there's a possibility they can still have uh, relationships. Uh, back to the conversation, um, uh, there was, from everything I've seen online, there, there was no clear reason given for the decision by the Niger um, junta. They only made the announcement that they don't want them there. Is there a background that could give insights as to why they chose to ask the U.S. to leave? I, I think time is everything, and everything is about timing. Um, you know, so why now? I mean, that's the question you're asking. I, I think the possibility... Uh, from what we know, is that the United States, um, you know, had a visit, uh, and a very high-profile visit, um, uh, which, you know, was uh, led by the envoy Modupi. And, and of course, there is a possibility that, you know, the envoy, one, according to the Nigerian junta, did not, did not uh, kind of inform uh, them of the composition of, of that envoy, uh, of that delegation. Possibly they were not informed of the discussions that were supposed to be had. And, and I think another reason uh, is that, you know, I think there may have been some kind of a suggestion. Remember the U.S. said in December that it will continue to give aid to Niger, um, but subject to conditions. So I think perhaps one of the conditions that the U.S. may have proposed, or the U.S. envoy, or the delegation may have proposed, is that we can continue to give you aid as long as you do not um, maybe, you know, share the, the country or, you know, have any partnership with Russia or, or some other partnership with um, Burkina Faso or Mali. We don't know. Um, you know, these are very secretive discussions. But for the Nigerian government or the junta to have said that they are re revoking without any warning um, the military uh, alliance, uh, well, the military um, agreement between uh, uh, United States and, uh, and Niger with immediate effect tells you that, you know, something went wrong which was not expected. And the only thing I can think of is perhaps the fact that maybe the U.S. may have said to the Nigerian junta that, you know, one, perhaps you have to hand over power immediately to um, you know, a civilian government, or maybe you do not have to have any uh, kind of relationship with Russia. I mean, bearing in mind uh, that yeah. this was at a time when Russia election was going on. Uh, yeah. So there could be some links there. Um, but, you know, I think the big question uh, that the United States Congress will be asking Africa and the State Department is, was this one of the scenarios that was figured out when this military base was being established? Or... Uh, does this come as a surprise uh, even to uh, the U.S. State Department and Africa? So I think Congress would want to know, you yeah, know I if think, this was uh, money well spent. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I quite agree with you because what the statement that the spokesperson made uh, simply alluded to the fact that some of the um, tone was disrespectful. The tone was... Um, um, you know, sort of disrespectful to their sovereignty. So basically, one would assume that there are instructions that they were not uh, comfortable with. Then again, it, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary um, did say on Monday that they had discussions with officials. Uh, the, 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 their discussion was spurred by concerns over Niger's potential relationships with Russia and Iran that you've mentioned. Uh, Scholars like yourself are saying it's more America-centric than anything else. It has nothing to do with what benefits Africa and Niger in particular, really. What's your view on that? I think from a Nigerian point of view, um, they would be asking the big question. Uh, the U.S. base 201 um, in Agadex you know, has been there since 2012. They would want to see the report card. I mean, they would want to see how effective uh, that, that U.S. base has been in terms of providing uh, safety and security around the region. And if you look at that, you know, from a, a scholar's perspective or from an outsider's perspective or from an analyst's point of view, um, you, you can simply tell that, you know, there hasn't been much progress uh, in terms of the counter incidents operations. Yes, the U.S. has deployed uh, it's drones from that region, the right down to Somalia. And as I mentioned, there are seven terrorist designated groups that this particular base is meant to deal with. 
But for the Nigerians, they will be concerned about the insecurity within the region, not just Niger, uh, but of course within Mali and Burkina Faso. So for the Niger uh, um, junta, they would think this has not been effective because, of course, uh, there are still issues within uh, their region, and, and they would think, well, if this is just not benefiting us, why do we have to continue to have it? From the U.S. point of view, um, the U.S. would want to not just look at Niger as a country on its own in terms of you know how effective it has been, uh, but you want to look at other regions like Somalia, uh, you know areas like uh, um, you know Chad, um, which of course you know the French has interest in, um, areas like Libya. Uh, they would want to look at it as an overall um, counterinsurgency operation. But mind you, this is all not just for the uh, interest of uh, the Nigerian or the regional. Um, you know, insecurity. I think this is more or less the U.S. Uh, placing itself in a position uh, in, in geopolitics which would interest, you know, its, um, its outpost. So, um, yeah, so for the Nigerians, if it's not an effective uh, 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 deployment, if it doesn't serve the purpose of, you know, uh, bringing stability within the region, then why continue to have it? Go for ahead. the Americans... You want to have it because, of course, it does save their interest. Okay, uh, I'm um, told we have less than two minutes to wrap up. I'll, I'll just quickly ask, how does this um, decision, uh, the withdrawal of the U.S. military presence, impact security situation regionally and the junta's uh, control in the country? I know it's, I, I thought we had more time. Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, the junta has, you know, made an alliance with Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, to uh, have some kind of uh, a defense pact to fight against insurgency. Any counterinsurgency operation that is ended abruptly will leave a very huge gap. Um, how does the Nigerian government, how do the other countries want to fill this gap? Um, is now left to uh, perhaps, you know, the likes of the multinational joint tax force, um, what, else, what else is remaining of G5 Sahel? Uh, and perhaps, I think, uh, to conclude, I think, maybe Niger is looking at bringing in other partners. You know, it could be Russia, um, it could be um, expanding uh, the confederation or the federation of states between Mali and Burkina Faso to uh, cover that gap. But for now, uh, I believe that um, it's not yet over. Uh, the U.S. Right. may try to negotiate. It's too expensive for the U.S. to just let go. All right, David, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's always a pleasure to have you on one slot. I appreciate the insights that you give to us. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap on one slot for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you join us again next week for conversations like this. Take good care. Two words that come to mind when you think of Lagos, the commercial capital of Nigeria. Wildlife in this city can bring something new every day. For residents of Lagos, there is a flavor, a feel to the Lagos that can be felt even in the words spoken on the streets. While the city remains bubbly, there are several means of communication away from the major languages of the ethnic groups that are represented across the city of over 20 million. Giving that slang is a type of informal language comprised of words and phrases that are generally used within specific and social groups, regions and contexts. Why do people use slangs? This is the way you want to collect money from somebody's hand. Yes. Not like this with the collector. Not like this. There are several reasons people use slangs. These include to communicate more efficiently, to fit into certain social groups, to create one's own identity, to gain independence, to show belonging to or an understanding of a certain region or country. So where do these slangs come from? Many believe the entertainment industry plays a major role in the churning out of slangs, especially in music.
Pepe Many, many with it one lit. Huh, record the unruly. Afro pop um, has really influenced the pop culture language across not just Lagos, not just Nigeria, even Africa. I do remember back in the days there was the Nothing the Apple by the popular artist Two Face, Adibia, and then it from to the Choke by David Doe, to the Shaq Materi, to the Joe War, to the Shaq Tibobo. You know, various languages that have now become a way of communicating even on the street. And over time, people just look and wait for these artists to drop one slang or the other, which has become a mode of communication per se. And as we are looking at it moving forward, not just in Nigeria, even across Africa, we might get to see that one of the best ways to actually convey messages or to say some things, for example, in Nigeria, they say the word Jakba. Jakba came from a particular song. It's a way to say, you know, someone is moving out or, you know, try to get away from the country and get look for a better life or greener pastures. According to Oxford, a slang is a type of language consisting of words and phrases that are regarded as very informal, are more common in speech than writing, and are typically restricted to a particular context or group of people. Yawa de, yawa, yawa, yawa don't gas. I think I put body come over, you know, go just Lord, go just Lord. I will not be there. We will not call, we don't call, we don't be there. Man, come man. Come past man inside here. Inside man, I'm a day. Inside life. Inside life. And as I have here, it's a day. How far? Where did they fall? Uh, you just have to know the reason why they ask you how far now. Nah. You need to know now. Nah. Eh? As they go now. Nah. Eh? Just let me know as they go. Oh, I mean, I mean, I want Jack Powell. All this now, what they do for this country, they don't tire me. So I just look, say, I just move my way. Jack Powell, go on that location, on that place. What is that means? What in the soap? What in the apple? As in, maybe you see one of your nigga be your paddy. Okay, you asked that. Okay, what in the soap now? Okay, like today now, I can ask you, okay, what is there? What's as in Kilo Shelley? What in the apple? That's the meaning. The nature of that word is from portable. My man, portable, what do you understand now? Zazu, aha, that kind of thing. Popular slangs on the streets of Lagos include on your own, wutu wutu, shine your eyes, and others. While slangs can show up in popular music, movies, and entertainment, the reverse is also the case where art is not imitating life, but influencing it. It's even been the case that some slangs have found their way from one generation to the next, somehow surviving the winds of change that come with the different influences each generation has. Shelf life, I feel, is pretty low because most times these slangs just come from the generics of the song. Probably it's a particular line from the song that people just hook up with or it means something that actually links up with what is happening in the economy at the time. For example, when someone sang about the Jakba or when someone sang about Sakba, Sakwa is like a broke, brokest level, uh, not poverty per se, but when someone is broke and it just sync with the time when Nigeria was actually having an economic downtime. So um, most people just related with it and it became a thing. Sakwa, Sakwa day, Sakwa day. Sakwa simply means brokenness. When she, she no go, you don't have a dime, nothing, nothing, that's Sakwa. <laughs> Language grows and changes over time. New words and new meanings from old words come about all the time. This happens as people seek to express themselves in new, creative ways. Slangs allow people to be funny, clever, different, shocking, friendly, or even secretive. <laughs> Over the past couple of decades, many slang words have come from three specific sources. These are popular music, politics, and the internet, with the internet being considered the biggest source of new slangs that transcend physical boundaries.
solar energy has emerged as a transformative force in Africa, eliminating a path towards sustainable development and energy self-sufficiency. With its abundant sunlight and untapped potential, the continent is harnessing solar power to bridge the energy gap, particularly in remote and unserved regions. As nations across Africa increasingly embrace solar energy, a brighter and a more equitable future begins to emerge on the horizon. Africa is witnessing a dynamic landscape of diverse solar energy projects that are catalyzing sustainable progress across the continent. Nations are embarking on massive projects building solar plant that underlines their determination to reduce dependence on fossil fuel, explore the use of renewable energy and move towards low carbon development. Notable among these is the effort of Malagasy women who have taken up the responsibility to light up their village Antananarivo. Up until the end of 2017, these isolated fishing village in western Madagascar had no access to electricity. Yolande, a fisherwoman, and her grandchildren used oil lamps as their light source. This was considered a setback, especially making study difficult for her daughters. This condition is unsuitable for anyone and a little help could make a difference for Yolande and her two daughters. Years later in this little village of Andernarivo, a solar project that will equip over 200 homes with solar panels has been initiated. For Yolande and other women in the village, this was a great opportunity. Yolande and three other women from the village took up the responsibility to train as a solar technician and now they install and repair solar equipment, a skill acquired in India where they were trained as solar technicians. This project has changed the lives of the villagers who can now continue to study, work or cook in the evenings. From these life-changing projects in Madagascar, the continent set out on a mission in 2018 to build the largest concentrated solar power plant in the world that will produce 500 megawatts of electricity, providing power to more than 1 million Moroccans, a country in the northern part of the Africa. These magnificent solar power will reduce Morocco's carbon emission by 760,000 tons per year, equivalent to about 1% of Morocco's CO2 emissions of around 56.5 million tons in 2011, a project made possible by the vast potential of the Irena's estimation which pegs Africa's solar energy potential at 60 million terawatt hour annually dwarfing Europe's 3 million telawatt hour. Sur le continent africain, euh, ça prouve que lorsqu'on utilise le désert pour mettre des panneaux photovoltaïques, ça marche. Et c'est un formidable espoir pour tous les pays qui ont beaucoup d'ensoleillement, qui ont des terres désertiques et qui peuvent couvrir ces terres désertiques par des panneaux photovoltaïques et donc produire de l'électricité. C'est un projet extraordinaire et je suis très heureuse d'être là pour trois raisons. Euh, D'abord parce que le Maroc nous a beaucoup aidés. 
réussir la COP21 et on voit aujourd'hui une réalisation qui concrétise les engagements pris à la COP21, la conférence de Paris sur le climat et en particulier la montée en puissance des énergies renouvelables. Well, this is so in Morocco, Togo, in a push to increase access to electricity and develop renewables in the small coastal country, launched West Africa's largest solar power plant. La centrale Cher Mohamed Bin Zayed de 50 MW Crète de Blita est la plus grande centrale solaire photovoltaïque de la sous-région utilisant la technologie des trackers solaires ce qui permet d'augmenter le rendement des panneaux solaires en leur faisant suivre la course du soleil. By the time we complete the additional 20 MW plus the battery storage system this Blita plant will be 70 megawatt less battery storage system, which is definitely the largest in West Africa. When completed, this magnificent project will power almost 160,000 houses. Africa has established itself as a trailblazer in solar energy, owing to its extended duration of sunlit hours. Throughout the year, Africa enjoys a considerable higher amount of radiant sunlight compared to any other continent on the globe, hosting numerous of the world's most sun-drenched locales. South Africa, one of the leading economies in Africa, is a top country on the continent with regard to the use of solar energy deployment. One project stands as a testament to South Africa's large-scale renewable energy development, the establishment of the continent's first solar power airport in the regional airport of George, a town of just 150,000 residents on South Africa's south coast. This small site is Africa's first green airport to be powered by the sun. The control tower Escalators, check-in desk, baggage carousels, restaurant and ATMs. Every service here depends on a small solar power station a few hundred meters away in a field on dandelions next to a runway. I take pride in that we are one of the first airports to have it. Uh, we've seen a nice electricity cut, which is plus for me on the budget. Um, I see and I, and I recognize that gone are the days where power failures used to be a big thing for the airport. We no longer have those. Even though we do have our backup generators, we first get our source from our well-improved uh, solar plant. The airport solar plant was launched in September 2015 and became the second solar-run airport in the world after Cochin Airport in southern India. On the southern coast of West Africa, we are introduced to the adventure in the Ivorian resort of Jacobo, just outside Abidjan, which started in January of 2018 with two little cars. The mini cars, 2.7 meters long and 2 meters high, are covered in a solar panels, each fitted out of a six 12 volt batteries, giving the vehicles a range of 140 kilometers. For Ivorians, these Salini or Antara tricycles could eventually spell the end for old school Wara Wara. Four wheelers as Jacqueville looks to make itself Ivory Coast Premier Eco City. A switch to solar and durables may appear paradoxical in Jacqueville, but it is worthy of note that the area produces the lion's share of the country's gas and oil. It's an experience that works well at Jatou and that we want to deploy in the villages as well. We want to circulate in the villages. C'est à Jacques-Ville ici, j'ai découvert, découvert cette, euh, cette voiture électrique. Elle, elle nous paraît d'abord elle nous paraît d'abord une voiture sécuritaire parce qu'elle va très lentement, mais sûrement. Et du coup aussi, 
monétaire, c'est un arrangement. Avant, ici, les déplacements, c'était à 200. Maintenant, du coup, 100 francs. Et puis, on a cette voiture voilà, qui fait un peu l'innovation ici à Jacquesville. L'avantage, là, c'est beaucoup. On ne peut pas du tout. Qui ne sert seulement, on ne peut pas être paysan. Bon, maintenant, tout le monde dit, maintenant, tant c'est censé, il faut que tout le monde ait rentré. Donc, moi, c'est la première fois que c'est rentré. C'est pour ça que moi, c'est le premier, c'est rentré, c'était à faire la à Côte d'Ivoire. Donc, les Ivoiriens ils sont gagnants massés à, 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 dans ça là. Vous savez, le petit petit là, tous sont rentrés dedans. Il y en a techniciens, il y en a chauffeurs, il y en a monégassés. Tout le monde, il pleure derrière moi maintenant. While Ivorians celebrate the success of the Antara tricycles, solar-powered racing cars hit the road in South Africa. These fancy solar car not only looks futuristic, but it also raises awareness about advances in solar energy and inspires countries around the world to make more use of green technology. Today, a dozen cars are up and running. Although still in the test phase, the solar trikes have provided job opportunities for around 20 people, including drivers and mechanics at initial launch. The popular bush taxis do not only pollute the atmosphere and the environment, they also cost more in terms of fare for commuters. So, replacing them with solar trikes is a chance to kill several beds with one solar stone. The deployment of solar energy in Africa is no longer negotiable. There are evident efforts by nations to extend electricity access to previously undeserved communities with several pioneering initiatives like Morocco's Noor Solar Complex, which is currently pushing the boundaries of the concentrated solar power technology while off-grid solar initiatives like Nigeria's Solar Power Niger program are fostering rural development and improving livelihoods. These multifaceted solar endeavors collectively illuminate Africa's journey towards energy resilience, social empowerment and environmental stewardship. From large-scale solar farms to innovative off-grid solutions, Africa's solar revolution is not only reducing carbon emissions and mitigating climate change, but also empowering communities by providing reliable electricity, sparring economic growth, and enhancing access to education, healthcare, and communication technologies. Thank you so much for joining us once again on Jassiri. It's a bright day and this is the last episode for the month of March. After this, we are marching into April. But before that, this month, we have celebrated the achievements and potentials of women. And we have seen people who have inspired us in, the, in this field with family, faith, and, you know, all round. Uh, but this is another sizzling episode, and we are going to be giving it to you hot, hot. And if you've missed any episode this month, I would say sorry for you, but I mean, thank God for the holidays. This is the time to binge watch all our episodes, so you have no excuse whatsoever not to catch up on this amazing women and Lola's drama, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyways, yes, it's another episode to serve up the spiciest and the hottest gist on, uh, on the continent, Abby. Yes. I know she's Shalama. Shalama. I know she's Shalama. That's what is in her mind. That's what she just said. I know she's Shalama. 
Oh, oh, I'm doing that. It was the attempt to do the dance. Yeah, I know. Like, to, know to, this is no attempt. This is a win. A win for this table. Because on this table, I took one for the team. Eh? I know to Shalama. Uh -huh. I got it. Because somebody on this table just cannot dance to save their life. I can't. Ah! You don't need to say somebody. <laughs> I own it. I have two left feet. The only thing I can do is wind my waist. And that's it. Wow. <laughs> At least that's it. Your waist is good for something. I, I just, <laughs> just wind it for something. Stand somewhere so, and wind it. Absolutely. <laughs> we're so excited and ecstatic because we're wrapping up the month with a bang. Like, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> Diving into our hot topic special. It's going to be like, oh my God, everything is off limits. You know, on this table, our opinions, we give it with our full chest. Yes, so. Why did you use that? Hey, you know, why are you the one who said it? Daytime TV. <laughs> and you had to call attention to obvious Thank things. Thank God I didn't even say because the Lord have come for me by ah. taking two chairs. My sister. So mm. grab your popcorn, get a drink because you're in for a wild ride. Mm. But before that, I'd like to ask you ladies. Eh? <laughs> why are you asking all these kind of questions? I don't know. What's the most daring thing you've ever done? Don't ask me because producer. I cannot say such things on TV. Neither can I. And neither can people that wear one lash for one week say <laughs> They know themselves. <laughs> this is the first time I'm wearing lashes, Lolo. This week. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> How come me and the audience are still If you surprised? want to come for me, have your facts right, okay? I'm sorry about what I said yesterday, but please let it drop <laughs> in. <laughs> This one, I buy a fully loaded, unrelenting. I knew, I knew that that thing could yeah. not just die like that. Have you seen some people that wear nails for an entire week, even when it has almost left their nails? <laughs> but they're such managers. I wear my nails for a month and they're still intact. Wow, I and wish the camera can, can zoom it to the person who did it and hopefully, to, but then you don't cook. Mm. No, 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 she doesn't cook. Room. She eats chin chin. So it cannot. <laughs> I cooked every day this week, funny okay. enough. Because Hacha is around. That we ask. No, you. I don't even cook. Apart from yeah, me, like, do you guard for myself? Do you separately. do farm work? <laughs> <laughs> But I, I like how you ladies have avoided the question that our producer sets us yeah. up with. Yeah. Because. Daneki, <laughs> Shalama. How do you. How, what does our producer. Who do, does she think she is? Well, so, so, she's my sister. Well, but it would, seems like Blessings wants to answer the question. Oh, yeah. Daring thing. Before they say, I always have something to say. <laughs> I, I don't have an experience, so I wouldn't say that I have. What is your finger now pointing there. to me? It's a, you don't have what is going on? <laughs> it said, don't have experience. <laughs> it said. So she you said, have to destabilize our uh -huh. set said, in your ruling behavior. So she Can she I don't I hear me. It's okay. What? Okay. What did I you do? You were saying? Yeah, I was saying that I haven't exactly done something very daring. But one thing I'm hoping to do very soon is either skydiving or bungee jumping because I'm scared of heights. Hmm. All I see is death. Oh, yeah. I, I did. <laughs> see, my, I mean, I'm... I'm I, and I'm agreeing with her, Gosman. but I don't know which one is the worst. The, no, no, the no, no. The bungee oh, jump. No, like no, bungee jump is better because in a few minutes uh, it's over. Yes. But skydiving you takes see, minutes. You'll be wondering whether you will land. <laughs> Honestly, I haven't skydived, but the last time I was on holiday in Maldives, I did this parasailing. Yeah, how? My it? sister, the day I went up, <laughs> I can tell you categorically, without missing words, that I shall never in my life do such a thing. Tolu, it felt like I was touching God. <laughs> I said, the no. door was opening the door for you. If I ever had come down from this, I was seeing the water. You know, the thing takes you like yeah. how many meters up? Did you, were you screaming? Look, but beyond, you had the guy with I you was now. Picking, yes, I was so grateful that I had somebody. It wasn't only me on the on the, on the stop. I was enough. telling God how <laughs> I, I, was the, everything. I had this overwhelming urge to just let go. You know, you have to hold no, that thing. You know thing. that thing happens? No, oh, in no. situations like this, you're always, your mind just, you're, you're, your mind is playing tricks on you. What even would on, happen if even I just on the bridge, even on 3rd Milan Bridge or anywhere, yeah. like, no, no, it would be telling you, why not just jump? Jump. Or why what, what jump? would happen ah. if the car went this way? <laughs> oh, so I'm not the only one. No, I, no and I climbed that, and now I know for a fact that me and Heights, honestly, I've, I've done um, snorkeling, mm -hmm. but I've not done the deep sea one. You, you're but not I intend, enough. I, but I love, I will do that. But anything that's up high, <laughs> count me out. Hey, my own is not even as bad as that. I went on this roller coaster that's flat, oh, no, 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 uh -huh. that flips uh -huh. you upside uh -huh. down. Uh -huh. So it was at the top around, uh, I can't remember, but I could see the skyline of Lagos and everything. Mm -mm. My heart. Ah! 
Hey, Mike. The, uh, the guy was laughing because when we'd come down <laughs> and we would turn over, if I extended my hand, I could have touched the ground. I was saying I want to come down. I was promising God everything. Ah. I said, I'm not doing it. Yes. Yes. I was ah. literally crying. Oh, no. yes. So yes. if it is adventures, it it's not me. No, I'll no. end it there because at the end of the day, the other things we can't talk about are no. eh. truly. <laughs> Madam, tell us. I, I, there's nothing to say. Well, no. just say there's nothing that you can say on national TV. Yes, there's nothing I can say. You don't want to trend TV. today. Catherine <laughs> said she <laughs> wear a pint on her head. No, if I had the sun and the whole thing. I want to market. But you see what day. they described. I can't do that. No, I no, cannot. No. I will sit when Tolu uh, said. Oh, when Tolu said, okay. I'm, I'm, I don't want to do it again. I don't want ah, that. Would have been me crying. I would no, have no, no. Ah, so no, I, I, I was, was coming out of my nose. Ah. I was begging. <laughs> that guy was beside me. me. But do you know, I also want to do hot air balloon, Sha. No, hot air balloon I love to do because you're, you're in something. Mm -hmm. But you see that parasailing, I was telling and I do the, the guy beside in the me, sky thing. Jesus is Lord, okay. everything about the air This is thing great. is calling people in the sky and in the water. <laughs> the <laughs> one from yeah. Yeah. Are you not the spiritual one among us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the one that ah. knows spiritual no, things. No, I, I don't know. I'm just I saying from experience. Water affinity. Oh, my God. I yeah, love to swim. I love the water. But is that thing you say you're driving on 10 minutes, it's like it's calling your name. Come to me, come to me, come to me. Come, come. I'm not coming anywhere. So you see, when you see some people driving in the middle of Third Milan Bridge, don't there's blame us. Because oh, there's yeah. a reason, guys. There's a reason, girl. There's a reason. Funny I, I enough, looking. I prefer to drive at the edge, though. Is it not you? I'm like, leaving. I've, I've seen blessings enter the compound. <laughs> I, see, everybody likes to talk about my driving, <laughs> but I've seen blessings. I'm not joking. Like every guy that has been in my car says, "This is the first lady he sees that drives." The only thing is, I can't control my speed, mm. but I hate to drive so. Like I can literally. Control I want to just you just keep going. Yes. Oh, oh yes. what else? <laughs> so you're on that walk now. If race Formula car driving one. is in Nigeria, you will be there. <laughs> I would, I, I would be the fastest. Fast and furious. I'm telling you. Fast and blessings. Yeah? <laughs> At least we know that if this doesn't work, we know what my likely career. work. All right, okay, ladies. So work. since you guys are shied away from <laughs> what is the most adventurous thing you've done, ah. thank you, Bookie. It did not work. <laughs> Your plans for us yeah. have failed. Yeah. But yeah. there is, of course, a whole week that we've ended. And not even just the week. We've ended this month, which is we're ending the month with this um, March. And of course, it's Women's Month. And we've had some fantastic conversations this past month. And we've had some great guests as well in the week. So your highlights, ladies, I'd love to hear that, whether it's sometime, something that happened this week or something, of course, that happened in the month. Is the month. In the month? Yeah, to always, us personally. No, no Jessiri. Oh, and there's a lot that has happened okay. on Jessiri this month. month. Yep. I think it, if you sit down to actually think about it, sometimes you're confused. Did all this happen in this month or I last? I tell you. What? I'm not even going to lie. Most times I lose track of days and months on Jasiri because I'm like amazing things are happening but I can't say okay this one happened in March yeah. this one happened in February w women's I month I actually enjoyed the conversation we had um, with the sex therapist mm -hmm. uh, because he, he opened my mind a little more when Tolu actually pointed out that sometimes when we're talking about sex education it's not about intercourse teaching children it's mm -hmm. teaching them so many nuances to their sexuality yeah. their body yeah. how they should relate you know all those things are very important, but a lot of people get it wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because when you say sex education, they just think, oh, it's about intercourse. No, it's not. It's about teaching girls. Do not be making effort to call things by their real names. Yeah. Because I would lie to you, growing up, we were told to call body parts stuff. Yeah. That we it was were kind of a decent yes. so we were to just told. say, mm -hmm. like I've always said, my children, for when they are three boys, so I'll just say PP. I want to now say PP to adults in men who say, what do you? Let, let me share a story. So there was a story I read online about a young girl who was being molested, right? Mm -hmm. But her family had raised her to call her private parts cookie. Mm -hmm. So she just kept saying that this uncle was taking her oh, cookie, cookie, touching her cookie. And nobody could understand. She's basically like wow. three or four years old. And she was just calling it cookie. What? Cookie. Like he was taking her cookie, touching her cookie. Three or four years old. But nobody could break it down because she was not empowered to use the right words when they figured out what she was yeah. talking about. It was. Thankfully, she has a family and a school that supported her. The guy was arrested, relative, unfortunately. But it was a, a, an unfortunate opportunity for the school to, to encourage Parents yeah. to teach their children the right names. Names. These are the medically recognized 
Names. Uh, physical names for these yeah, bodies. Body. No, it's not, it's not dirty. And, and exactly. Teach your children the right It's term. called the penis and it's called the vagina. It's breast. There's, they there's, have there's nothing. Oh, they no, because and they, and they have good. functions beyond sex. So I yes. think that's what stumbles yeah, exactly. people because they only associate these body parts with sex. But they have yeah. functions, physiological, biological yes. functions, aside from sex. So empower your children, empower yourselves, say the right names. Yeah. Very, 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 very important that we do that. I, I, I enjoyed that. So that I enjoyed was having the female politician. It always sticks out to me that she yeah. said the women told her, and you will be controlling our men. Men. And it just feels so <laughs> short-sighted sometimes. Um, for the unfortunately, the female gender, you're thinking about how somebody, another woman outside, will be controlling your man. man but meanwhile, how? this is somebody who's able to represent your interests probably yeah. better than the majority of men mm -hmm. in these situations. But you were stuck on, so you'll be controlling our men, but we don't control them at home. Uh -huh. it, it's it no. I, I think we need to be very introspective. It doesn't mean because a woman is running just yeah. because she's a yeah. female, vote for her. But give them the same space, give them the same opportunities, um, hear them out the same way we hear men out. Mm -hmm. And just because they're women. They can lead as well. If you're not leading at home, that's on you. But in yeah. society, yeah. we all need to get on that train yeah. because 50% of us need to be yeah. represented and we need to be at that table. Uh -huh. we, we've and had I, it, we've yeah. had a rich uh, women's month. Yeah, just we have. From when Jay Franklin was in the studio talking about what do women bring to the table mm -hmm. up, until, yeah, up until when we was talked about... Was that this month? Well, that was yeah. this one. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was like Up until ago. recently, yeah. we, we took what Williams Uchemba said about what women are and who women are. So I think we've had formidable, and I'm really proud of us that. And of course, we enjoyed all the tears <laughs> that this month has brought. For me, funny enough, we've done a lot of emotional things. Yes, yeah. Tolu bringing our baby pictures on us. Was that this month? It was this month. Was this, month. Wow. this month. Oh, I that day, I, I, I loved it. I don't think I've ever felt so loved. I wailed. You know, someone asked us, you did your cry really face was really this coming, ugly. And we said, it wasn't no. ugly, I was so cute. I planned you people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was cute when I cried. Like, people were like, oh, I love you. So it's ah. not working well. Ah. Ah. We're going to go on a break while Bessie does whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> she does. Right but we'll be back after this. This is a Hot Topics Friday. We have some Hot Topics that we couldn't really finish during the week. So yeah. we brought them back. They're on the table, on the plate. Mm -hmm. And we're going to keep things warm for you. When you come back, it's Hot Topics. Stay with us. Africa needs its own storytellers, people who understand the continent because they're from it. People who know that news is more than just a conversation starter, it's our stories. Because these stories run deeper than headlines and segments. It's about digging deeper to get the facts and telling the human side of every single story. Not just the echoes from foreign headlines and perspectives. It's time to take back our narratives and share them in our voices. The birth of Africa's new age reporting. And this is where it begins. Right here at New Central TV. The stories that put Africa first. Thank you for staying with us on Jassiri. And don't forget that we are streaming live across all social media platforms. We are at New Central TV. And also use the hashtag Jassiri so we know that you are following the conversation. Talking about following the conversation, if you have followed us throughout the week, you know that sometime during the week we had a conversation, but we're bringing it back because we didn't quite agree that day. And I'm sure that we still don't agree, but we want to know what people think. It's the viral video of Reverend Funke Adejumo giving advice to ladies on how to comport themselves when they visit their in-laws. So let's take a quick look. Where you are going, advise that that first tree, you don't go with a gift or something too big, maybe just a basket of food or something or apart from mama. When you get there, depending on your culture, in my culture, we kneel to greet elders. I say, you will kneel down and remain on your knees. And you will let your eyes look down he said that you'll be staring at the mama and the baba and everybody there. Let them tell you to stand up before you stand up. 
even if you're an extrovert, please pretend that day. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Stand up. Ah, my daughter, stand up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay? So you stand up. When you get inside, sit on the very first seat. Don't walk around, you know, the length of the house. Just enter and sit down. When you sit down, you may not realize they may be watching you through the keyhole because you've gone there for your entrance exam. Your own is more than the man. So you calmly remember what you wear. It will not be something you'll be looking for scarf and be pushing like this and then one high heel shoe that you are shaking. No, 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 no. Be as comfortable as possible. Not that your cleavage, everything is okay. If you must look around, turn your eyes, not your head. They can, you know, and all that. If they ask you any question, answer briefly. Where are you from? Were you in Anambra state of Nigeria? It's just, you know, as calmly as possible. If they are discussing or the TV is on, don't open your mouth and say, Ah! You see about such Oh my God, you know? Shh. I voted. Did you vote that day, Mama? You know, I know you will not finish food if they serve you, but please, if the meat, is tough. Don't pull it. Just leave it like that. And make sure that no oil spills on your dress. As soon as you finish eating, I know you won't finish everything, you know, just a little. Even if you're hungry, go and drink gari when you get home. But, you know, just carry your plates. Make attempts to pack. The, ah, my dear, leave it. Ask about, no, ma, thank you, ma. <laughs> thank you, ma. Just be looking down. Am I might pretend you know I've been diplomatic. Carry the plate, you go to the kitchen, you wash. Yes, you wash the plate. Some of you, you go to your boyfriend's houses and you wash plates there. So we're talking about your in laws now. Singles. Come on. Catherine is already. <laughs> okay, so you know when we talked about it earlier this week, there was cultural context. And yeah. she does talk about in my culture, she's Yoruba, we understand that. Um, and all of that. And I, I get it. Do you understand? I, I get where she's coming from. I understand that. I remember somebody um, talking to me about it during this week that what was I thinking about? I get it. But I think there's just a little too much. And in this day and age where we hear so many stories about in laws, if you. If you do that pretense a little too far. Sometimes it becomes difficult to really let your real self come out. And then when your real self comes out, they'll be asking, where is that girl that we met that first time? Mm -hmm. Blessings called it a job interview. And I understand. It's first impressions when you're meeting your in-laws, potential yeah. in-laws, for the first time. But I do think that somehow we've sort of, in a way, taken the piss on this matter. Yeah. I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, it all depends on the individual and who you're meeting. It's just like any job interview you want to go for. You prepare for it. Yeah. You learn about the company. You want to know the style of management, you know, their job style, their work ethics, and all other things. That's how you prepare when you want to meet your in-laws. Because if it's the first time you're seeing them, you want to put your best foot forward. Not it doesn't mean no, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you have to go and be excessive. Mm -hmm. I know that there are lines that cross that you even if you tell it to a child, it's a lot. I'm not expecting you to go for the first time and your mom-in-law will be asking you to cook momoy and sweep the ground. It's a different so, thing that maybe you meet her that's, sweeping. So uh, even, even beyond the cultural, I, I'm going to come back to this job interview thing. Before, beyond the cultural context, if you notice, she said she's Yoruba and she didn't mention that they asked her to cook anything, mm -hmm. right? That's one thing. Then secondly, Aside from job interview, said this is just like meeting someone that you adore. Let's say in the industry, we spoke about Ibuku Awoshika. If I'm meeting Ibuku Awoshika, I don't care how good I am with speaking pidgin English. I won't, right? There are things that I would not do. There are things that I'm conscious. I, I don't even need to read a book, right? I would know to greet her when I see her. Yeah. And the greeting is not going to be, hi, ma'am. That's exactly. not how I greet normally, but that's how I would greet her. Like, I would, I would literally want to do... Like, be the best that I, I, I can yeah, be. But that is now somebody you admire, somebody you look up to. This is somebody this I is, want to marry. What's the difference? Into the family. family. If it is somebody you want to marry and, okay, you want to put your best foot forward, okay, I get that. But if you're not stepping far away from who you really are. You're not stepping far away. You're not stepping far away. Let's take reactions. Because it's easy to say with 
the experiences we've had. People yeah. have had other experiences that are leading to other things. So let's take some of the reactions. Somebody said, wash plate care. Why are you even allowing a guest to enter <laughs> your kitchen? We'll take this up in a little bit. Um, somebody else says, Funny, funnily, most of what she said applies to everyone. It's basic courtesy based on our culture in Nigeria. Anybody who faults what she said is a hypocrite because someday you expect the same thing from your son-in-law or be daughter-in-law. Uh, who else? When you don't eat the meat and they ask why, then you say it's strong and it's mama that cooked it. <laughs> just like that, mama doesn't like you. And I thought about that. At least try to eat some of the meat. <laughs> what else? Someone just, says, why will a guy allow his people treat his wife like an errand girl? Some women wanted to test her father by wanting, by wanting to be sending my wife on errands carelessly. Well, the rest not story. Even my mama go always say, use him, wife, avoid him. I, li I like those people who bring in barriers. A man will visit, uh-huh, a man will visit his in-laws and be treated like he's royalty, but a woman will visit her in-laws and be expected to audition for the role of maid. The game is rigged. So I want to go back to two things. So the lady, one of the ladies talking about, if anybody disagrees with it, you're a hypocrite. This is our general culture in Nigeria. Yes, I agree. It's mm. a general culture. But then the one who also talked about the fact that at the end of the day, um, why would they guest? If somebody is a guest in your house, we don't expect a guest to offer to do things. So I don't mm -hmm. think it's, we, it's not the right example to use as a guest. Yeah. We know when visiting in-laws, you're not just any guest. Yes. yes. You're not just any a guest. Potential and daughter the expectation in -law. is when we finish eating, I'm cleaning up. The expectation is that no. My darling, you came to visit us. Exactly. Please. Yes, so no, yes, yes, the idea, yes, the idea is you, is you at home. Home. But any that's why I said there are lines that are excessive. Let's be honest. But the only thing is, even yeah. if you get to excessive people, like I would wonder why when I visit my mom in law the very first time and it's not seven AM, let's say we got there like let's say twelve. That's like brunch time. And that's when as I came in, sat down for two seconds, she just after greeting her, basically, she goes back into the kitchen and comes back with a broom to sweep the... That's the obviously definitely... So that, 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 is, that, is, that is I know that she's board. pushing mm -hmm. the boundary. Yes. But I would say, I'll take the... I would offer, Mom, can I... Help for you, you. Can I and you. You're, you're if she say, oh, that don't worry, can you call, can you call? I would stand aside. But do you guys even but know? If okay, she hands okay. you the broom, what happens? If so, she has the broom, I would sweep. But I would definitely take it up. With so them. number one, beyond the context of marriage, right? If I visit a friend, mm -hmm. let's say a female friend or even a male friend, mm -hmm. and he brings food to me, when I'm done eating, I would offer to go to the kitchen yeah, to drop it. Drop, drop it. If he says, no, don't, or she says, oh, yeah, just put it. It tells me who you are, but it doesn't change who I am. I would still offer whether I'm, I'm attempting to marry your husband your you or not. For me. That's one. I'm sorry. That's mm -hmm. one. Then secondly, do you guys also realize that that is, I, I think that it also, it boils down to the way we're seeing it. If I'm going to visit my husband's people, or let's say husband to be's people, and then I get there and someone is giving me a broom, it's an audition for me too. You are auditioning as yeah, my mother in law. That's the other part. Let's be honest. Yeah, you're auditioning audition because the if, I do not, if I do not want to marry, your husband, based on that, I, I have the right. right. So I, I might sleep that day, but yeah, as Lola said, yeah. I'm going to take it up with me. Think about and it. I'm like, so is this I'm, the I'm kind of also auditioning. Yeah. Let's even talk about Omugo. If a mother-in-law comes to me, let's say my husband's mother comes to my house, and I'm still the one bathing the baby, I'm still the one doing all the work and all that, there's, that's where I'll say, look, this woman is not doing anything. Let her be going. So she would also want to come and do the work that she came to do. See, Everybody is auditioning. Let's be honest. Let's not make it die. This thing actually goes two ways. Yes. Maybe because of it this does, mentality. No, of, no, no, it does. No, no, no. It. I'm saying subconsciously. It's because of that no? culture of this fear mentality and respect. Of ah, if I don't marry you, nothing yes. will happen. No. But if I go to a mother in a potential, uh -uh. I've gone to some potential in-laws' house last year, and when they saw me, I heard what they said to their own son. That was the first thing that made me like. This is not what it is. Gen, 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 gen. E so many careful. women should know that when you visit your in-laws, it's both marrying ways. a person goes beyond marrying one individual. Yes, yeah. so you have to know the synergy of their home. Yes. Imagine you go into a house, like one of my ex-boyfriends, oh my god, their family was amazing. That is a blessed memory now. Do you know in their home, the gender roles are a bit switched. Daddy cooks on Sunday mornings. I have never seen such a thing in my life. On Sunday, but before we wake up, when I spend time with them, mm -hmm. their dad is in the kitchen. To me, at first, I was confused as at how to engage. Engage. Should you be in the kitchen with him? But yeah. what I, at first, I offered them, I said, oh, no, 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 this is my time. <laughs> and I just looked around and I saw <laughs> mommy lounging. 
all the children lounging. <laughs> Potential daughter-in-law that they never married. Lounging. Lounging also. <laughs> so many of us should know that when you go to your in-laws place, their behavior towards you can we even determine your decision. And that is you why, marry and that's son why I say, you know, keep it simple. Stay true to yourself. yourself. If you go and you are someone that this is how you are a certain way, my dear, can you just bear it out so they know no, what it like is? Like you are Hold on, no, 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 no. Hmm? You will just be who you are, so it cuts because everyone's auditioning whether we like it or not. They are auditioning you, you are auditioning them. No one's holding a gun to your throat and saying that you must marry this person. Neither are they vice versa. You. So you have a cho you have a choice. It's just that we forget because we're in a culture that we are dependent on their opinion about us as women. Yeah. So we forget about the part that we are also um, um, auditioning them. But me, I say, go as you are. Fine, I understand where blessings come. So okay, you know, a bit of decorum here and there, which is okay. It shows that you have home training. You know, but at the same time, don't veer away too far from yourself. Because what no, I think you're saying also goes to don't start what you, what can't, you can't finish. Mm. No, I know somebody I, that went to an in lost mm. place, Tolu. I would lie. I can't. She went into the kitchen. They didn't ask. No, I don't she saw this. plates. She washed. Ah, okay. She stayed there, I think, for the weekend. By the time they wake up, she had mopped the entire okay, house. Lola, I, I wow, want you to wow, hold this wow, story wow, because wow. we need to hear the end of this story, but we need to go on a break. Wow. We will come Aye, back yeah, and we'll find yeah. out what happened if they actually ended Aye, up man. No, they didn't. We'll, <laughs> tell me they didn't end up. No. Did they? Let's go. As reporters, we don't just gather new stories. We experience them daily. So join us on Report Desk Africa as we share these experiences and review the top African stories. Only on New Central. Welcome back to Jasiri. So I had to cut Lola off from telling that story, but she's going to finish it now. We'll wrap up this conversation and go to the next one, which is also very interesting. Lola, so, Lola, did they marry her? Of course they didn't marry her. Wow. The what mother, was the reason given? Exactly. The mother had to call her son that this girl is excessive, hmm. that it was not, that that was no expectation ah. from her, that yeah. she's, she's hiding something. Yeah. That why is she so, for, why was she so, so forward? So quick. That yeah. if she's quick to try to impress them, that they are sure that she would never keep up this particular There's a similar uh, story that a, a pastor so told. You can't he lost that. out. Yeah, there's a similar story that a pastor told that he was um, dating this girl and she was, I mean, he just became a pastor and she was in his congregation and then she would come to visit him and then, you know, they were in school. So he would expect that maybe she would not, not bring food, not like the cooler ministry, but at least offer to cook or something. <laughs> <laughs> It's true now. <laughs> she glided. <laughs> so, but I mean, there was a time he fell sick, and apparently he had not eaten for three days. That's why he was sick. He was admitted. And this girl came with the Bible, and she told all his friends to step aside. It's like something is going to happen here today. <laughs> Raise your two hands. And then she was, you know, performing yeah. deliverance for the pastor. And then he's like, I can't marry this person. So yes, there's the part of going of being excessive. But one thing I'm basing my own uh, this thing is is when you are in Rome, you act as the Romans. If I'm coming to work in the morning, I don't feel like dressing up. Right? I feel like being in my pajamas. But I cannot come in my pajamas. It's not every day that I feel like greeting people. It's but good. I have to. You know, it, it's, I just have to be cautious, right? I cannot see my MD or my boss and, and uh, I'm not in the mood. I'm just giving me an idea. There's going to be a Jassiri pajama day show. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm basically, sure I'm, I'm, just, I'm just basically talking about, you know, Since general expectations, pajamas. environmental, yes. cultural. It's not yes. you <laughs> not being who you are. It's just you considering other people's interests as well. So yeah. I think at the end of the day, this is, I have two other things on this. One, we... Uh, and I say it a lot. This ministry of preaching to women about how to be wives is a multi-billion naira 
billion dollar, billion euro Forget industry. It. No, I, I <laughs> wanted to emphasize. No, man. Who is we talking to, to the men? Yeah. That's one. And then I said it on the, the last day we had this conversation. Yeah. I also think a lot of men don't help. One, give your intending fiance or whoever it is some expo. Prepare her for the exam yeah, so that you know she's going to. I was yeah. prepared, you know. My mother-in-law mm. kicked me out of the kitchen. And to this day, I go to our house, I eat, I sleep with Jim. Exactly. Love it, you know? yeah. My father in law too enters the kitchen. He'll be asking me, tell me what yeah. you want to do. I love you. Yeah. Yeah. So also give your intended spouse the expo, but yeah. also step in. Step if in. If there's too much yeah. excess, you are responsible for protecting your spouse. That's exactly. one thing we learned in marriage counseling. On both sides, protect your spouse from your family. Yeah. And when we say protect, it's not that they're coming at them with knives. Yeah, and yeah. But you, you, you circle yeah. around them so that they yeah. know that there's a boundary here. True. We're going to continue. All right. I so I stumbled on this thread this week on X, and I just couldn't resist sharing with you guys because it's about experiences that Nigerians have had in trusting their businesses to other Nigerians for management. They shared their frustrations, recounting instances of mismanagement, dishonesty, and even theft by those they hired to oversee their businesses. Now, let's look at some of the uh, comments that came in on this particular <laughs> thread. Yeah, it should get Max now. I'm the one who did it. I run a poultry farm that I refuse to shut down. Staff members started stealing while I was away, so I hired a supervisor and paid him three times what I paid the farm attendants just so he would put a process in place. Do you know what happened? The supervisor introduced a new level of theft and record alteration to the system. I had to let him and other staff members go. Who else do we have in this regard? Uh, my first entry into poultry, let's go all of this. I, I saw Shege Max. Um, we were looking for a farm supervisor. Somebody recommended this Egba in the area who had supposedly managed a couple of big farms, was now unemployed. He swore that he resigned from his last job because the owners didn't appreciate him enough and didn't get enough pay. And so many people in the area vouched for him. I hired him and added 50% to his most recent pay. The infrastructure was ready. It was time to stock. But the first moment, he inflated the cost per bird. Five to six weeks after the I birds see. were delivered, he called me one day and said some of them died because they had disease and he had to burn them quickly so they wouldn't affect others. He even showed evidence of where he had burnt them. I'm helping you paraphrase. Actually, he lied. He transferred them to the cage behind his house. No. We didn't know until months later when his partner was caught selling eggs, that one's job was maintenance to clean up, behind our backs, right. and he took him down with himself. Now the fish pond, four swimming pool sized ponds were ready at the time. One day he left the birds alone on a rainy night to go and party with his friends where he traveled out of town for a wedding, didn't tell anybody. That's how soldier ants invaded the poultry and we lost 30% of the broiler stock. What did he do? He started throwing the dead broilers into the earthen fish pond so I wouldn't know. The whole place began to stink. At a point, feathers were floating on the pond. What the uh -oh. heck? After we found out and saw how much he had stolen, he begged and said he would refund 550K, but he could only do it if he had a job. So we were going to remove a percentage from his salary till it's fully paid. To checkmate him, I hired a seasoned a Greek expert who retired from the Ministry of a Greek as a consultant, another Wahala. No. As a matter of fact, I went to beg this man to work with us because I knew him growing up. He was posted to our area by the government about 15 years prior, and he managed fisheries. In the long run, they stole oh. this guy's... They stole his uh, catfish. The, they stole the fish from the pond. Mm. They stole the eggs <laughs> behind him. The Even guy was this one that left to his to his friends mm. to go and roast and drink beer. Oh. That's just one story. So the whole thread basically talks about the fact that they're hiring people, they're mm. employing labor, but these same Nigerians are destroying the businesses. Mm. As we're talking, we can show some more of the graphics as yeah. well because yeah. of time. And then Guys. you ask, and then you ask yourselves. Where are we going as a people? These are the people who are who are the ones that fill up churches. My friend ran his poultry farm from America with cameras and sensors because he couldn't afford an automated poultry. They were stealing eggs, and by month end, they, they, they'll be deducted from their salaries. A camera caught one of the workers stealing another. Bill as <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, oh my god. I love it. Oh my god. This is where this is where it is because we are all, we are our own individual government. Oh, yes, and I love that he did not mention to them. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. But do you know that most of these things <laughs> when I look at a lot of people that are hiring people, mm. a lot of graduates are out there looking for jobs. But do you know many of them are so unfit? Yes. Have you ever done interviews and no. you are wondering that How did, did these you? people yeah. actually go to school yeah. or the mm. school went to them? Mm. Mm. Because it's unbelievable yeah. their level of ignorance. Yeah. And it's like an ignoramic express. Exp inability to even apply A lot of them feel entitled. And it's even entitled is, oh if you are God. saying entitled, that means you know your onions a bit. These ones are clueless. And I'm wondering that, okay, why do you want to do this job?
they'll tell you something like, I just need something to do. Right. Once I hear, I just need something that, I, I, to that, do. That's, 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 that's it. it. I yeah. will not that's touch the end you. Of that's the end of That means you do not... You see many security men. That's I'll go it. to them. We are just too dubious. My fish farm manager used to take at least four daily to his bear parlor. Only hell? him stole over 500 fish in one cycle. So we talk about... People Abba. owning businesses. You, you're already dealing with maybe it's policy, agrarian when you want to build. You're dealing with state uh, state yeah. policies and laws on Tax. taxation. Yeah. You're Your dealing with the fact that too. you don't have electricity. You need to buy diesel. You need to operate something. And then you now have to deal with the Nigerians you hired that you're paying. That the success of the business hopefully means more money and success for them. So we run a restaurant, and <laughs> sometimes I think the extra gray hairs that have popped up on his Abba. head are from it. From by the time you catch staff, some on Friday, on Monday, somebody comes back, is empty. On Saturday, when you're leaving, your bag is full. You'll be telling us that food has finished. Meanwhile, you put the food aside because you're going to take it. And it's like, do you guys not... Do, do, people are paying for this. Yeah. We, we need to account. We need to keep the doors open. We need to pay your salaries and the salaries of other people. But Nigerians don't care. What happens is once that business... So about to, about to Jeru, Jeru, because so it's, leave. it's not enough to say they ruined the business. Yeah. Your buy is right. To about to Jeru, they've eaten everything they can yeah, eat and they, they leave a carcass. Them. They just move on to the next They place. say, Ogata, Ogata. Yeah. That's such a And you an have out. these people uh, who you uh, run over. interviews on, and you have people vouching for them. They is vouch it for they... the Egbo? Yeah. Uh, but do you know that? Is this is still this doctrine of unaccountability? If people suffer, do you know many of these things? When you catch these people, they just bend down and, and prostrate. Or they bring people to go. beg. Or they bring people to oh, be. But nobody gets punished. Yeah. So this bad behavior is entrenched in them, is solidified. They just keep going from one employer to one employer, honing their stealing skills. How can and they? nobody will, imagine if you steal a bird and you spent one year 600 in prison. Yeah, because when you come out, 600? This, yeah, yeah, even this metric of uh, reducing their salary, it, it has now become a what's the worst that can happen. Yeah, 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 yeah like you, I, you reduce I, their salary, they will say yes, sir. But they will find ways of stealing from you to make up for the salary that you're reducing from them. So the amount of business owners who shared in that thread lets you know that it is a societal issue. Mm -hmm. But I'll come back to this. But we're so religious. Uh, on Fridays and Sundays, and, these and, are on the Sundays and Saturdays, mm -hmm. depending on what religion, you're going to, we're the ones raising holy oh hands. Oh my God. We're the ones asking oh. God for open doors yeah. and everything. Meanwhile, the money you might even be giving oh. is money you somehow got don't. from. I, I don't yeah. understand. Yes. I fail to see how a country that claims to hold on to religion so God. deeply is the same society we That's have. So decadent. Goodness gracious. Oh, please. A, a, a but lot of people, a lot of people use it as a cover up. In this country, I know that oh. a lot of people pay lip service to religion. Yeah. You know, the fact that you, even the Bible says it, that it's not all those that call me Lord, Lord, mm -hmm. that, that will see the kingdom right. of heaven. Yes. Yeah. So let's not deceive ourselves. We have more hypocrites in churches and mosques and even traditional worship places. So many of them do not even uphold the values of what they say they believe. So like me, if somebody says they are a Christian, that's the first thing I will look at you and in fact well, is well, a destroy that you want to wear exactly we want to wear it. Yeah. Yeah. Said this, yeah. I, I, I interviewed somebody last week for a radio. Mm. And you know, when I looked at the young man, I almost called him aside and said, How would you be employed? <laughs> because no. I said, Oh, what experience? He said he wanted to do me, um, uh, sales for media. And I said, What have you done sales wise? He said I worked in a machine company. And I said, this doesn't have any correlation. Okay, what other skills do you have in my church? Oh, I do this thing and this and that. I'm very vigilant. And that. You know, he said in my church more than seven times. Ah. <laughs> Even for me. It's and I hard. just looked at him and I said, maybe for an admin job, this can work for you. But if it's about integrity and all this and all that, you are giving me off this thing like a very religious person, and that makes me suspect you. Mm. Because most of the people that act sanctimonious, mm. they are the worst oh, kind. La la. I asked the question, do, are we getting enough preachings, whether it's temple, mosque, church, whatever it may be, that is not about how you're breaking through, how you're going to find no, prosperity, no, no. that is challenging how we live, that is yeah. challenging us on the issues of corruption, mm -hmm. the issues of lying, the issues of I've dishonesty in our society. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've always Do said we this. get those? Right from mm -hmm. when I was in NT, I've always said it, and I was interested in doing reports about church, mm -hmm. churches, because, I, you know, I always ask questions that are uncomfortable. Why are we talking about prosperity? Why are we talking about breakthrough? Why are we talking, these people are poor, they, they barely have enough to eat. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know, and, 
you, you have a way of, of pulling them in and keeping them in when the core things you should be talking about discipline, about uh, greed, being ethical, the, being, being moral, ex, yeah. being upright, being moral. We are just gliding past that. As in, we just pretend as if those things don't even exist in So I, I'm, I'm going in religion. to be honest. I'm, I'm not going to say that they don't teach it. It's just they like children it, going to school and not passing. No, like, I, no way. I, I get your point. Teach it I get in your Sunday point. school. No, 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 because a lot of times, this, this same thing about gliding over, we glide over the fact that churches preach about being excellent as a Christian. Churches preach, preach about hard work as a Christian, mm -hmm. but we glide into the part that they talk about, you know, um, prosperity, success, prosperity, yeah. which is understandable, right? Because a lot of times people would want to criticize what they do not know, but I would say that it is on the individuals who call themselves Christians Christian. or Islamic worshippers who do not do the work. We are selective with what we want to believe exactly. let's be honest even the bible okay the bible is not a person standing in front of you it's some is a guide for you yeah. but even that bible we are selective with it okay the bible says do not steal but we go past that and we say the bible no, says some will say you can steal yeah white collar stealing is not really stealing most of the time even like you have recalcitrant children their parents have taught some of them but it is you that chooses the lifestyle that you have even this Bible, all of us, even this so, preacher that all of us are criticizing. Okay. Don't you have the Bible with yourself? Okay. And the okay. Coincidental okay. is it uh, then that okay. the next level? Yes, let's go. Yes, <laughs> all right. Uh, just very quickly, I want to say to our viewers that in the light of this conversation, it's crucial to stay vigilant and discerning, especially when it comes to business partnerships and business management. It's not enough to own a business. It also matters who runs your business. Whether you're hiring someone to manage your business or considering a partnership, take the time to thoroughly vet and assess their integrity and track record before you hire and even while they're working with you. So if you have to go automated, please, by all means, stay tuned for more laughter and thought-provoking conversations right here on the series. We'll be right back very shortly. From the hills of the Southeast Africa, reporting coverage on the ground, exclusive reports, and the latest news, all right here. We speak to the people live, get their perspectives on the latest news, the happenings, and the trends. I am Wongani Siziba, live from Johannesburg, South Africa. This is News Central. Welcome back to the show. We are, of course, streaming on our social media platforms at New Central TV. And, of course, we also are using the hashtag JustSiri to check in on your comments. But, ladies, I know you were, it was about to get intense. One 30-second comment. We are not ready. Screen. We're not ready. Yeah, I'm uh -huh. Blessings. I'm done. You're done. No, no. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> My final comment on this is from the story we just shared. We are the, these will be the same Nigerians who are talking about politicians and government. That's why I say we are. And so at the end of the day, what are we talking about? Exactly. But we want to move on to our final story. I have I'm proud of these ladies. They didn't say much today. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised. Like, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> right, let's go. All right. So imagine you bought an iPhone 12 for your sister. Please, someone check how much it is. Um, an iPhone 12 for your it's sister. It's like 720. Uh, seven, what? 700,000. Hey. Okay. Um, for your sister. And then her boyfriend seized it after they had a quarrel. What's mm -hmm. your next move? You bought an iPhone 12, 720 something thousand. Mm -hmm. This economy. Let's say it's under key. For your sister. Her boyfriend and her have argument. The boyfriend seizes the phone. What do you do? Uh, oh. It's okay. I will find my way down there. Okay. Uh, and I'll say, a <laughs> quarrel. <laughs> uh, uh, Jonathan. Oh. Uh, Perhaps <laughs> you have seen a silver phone somewhere. They say you have for it. Just hand it over. Just hand it over. Mm. You are you really talking from there or not? If you hand over my phone, I will say okay, goodbye, <laughs> and God bless. That's all I will do. That's all. Really. Uh -huh. Except, except that boyfriend. I, I wanted to say except he has two heads, but I, I'll be fair. I know some people that have two heads. They have not really born the boyfriend and my sister. That allowed him to say, I came to tell me that he sees it from both of them. 
they are going to <laughs> they're going to get in some trouble. Seven hundred and twenty something thousand naira in this economy. Yeah, yeah you, my own phone is in the middle of your argument. Do you understand? Something, something. Is wrong. Oh, it's okay. What was that? <laughs> is it that? <laughs> no, it doesn't make any sense. Are, are you mad? Uh -huh. Don't look are at you me. Mad? <laughs> Are you mad? 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 I'm yeah. turning to her and say, if this guy touches your phone again, no, I, I'm sorry. You, I think actually the relationship should. End. I, yes, yes. How I'm, tell, yes. I'm telling you, seizing personal property. You didn't buy the phone from her, even if you yeah. bought the phone. That means you because you know we have those situations yeah. where people yeah. want to be yeah. collecting their gifts yeah. back. Yeah. Even if you bought the phone, the law says when well, you hand it over, it becomes a gift and transfer of ownership. Yeah. But you didn't buy this phone. No, I bought the phone. So yeah. I gave it to her. Yeah, exactly. Why is it that phone that? Because you don't see the phone, don't they give you? No, seizing of the phone. You're already feeling something. Time season away. will enter seven. Yeah, because to be honest, that relationship season will enter season. has to end. Ah, Thank God the person uh, is my sister. I'm going to campaign against the relationship. That relationship, mm, because it. at the end of the day, now when they're married, the lady, if she offends him, that was an him, audition. Now, he will, he will seize the ATM card. That was an he audition. That was an audition. Exactly. You have failed. You have failed the audition. No, 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 no. It's as simple as that. Your so time is up. Have, please go. <laughs> let's see if we have some reactions to that particular story that we saw on social media. Uh, it's a uh, no brainer. Okay, I think our reactions because, are enough. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I also think when we when it comes to relationships, except, especially for young girls and their first one or two relationships, there's a tendency to allow a lot of nonsense. Yes. And if you're in a situation like that, one, it's an audition. He yeah. has failed a test. Yeah. Why are you seizing personal property? Mm -hmm. That means if that we are together, you to might do. kick me out of the house yes. or kick me out of a home we're both living. Even, even if I bought the house. house. That we're both that we both have yeah. property in. You might destroy my personal property. And I'm also curious as to why that phone is the thing yeah. that's yeah, bothering you. Thing. Do you have anger issues? Do you have a problem with me being close to my siblings? Shouldn't that be a plus? Do you feel threatened? Are you feeling insecure? If so, then please explain in three paragraphs. I, mean, I don't want, I, don't want, <laughs> I, I honestly don't even have time to wait around. I'm not leaving that house without my sister and the phone. Exactly. That's the truth. Honestly, these no, days, you know, there, any just, sign you see that tends towards that is over... It. Maybe uh, overreaction uh -huh, or behavior. excessive control. Yeah. You should know that there's more fire under the mountain. So you better save your sister because sometimes love can really scatter us. Me that I love love. Sometimes you oh, see no, no, obvious no, no. things Ooh. like this. Yeah, let's be honest. And you are still, we give excuses for shit. Did I say with the narcissists for months? That's why and families, I can't say you I think change, families should change. do better. They never families change. should actually do better and step up to the plate. I understand that, oh, you know, I don't really want to get, I don't want to be the one to force this person out of, let the person get to a realization or his realization himself. Sometimes they need help. Realization. They need clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I was, I was having things. a conversation with, um, the, the day we had that um, talk about the woman whose husband spends their money on, on, on her the, on husband. The yeah. so one of my friends was watching and then we just got talking and I, I created a scenario. I'm like, imagine a woman tells her husband, maybe shows something on Instagram and say, I see this man who, he beat his wife because she broke a cup. And the husband says, I don't have anything, um, there's nothing wrong with it. She probably deserved it. And I asked, like, what would you advise that woman to do? And the person was saying, hey, as long as it's not the man she was saying, showing that did he, he just said it. I'm, there's no just saying it. You don't just say things like that. Show the exactly. depth of your heart. Your actions also It means show. you agree with it. You don't have to be the one to beat the woman. As long as you agree with it, you are that. Let's not... Let's... You, out of the fullness of the heart, the what? Show the mouth. Speak it. Bam. <laughs> there's some things don't hide. There's, there's the when you take antibiotics, it used to, when you... <laughs> it come out of you your body. Mm. You Something that is like eating garlic. Garlic. Yeah, but when you eat garlic, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't like Ned Bless's boyfriend. Oh, I knew something was coming. Ned Bless's okay, boyfriend okay, sees that okay. phone. He's was okay. so sure. You were going to escape. I, I, I was no, sure. Ned Bless's boyfriend sees that phone. She had been turned fed. towards you for like 30 seconds. It was, it was boiling. <laughs> but we have finished, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. We have ended the first quarter of 20. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. For just a little over two months, oh, our, our, our yeah. birthday is not, you know, correlating. But no way, we're going to celebrate our three months on air very soon. I, and I want to take this time to apologize to my fans. I've not really been very comedic. It's because um, I've I've kind of been on a hiatus of some sort. I need time to compose myself. And Are I want you to roll credits. You, the next quarter, 
you're going to Please, see me in action. Um, producer, this is where you start playing um, the, 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 the credits. Yes. Or the I know you all believe in me. Oh, we'll see forward. you guys on Monday. Oh, we hope God. you have a fantastic weekend. Share love yes, with please. your family this Easter. Uh, if you want to call us, we're available as well for guest appearances <laughs> with the food. But have a good one. We're edited out of the... Hey, Jess and Chegbo. We edit. <laughs> we, we, you know, we came out with and, and, and please be careful how you spend this Easter so that the Jesus' tomb and your bank account will not go <laughs> to any Yes, at the same time. Jesus, guys, what's that? Jesus' tomb Jesus and, and the bank, bank account. Let it not be parallel. Empty. Yeah. <laughs> All right, say guys. goodbye now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
She says the harmful chlorine residuals found in bleach are toxic to the internal system of consumers. They, they pose so much effect on the health, you know, aside from um, gastrointestinal issues alone, it causes, it, it causes um, effect on the reproduction health, on neurogenetic health, and long-term exposure. When a consumer eats this contaminated fufu or any other food long-term, it puts them at risk for long-term health disease as, as well, like cancers, um, like um, um, a dementia, even things like that, because it has damaged the liver, the kidney, and the nervous system. What chlorine is majorly used for is for disinfecting, and it is also present in water, in um, tap water. It is used as a form of um, um, disinfecting water to make it suitable for drinking. But chlorine in Gary is not something that should be. There are other ways that um, Gary or uh, Fufu can be fermented without the use of chlorine to make it suitable for human consumption. In Nigeria, the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control is the agency responsible for the regulation and control of the importation, exportation, manufacturing, advertisement, distribution, sale and use of food, drugs, cosmetics, medical devices, bottled water, chemicals and detergents. In the virtual interview, the Director of Chemical Evaluation and Research for the agency disputes the notion that bleaching compounds are used to ferment cassava, citing the chemical makeup of both the crop and the bleach. That detergent, if you add it to your fufu, maybe you grind your cassava, add it to your fufu, number one, the smell will remain. You know how detergents smell, all detergents, it will remain, that's number one. Number two, there is no basis for anybody to convince me that there can be a reaction between linear type benzene sulfonate and starch because the major ingredient or the major chemical that is inside fufu or cassava or yam is starch. Starch is an organic compound. This linear archive benzene sulfonate, the linear archive benzene part of it is also organic compound. Two organic reacting, the reaction will be terribly, terribly, terribly slow. It doesn't support you unless you put a catalyst there. In the course of working on this story, our efforts to get the ex-user at Ikete Baby Gulf or his friend whom was said to have been hospitalized after eating fufu wasn't successful. Though there may not be much to worry about, relying on what the NAVDAC official and nutritionist said, many kin lovers of fufu, since the viral tweet, have urged regulatory bodies like NAVDAC to introduce strict rules that guide the production of local dishes. Adesha Waudu Shoga, reporting for News Central.
Hello and welcome. You're watching News Central Television. I'm Kofi Bartels. Let's begin the news of this hour with a look at the top stories. Christians across uh, the globe have celebrated Easter amid calls for hope and unity. Fire left two dead and about 2,000 homeless in South Africa. And Somalia's Portland shuns federal institutions over vote reform. Those are the headlines. We have details of those and other stories ahead on the news. You're welcome. Let's begin the news tonight by telling you the chairman of the All Progressives Congress Caretaker Committee in River State, Chief Tony Okocha, has marked some chieftains of the People's Democratic Party in the state over their recent celebration, or rather declaration, of support for President Bola Tinubu and the governor of River State, Simonala Ifubara. Now, this came as a direct reaction to a press conference by the former national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Uche Sakondas, uh, the former Minister of Transportation, Abiy Sekibo, among others, who declared their support for Tinubu and Fubara. While addressing a press conference at the National Secretariat of the Party in Abuja, Okocha said most of those PDP elements are still in the camp of former Vice President Atiku Abubakar. He also faulted their declaration of support for President Tinubu while saying that they are the ones giving Governor Fubara what he called the confidence to challenge the resolution of Mr. President Bola Tinubu on the political crisis in River State. If the midnight pseudo lovers of Mr. President today are shown in their test under critique, if they are now convinced that Mr. President is abundantly fit and proper to preside over Nigeria and that his 10 months in office has provided renewed hope for an El Dorado for Nigerians and choose to recant their hitherto unsavory and un unprintable tosics against Mr. President, they should follow the proper channels allowed for putting or the campaign to a new political party. This approach of browbeating and blackmailing they intend to use is not fashionable at all. No sane host tolerates a guest who attempts to enter his or her house through the window when the doors are wide open. That's six out of eight. Why are the other two difficult? What are the two? Go and conduct local government election. And if you are governor, you are almost there for one year and every day you think you are carrying crowd, you should just test the waters and find out that those crowds you are carrying are rented. When a man is hungry and you say, hey, enter the bus, we are going for somewhere, I will give you 5,000, they will push each other to enter the bus. That's the kind of crowd he has. He doesn't have the people. I'm River. That's in River State, where the State House of Assembly has accused the governor of dishonesty threatening to resume impeachment proceedings against him if he continues to breach the constitution in their opinion martin amehule v speaker of the house of assembly made this known on saturday during a press briefing in port hackett the capital of river state amehule who was accompanied by 26 members of the assembly read out a communique issued after the briefing the lawmakers accused governor fubara of refusing to hold up to his end of the presidential peace accord, which they say he willfully signed without coercion. Well, let's discuss this some more. We're joined by Nelson Nekujimi. He is a political analyst. Good evening to you, Nelson, and a very happy Easter. <laughs> Nelson Nekujimi, can you hear me, please? Good evening. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Um, Nelson Nekujimi, is there a chance that um, the latest statement and move coming from the River State House of Assembly, we just 
you said the words of uh, Martin Zamey, who the speaker, is more of a um, political than about governance and even about the constitution. <laughs> Well, the truth of the matter is that um, I can't hear your question very well. The truth of the matter is that uh, in governance, there's a little bit of politicking involved. So one expects that uh, the governor should uh, place politics right, even though we know governance, you know, take precedence over every other thing. But like we all know that politics is life. So one expects that the governor should get his act right with regards to how he governs the state and the, the stakeholders involved. Because uh, whatever we do, we, we cannot run away from politics, even in a family setting. So uh, you cannot run away from the fact that uh, there's a bit of politics involved in this impeachment uh, threats by the uh, River State House of Assembly. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it cannot be isolated or it cannot be you know, removed from it. Now, so what are the potential consequences for Governor Fuller and indeed for River State if uh, this impeachment proceedings resume? We seem to have an issue there with Nelson and Kujimi. Uh, public affairs analysts, we will hope to have this discussion at some other time. But we're moving on to another story, uh, to our Easter update. And Nigeria's President Bola Tinbu has felicitated uh, Christians in the country and around the world as they celebrate the Easter season. Easter is an event that commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is also a symbol of Christ's victory over death and sin. To mark the day, the Nigerian president in a statement called on Christians to imbibe the virtues of love, sacrifice, and compassion associated with the season. Since resuming office, or assuming office rather, in May, Nigeria's president has embarked on several policies that have had an effect on the masses and the economy. Well, in his Easter message, the Nigerian president hailed the resilience and sacrifice of Nigerians saying it is necessary for economic recovery. Easter is one of the most significant festivals for Christians. It is a time of profound spiritual and renewal and joy, marking the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday following the full moon after the spring equinox. In Nigeria, this year's celebrations seem rather different, with citizens contending with the rising cost of living. With more, here's New Central's Bettina Willy. Whether through solemn rituals or joyful gatherings, Easter is a time when Christians reflect on life's blessings and spread love and good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection. However, in many places, most people concentrate more on the celebration than the reason for the season. Easter is simply about the reason for why we are Christians. I mean, um, without um, Easter, basically, the whole essence of our faith is not there. I think the present generation has lost it, and sometimes I look at it that maybe we should be blamed um, because um, the essence of Easter is for us to look at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what he really stood for and what he did for us, and then lend our life, give ourselves to him, and be obedient unto him. But what we see is that people are now celebrating, dancing, jumping, drinking, doing things. Instead of being a sober time where you look at your life and you dedicate yourself to Christ. Usually a time to merry and jolly, especially after the long fast. This year, the economic hardship in Nigeria seems to be biting harder than ever, leaving the faithful clinging to nothing but their faith and hope for a better tomorrow. In our own little way, we do our bits. I mean, uh, a few weeks ago, in our neighborhood here, the whole of the jack on the here got pulled down. Of course, who, who, who takes the blunt is the church. These are uh, church where they come. We've had to do 
we have to to support them with funds to relocate we every sunday we are giving people food stuff so we are doing the bit we expect the government to do their bit this is how it's okay for the economic uh it's only, it's, it's only by God's grace for everything. The hardship is too much. This time of Easter, there's no much customer in doing our work and everything. The economy has nothing to do with my Easter because I'm of Christ and because I belong to Christ. Nigeria's economy has nothing whatsoever to do with my Easter. Christians in Nigeria are having a low-key Easter celebration this year. No thanks to the current economic hardship in the country, that has triggered high cost of foodstuff as well as the soaring cost of transportation for holiday travelers amongst other factors. It is hoped that just like the seasons, this too shall pass. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili. In Umuahia, the Arab state capital, Christians trooped out Indian numbers to celebrate Easter in commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the central message by the Catholic Bishop of Omoahia, Right Reverend Michael Upong, focused on forgiveness, sacrifice, and endurance. He also enjoined Christians to emulate all the virtues of Christ, which he exhibited while on earth to help them advance their heavenly race. Also, the Bishop of the Umuahia Diocese of the Methodist Church in Nigeria, Right Reverend Ike Chiku Emezi Nkulo, called on the government to make people oriented policies and fix the nation's infrastructure. The resurrection of Jesus gives us the firm hope and faith that resurrection from the dead, as he promised us, is a reality, not just fiction. The lesson it is teaching us that is that Goodness has always the upper hand, will always triumph over evil. Because Jesus was crucified out of hatred. And it's also telling us that no matter what we suffer, as long as we are suffering innocently, then you have nothing to regret. At the end of the day, God will vindicate you. And so we shouldn't see every suffering as evil. And it should encourage us to be bold in doing the right thing always, even when everybody is persecuting us, remembering that Jesus was crucified for doing good. To actually rise with Christ. But in my own uh, understanding, I want to rise living off whatever that is against the wish of Christ. Whatever is sinful, whatever is harmful to humanity. I leave it away and then decide to live a brand new life, emulating Christ in all I do. This is my main aspiration, particularly. As Nigerians continue to groan over the nation's worsening economy and insecurity, Christians remain optimistic that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead guarantees a better tomorrow. These were the crux of Christian faithful in Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, as they join their counterparts all over the world to celebrate this year's Easter Sunday. At various church services held in the state capital to herald the celebration, Nigerian leaders, uh, rather, were urged to be willing to make sacrifices for greater unity, peace, and progress of the country. Christians reminded that having gone through 40 days of fasting and prayer, Easter remains the most appropriate time for them to purge themselves of weights that have impeded the progress of the country by demonstrating love in its fullness and purity, not only to one another, but to others in society. One must rise. They must embrace the rising of Jesus and make this nation rise because it has been placed in our hands and the hands of the politicians to make it work. They should make it work. We cannot remain in darkness when Jesus has risen. That there is difficulty, but because of the resilience of Nigerians, that they are forging ahead with happiness. It's love over us to supersede what we are going through, supersede the hardship that we are going through. So I think today, is, um, no matter what you are going through, you come out and celebrate. You don't have to cook. Just celebrate his grace, celebrate his power, celebrate his passion to die for mankind. We continue to pray 
but my message to political class is for them to do the right thing. It is just very good that we do things that will uplift the people, not, you know, tormenting people, putting them into bondage. So I'm expecting that the celebration of Jesus Christ will bring upon us, the Nigerians. Every good and still in the spirit of Easter, we head to South Africa, where millions of Christians around the world today celebrated Easter, also known as Resurrection Sunday, a Christian day that celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is one of the most important holidays in the Christian calendar. In Johannesburg, at the Cathedral of Christ the King, the congregates uh, celebrate, so congregants celebrated the day at a Mass and took Holy Communion. New Central's, New Central's Mbongani Ziziba has more. Harmonious praises all to exalt the glory of God. A Sunday Mass gathering to commemorate the most profound event in their faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From readings from the scriptures to recounting the story of Jesus' crucifixion and miraculous resurrection, each word spoken carries the weight of centuries of faith and tradition, uniting the congregation in a shared sense of purpose and belief. That of the resurrection, which in the minds of many people is difficult to fathom. For Christians, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of their belief. It signifies the victory of life over death, hope over despair, and light over darkness. A testament to the power of divine love that transcends all human boundaries. It also offers believers the promise of internal life and the assurance that even in the face of adversity, there is always hope of renewal and redemption. Time to partake in a ritual known as the Holy Communion. Congregates take turns around the altar with their faces showing gratitude and devotion for the sacrifice that Jesus made for their salvation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is more than a historic event for many here. They are reminded that his victory over death is a source of hope and inspiration for believers around the world. We need to take this time and remind ourselves where we're coming from and where we're going. Who are we and um, our journey in Christ Jesus Christ. We must repent and we must go back to our Savior. I feel happy that he rose from the dead and he died for our sins. I'm also happy because he did so much for us and he was nailed to the cross. He bled and died and some people on this earth do not really know who he is. So I want them to know that Jesus died for our sins and he loves all of us. It's a blessing to have him being resurrected for us during this Easter. Resurrection Day, a day where many Christians across the globe celebrate and reflect and take a new leaf on their Christianity, a day that they believe Jesus died and rose and washed their sins away. In Johannesburg, for News Central, Bongani Siziba. Well, let's come back to West Africa. In other news, the Muslim faithful in Joss uh, Plata State in northern Nigeria have urged the federal government to wade into the economic crisis that has called, caused rather untold hardship to the citizens. Uh, this was made known when New Central's Chizoba and Yoe sought to find out how they are coping with the economic meltdown even as they perform their Ramadan rite. <laughs> Ramadan is one of the most spiritual exercises within Islam. It is a period of fasting where believers abstain from as much as carnal acts as possible, give alms to the less privileged, and above all, abstain from food from 6 o'clock in the morning till same time in the evening when a call for the closing prayer for the day's fast is heard. Allah Akbar Allah Sun 
Tony Muazu, his wife and children have just concluded prayers to end the day's fast. It is now time for the breaking of fast with different dishes to choose from. They spoke on the essence of Ramadan. Fasting is um, not just an, a way of nourishment to the soul. It is also, you know, a shield, you know, for the Muslim. Shield from uh, committing all kinds of um, uh, atrocities or, you know, unruly behaviors. It's not the much that you give, but it's the little that you are able to give. There's a hadith that the prophet said that even if it is half a date, share one date, give your neighbor half. It gives me a chance personally to reconnect with my religion, to put this uh, hustle and grind to the side just for a little while and focus on what is important. Actually us as youths, you know, coming from the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you interact with people. Behind me here is the Masalichin Juma in Jos. It is the biggest and the main worship center for the Muslim faithful here on the plateau. However, I am here to ascertain from the Muslim faithful how they cope with the hardship of the economy as they celebrate the month of Ramadan in Jos. We are trying our best to cope with the economy because this uh, this our fasting is a sacrifice that we must do it. When um, doing um, fasting, I have um, kamu, I drink nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. This con this condition is very high. Well. It's very high. We need government to do something about this. Behind the sharing of this palliative is Pam Watcom, the senator representing Plateau North senatorial district. As we can see today, people are suffering. People are stopping you from the road, begging you, I will asking you for assistance or help. So I think this can go a long way in touching the lives of some people. I want to appreciate the senator for remembering the Muslims for the palliative. By the next nine days, when Ramadan will come to an end, it is expected that the fruits of the month-long fast and lengthy supplication to the Almighty will be evident in the commitment of everyone to making the country a better place for all. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba Anui. Up next, we have a break, and when we return, we have more stories. Please stay with us. Welcome back, and now to more stories. Uh, agricultural revolution through food production is what many administrations in the past and present Nigeria seek to explore for food security. In this report, New Central Zumar Kirawa assesses the food production in the first quarter of the year. The prevailing economic situation in Nigeria 
has made millions of people struggle to survive. Farmers in recent times in the northeastern part of the country have been in the middle of this and even worse. This is as a result of attack by insurgents marauding the region and shows of the lecture. Although there is no available data on the number of farmers affected, 12 farmers were murdered early this year in Gatamarwa and Sia communities of Chubok local government. 13 farmers also paid the spring price along Pulka and Frigi Road in Goza in late January. This has somewhat disrupted food production and supply chains, contributing to food shortages and inflation. In the past three months, if you look at it, there is bus, that is massive improvement in production. But the challenge there is, cost of production, if you look at it now, is very high. Then, with much encouragement, encouragement from the government, we can aspire to go produce more. Cost of food is still not affordable compared to uh, last year or yesterday years when you look at the purchasing power of the ordinary Nigerian. So to me, yes, we are producing, but it's not good enough to beat the price. Farmers seem optimistic and determined to rebuild their lives and communities through their vocation. Sustained efforts by the federal and state government yielded immense results in the first quarter of this year. Many families have been resettled to their ancestral home to resume their trade, farming. Former fighters have been de-radicalized leading to significantly less security concerns in many parts of the northeast. Some parts of northern Borno, like uh, Mwabar, they've started producing both food and cash crop. I can say they have reached about 40% compared to the lost and then the recovery target in ratio of 100. You will see that we have recorded about 40%. Rural livelihoods are being revived, particularly in the tail end of the first quarter of 2024. Agribusiness must be introduced, and then value addition to agricultural produce must also be encouraged. These are capital-intensive issues and activities that ordinary peasant farmer cannot afford to do it. Borno State is pioneering sustainable food production by providing improved seeds, fertilizers, and adopting solar-powered water pumps to enhance their irrigation systems. We are also trying to shift from the utilization of fossil fuel to green energy with a view to reducing carbon emission and reducing cost also. The visit by the United Nations Secretary General earlier to Borno State re-energized the government as it is said there is still hope for the better. The Borno I found today is a Borno of hope, is a Borno with future. And I was very impressed to see the policy that is being applied here recognizing that you don't fight terrorism just by military means, you fight terrorism addressing the root causes of terrorism. As government continues efforts to reverse some of the negative trends, like the extreme upper hand of the dollar against the Naira, it is hoped that by the second quarter of this year, food will not just be available, but affordable to every Nigerian. In Maiduguri for News Central, Omori Kirawa. Thank you, Maru. Let's move to other reports. Uh, the persons living with disabilities in Abuja, Nigeria's capital, has called the performance of the current government high in reaching out to members of the disabled community. Now, this was as they converged on the Unity Fountain to mark the Easter and celebrate the birth of birthday rather of President Bola Tinubu. With more, here's our correspondent, Amadine Wee. They converged on the Unity Fountain in Abuja. <laughs> Members of the disability community from across the federal capital say it is a double celebration, the Easter celebration and the birthday of President Bola Tinubu. Some of them say the current government has been fair to Nigeria's disability community. This administration does not judge persons with disabilities. And they just started. They are not even up to one year. In two months, they're going to be one year. So imagine another seven years to go. So much. For others, it was an opportunity to read the performance of government. I am really happy for the president in the aspect of including persons with disabilities. Like myself, 
for the first time of being interviewed as a coming out in the midst of people, I think it's a privilege. We are happy and we, we said we must celebrate him because he has done what others cannot do for us. Uh, he has included it in so many things that we are expecting. And we are also expecting that he, uh, he will do more for us. The government has the interest of persons with disability in mind. And the Lagos State, when the president was the governor, Lagos was the first state to pass the disability law in this country. Persons with disability, we have not had it so good like this before. Since our president uh, Tinobu took over power, he has uh, created an enabling environment. The first thing he did was to appoint uh, the senior special assistant to the president of special needs and equal opportunity. They are also calling for more funding for the National Disability Commission and more intervention programs for members of their community. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi. The Delta State Governor, Sheriff Oberewori, has been urged to prevail on President Bola Tidabu and the Chairman of the Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency to rescue the Omoniria families, his second son, Eromo Sele, from total blindness on this stray bullets from the guns of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency operatives are said to have shattered the left eye of the boy in his mother's shop during a raid on Okapanam in Delta State on July 13, 2023. The same stray bullets took the life of his elder brother, Ivan Omonria, during the incident. Uh, his New Central's correspondent, Austin Azul, visited the family in Okapanam Road, a suburb of Asaba, the Delta State capital. And now reports. It has been eight months and 13 days after the accident that took place here in Asaba that led to the early death of a two-year-old boy who was caught short by a straight bullet of NDLA. Eight months and 13 days thereafter. The younger brother of Ivan, who was caught short by the NDLA bullet, has been battling for his health. I'm here at his father's house, Fidelis Omoria, to seek what has happened so far about the younger brother who has been ill for some time now. On the 13th of December, I have to go and bury my son at the mortuary. Since the chairman has come, that there's no issue and all that. So when I buried my son, they now told us that since we have buried my son, the one, the, my first son, that we should not worry, within a short while, they will get the visa and the expedited date for us. With the chairman, NDLA, I was in communication with him. He was assuring me every day that they would do the need for that I should not worry. The father, who explained the various stages gone through after the promise made by the NDLA chairman, including securing a traveling visa that was unsuccessful, said in spite of the urgency that the trip requires, the family regrets that little or nothing is being done to expedite action. He said the family not only battled with the irreversible damage that was done to their psyche, but they were also saddled with the burden of paying the enormous hospital bills that come with treating the child. Governor Sheriff Oboriwari, to help me prevail on the federal government and the NDLA to help me save my son. I don't want him to die again. At least I've lost one. It's okay. Let's see how we can pull us together to rescue, to save this one. The son's mother, who couldn't hold back her tears, said they can't watch their only son losing his sight after losing their first son. She lamented the sleepless nights they have been experiencing because of the deteriorating health of the child, saying they can no longer wait till 2025 before the visa approval to take the child abroad for surgery. I'm begging the governor, please help us speak to Marua, the president, has amend Sinubu. Please come to our aid. Come to our aid. I cannot lose a child. And I have a child lose an eye. The whole reason for those surgery is to help to get his side back intact. Efforts to reach out to the NDLA chairman were unsuccessful. Eight months and 13 days thereafter. This young boy here is still battling for his eyesight who was wounded by the straight bullet from the NDLA. They are all appealing to the federal government and relevant stakeholders to come to their rescue to enable this young boy regain his sight. 
In Asaba, for News Central, I'm Austin Azu. Since its establishment in 1949, the Lagos Country Club has been known for its tranquility, but now it's facing an internal conflict. The club's management council is reportedly at odds with the recently appointed interim management board. Let's take that to a report from correspondent Chilima Ona. Have the support of the members of the club and are to be withdrawn. The bone of contention is the registered trustee's decision to suspend the management council of the Lagos Country Club. In a recent statement by the management council, described the registered trustee's decision to suspend them and establish an interim board as illegal. This move has sparked outrage among a significant portion of the membership prompting an extraordinary general meeting for a peaceful resolution and voting. This is very, very disagreeable to the members. So we insisted we must have an EGM and bring the club back to a peaceful situation whereby all petitions are dropped, the interim management council set up by the trustees is cancelled, and we pass a vote of confidence on the management committee that was sacked by the trustees. There's been a lot of things happening in the club that has been very, very shameful to us and we needed to quickly uh, come together to be able to see a way to resolve this peacefully and to be able to make sure that we bring back the sanctity of the club back again. We have a lot of issues where the trustees of the club are taking the, dissolving the management council, which is out of the constitution of Lagos Country Club, and imposing an interim board on the management council that were duly elected. Members of the prestigious club are urging the registered trustees to lessen its interference in the matters of the club. Their interferences over the years started creating uh, unnecessary conflict that now accumulated to this climax that we are having now. So for us members, we decided that this kind of interferences must stop. The trustees must stop uh, exercising the powers that the constitution did not give them. They must stop issuing directive to the management council that is charged with the responsibility of running the club. In fact, the management council nominates them to be appointed as trustees. So there is no way they can even be above the management council because in the years past, they've played elderly roles, they've played fatherly roles, uh, mediating in conflicts and uh, achieving peaceful resolutions to conflicts that have happened in the club. The Oust Management Council has appealed for calm and returned to the supremacy of the Lagos Country Club's constitution. They say they are committed to resolving the issue swiftly to ensure a safe and welcoming environment for members. Coming up, Somalia's Puntland shuns federal institutions over vote for a reform. We have details of that story and others when we return from the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. The news continues in South Africa. Two people died and almost 2,000 were left homeless when fires engulfed hundreds of shacks in three separate incidents. 
in South Africa's Cape Town. In Johannesburg, at least 60 shacks have been destroyed, leaving hundreds homeless. It is understood the blaze swept through the informal settlement early on Sunday at Commissioner Street in Fairview. Johannesburg's emergency services spokesperson, Nana Radebe, said firefighters managed to contain the blaze. In the east of the continent, Somali's state of Pondland, or Somalia's state of Pondland, has announced on Sunday it will no longer recognize federal institutions after Parliament backed a plan for one person, one vote election system. It was the latest move in a long running, sometimes tense saga, with Pundland repeatedly issuing similar declarations in recent years to express its disagreement with the central government in Mogadishu. As a result, Pondland says it will have its own comprehensive government authority until a federal government system is put in place with a mutually accepted Somali constitution that is subject to a public referendum. Authorities in the region opposed the adoption by Parliament of a plan to reintroduce universal suffrage and end the complex clan-based indirect voting system which has been in place for more than half a century in the troubled Horn of Africa nation. Let's join our business desk for the latest from the world of business. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Nigerian never appreciated significantly against the US dollar throughout March 2024. Official figures indicate that the Naira closed the month at 8,309 Naira per dollar on the last trading day, up from 1,595 Naira 11 Kuba per dollar at the end of February 2024. In a parallel market, the Naira saw an even more pronounced recovery. The exchange rate improved from 1,600 Naira per dollar in February to 1,250 Naira per dollar in March, representing a 28% gain in one month. The gains in the official and parallel market at the largest scene in over five years. Rice Farmers Association of Nigeria, Rifan, has called on the federal government to restart the Ankor Borua's program, ABP, and address insecurity across the country as a measure to stem the ever-increasing rice prices. This was stated by the vice president of the group, Nina Ejim, in an interview with the news agency of Nigeria, NAN. Recall that Rifan, a top beneficiary of the ABP, with 1,518,603 members benefiting from the borrowing program, is currently grappling with a repayment shortfall. From the total principal of 283.01 billion naira that was allocated to Rifan, there has been a repayment of 137.24 billion naira. This leaves an outstanding principal balance of 145.77 billion naira, which is considered as past due. And finally, Every Coast's president, Alassane Watara, will raise the official farm gate price of cocoa from the current 1,000 sefer francs per kilogram to 1,500 sefer francs on Tuesday. This is based on information from sources at five distinct export companies. The sources, who pleaded anonymity, stated that they were referring to a decision made on Saturday at a government meeting. The official farm gate price that growers in Ivory Coast, a key producer, can charge for their beans, has not yet reflected the more than threefold increase in cocoa prices over the past year as disease and unfavorable weather sent the world market to a third consecutive deficit. And that's business news at this hour. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasan Repeater. The news continues shortly. Bye for now. Let's take some sports stories now. Rivers United got a crucial 1-0 victory over USNOJ 
of Algeria in the first leg of the CAF Confederation Cup quarterfinal clash in Nigeria on Sunday. Augustin Okpejefa broke the deadlock in the 10th minute with a crucial strike from the edge of the box at Godzilla Pabio Stadium. The Nigerian team's fiscal dominance it proved to be a major factor throughout the game. The second leg comes up in Algiers on the 7th of April and the North Africans will battle to overturn the deficit and secure passage to the semi-finals. The stakes are high for USM Algier with qualification to the next round offering an opportunity to continue their title defense. Let's now join our sports desk for more stories in sport. Nigerian athlete Akiro Duye Samuel, better known as Coach Dre, took on a remarkable challenge on Saturday morning, March 30th, 2024. He swam the entire 11.8 kilometers across the Lagos Third Milan Bridge to raise awareness about mental health. Coach Dre, CEO of Ocean 28 Swimming Academy, embarked on the impressive feat from Oro Shoki on the mainland to Adeniji at Dinli on the island. The professional swimmer completed the journey in a commendable time of 2 hours and 33 minutes, with his friends and colleagues cheering him on throughout the way. Coach Dre affirmed his 10-year career as a swimmer could help him do anything and become anything. He added that taking care of mental health is so important that when life throws curveballs, there's support available. The defending champions of the Lewis Edem Invitational Basketball Championship, Rivers Hoopers, have arrived in Lagos for the third edition of the tournament. Having clinched the 2023 Nigerian Premier Basketball League title, Rivers Hoopers find themselves in a challenging group alongside Ebun Comets, Hoops and Reed, Quara Falcons and the Braves of Ghana. In the previous edition, the King's men emerged victorious with a dominant 74-56 triumph over the Spintex Knights of Ghana, and they are now aiming for consecutive titles. Additionally, Rivers Hoopers view the Lewis Edem tournament as a vital opportunity to prepare for Season 4 of the Basketball African League, underscoring their commitment to maintaining their competitive edge on the continental stage. Jürgen Klopp's Red Army is hell-bent on making sure that the German football legend ends his tenure at Merseyside with a major trophy as they overcame a 1-0 deficit against Brighton to keep their title hopes alive. Despite being the second-best defensive side in the EPL, Liverpool conceded a goal in the second minute after a clearance by Virgil van Dijk felt perfectly for Danny Welbeck to fire in a volley that gave Brighton the lead at Anfield. However, as they have done in previous games this season, the 2024 Carabao Cup champions came from behind to defeat the Seagulls. Luis Diaz equalized in the first half while Liverpool's top scorer, Mo Salah, netted his 22nd goal of the season in all competitions. The win puts Liverpool on top of the Premier League table with 67 points ahead of Arsenal and Manchester City. Fashion and arts enthusiasts in Nigeria have called on the government to invest in the fashion and arts subsector, saying it can help solve Nigeria's unemployment challenges. They say the sector has the potential to help Nigeria and the much needed foreign exchange generate revenue for the country and make the youth more productive. Here's Amadinui with more. In attendance, we have fashion and arts enthusiasts, entrepreneurs, designers and makers of African crafts. We are the creative industry. We believe that over 70 percent in the continent and even the country is of youth within the ages of 12 to 35 years. So this is the age bracket for creativity. So this summit is for us to converge in one space. Both the creatives, the emerging fashion and art entrepreneurs, successful business owners in the private sector, the public sector leaders. We need to hear from the mouth of authority. We need to hear from the mouth of people who lead the creative industry. Participants at the summit say the African fashion and art subsector remains untapped, and through investment from government can live up to its potentials. They say through collaboration, creatives, including fashion and arts lovers, can become a force for good in the country. Together we can create a vibrant ecosystem that fosters creativity promotes sustainability and drives economic growth across the continent. Today, we invite you to join us 
in this remarkable journey. Together, let us celebrate the richness and diversity of African fashion and art. The, the movie industry is generating over $600 million. You know, not talk about the comedy, not talk about the music, Afro is getting popularity uh, across the continent. And I, I bet you this is one thing uh, I always look at, the government should invest in things like this that not only promotes young people, but brings about productivity. Experts here are saying that investment in the fashion and art subsector can help Nigeria harness available potential and solve the nation's unemployment challenge. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. And that's all at this hour. Before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories tonight. Reporting news that Christians across the globe have celebrated Easter and mean calls for hope and unity. Fires left about two dead and 2,000 homeless in South Africa. Somalia's Puntland has shunned federal institutions in that country over a vote reform. We'd like to hear from you. Please send us your eyewitness reports. You can use the WhatsApp number and email address showing on your screen. Also, social media, we're at New Central Television. Give us a photo on the major platforms. And you can watch us live on any of these channels or platforms. Many thanks for your time tonight. My name is Kofi Bartels. Have a lovely Easter. Nations in the Caribbean are saying now is the time for King Charles III of the British royal family to say sorry for his ancestral involvement in the slave trade. Campaigners are demanding the king apologise and make reparations this year. Their calls are echoed by aristocratic families who have made public apologies for their historic ownership of enslaved people. In recent years, the reparations movement in the Caribbean has grown strength, led by the CARICOM Reparations Commission, made up of 20 member nations and states. Senior royals haven't stayed silent about slavery, but they have stopped short of saying sorry. In 2023, the king told Commonwealth leaders, I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. So should slavery be something that the king offers an apology on? Well, the calls for an apology uh, from the king are getting louder and louder and they're not going to go away. In fact, every time uh, that he sets foot in a Commonwealth country, in a former colony, uh, those questions are being asked and they're being asked louder and louder. It's not something that he can ignore, nor do I think the king wants to ignore this. I think we've seen a shift from the late queen to the approach of King Charles III. He has given his support to a research project which is uh, co-sponsored by historic royal palaces into the British monarchy's links to the transatlantic slave trade. He has expressed his profound sorrow. He's talked about the appalling atrocities uh, of uh, Britain's past and of uh, the links with slavery, but he has stopped short of saying sorry. Why is that? Why is it so hard uh, to say sorry? Well, as the king, he does have to toe the government line. And as yet, it's not government policy to apologise. In fact, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's approach is that it's not helpful or constructive to dig up sins of the past. We need to look to the future. What's not clear to me, though, is whether the king will be in a position to make a personal apology on behalf of his ancestors an apology on behalf of the British monarchy and his family that is separate to British government policy. Now, we're seeing other aristocratic families starting to apologise for their links to the slave trade, the Trevelyan family uh, being one of those. We're also seeing other European monarchies addressing this. King Willem-Alexander of the Netherlands uh, leading the way on this. It would be hugely significant 
if the king were to say sorry. The king is supporting research into the crown's connection with the transatlantic slave trade. The links are well documented and the National Archives holds many of the records which shows how the monarchy were not only involved in the slave trade but actively investing in it. Charles II helped found the Royal African Company which shipped nearly 200,000 enslaved Africans across the Atlantic. Meanwhile, an independent oversight group says the Church of England's £100 million fund, which was set up to address historic links to slavery, is too small and should be raised to a billion pounds. The funding programme was announced in January last year for investment, research and engagement to address past wrongs. But the independent group says that £100 million is insufficient to encounter the historic and enduring greed, cynicism and hate, while adding the project's nine-year time frame is too long. The group said the church commissioners had embraced a target of a billion pounds for broader healing, repair and justice. While there will be grants for non-profit investments to promote and enhance healthy lives, thriving minds and cultural impact, there will be no cash compensation for individuals or grants to government bodies. This is more than an investment fund. Part of the funding is going into grant funding to provide capacity building and do ecosystem building so that it is clear. You c we may not have every business ready out there to get the funding. There's work that needs to be done. How is that funded? So we, we as the, uh, the oversight group, we designed something which accounts for that. And the third element of the funding is it's, some of it is being used for research. And that research is, again, important because it allows for there to be general truth-telling truth and understanding of how this is working and to be transparent um, with, uh, with everybody, not just... That this could have been a very closed, you know, very closed uh, thing. But it is instead quite uh, open. The intention is open, not just up until now, but going into the future. So the research piece, I think, is an important one. There have been mixed reactions to the news that the Church of England is setting aside such a large amount of money for this cause. Uh, there's been a lot of backlash for this, um, but genuinely... I don't understand why anyone is angry about it because it's their money. This isn't a country, this isn't a state that is saying we're going to use our taxpayers' money to, to hand out reparations. This is essentially a charitable organisation who are saying this is how we're going to use some of our money. And by the way, they have something, they're worth something like £8 billion. So this is a drop in the ocean for them. Just like the Catholic Church, they have many different business interests. They, some of the biggest investment banks in the world... Uh, control their their assets for them and, and make sure that they're continually making money. So if the Church of England, the Church of England did profit from slavery, it absolutely did. If they feel morally that they want to now make a difference and hand out reparations, then they should do that. The Church Commissioners will disperse the £100 million over five years, rather than nine as originally planned. Both the commissioners and the oversight group stressed that they did not want to rush into action, but rather focus on doing it well. Whether King Charles III apologises for slavery or the Church of England manages to raise its £1 billion goal for reparations, it's clear that the time of reckoning on both these issues is now, and only actions, not words, will suffice. Afia Hagen, New Central. Binance Executive Tigran Gambrian sues NSA and EFCC. Down the Sunny offers free education to rescued Kuriga students.
Caution Week A, Sekibo, Secundus, Omehia, others lament as they pledge support for President Tinubu. Well, let's take a glance outside Nigeria. South Africa's Jacob Zuma barred from running in South African elections. Burkina Faso's junta sends anti-jihadist emergency measures. There's a headline, certain other politics HQ, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Nigeria's Electoral Empire, has denied monitoring the National Convention of the Labour Party, Nigeria's Opposition Party. We talked about that last night. Now, we're asking, what does this mean for Julius Abure's re-election as National Chairman of the party? Also tonight, a group of aggrieved candidates of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, in the 2023 general elections in Lagos State has dragged Chief Olabode Judge and other leaders and elders of the party to court over what? Over alleged anti-party activities. Why? We'll try to find out tonight on the program. My name is Kofi Bartels. Politics HQ starts now. Welcome. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, today has come out to say, oh, we didn't monitor Labour Party's conventional. And it's raising questions about the transparency and oversight of uh, the party's internal processes. Um, the absence of officials of the Independent National Electoral Commission uh, to monitor the Labour Party's national convention yesterday is now raising eyebrows among political observers who view such an oversight by the electoral umpire as essential for ensuring the fairness and credibility of internal party elections. Questions have been raised about the reasons behind INEC's decision not to monitor the convention. We'll try to find that out. But yesterday on Politics HQ, the suspended national treasurer of the party, Olucha Para, revealed right here on Politics HQ that she had written to the Independent National Electoral Commission asking them not to monitor the convention, citing non-adherence to the parties or by the party's leadership uh, to the electoral laws guiding the change of venue for such elections. Well, the build-up to the Labour Party's convention and uh, the convention itself has been a matter of serious contention between Julius Saburo, the national chairman of Labour Party, on one hand. And the Nigeria Labour Congress, and indeed the Labour Party's National Assembly Caucus, on the other hand. The NLP, sorry, the NLC, uh, wanted the convention postponed until Abure stepped down. Um, yesterday, there was no, no media coverage of the election in the press or even on social media until the results were announced. The reports say journalists were prevented from accessing the venue. Well, a lot has happened between then and now tonight. Joining us, we have a comrade, Benson Opa. He's the head of information at the Nigeria Labour Congress. He joins us via video link from Abuja. And of course, Monday Mawa, a lawyer. Uh, gentlemen, good to have you on the program tonight. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, um, let's start with Mr. Benson Opa. Um, what, in the, what is the NLC's position? on the convention organized yesterday it is an illegality or, or let me put it this way it was and and it stands an illegality an act in nullity an act that has no basis in law has no basis in in their code of uh, conduct of politics and immorality Okay. Uh, why, in your opinion, Benson or Party, did uh, INEC decide not to monitor the Labour Party's convention? Why, why I think INEC did he monitor the, the convention? Yeah. Is that a question? Yes. Okay, fine. Well, um, yeah, whatever anybody might say or think of INEC, on the score of obeying court decisions, INEC has been excellent. And um, there is a subsisting 
consent judgment that prescribes the following, that there should be an all-inclusive convention, expansive all-inclusive convention. If I let me read directly from, from the consent, from the text of the consent judgment, amongst the major uh, items are that that the political party, that the Labour Party, though not a trade union, is an institutional political party founded, promoted, and registered by the Nigerian Labour Congress on behalf of Nigerian workers. Two, that parties agree to convene an expansive and inclusive national convention of the party as stipulated by the party's constitution. Three, that the defendants are hereby discharged from all claims or further claims or liabilities. Five, that this term of settlement shall be irrevocably binding on the claimants and defendants therein. So all that Abure has tried to do or has done is in violation of the, of the, of the terms of this uh, consent uh, um, judgment. And of course, INEC as a law-abiding uh, institution organization will not want to be identified with this kind of process. It was a charade. All so right. INEC did the right thing. I, so INEC did. So in effect, INEC did the right thing by not being part of this process. Of course, it should not be seen dignifying such illegalities uh, and impunities. It should not, and it has not. Okay, uh, Monday, Mawa, uh, over to you. The, um, the spokesperson of Media Aid to the INEC chairman, this is uh, 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 Rotimo Yekami, uh, has not, you know, who responded to media inquiries um, by the news agency of Nigeria. He did not really give specific reasons why INEC did not uh, monitor that elections as opposed to what we used to see uh, in elections of uh, party uh, conventions in Nigeria. Uh, um, what do you think is responsible for INEC, uh, you know, absence from that convention? Monday? Well, uh, I actually expected the the INEC person you mentioned earlier to have uh, told the world or uh, informed everybody the reason why they did not turn up for that uh, uh, purported convention. I think I will use the purported convention as a lawyer in that. If you look at, if you follow the sequence of that uh, planning of for that convention, initially, I think the date was was the venue rather was to be in Lagos. Thereafter, we heard it was moved from Lagos to Edo State. Thereafter, we learned from Edo State to Abia State. Then the last one, we suddenly heard also that it had been moved to Anambra, in Newi in Anambra State. Now don't forget, by the I think section 82 of the Electoral Act, which provides that every Every convention or meeting of the party, when we meet, now we're talking at something like convention primary of the party, that INEC must be given not less than 21 days notice to it. Now, the initial date of the, the, the purported convention was for 29th of March. Then later it was changed to 27. The, then we're not looking at the venue. I will tell you for free that I neck them say we are not even sure of the venue in which the said convention was to take place. So where do you expect them to go and monitor it? So to my mind, what I feel was responsible for INEC not going there. I'm not uh, without a uh, prejudice or without uh, contradicting what uh, the earlier uh, man said. I think one of the major reasons that account for why INEC would not even go there was because I neck them say they were confused as to which venue they were going to hold the convention. So I cannot move to Lagos today because you don't just expect them to just, they have to go overnight and then stay over. If it's going to be Lagos, I now, they have to move to Lagos, stay over, and then the next day to observe what is uh, to what is going on or what they are doing. But you move from Lagos to Edo, Edo to Abia. Abia, you are now saying Newi. So even before that day of the the, 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 the before yesterday, I think the day before yesterday, when they eventually had the convention, nobody.
nobody was this sure of the value of it. So oh. there was no one there could have been there. So I think that is my uh, my, my 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 little reason. Perhaps I might be wrong until INEC themselves are able to come up, INEC officials rather are able to come up to tell us or tell the world the reason why they did not attend. But that is my own opinion. Okay, why Monday, Monday the, yeah, the, the, the party initially stated that convention to hold on on 29th of March. Uh, but the date was brought forward to 27th of March, and uh, the, le the leadership of the party gave a reason, uh, saying that that 29th yeah. of March was Good Friday, so it wasn't uh, uh, a favorable day for it to hold its convention because of the importance uh, to Christians around the world. Monday? Yes. Yes. But <laughs> that's why I told you, I said beyond the date. But the next question is the venue. Mr. Kofi, if somebody informed you that, oh, I'm going to hold a, a, a program in Abuja on the 27th. Five days thereafter, he informed you again, I'm sorry, Kofi, I'm moving that program to Port Harcourt. Then, three days to that program, he also wrote a letter to you again, Mr. Kofi, sorry, I'm moving it, to, I'm moving it to Sokoto. Then, 48 hours to the program, another information got you that, sorry, I'm not going to Calab I'm going to Calabar. Will you be certain of going to that kind of program? So beyond the date, the venue is also very, very important and paramount. So why the change? Convention is one of the most important that calendar program of every political party because they mark the epoch change uh, period when leadership of the party has changed from one to the other. So it's not a child play. It's not for fun. It's a serious business. Mm. Okay. So the way it for to the whole world, as if we're just doing this kindergarten uh, program. Mm. So Kofi, nobody could have reasonably be expected to have attended. I would have been shocked if I never could have, if I never had attended that program. To be sincere with you. Okay. Um, um, uh, I'll come back to you Monday on that. But uh, I want to go back to Benson Opa Benson. Um, the, the Electoral Act does not, and even the guidelines for the conduct of a, does not in any way um, deny parties, political parties, the, the right to change venues as they wish. It only stipulates the uh, mode of informing INEC about the change of venue. And the National Legal Advisor of uh, Labour Party, Ken Deidu, stated that um, the party duly informed INEC about the change in venue. Benson? Answer your question. I did say that INEC has a record of obeying court decisions. Okay? And we have a subsistent court decisions since 2018. And even in 2022, we have a document here. Um, on the 20, on the 21st, oh, sorry, please, we have a document here. This term of settlement is made this 27th day of June 2022 between the Nigerian Labour Congress on the on the one part and Labour Party on the other. Yeah, but, but, but Mr. 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 Opa, is, is this... Wait, is just this... a moment. Okay, all right. Just we, a moment. Yeah, you read you it already. You question, and you, 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 you should let me uh, we, we don't you. have all day. Okay, please, I'll I, give you a, I, a, 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 a 30 seconds to just go through it. Thank you. No, don't hush me up. If you wanted answers, you should allow me to. I mean, to give you the answers. We don't have all, all the time, I mean, sir. Documents. I'm sure you can understand. The, the, the next time, don't invite me. Okay? We, we will invite you. I please go. But please, we're, we're pleading with you, Mr. Opa. Yes, we're, we're just pleading with you no. to abridge it. That's we're just pleading with you to abridge it. No. I'm sure you can understand. We have a document here by INEC Brokard Peace. In, in furtherance of the consent judgment. So INEC has been in the know of what has been going on. INEC has been in the know that uh, Abure and his uh, cohorts have been acting in breach of, uh, of, the, of the consent judgment, okay? And apart from that, everybody knows, everybody knows the rules that 
the convention is the last major act that before you do convention, you do what Congress is, you do state Congress. If not, where are your delegates coming from? But, but, but then consistent with the character of Abure, he chose to do the last most important thing first. And you can see even the members of the media were kept out of the show. But I want to tell you, even when uh, electing a pope in the conclave, I mean, the media do have access uh, to, to, the, to the papal ground. In this case, I mean, the media people were not even allowed to the com allowed in the co I mean, convention ground. Okay. It tells you, it tells you the, okay. it tells you the intent. All right. Yes. I All mean, right. I mean, yeah. Okay, uh, Benson. Uh, thank you. I mean, thank I mean, you. Let I mean, me allow I mean, Monday. I mean, the uh, intention. I mean, yes. I mean, I mean, the intention yes. and the act itself are ben perfectly Opa. faulty. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Monday Mawa. You've listened to him. Um, would you agree that um, that maybe will be the major reason why Anik didn't monitor the the primary, um, that by that concerned judgment, um, Anik is aware that maybe Labour Party belongs to NLC and they have the right to dictate or to direct uh, or to organize how things like a convention and others will go, which they've tried to do and Abue has resisted them. Monday. Well, again, like I said earlier, I would do want to act like a spokesperson. No, no, I'm asking Anik. for your view. You, you're also a lawyer view, as well, so yeah. My view, my view is that I would do. Well, it's possible that that was the reason they did not attend. That they have the consent judgment, which, like he rightly mentioned, that they broke up is between INEC, uh, NLC and the Labour Party. But the point is this: I think another thing we must be looking at is this: the absence of INEC in a convention. Does it really affect the validity or the wise of the convention? In my view, once INEC is informed of the intention of the party to carry out convention, who have validly given them the time, the, the, the required time frame, whether INEC now decide to attend or not, well, it's at their discretion. With the greater respect, it does not actually confer or derogate from the validity of the activities. That point needs to be made clear. Are you, are you saying that if INEC monitors or doesn't monitor an election, it does not affect the validity no. of the party convention? No, it does not. What is important is the valid notice given to them. Once the Supreme Court had criteria of authority that once INEC had been involved, informed of the pendency of an activities of a party like convention or primary election, once INEC gets that notice and they refused on their own to come, it does not vitiate the process itself. What vitiates the process itself is the failure to give the statutory notice to INEC. All right. So the point is this. I'm not trying, I'm only trying to get guide us now that oh the absence of INEC in any convention or, or primary, go and check the case of Fabio. Go and check the case of Lawa, I mean former uh, president of the Senate. So the presence of INEC is all is merely an observatory duty. Okay, but, but, but Monday, Monday, um, um, the, the, the point being made by Benson Opa, and I heard him clear, he took the time to read some, some you know, except of, of that court, um, that consent uh, judgment or agreement, uh, whichever it is, that INEC knows who owns Labour Party. And they've been following the, the, the developments, and therefore, they, they won't come to an event organized that was they don't involve the NLC. That's what he's saying. And um, so I'm, the, I'm, I'm, yeah, so so who owns the NL the, the Labour Party? Who is who owns the party? A party generally belongs to its members, which comprises both the NLC members and all that. Because its point is this: can can can, you, can, can the LLP organize its con its convention the without the 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 the, the NLC? You know, being in charge, for instance. I didn't get that. Can the LP organize its convention or any activity of such nature without the NLC being involved and no. actually even directing affairs as the, the owners of the party? Well, I don't want to look at it from the perspective of an ownership, but I want to look at it from the perspective of stakeholders. Now, by virtue of the consent judgment that the... Uh, Mr. Benson read out earlier on. Of course, I, I don't think I've seen it physically, but I think I've heard about it. The point remains that from that judgment, see that there is no other contrary judgment 
the duty of Labour Party in organizing its convention, the, it must, as a matter of necessity, carry along the NLC, who are equally stakeholders in the project called Labour Party. So, but I, because I do not want to look at it from the point of view of ownership, but the point is they are stakeholders and they ought to be carried does, along. Does the, so does, does the, does the, okay. Beyond the, beyond the yeah. NLC, yeah. I've already deprived the media people from being participants in this whole thing. The, 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 the Peter Obi, what, I, I think, I, I don't know whether they informed him or not, but it was obviously absent. But that does not mean that he's absent, vitiated. Peter Obi present or absent does, does not add anything to any convention. But it is necessary also as a stakeholder that is carried along, just like the, the, the members of the National House of Assembly and State Houses of Assembly ought to also be carried along. Not because they are the owner, but because they are equally stakeholders in the, the, the in Labour Party. So my position is that, in view of that consent judgment, I ought, as a matter of necessity, he ought to have carried along the okay. Nigerian Labour Party. I want, I want to come back to Benson Opa. Thank you, Monday. Uh, uh, Benson Opa, um, so would you agree uh, that um, uh, by virtue of that consent judgment, um, NLC... Uh, uh, stakeholders, merely stakeholders, not the the owners of the party. Well, um, the matter speaks for itself. Res ipso loquito. My my colleague speaking with you knows the truth. Um, we cannot at this point in time begin to change the language of the court. That will be acting in contempt of the court. But let me actually take him to. Let me take him to uh, uh, Section 15, Part 1 of the third schedule of the 1999 Constitution as amended, and Section 2 of the Electoral Act 2010 as amended. I'm going to look at uh, the third item as per the role of INEC. It states, monitor the organization and operation of the political parties, including their finances, conventions, congresses, and party primaries. Okay? So I do not understand uh, uh, the reason why he wants to downplay the, I mean, the role uh, of INEC in, in the internal and external uh, a governance of political parties. Their finances, even their finances. INEC can uh, poke its nose into the finances of parties. So if INEC has that statutory role, I do not know, I do not understand why he thinks it is, it will be irrelevant if INEC uh, fails to show uh, his face at a convention. I, uh, yeah, with all due respect to him, I would want to hold a contrary view. I would want to hold the view that, that the presence of INEC is very, very important. It is key, and there is no substitute to that. Okay. So, all right. But, but, but then, thank you. But then, but, thank you. But then, most importantly, I, I, I stand by the decision of the court. Okay. I mean, so you've also, you've also said that any... Um, uh, uh, description to the contrary to what the court has said that you, you know uh, I don't see how the owners of the party you're saying it's a contempt of, yes. of court well we'll be back after this break so Monday market tell us if he agrees that he's in contempt of a court uh, uh, a decision stay with us we'll be right back Welcome back. You're still watching uh, Politics HQ right here on New Central Television. I'm Kofi Bartel. Still looking at um, the aftermath of the Labour Party's um, uh, controversial national convention held yesterday at Newi, the in uh, Anambra State. We here, I mean, there was no media coverage, so we hear that Julius Aburi emerged uh, as re-elected national chairman of the party, along with uh, a plethora of other persons uh, who 
uh, were announced as uh, newly elected uh, uh, members of the National Working Committee of uh, the party. I guess tonight we have um, a representative of the Nigeria uh, Labour Congress, and I'm talking about um, the National um, Head of Information of, of I almost said INEC, the NLC, um, Comrade Benson Opa, uh, joining us from Abuja, and of course, we also have Monday Mawa, who joins us via Zoom. He's a legal practitioner. And Monday, um, do you agree that the, the view you, views you held um, uh, may be in contempt of court, describing NLC as mere partners <laughs> in, in Labour Party, or stakeholders, rather? Well, I, I, will, I merely express my opinion with regard to my understanding about what is contained in what he read out. The point, the point must be made. I think Mr. Bensi seems to be getting me a bit uh, wrong. The, you see, he had just read the provision of the Constitution that talks about the duty of INEC as to monitor. Is there a difference between monitoring and also participating? The Supreme Court has given pictures of judgment and, and in interpreting the roles of INEC. And like said, I cited some of the, the Supreme Court decision earlier on, case of Akpabio. Now, what happened in Akpabio? I know we don't have time. Akpabio did a primary in which they invited INEC to come and monitor it. INEC said, no, they are not going to monitor it because they have earlier monitored another primary. And they, they were, the party was dissatisfied. They went to court. And the court said, well, INEC, once you have been notified of, a, of, of the intention of the party to conduct primary, your decision to come and not to come is now discretionary. So your not coming cannot not affect the validity of the primary. And so the same thing goes for convention. Please, I want to put it on record. I'm not by any way trying to give credibility to the convention that probably took place or held by Aburi and his group. But the point is that there is a need for us to be, be informed of the law as it is today. Now, the role of INEC has been whittled down or has been interpreted by the Supreme Court to mean to merely observe not to participate. So whether they now decide to come or not, the court, the Supreme, I'm not talking about Court of Appeal, I'm not talking about the High Court, I'm talking about the APS Court in Nigeria. The Supreme Court has, you can quote me anywhere, the Supreme Court has now said, their duty is merely observatory. So they are, whether they attend or not, as long, what is fundamental by virtual section 82 of the Electoral Act is for you to give the notice the statutory notice to INEC, one that has been complied with. So INEC, whether they come or not, does not confine anything or whatever has been done. That is that. Then back to that of the Labour Party, uh, NLC. Like I said earlier on, you see, Labour Party is not just, the, the membership of Labour Party is not just that of the NLC. There are other persons that are not part of NLC that are members of the Labour Party. So the point I made earlier on was that, which I also I wish to also restate, is that when you say somebody is a stakeholder, in other words, if today there is a convention going on and you, you, you are unable to inform me, Monday Mawa, I don't think there is anything going to happen to that convention. But in view of that judgment, Labour Party has a duty, a legal duty, and a binding duty at that to carry along the NLC. Would you say, would you say the NLC were, were carried along by Labour Party, following up on what you said? You said what? Would I you say the that. NLC were carried along by a Labour Party? Well, I think from what they have stated, I doubt if they were carried along because we have had the NLC coming up to the public uh, uh, space to say, well, let this plan convention be okay. a little bit. Monday, so, sorry to interrupt you, Monday. I'm so sorry. So I, I'm so sorry. Meeting. Yeah, I'm because of time. Let me just I, you ask you a quick question. Um, I want to, you're a lawyer, so you can help us maybe explain this section. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Opa, you also have the uh, Electoral Act by, with you, I'm sure, because you quoted it. Um, section 77 of the Electoral Act, you know, provides that a political party, Monday, uh, once registered, yes. has a life of its own, and it's, it's only regulated by the party's constitution. Is this something... Uh, that, that, that maybe may be a work in favor of um, the Labour Party and the officials were saying, try to, you know, stand on their own and not to be, you know, under NLC. I entirely agree with that interpretation. You see, once a, 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 a body had been registered under the corporate 
under the CAC, the, it assume a separate status of its own. It become a legal personality with its own life, a separate life from that of its members. But don't forget, the activities of that organization or that corporate entity still needs to be supervised or oversee by the instrumentality of its members. Now, yes, once a, 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 in the case of PDP and Uzibos, the Supreme Court said the members of a party are bound by the content of their constitution. However, there is now a judgment of the court of which Mr. Bessie read out earlier on. Now, until that judgment is set aside, the content of that judgment must be given, must, must, be, must be complied with to the letter. Okay. After All right. What Thank that you very much. Did, the judgment was not in this derogate from the Labour Party Commission, but rather All it right. was trying to see how they can have an Okay. Th thank you, Monday. Thank you, Monday. Uh, uh, Mr. Opa, what, what's your reaction to what uh, Monday has just said, sir? Well, he has uh, spoken eloquently well. Uh, he's entitled to his views, just as I'm entitled to mine. Uh, he did say something about uh, uh, an organization having a life of its own. That is quite true, but I also want to remind him of the doctrine of lifting the veil or parting the veil. Uh, but of course, we know the circumstances that uh, uh, do uh, and necessitate uh, the operation of uh, parting the veil and all of that. But then, we should not even reduce this matter to the level of uh, splitting, splitting the hair. The matter clearly speaks for itself. Has Abure acted in contempt of the consent? Has, has he acted in contempt of the court decision of the court of the consent judgment? The answer is, is a, is a clear yes. Then to stretch it further. Who were the stakeholders at the so-called convention? The caucus of the party were not there. House of Reps, Nigerian Labour Congress was not there. Other, other stakeholders were not there. So who and who were at that convention? As I stated earlier on, Yeah, but, 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 but uh, Modi Bawa says their yeah, presence or not so, does not vitiate um, uh, the convention, Benson. No, I, I mean, I mean that I mean that the presence of stakeholders, or, or the, I mean the, that the presence or absence of stakeholders uh, does not uh, officiate a convention. Yes. How, how can you? I mean, how can you? How can you have? I mean, how can you hold a convention without people? Okay. A convention is about people. That is why it's called a convention. Convene convention. Okay. How can you? How can you just go? You. I mean, you lock yourself up. In, in, a, in a boot and say, this is, this is it, this is that. Do you call that a convention? All right. A convention has to, meet with, has to meet with all the statutory requirements. And in any case, I did tell you from the beginning, I said that there must be delegates to a convention and that you have to yes. hold congresses, what congresses, blah, 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 blah. If, how do you pick your delegates? Or do you just say, okay, you are the one who's going to be a delegate? All, all right. Uh, ben Sinopa, we, we have I, to go. I think, uh, Monday, I, I don't know if you've changed so, your mind that the president's absence of the likes of will be another six no, does, does I, I, not I affect. didn't, I didn't change we, my mind. The we, point I was making is, I was met, I'm talking about Peter Obi. Yeah. Now, if he's informed and he refuses to come, it does not be shared the Congress. I, I, I'm aware that I, the even, the NLC, even the NLC was informed as well. They were aware. I'm sure Mr. Opa would agree that they were aware you know, of the convention. So if they were aware and they NLC didn't go, was not informed. Does, does it affect N the convention NLC was Monday? Not and, and, and NLC was not informed. Well, the Let party says they informed you, Mr. Opa. They said they informed you. They did not inform NLC. I, 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 mean, I want to tell you that Abure was with the president of NLC if uh, like today and the next day and the next day we read in the papers that, I mean, that was good. Well, to be at least you heard about it in the papers. No, in the papers. That is not. Oh, the, that is not the notice we are talking proper, about. Uh, then we have to go. Uh, look, 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 my friend. Look, 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 look. I tell you something. There should be proper c communication. Okay. Don't go that way. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Benson Opa, Monday, yes. uh, Mawa. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. We appreciate you joining us tonight. All right. We'll look at uh, developments in Lagos PDP. Where we come back. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The political terrain in Lagos State has been rocked by a lawsuit by candidates of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, against prominent leaders of the party in Lagos State, including uh, Chief Bode George. Uh, the candidates uh, allege anti-party activities, and this has sparked a contentious legal battle within the party. Um, also, let's uh, remind you that uh, in a surprising turn of events, a group of aggrieved candidates, uh, 24 of them in the PDP in Lagos, these were candidates in the 2023 elections, cited the allegations of other parties' uh, activities and took uh, the aforementioned persons, the likes of um, uh, Kerry Lee, Bukno, Kerry Lee, Edward A. George, amongst other members, um, both of the Board of Trustees of the party and the leadership, the elders, to court. Um, so those named in the lawsuit are Bode George, is a prominent leader of the PDP. We had him right here in the studio a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this lawsuit was filed at a federal high court in Lagos, as I said earlier, 24 aggrieved PDP candidates. Now, they're led by the man on your screen, Shegun Adewale. He is a former senatorial candidate for Lagos West Senatorial District in Lagos State. He's popularly known as Aeroland, um, and this is the latest in the internal strife within the party uh, in Lagos. Now, Adewale is not alone. Adewale's political ally, Abdulaziz Adediro, also known as Jando, recently uh, said in a public speech he gave that some prominent stakeholders in the Lagos chapter of the party were no longer in the party and that he is the new leader of the PDP in Lagos State. And this elicited reaction from some, including Olabode George, um, who is a presumed leader of the PDP in Lagos State. Also, let's remind you that last week, the Forum of PDP local government chairman in Lagos State urged the national leadership of the party to probe Jando uh, over what they alleged to be uh, the diversion of funds um, during the elections last year. They also lampooned Erolan, the man you see on your screen, describing him as a burden to the People's Democratic Party since joining the party in the year 2010. That's about 14 years ago. He's a former chairman of the PDP in Lagos State, by the way. Well, one of those um, litigants uh, is uh, Tunde Pratt. He is um, uh, of the PDP in Lagos State. Um, he's an aspirant for the uh, Lagos State House of Assembly seat in mainland constituency 2, that's state constituency. Uh, he joins us via video link from Lake Lagos. Uh, Mr. Pratt, good evening to you. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Good evening, Kofi. Thank you for having me. Uh, you, you, you're one of the people whose name or who have approached the court. Um, what specific anti-party activities are you, the likes of Erland and other aggrieved uh, candidates of the party alleging against Bode George and other leaders of the party? Okay, um, first of all, um, I think I think probably just need to set the scene just a little bit because, you know, to give people a bigger, wider context of what, you know, what we are discussing. First of all, um, just a bit of clarification. Um, you mentioned aggrieved um, members of the PDP. Rather, I would say we are asking for clarifications rather than agree, because aggrieved, you know, it's a kind of like, you know, um, um, you know, it, it's as if it's a it, it's a dispute of, of, of physical dispute. So, you know, we are seeking clarification from the court, which I will come to in a minute. So and also um, just to mention that, that there are two legs or two limbs to the case. It's not just the anti-party allegations that we should be focusing on. Um, there is also the issue that um, we are also seeking clarification from the court with regards to what sponsorship means when you have a candidate that's running for election under a party. So to your question specifically, um, the, um, what we are asking the courts to clarify, um, bearing in mind you know, the, the papers are before the court, so we have to be mindful of what specifics yeah, um, yeah, I give yeah. to you we today. We don't want the information. In so some, yeah. Correct. In summary, what we are asking the court to clarify, as I said, is to determine the, uh, to give us a definition of what sponsorship means, because we are bona fide candidates of the election that's just gone through, and we felt that certain activities that occurred during the, um, um, the campaigns and also during the elections, we didn't feel that the, the, leadership in Lagos State sponsored us uh, or supported us. And also when it comes to anti-party as well, you know, as the uh, as the papers were filed yesterday, there, was, there, there are allegations that um, we, 
that some members of the PDP informed other people within the PDP to vote other candidates. So, so you're asking for clarification about our sponsorship? Um, uh, what, 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 what are you asking about this for? I mean, are you not aware of what sponsorship means? I want you to just help us understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great question. And, and exactly, you know, that's why we're here. We need to deepen our democracy because, you know, we need to understand what, you know, this terminology is. So my definition of sponsorship, uh, or rather our definition of sponsorship, was that once we were the duly nominated candidates of the PDP in Lagos State, our expectations were that the uh, party hierarchy um, within Lagos State, who by, you know, by all accounts have conducted, you know, elections over maybe you know the last 20 years or so during this dispensation of democracy they've got the experience they've got the wherewithal they can you know take us through what we need you know to have constituted in terms of you know our election campaign the sort of messaging we should be given to our uh, you know constituencies and you know in if even in the simple terms, you know, merchandise for us to be able to, you know, give out when we go for campaigns. Because when we run for campaign, don't forget on election day, um, my name is not on the ballot box. I am representing the PDP. So during the course of the election campaign and also during voting, we didn't feel the presence. Uh, as I sit before you right now, uh, there was never once that I had any text message, any phone calls, or any meetings with the party hierarchy in Lagos State. They've okay. conducted elections several times, you know, in the last 20 years, you know, some of us haven't. So we were leveraging on their expertise to guide us through because we were representing the party. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we never set eyes on them. They never called us. They never sent us a text message. So, you know, that's why we're trying to seek clarification. What, what are the prayers? You know, what, what are the exactly? prayers? Yes, Sunil, but because of time, just quickly, what are the prayers yes. in, in this suit? Okay, so the prayers one um, is that uh, we need clarification whether or not you know we should have been sponsored the way we felt that we sponsored. Otherwise, if that had not been met, or the you know uh, you know to clarify whether there was a contract, either social or you know a legal contract, then we are asking the court to um, to compel the leadership of Lagos PDP to um, to to. Uh, to give us some kind of compensation, we're seeking damages because you know we we felt we had a contract with them and that their part was not fulfilled. And then secondly, in terms of the allegations that certain members of the state hierarchy also, you know, were asking other people within our party not to vote to us, we also needed we also need the court to clarify that and also um, you know to tell us exactly how the party should actually be handling that. Okay, so this is a lawsuit seeking damages uh, because you feel that uh, the leadership of the party in the state did not support you during the election, rather they supported uh, candidates of other parties? In a nutshell, yes. So if, if the court rules, the Federal High Court in Lagos rules in your favor, who are those who will be paying, or who are, who are those listed, let me say, as uh, defendants? Okay, so um, I'm sure you've probably seen um, the court papers that was um, written, uh, that was circulated yesterday through the, throughout the media. Uh, but theoretically, it should be the Lagos State PDP hierarchy, the hierarchy within Lagos State PDP. Okay, rather and than do we have um, the likes yeah. of Bode, George Funko, uh, uh, Bucknor, and all those members of uh, uh, the party's board of trustees in Lagos State? Are they listed? Well, again, yes, they are listed, okay. but like I said, we are asking the court to clarify who exactly should be in the position to sponsor us and also support us. All right. Um, I, I'm aware, just very briefly, that the PDP has um, in its constitution, a copy of which I have here, um, uh, uh, modus operandi for um, disciplinary procedures in the party. We check Chapter 10 uh, of the PDP constitution. Um, there are disciplinary procedures in the party... Um, we have offenses and sanctions. Basically, um, it seems the party has, uh, in this constitution, an internal mechanism to address any grievance. Uh, have you explored the internal mechanism of the party as contained in Chapter 10 of the constitution of the PDP to resolve this issue before approaching the court? Yes, we have. So um, at the press conference given yesterday, uh, Dikin Adewale did mention that, uh, that after the elections, um, we wrote to the state chapter seeking clarification as to how, you know, um, these allegations that, we, that, that we've heard 
We've also, you know, reached out via our personal contacts. But, you know, we haven't had a meeting. Just today, one of the leaders was having a conversation with me. And, you know, and you know, he asked me the same thing. I said, I've never been invited to any meeting with PDP hierarchy in Lagos State before. You know, so obviously it just means that we were, you know, left out into cold and we would like them to take responsibility for our losses. All right. Did you write to the National Working Committee? So the National Working Committee was not written to uh, because first and foremost, we have to go through our state chapter and then the National right. Com Working Committee would also get involved. So this lawsuit also lists them as def co-defendants as well. So I suppose there'll be an opportunity for right. these questions that you're asking to come to the fore. Okay, we'll have some more on this later. I'll probably have you back on the program. Uh, Tony Pratt uh, of the People's Democratic Party has spoken for Lagos Mainland uh, Constituency 2. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And that's the size of our package tonight to see what happens and how things pan out with the PDP uh, in Lagos State. But all is not well with the party. My name is Kofi Bartels. Good night. With the diverse challenges and occurrences going on in the world today, there are still stories that lift our spirit up, filling us with courage and enough encouragement to overcome all the loud and silent battles we have to face each day. Meet Zion Oke, a four-year-old warrior living with cerebral palsy. He was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at only three months old. This medical condition went on to affect his sight, speech, and even his ability to walk, therefore making him totally dependent from age three months till date. But amidst all of this, the rare and completing love of a mother has withstood this long test of time and has not been found missing. One can only wonder how much despair goes through the mind of Mrs. Lolade Oke every day, especially as she watches other children do the things she so longs to see her own baby do. After he um, diagnosed him with cerebral palsy, I remember I carried him and went to a corner at um, I sat at the corner and then I wept. People were looking at me like, what's wrong with this one? I wept and I called my husband. My husband is someone that doesn't really, doesn't really um, show emotions like that. I expected that when I, when I called him, I was crying. He used to cry now. <laughs> but it was just like, I should just calm down. Like, everything will be fine. And then I called my elder brother because he is a nurse. So I called him and I explained to him. I, I remember he, he, he just went silent on the phone. He didn't say anything for a long time. And then it was just like, I should just take my bag and go home. That we'll see at home. I'm not moved. I'm, I'm, I'm... I hardly react to things, so people, I can react to things, but you don't see that reaction. So people always even complain that you, you don't see the kind of reaction they're expecting. You don't get it. So I have this calm man that just takes things in, just take it in. So my first instinct or my first um, um, reaction based on my natural instinct when I got that news for, from, of, of Zion, um, I have to undo this. Cerebral palsy is a medical condition. Uh, it is not sickness. It is not. Um, it's just a disability. 
and uh, cerebral has to do with the brain and palsy has to do with the muscle. So it's a result of an accident uh, that happened at the part of an infant's brain, just part of the brain, and majorly the motor, the, the part that controls the motor, so that's the part that controls your ability to move your hands, to sit to hold up your neck. So which is why it affects uh, balance, muscle, and posture. So, and it's a permanent condition. Uh, medically, it says to be a, a, a non-progressive condition. It, it is a lifelong thing. Uh, from a layman's point of view, uh, we, a, a mother will say it is that thing that makes your child not to do those things, those motor things will take for granted. Assuming I knew that that was this was what it entailed, I would have started all of the um, necessary medical requirements like when it was a baby. Because like the six, seven months we wasted at home, doing nothing, not seeing any, uh, any medical personnel, something could have been done. Because we're told to come back like July. If we had been told, okay, at that three months, if we had been told that, okay, start doing some things for him at home, start doing some things, start giving him some um, medicines, some drugs, probably it wouldn't have been um, worse to this um, level. I would say that the awareness has increased from what it was um, 17 years ago or 20 years ago. So there's a lot of awareness. Uh, because, I mean, uh, of course, more people are defeated. Why uh, were we saying there was not awareness? Because first of all, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, we don't have as much educated people as we have now. Internet had not spread as it has spread today. People uh, in the villages everywhere can, if you just suspect something wrong, if you Google it on the, you know, and then you see on the internet, you see, you see what is wrong. And there's a lot of people discussing and talking about it. So I can, I can really say that there is an improved, there's a lot of improvement, you know, in, a, in awareness creation. A lot of people much more aware than what it was in 15, 20 years ago. Cerebral palsy is a neurological disorder that affects the muscle control of a child and the result is different for each victim. For some, they are able to do some more physical activities, while for some others, they are unable to and while other children are able to learn how to do these activities with them, some others are not that fortunate. It all depends on the severity of the condition and the determination of the victim. Zion is such uh, a strong boy, very strong. Sometimes I look at him and I'm like, wow. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how you are just created like this. I have never, okay. I could say just one, but that's not like an emergency like that. I have seen emergencies. I have seen I have seen parents rush down their children to the emergency units. Maybe because maybe um, a seizure that was triggered and all of that. But for Zion, the the, the worst thing you can just um, notice about Zion is maybe he has malaria. This one was sleeping. There are no. Most of them are as, as intelligent as the next person. Once it does not affect their intellect, they can do anything just like. In fact, they, they, they are just at a par with their contemporaries. So that's what I have seen. And then once I can tell you about cerebral palsy, then it is so expensive to manage. Of course, everybody knows that. It's the most expensive congenital disorder to manage all over the world. For a number of reasons, I've just mentioned wheelchair. And then the wheelchair is not the one the child uses this year, that the child is going to use next year, unless the child is not going. The child will probably use it for about two, maximum two, three years, we need to buy another one, and they're not cheap. So I, I can tell you that, that it's, um, it's a difficult condition, it's a complex condition. Statistics show that over 17 million people are impacted with cerebral palsy. In 
this um, journey, I have seen moms more committed than the dads. Some of them leave, some of them just um, dump the child like um, you, are the, you, you are the one that know where you got the child from. There are some things that you think you could control, but definitely are just, it's just out of your control. So what you cannot control, don't regret it. So I, I, I feel at this point we need to also um, get involved uh, in the lives of th these children and also for moms, try as much as possible to um, be yourself. Do not let, it can be overwhelming. The journey can be very, very overwhelming, tiring, um, stressful, but just try as much as possible to um, just um, be yourself. The children will live, they will survive with your help. If you are the one they need for this journey to be very easy for them. So, and while trying to also take care of them, take care of yourself too, because like I said, it can be very overwhelming. Just also take care of yourself because your child wants you alive. bosses, toxic work environment. I've been very lucky to be very honest with all the bosses that I have. Um, maybe because I do the work, so I try to stay out of trouble as well. But then, yes, I've been hearing about these conversations and I feel like they're very crazy. Should I say the truth or should I lie? Okay, <laughs> I, 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 am, I am glad that there is the voice. It's not like it's not being talked about, but it's getting louder and it's being reinforced and it's fantastic. I think it's something that should continue. I think quite importantly, because the light is being shown, the people that are being pointed as being toxic, in all honesty, I may not flow with the stream, but I would say they're pretty much the ones that need help. So it, you, it's, it's not just the abused that we save, it's the abuser that needs more saving because if you can correct the abuser, there will be no abused. I used to work for an NGO and then I was on, um, you have to renew your contract. And time for, to renew my contract, my boss told me I was supposed to sleep with him before I renew the contract. So I told him, you know what, if that's the case, then that's the end of me working for somebody else. To date, I think I'm pretty good. There are lots of narcissistic bosses out there. I think that for your mental health, if you can't cope, I think that it's, it's best to get a new job. So the people that have been identified, they need to think of self-awareness and coming to the place to ask yourself, why am I being toxic? Because some people that are being toxic are pretty much just bleeding on people that they didn't, didn't hurt them. They are hurting. And it's either they come to the realization of the fact that they are hurting and pretty much repeating a pattern which they need to stop, a cycle that they need to break, otherwise they will keep hurting other people. The reason for this conversation actually, uh, because they, there's now light, on them. I feel like they'll feel the need to do better. I mean, it's always good to speak up. It's always good to let people know when there's a problem because a problem shared is a problem solved. It's not everybody that can stand up to. And, uh, and narcissistic, narcissistic people find a way to either gaslight you or make you feel miserable at the end of the day. So in the long run, it's not sustainable. I would advise that you find a healthier working environment. warm welcome. We appreciate that you're here. I am Felicity Ezewike. Our slot topic for this segment has been described as the eighth most common cause of cancer-related deaths among women. Cases are predicted to increase by 42% globally and by 86% in Africa alone by 2040. And there is real fear a diagnosis 
is as good as a death sentence. Or should it be? I'm talking about ovarian cancer. While the rate has significantly reduced globally in the last 20 years, recent trends suggest a rise, especially in Africa, with the possibility of figures doubling by 2040. As of 2020, over 17,000 women had died in Africa due to ovarian cancer. The death toll is predicted to increase by 51% in the world and 92.3% in Africa also by 2040. This means that by that year, around 15,694 more women who could be dead, almost double the present figures. Should an ovarian cancer diagnosis be feared as a death sentence for women in Africa? To help us with some perspective about the cancer, awareness level, challenges and treatment options are the joined after the short break by Dr. Noye Okoye. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. I'm now joined live in the studio by Noni Okoye, consultant, obstetrician, gynecologist. She joins us from Lagos. She's here with me. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a basic understanding of what ovarian cancer is and why this seemingly palpable fear that a diagnosis is synonymous with being given a death sentence. Yeah, I think, um, thank you so much. I think it's really um, applaudable that you're, you're bringing into fore this kind of talk. So um, ovarian cancer, as um, you may know, it's a cancer that affects the ovary. So the ovary are just, you know, structures. If you see, if you watch on Instagram, you see people, when they see babies, they say, oh, my <laughs> ovaries, yes. <laughs> they say my ovaries because, you know, it's, it's because of, it's, uh, it's, it's there for reproduction. So you have actually two you know, ovaries seated in the pelvis, that's just down um, around between your thighs, that's where the pelvis is. So ovarian cancer affects the ovaries and it's, um, there is a palpable fear, yes, it's true, but you have to ask some questions, why is there a palpable fear? Is it because um, people have lack of information, awareness, do they have relatives that probably the present leads to the hospital and how do they feel, how are they managed, what is the information that they have? Could it be because of affordability, accessibility? So all of those things could contribute to why there might be a fear for ovarian cancer. I guess we will come back to that. Like every other when cancer. We, okay, yeah. when we have maybe a little bit of uh, understanding of mm. um, where we are at. So you, you highlighted a couple of things that could trigger people thinking that a diagnosis is a death sentence. One mm -hmm. of them is awareness. What would you say we are in Africa, mm -hmm. and specifically in Nigeria, um, mm -hmm. this is where we're domiciled? Yes, so um, coming to the awareness aspect of it, if you do look at, like, like in Nigeria here, where I, I'm in Africa, if you do look at um, the awareness, the awareness in Nigeria, uh, even in African countries, is like low to average. People don't really, um, they, yes, they, they do know that there is cancer, there is ovarian cancer, but most of them don't even have the knowledge of the symptoms, of the risk factors. So even in developed countries, you see that um, one of the challenges in managing this condition has to do with presentation. So that's that's the the, the that's the, the the main challenge we have, which is linked to awareness and knowledge. And so it's really a good thing because if you're talking about prevention of medical conditions, even cancer, one key in management of these conditions it would really be attributed to creating more awareness, so people could have more knowledge about this, what causes this, the risk factors, how can this be prevented, how can this be managed, and then you you could see that you would ultimately reduce the death rate or fatality rate. Um, I know there's a couple of issues associated with this. I'm not, um, yeah, yeah. it's just basically from the little things I've read. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, risk factors. Uh, before we talk about prevention, mm -hmm. what I did see was that the, it's not quite easy to mm -hmm. identify when someone has 
uterine cancer. Oh, um, oh. I, I hear is it, it is it mimics other symptoms. Oh. It is not just one thing. That maybe you have headache or you feel feverish. People automatically just diagnose themselves with malaria, for instance. So, um, is that true that the symptoms mimic? different ailments that you might not be able to pinpoint that you have ovarian cancer? And if yes, are there specific tests maybe that can um, show you that you have this cancer? Yeah, so I'll just take these questions one at a time. So you're asking about the, the symptoms. Yes, one of the problems, one of the challenges we do have um, from my experience with management of ovarian cancer, it has a lot to do with um, the symptoms. Now, if you, if you also know that um, just if you compare that to um, other cancers, like ovarian cancer is the second most common gynecological cancer. I don't mean overall, it's like the seventh, but I'm talking about genital cancer. After cervical cancer, you have, genet uh, you have um, ovarian cancer. Then firstly, apart from that, um, overall for women, the commonest is breast cancer. Now, the difference between ovarian cancer and these other two cancers I mentioned has to do with you know, accessibilities. The organs like the breast is easily accessible. You could if easily, if you have a lump, you could easily feel that. Even at such, like for instance, I went for a program um, like two weeks back on a modern Sunday, and I had to talk to a population of women about breast and um, cervical cancer. So after that, I had to screen some women. And I just chose five, chose five. And out of those five women, like three women had lumps on their breasts. And, and one of those three women, I'm coming, one of those three women, she had um, a family history of breast cancer. So it, does it make a sense? So that's where awareness comes in. And this is about, you know, organs that are accessible. Even the cervix, which is the neck of the womb, is quite accessible as well. Yet there are issues with presentation, talk more of ovaries that are located, you know, in the pelvis. So that is the, the issue. And adding to that, the, you, we have um, concerns about the symptoms are vague. Um, so most of the times women could, sometimes women would even have no symptoms. Some would present with symptoms like abdominal pain, abdominal discomfort, bloating. Some women would present with satiety. That means early satiety. That means you eat a little um, kind of food and okay. you feel you know, full and bloated. Some women could have pelvic pain. And at the last stages, they could have weight loss. So when they do have these early symptoms, over the past, in the past few years, they, they did say that um, these symptoms of ovarian cancer is really present when it's advanced, but it has changed because even in early stages, these symptoms are there. So um, that is where the issues are with regards to knowledge, awareness. You see, some of these. So as, as a doctor, as a doctor, yeah. What would what would make you ask somebody to go um, have a test, maybe to right. confirm if they have ovarian cancer and. Um, are there, that's part of the question I asked earlier, okay, are there yeah. specific tests that will confirm that somebody has it? Definitely, there are some um, diagnostic tests for that. But the, but the thing about ovarian cancer is that, you know, we are talking about um, screening. Like um, other health conditions, other cancers, there could be a pathway to screen for, <coughs> sorry, these health conditions. For ovarian cancer, it depends on what the patient presents with. Like I said, these patients could present late. So when they present late, by the time you subject them to have some tests, you know, some scans, special kind of scans, MRI, most times it may be too late. So when the patient comes to me, I would first of all ask the patient a couple of questions, ask them about their history, what they're presenting with, ask them about risk factors. Now, if you do tell me that you have a family history, if you know about um, a celebrity, Angelina Jolie, you know about her? Yes, the, yes, yes the, had the, breast cancer. Yes, not just that. She didn't have breast cancer. She had a family history of that. Her oh, mother okay. died of breast cancer. She had, a, her grandmother was affected. So she just went to the, uh, you know, she was just being assessed. That was about 2015. And she had a couple of tests done and a genetic test done, which um, one of it is called, we call it BRCA gene, which is an abnormal kind of gene that if you do have that, there could be a high chance that the person could have an ovarian or breast cancer. So because of that, she was offered some treatment options, which included to remove, you know, her breast, breast and, and the ovary. I think that's, that's the part that I'm yeah. aware of, that she removed her breast. Yes. So part of it, it will be assessing you, asking you a couple of questions based on your symptoms, based on your family history, some kind of lifestyle measures that you have. And then based on that, the, the doctor would refer you to do some couple of tests. And then from there, you could make the diagnosis and offer treatments to the yeah, patient. You, you talk about family history, um, yeah. um, uh, life experiences. What mm -hmm. are these factors, aside the two, that increases a woman's um, 
probability of getting ovarian cancer? Yeah, so surely, so for every um, kind of cancer, really the cause is not clear, but yeah, like every woman, as long as you have an ovary, you have a lifetime risk. predisposition. Yes. So there is a one in 70 background risk that every woman would have ovarian cancer um, as, she, as, as she is advancing in age. But then there are some things that increases a woman's risk. First has to do with um, some, like I've mentioned about genetic factors, which is very, very necessary, Family factor, familial factors. Now 10 to 15% of ovarian cancers could be linked to this. So you and I, every human being has, you know, you have trillions of cells, you have genes that carry the information about how your cells work. So for any reason, if there is an abnormality or a damage to any of these genes, actually these genes should protect someone. But if there is a damage to any of these genes and this gene is being inherited from either of the parents, then you stand to have a risk of having ovarian or breast cancer. So we call some of these genes, one is BRCA gene, there is BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. So those are, in, they, those are you, know, you know, they are implicated in such cancers. But another thing has to do with, you know, having someone being, or the, you know, having a high BMI, body mass index, obesity. So there are also early, some things that can be modified, like your age, as someone is advancing in age, there is a risk to that. Then um, elements, when a woman sees elements, because what happens is that the ovaries are egg baskets, they release eggs every month. So there's some theories, when this kind of thing happens, you know, researchers tend to, you know, research to find yes, what are the likely yes, factors. Yes. And then the factors that have been there has to do with what we call incessant ovulation. When a woman keeps on releasing eggs, now when you release eggs every month, there are some damages that could occur to the lining of the cell. Ah, it sounds really complicated. I'm <laughs> sure somebody watching for the first time might be wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, this sounds really scary. So we've yeah. talked about the risk, the factors that may make somebody predisposed to ovarian cancer. So what are those factors or those lifestyle changes that could a woman should risk. maintain Good. to reduce the risk yes. of ovarian cancer? Fine. The, 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 the reason is not to scare anyone. Uh, that's the, the, the issue is that you need to give people the information yes. so that they make informed choices. So it's not about scaring people. It's just to give you the right information. Now, um, there are some things that you cannot change, like your age. You can't change that. If you do have a family history of breast cancer, that can be changed. If you have a sister or a brother, uh, or if a sister that had a breast cancer or ovarian cancer or a mother, you can't change that. But what you could do is that what are those risk reducing strategies? So now coming to generally, like I said, lifestyle measures. If you do go to developed countries, if someone has any medical condition, the first thing they talk to you is about diet and exercise. So those are very important. So you have to watch what you eat. And that's where you have to go to maybe dietitians. They talk to you about if you have issues with maybe weight gain, exercise. It helps. It helps in the functioning of the body. Then for women, it's, it's you advise them to breastfeed. Breastfeeding is good because when you, there are some factors that interrupt ovulation process. So when you're pregnant, you have a lot of time. The ovaries are not releasing eggs. So it keeps the ovaries to some kind of resting phase. And that reduces the risk of ovarian cancer. So you exclusively breastfeed if you are a woman and you, you have babies. So if you don't... So have... let, let's pause and emphasize it. If you're a woman <laughs> and you are having babies, please, mm -hmm. please do exclusive if you can. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any reason mm -hmm. not to or you don't have any medical challenges, if you can, please. Mm -hmm. So those are, those, are, um, those are the ones that... Then contraception, those, some, some women, like um, if you do use some kind of contraceptive pill, like if you use combined contraceptive pills... Yes, they have, I, I read that as well. Yes, yes, it does. If you use that for over five years, five to um, ten years, so studies have shown that it could reduce the risk of ovarian cancer to over 20%. But then you have to be careful because the COCP as well would increase the risk of, you know, cervical cancer. <laughs> so you have to <laughs> balance all of that the, and get um, the right information. And then there are some factors like, um, you know, some endometriosis, which is when you have an abnormal cells that is meant to be in the lining of the womb, it's, um, you know, in the ovaries, and use of some fertility drugs. So these are, you know, modifiable risk factors. So when you are exposed to such kind of risk factors, of course, you need to pay more attention to your health. You need to think more of if you have symptoms like bloating, abdominal pain, Repeat you know, insistently, symptoms, right? insistently, like you're having three or four episodes of that in a month, of course, you should be able to go and see a doctor. Don't right. go over the counter, take some medications. Uh, by doing so, because part of, you know, reduction of this risk will be early detection and treatment. I was just about to go there. So that's that. the, the, at the mm -hmm. beginning, we talked mm -hmm. about 
uh, the fear that once you get an ovarian cancer uh, diagnosis, you're almost as no. good as dead. No. And then there is the prediction that you the, the you have like a five years um, survival rate, survival rate mm -hmm. and all of that. So. Um, no, no, let me what? come to that. People read a lot of things in the internet. Now, it, it, now, no, but there are research that I, yeah, that, yeah. I understand that, that gives you... So, okay, I, basically what I want to ask is, is it treatable? And uh, is there a possibility that after treatment, the person can go on to live uh, the, the full span of their life? And... What's at what stage? Because I know it's in stages. Mm -hmm. stage one, yeah, stage one, two, two, three, four. Yeah. What stage is it? Um, if you catch it, what stage will you catch it, and you can have that chance? Yes, for every cancer, once it's um, the cancer, most of the, all the cancer stages usually are from the way it's being um, called. We have what we international, what we international staging system we call FIGO is from stage one to stage four, right? So for every cancer, once you come around, once you're in stage one, it's an early cancer. So those are really uh, amenable to treatment, cure, and the survival rates are higher. So when you do, um, when you're making all those um, research work, works like in Africa, we do have survival rates for stage one cancer. That's the early cancer. It's over 80 to 90 percent because most of these researches they don't go further than five years, right? So overall, it's about 40 percent. So that means that if these women they have the treatment, they are staying in five years during the research period, they are doing fine as long as there are a lot of factors that affect the treatment. It's not just about treatment, it's about the age of the patient. Does the patient have any medical condition? What are the kind of risk factors the patient has? At what time is she presenting? What, the team of experts managing the patient, what kind of facilities do they have? Those are the questions that you have to ask, and yeah. those are the factors that affect the treatment outcome for every kind of cancer. Okay. And of course, the patient's outlook. Yes, yeah. that's the mental state as well. Very that's why you, you always harp on mental health and Very how important. it impacts on healing. Yes. I, I want you to yes. speak on, uh, we talked about, I asked you at the beginning about awareness. What level of an awareness do we have? Um, how do you think we can improve on awareness? Because when we do that, the diagnosis might become easier. More women will be more conscious of needing to check themselves and know that there's a likelihood you could have this. What can we do to improve? What you're doing now? <laughs> no, but this is, the, the, yes, what? New Central is Pan-African, yes, but yeah. there could be more. It's not everybody that has a television. Now, let me tell you something. There was a study that was done in Luth, I think 2018, and they tried to assess the knowledge of the participants, over 400, and to find out the knowledge and awareness of, you know, they have about what, well, um, um, ovarian cancer. It was done in Nigeria. So about 19% of women had the knowledge. You could see how poor it was had the knowledge of the risk factors and symptoms of ovarian cancer, and then the sources of the knowledge. Like about 33% of such women had the knowledge from mass media, okay. television. So we're doing a work. Instagram, work we're doing a good work, <laughs> so it's like, um, you, know, you know, Instagram, social media. And about, I think, a, a, about 30% also had knowledge from just discussion with their fellow women. Fellow, no, doctors. Oh, okay. So they come to the hospital, they ask a couple of questions, they talk to them about... Um, ovarian cancer and they get to know about that or from relatives you know just social media they have a relative that had this kind of condition they had to read it up but mostly from health professionals just like i'm doing now so that's a, a very important way of spreading awareness you just have to go through a mass media disseminate the information and, and and also if you do have survivors you know because there is this stigma people have about social cultural region, region, um, you know factors that could affect them you know some people when you have a family history of cancer they, they don't want to talk about it. So if we do have uh, like celebrity survivors, people that people look up onto and they have this kind of condition or they have a relative, they could just, you know, do a campaign. Do we talk actually about still it. have cultural stigma about things like this? Absolutely, we do have. We may not be in some part of, um, you know, African countries, even in Nigeria, like in remote, in the northern countries. Yeah, yeah, we Why have, is that? What, what do you think? Yeah, it has to do with development. Okay, it has to do with education. A lot of things that has to do with social cultural factors has to do with education. You, although if, if you do conduct a study in cities like Lagos, where I stay, you would find out that over 50% or 70% of women, they have tertiary education. And those are people that have less chances of having this condition. Now, if you get to the north, southern part of Nigeria, you, you will find out that a lot of women, there is this issue of you know, patriarchy where they have to uh, they have to take permission from their partners to come to the hospital. 
even now you would see women who have medical conditions they do not have money they are not working the poverty it plays a huge role it works hand in hand with sociocultural factors some people okay talking about um, these um, factors as well some people who have this condition you would see some women who are learned they get to the church they believe they, they, they keep on praying no I'm, I'm telling you what I, I see from experience they get to the church, they keep praying, they, this happens for like a year, the letter comes to you, some would take some supplements, GN, G, GNLD, GNLD products, because some would go to take over-the-counter medications, treating ulcer and all of those symptoms. By the time they come to the hospital, it's, it's really, you know, too late. What more can we do? What more can we do? How can we reach these people in the hinterlands who might not have better access? Is it maybe, you, you talked about something about husbands who stop there, who might not mm -hmm. give permission. Is it not possible to also educate the men to be aware that if you have a spouse who might not be as, um, as exposed as you, you need to help them to make these checks? Yes, what we can do generally, like you said, for um, every medical condition, like you will start, you could start from the grassroots. If you have the information about any condition, you educate somebody with uh, around you. The person educates somebody around him or her, and then we have we have issues with um, you know I, political. I, I, I was actually looking more specifically at spouses, partners, men, men in in particular who may have. Um, partners who are not as enlightened as they are uh, yeah so what can be done to those what, like uh, how can we educate this people? because sometimes some men don't know about this thing why yeah. others educate themselves there are those who don't the only, the, what we can do is that we try as much as possible to involve men in issues of women like when you are a woman they, like you see some women they, um, when they come to me they have a health condition or even pregnant women or any issue they want you to their husbands probably don't want to come with them so you have to actively get the husband involved you have to tell the person or you have to take the phone um you tell the husband see your wife she has a serious condition i want you to come and when they listen to your voice they come so in any way you can you just actively get their partners involved, involved. Okay. and then we need uh, then political will is also very important because one challenge that we also have has to do now if we do have um you know politicians you know because a lot of they are so distracted with a lot of things happening the um, issues about security, political instability, and less attention is paid to, um, you know, cancer. So if we do have them trying to, or even NGOs sponsoring campaigns to enlighten people, even in such remote areas, it will go a long way to drastically reduce the burden of. I wish I could continue the conversation. <laughs> yes, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just give you like thirty minutes yeah, to. Yeah. Um, it's okay. What would be the key reminders you would want our viewers to take away from this conversation as we wrap up? Yeah, the key reminders I would want them to take away is simply that, you know, health is wealth. Um, you have to be healthy to live long. You, you have to be healthy to achieve anything you want to, to be in life. Ovarian cancer is real and is becoming a scourge. And um, uh, patients are being lost because of lack of awareness, um, lack of knowledge. And so trying to educate patients, anybody who is listening to me, um, try to um, pay more attention to your health. If you do have um, such kind of symptoms or if you do have a risk factor, we even have genetic testing where you could approach the oncologist and they could talk to you about, you know, genetic testing where um, you could be tested to find out if you have these abnormal genes that could increase the risk of you having a cancer. Yeah, yeah. So, and the heart um, of it is try as much as you can really, to be aware uh, yeah, and yeah. live a healthy life. Yeah. Thank you very much. For <laughs> we Thank you. Your Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. All right, thank you for staying with us this long. We're not done yet. We'll go for a very short break. And when we come back, we'll be going to security matters, taking on the situation in Niger and the U.S. concerns about a recent decision by the junta. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. So, on Saturday, the Niger Republic junta announced it is suspending military cooperation with Washington and that U.S. flights over the country's territory in recent weeks were illegal. 
It's been a marathon of discussion since, as Niger plays a central role in the U.S. military operations in African Sahel region and is home to a major air base. Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh said Monday that the U.S. officials had lengthy and direct discussions with the junta officials that were also in part spoiled by concerns over Niger's potential relationships with Russia and Iran. According to her, the U.S. is troubled on the part that Niger is on. In October, the U.S. officially designated the military takeover in Niger as a coup, which triggered laws restricting the military support and aid that is, it can provide to Niger. But in December, the top U.S. envoy for Africa, Molly Fee, said the U.S. was willing to restore aid and security ties if Niger met certain conditions. But the Niger Junta spokesman said the U.S. tone was condescending and threatened the uh, Niger Republic's sovereignty. Since the July coup, the country has ended its security partnerships with the European Union and France, and had they have withdrawn and have withdrawn their troops from the country. To share informed views on this, I am joined by David Otter, Director, Geneva Center for Africa Security and Strategic Studies, Nigeria. It's good to have you on one slot. Thank you for giving us your time. It seems Niger oh, thank you for having me. It, it seems Niger does not want the US military on its soil. Summarize for us your view of Saturday's events and why it is significant? Well, I think from what we know so far, uh, the Nigerian junta has revoked uh, the military accord, uh, which was signed uh, between 2012 and 2014. Um, effectively, that accord allowed uh, the United States to build one of its most valuable, uh, from a US perspective, uh, military base, um, which of course, uh, this is a military base that focuses on intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, it's a base that, you know, can fly C-19 uh, cargo jets, you know, uh, I mean, I'm talking about very large uh, military aircraft, uh, but it's also one of the very few bases uh, that the U.S. deploys, you know, what we call armed drones um, that are remotely controlled. So the U.S. had struggled uh, initially to find any country that would allow, and I'm talking about the uh, U.S. African Command, the U.S. African Command, they call it U.S. AFRICOM. They had actually struggled to find any African country that would allow them to have this military base. And they struck gold uh, in 2012 and 2014 when the then uh, Nigerian government allowed them to build that military base. This is a base that uh, is estimated to cost about 110 uh, 220 million U.S. dollars, and it's, it's about uh, the equivalent of uh, 13 million uh, being spent on a daily, sorry, on a on a yearly basis to uh, actually keep this base running. So for the United States, um, you know, this was one of the most uh, valuable bases. You know, it actually uh, uses that to conduct strikes uh, around Niger, um, as far as Somalia, Libya. Uh, but even as close to Nigeria. So it actually targets seven terrorist organizations, including the likes of Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, uh, the Islamic State of the, the Greater Sahel, um, you know, uh, Islamic State in Libya. So there are more than seven terrorist designated organizations that the U.S. You know, um, goes after using this military base. So fast forward, uh, the, the military coup that occurred uh, in, in Niger, Initially, the U.S. distanced itself uh, from the, the French, you know, because, of course, the toxicity that the French brand uh, in terms of uh, its uh, uh, neo-colonial and, you know, uh, you know, during the colonial period, that uh, rhetoric of uh, the French has to go um, was something which, you know, the U.S. tried to distance itself from. Um, when the French and the Nigerian uh, were having issues and the French were pushing for some kind of uh, an intervention through ECOWAS, um, the U.S., you know, tried to, first of all, did not acknowledge uh, that, that uh, this was a military coup. Um, it waited until, you know, very, I think, I think it was December or something, that's when the U.S. said, 
uh, you know, did ag agree uh, that uh, this was a military coup. So effectively, the U.S. you know wanted to continue to do business uh, with Niger because, of course, that's a very expensive military base. But it does appear uh, that the conditions uh, under which you know the U.S. has set, you know, has some kind of you know triggered um, you know this. Uh, uh, the military don't have to say to the U.S. that, of course, um, you know, this is not going to happen. Uh, and it has given them the ammunition uh, to say to the U.S. that it has threatened its territorial integrity. Perhaps the U.S. may have suggested uh, that uh, the Nigerian uh, junta should uh, discontinue any relationship with um, other strategic partners, for example, Russia. And maybe the Nigerian saw this as some kind of condescending in, in the terms that they described. Okay. So um, here we are uh, in a position where, um, you know, the Nigerians have kicked out the French. Uh, they've kicked out uh, the, uh, you know, the, well, they've, they've, you know, actually established what you call the Alliance of Sahelian States. All right. Uh, so, I, I mean, <laughs> you, you've clearly established that it is a significant development that we're dealing with. And that's yes. why everyone is talking about it. But before we move on, let me quickly... Um, clarify something you said. You 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 were um, a bit unsure if it was December or October. I think it was in October that they accepted that it was a coup, and then in December they said there's a possibility they can still have uh, relationships. Uh, back to the conversation, um, uh, there was from everything I've seen online, there, there was no clear reason given for the decision by the Niger. Um, a junta, they only made the announcement that they don't want them there. Is there a background that could give insights as to why? They chose to ask the U.S. to leave. I think time is everything, and everything is about timing. Um, you know, so why now? I mean, that's the question you're asking. I think the possibility, uh, from what we know, is that the United States, um, you know, had a visit, uh, and a very high-profile visit, um, uh, which, you know, was uh, led by the envoy Molipi. And, and, of course, there is a possibility that, you know, the envoy one, according to the Nigerian junta, did not, did not uh, kind of inform uh, them of the composition of, of that envoy, uh, of that delegation. Possibly they were not informed of the uh, discussions that were supposed to be had. And, and I think another reason uh, is that, you know, I think there may have been some kind of a suggestion. Remember the U.S. said in December that it will continue to give aid to Niger, um, but subject to conditions. So I think perhaps one of the conditions that the U.S. may have proposed or the U.S. envoy or the delegation may have proposed is that we can continue to give you aid as long as you do not um, maybe, you know, share the, the country or, you know, have any partnership with Russia or, or some other partnership with um, Burkina Faso or Mali. We don't know. Um, you know, these are very secretive discussions. But for the Nigerian government or the junta to have said, that they are re revoking without any warning um, the military uh, alliance, uh, well, the military um, agreement between the uh, uh, United States and, uh, and Niger with immediate effect tells you that, you know, something went wrong which was not expected. And the only thing I can think of is perhaps the fact that maybe the U.S. may have said to the Nigerian junta that, you know, one, perhaps you have to hand over power immediately to... Um, you know, a civilian government, or maybe you do not have to have any uh, kind of relationship with Russia. I mean, bearing in mind uh, that yeah. this was at a time when Russia election was going on. Uh, yeah. So there could be some links there. Um, but, you know, I think the big question uh, that the United States Congress will be asking Africa and the State Department is, was this one of the scenarios that was figured out when this military base was being established? Or... Uh, does this come as a surprise uh, even to uh, the U.S. State Department and Africa? So I think Congress would want to know, you yeah, know I if think this was money well spent. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I quite agree with you because what the statement that the spokesperson made uh, simply alluded to the fact that some of the um, tone was disrespectful. The tone was... Um, um, you know, sort of disrespectful to their sovereignty. So basically, one would assume that there are instructions that they were not uh, comfortable with. Then again, it, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary um, did say on Monday that they had discussions with officials. Uh, the, 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 their discussion was spurred by concerns 
over Niger's potential relationships with Russia and Iran that you've mentioned. Um, scholars like yourself are saying it's more America-centric than anything else. It has nothing to do with what benefits Africa and Niger in particular, really. What's your view on that? I think from a Nigerian point of view, um, they would be asking the big question. Uh, the U.S. base 201 um, in Agadex, you know, has been there since 2012. They would want to see the report card. I mean, they would want to see how effective uh, that, that U.S. base has been in terms of providing uh, safety and security around the region. And if you look at that, you know, from a, a scholar's perspective or from an outsider's perspective or from an analyst's point of view, um, you, you can simply tell that, you know, there hasn't been much progress uh, in terms of the counter incidency operations. Yes, the U.S. has deployed uh, its drones from that region the right down to Somalia. And as I mentioned, there are seven terrorist designated groups that these particular base is meant to deal with. But for the Nigerian, there will be concern about the insecurity within the region, not just Niger, uh, but of course within Mali and Burkina Faso. So. For the Niger uh, um, junta, they would think this has not been effective because, of course, uh, there are still issues within uh, their region. And, and they would think, well, if this is just not benefiting us, why do we have to continue to have it? From the U.S. point of view, um, the U.S. would want to not just look at Niger as a country on its own in terms of you know, how effective it has been, uh, but you want to look at other regions like Somalia, uh, you know, areas like uh, um, you know, Chad, um, which of course, you know, the French has interest in, um, areas like Libya, uh, they would want to look at it as an overall um, counter incidency operation. But mind you, this is all not just for the uh, interest of uh, the Nigerian or the regional, um, you know, insecurity. I think this is more or less the U.S. Uh, placing itself in a position uh, in, in geopolitics which would interest, you know, its, um, its outpost. So, um, yeah, so for the Nigerians, if it's not an effective uh, 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 deployment, if it doesn't serve the purpose of, you know, uh, bringing stability within the region, then why continue to have it? Good. For the Americans, they want to have it because, of course, it does serve their interests. Okay, uh, I'm um, told we have less than two minutes to wrap up. I'll, I'll just quickly ask, how does this um, decision, uh, the withdrawal of the U.S. military presence, impact security situation regionally and the junta's uh, control in the country? I know it's, I, I thought we had more time. Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, the junta has, you know, made an alliance with Mali, Burkina Faso uh, to uh, have some kind of uh, a defense pact to fight against insurgency. Any counterinsurgency operation that is ended abruptly will leave a very huge gap. Um, how does the Nigerian government, how do the other countries want to fill this gap, um, is now left to uh, perhaps, you know, the likes of the multinational joint tax force, um, what, else, what else is remaining of G5 Sahel, uh, and perhaps, I think, uh, to conclude, I think maybe Niger is looking at bringing in other partners. You know, it could be Russia, um, it could be um, expanding uh, the confederation or the federation of states between Mali and Burkina Faso to uh, cover that gap. But for now, uh, I believe that um, it's not yet over. Uh, the U.S. Right. may try to negotiate. It's too expensive for the U.S. to just let go. All right, David, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's always a pleasure to have you on one slot. I appreciate the insights that you give to us. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap on one slot for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you join us again next week for conversations like this. Take good care.
The problem of reading literacy has always been a debate in countries like South Africa, where a significant number of learners in grades 1, 2 and 3 are struggling to either read effectively or read and comprehend. According to some schools of thought, this problem should not only be associated with their teacher's instruction but also to be considered a problem of curriculum. This debate once again took center stage with South Africa's ranking on one of the world's premier assessments of reading ability, which involved more than 50 countries. While the country contends with how to handle its reading literacy problem, one young girl in Johannesburg is showing what is possible with the help of her parents. At just three years old, Litukutula Bengu reads better than 80% of South Africa's school children who are more than three times her age. Her remarkable reading skills have drawn the attention of the international community. She first came to the limelight in 2022 when her mother, Ntombikaise Bengu, created a TikTok account and shared a video of her reading words and sentences. This is TV Spook likes to romp. TP stop. Shh. Then help me with my mask. Bengu's parents started teaching her how to read after she turned two, seeing that she could memorize and associate words and objects, especially when they went grocery shopping. We have to read. This effort by her parents has yielded far more than they thought, especially in a country where children of Bengu's age struggle to read. For some parents, the ability of the child to read is believed to be the sole responsibility of the teacher, while others believe that parents play a significant role in reading literacy as well. I think when you send your child to preschool, I think it's just stigma around like they, the teachers need to do everything. And then that's why kids when they come back home, they don't, uh, they don't actually uh, cement the knowledge that they, that they learned at school. So parents need to take charge. Public education in South Africa is very behind. It's up to parents to make sure that uh, we, our kids have a great future. We have a significant number of learners in grade one, two and three that are not learning to read effectively. It's a problem of teacher's pedagogy, it's a problem of curriculum. So we have to address it systematically. Uh, we have to recognize that um, many, many of the practices that teachers are currently using aren't working. Bengu has not only made her parents proud, but she has also made South Africa proud too. Her reading skills have already made her a TikTok star with nearly half a million followers. And recently, she was named this year's youngest African kid fluenza at an annual award held by the US children's TV channel Nickelodeon. When she started going viral, people were interested in um, how do we do this? Right. So, and then we, that's when we started uh, making a company around that, uh, selling the products that we used to um, uh, teach Leto. According to research released by the US-based Progress in International Reading Literacy Study, South Africa ranked last out of 57 nations polled. However, Bengal's remarkable skills that have drawn the attention of an international US-based children's TV, Nickelodeon, is a paradigm shift and changes the narrative for the southern African country.
service has enabled us, given us an environment where women are given equal opportunities as men. It's a great feeling to go where men are also going. I've not been there before. This is my first time. I can only uh, um, depend on what I hear, hear, see, or what probably I read or watch. I'm a bit nervous in relation to um, the country we are going to. Their views vary. Their cultural diversity, their language, even their food. It's, it will be a bit challenging. I'll have, to, I'll have to adjust. I will adjust. Honestly, when I was growing up, I didn't think I would join the military. They made me responsible for some things. When you do something, they correct you and they make you responsible and answer for it. And the way she um, encourages me and tells me that I shouldn't let this thing pull me down. She was able to raise two kids and still be a prison officer, able to juggle work with whom, and I realized that if my mom can do it, why can't I do it? When I reached um, secondary school, I started thinking of probably joining the military. I said, I see, you. Because I didn't see anything about military in here. They felt so wise I should stay with my uncle, who is a colonel. He was a lieutenant colonel then. And they felt so wise I should stay with him, since he is still in the service and can coach me better than applied into the service. Daddy does her things on point. So I think that's also part. But she has also got that discipline from this house. I wake up in the morning, like 0 for 30 hours, go to the units, go with them for uh, jogging, some stretches, push ups, sit ups coming fresh up where I have to um, report to work by 0900. Show! Yay! It's something I always wanted to do all right, but it takes time. So when I got the opportunity and they nominated me to come, I was glad because I actually wanted to come. So I'm almost getting to a captain stage. I need to learn this, be able to experience some things other people are experiencing in their country. So when you come back to Ghana, you can implement it and it will help you grow. All those going for missions will come here, learn more about where they are going. In one scenario, we engaged with the community and found out that um, there has been a victim of rape. Women are more easy to approach because it's mostly the women and the youth that have a lot of challenges. So I believe me being a woman, it's easier for other women to open up. As her immediate commander, I expect her to show leadership qualities because um, she is going to lead a, a whole platoon, engagement platoon. Soldiers will be looking up to her. The community will be looking up to her. The language barrier is going to be a serious challenge when I get there. So I'm trying to learn some basic Arabic. I have to say thank you, I'm fine or welcome. Something to get myself around. I've been given the opportunity to be able to um, talk to people, find out their problems. I'm going to learn a lot, I'm going to see a lot, and I'm expecting to come back better than I left my country. How was the trip? I'm a bit stressed. I 
I wake up early in the morning. I have my quiet time. Work starts here at um, 08. So when you wake up, you freshen up, get something to eat, prepare for work, then you hit the ground running. I normally work alongside CIMIC and also help the tactical operation centers. Today we are going to Ramesh for market work. And Ghana very, very good. <laughs> we normally go to their um, shops to create that um, rapport. And when you create that rapport, they are able to open up to you, talk with you, invite you to their homes, see you as a friend, not a threat, engage with them, get to know their needs, encourage them if we can, help if we can, and let them know that um, UN is here not to intimidate anybody, but to help keep the peace. Hello, Ali. How are we you? went to Ali's place, Ali and his family, a young boy of 16. Right now, his dad is um, battling um, kidney issues, so his dad is in Beirut right now in the hospital. So he's basically now the man of the house. We met uh, Mr. Paul and his family. They were happy to receive us. They were just telling us how they'll miss us, the impact we've had in their lives, <laughs> how we've helped them see UN in a different light. In Lebanon, there are some places that the men don't see why some women should take that role. But as time went on, I've realized that they've all come to understand that, yes, the world is changing, things are evolving. Women can also do some things that men do. So in all in all, I felt that it was good. The, the reception all in all was very good. When my work is over, I get some time to go to the gym or go to the mess and interact with my colleagues. I've made good friends. They're like family now. We sit at the mess, have a chat, catch up during the days that we weren't able to catch up due to operational activities. <laughs> I miss everything. I miss my family. I miss my friends. I even miss our local dishes. Even though we try to cook something here that's local, it's still not the same as eating it at home in Ghana. Hello. Hello. <laughs> everything has been eye-opening. It, it's just not everything we read about that uh, is as it is. It's when you come on ground, you realize that a lot of things are quite different from what you really read or hear. Lebanon. I think I'm going to miss, funny, I'm going to miss most of the locals. Ali, like the place we went to, I'm going to miss them a lot. <laughs> I'm going to miss um, waking up, getting into a vehicle, being able to talk to new people, be able to impact someone, and also get something in return, be able to learn something new. I'm going to miss that a lot. The problem of reading literacy has always been a debate in countries like South Africa where a significant number of learners in grades 1, 2 and 3 are struggling to either read effectively or read and comprehend. According to some schools of thought, this problem should not only be associated with their teacher's instruction but also to be considered a problem of curriculum. 
This debate once again took center stage with South Africa's ranking on one of the world's premier assessments of reading ability, which involved more than 50 countries. While the country contends with how to handle its reading literacy problem, one young girl in Johannesburg is showing what is possible with the help of her parents. At just three years old, Litukutula Bengu reads better than 80% of South Africa's school children who are more than three times her age. Her remarkable reading skills have drawn the attention of the international community. She first came to the limelight in 2022 when her mother, Ntombi Kaise Bengu, created a TikTok account and shared a video of her reading words and sentences. This is TV Spook likes to ramp. TP stop. Shh. Then help me with my mask. Bengu's parents started teaching her how to read after she turned two, seeing that she could memorize and associate words and objects, especially when they went grocery shopping. We have to read. This effort by her parents has yielded far more than they thought, especially in a country where children of Bengu's age struggle to read. For some parents, the ability of the child to read is believed to be the sole responsibility of the teacher, while others believe that parents play a significant role in reading literacy as well. I think when you send your child to preschool, I think it's a stigma around like they, the teachers need to do everything. And then that's why kids when they come back home, they don't, uh, they don't actually uh, cement the knowledge that they, that they learned at school. So parents need to take charge. Public education in South Africa is very behind. It's up to parents to make sure that uh, we, our kids have a great future. We have a significant number of learners in grade one, two and three that are not learning to read effectively. It's a problem of teacher's pedagogy, it's a problem of curriculum. So we have to address it systematically. Uh, we have to recognize that um, many, many of the practices that teachers are currently using aren't working. Bengu has not only made her parents proud, but she has also made South Africa proud too. Her reading skills have already made her a TikTok star with nearly half a million followers. And recently, she was named this year's youngest African kid fluenza at an annual award held by the US children's TV channel Nickelodeon. When she started going viral, people were interested in um, how do we do this? Right. So, and then we, that's when we started uh, making a company around that, uh, selling the products that we used to um, uh, teach Letu. According to research released by the US-based Progress in International Reading Literacy Study, South Africa ranked last out of 57 nations polled. However, Bengal's remarkable skills that have drawn the attention of an international US-based children's TV, Nickelodeon, is a paradigm shift and changes the narrative for the southern African country.
Hello and welcome. I am Deji Barimasi. Now, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria has again hiked benchmark interest rate by 200 basis points as Africa's largest economy looks to recover from a historic currency crisis and soaring inflation. Now, the NPC jacked up the rate to 24.75 now percent from 22.75 percent in its second consecutive hike after February's 400 basis point increase. While uh, cash reserve ratio for deposit money banks was left at 45 percent, that of merchant banks was raised from 10 percent to 14 percent. Liquidity ratio was left at 30 percent. Governor Olayemi Kadoso told the press conference after the MPC meeting that the committee came to the conclusion that continued tightening in order to tame run, runaway inflation now is still the way to go. Take a listen to his explanation. The considerations of the committee at this meeting focused on the current inflationary pressures and the need to anchor inflation expectations as well as ensure sustained exchange rate stability. These considerations underscore the importance of the CBN's commitment to the price stability mandate and the need to urgently bring inflation under control to ensure that purchasing power of ordinary Nigerians is restored in the short to medium term. Members noted the continued rise in headline inflation, driven largely by food prices because of supply shortages and high costs of logistics and distribution. The committee, therefore, was of the view that addressing food insecurity is key to containing current inflationary pressures. On this note, members commended the ongoing efforts of the federal government towards addressing food insecurity. Some of these measures include the provision of various palliatives, release of grains from the strategic reserves, distribution of seeds and fertilizers, as well as farm implements for dry season farming. Now, the latest hike in benchmark interest rate will certainly not go down well with the business community in the country, especially manufacturers who kicked against the last round of interest rate hike, saying it would make access to credit difficult and impede economic growth. But Cardoso allaying fears of a continuous rate hike has assured that the current spate of monetary policy tightening measures by the CBN would not be long drawn and would be relaxed once there were substantial improvements in the economy in terms of inflation and exchange rate. Now, hear him again. We are not unmindful. We are not unmindful of the impact that these increase in interest rates are having. We are not unmindful of it. We are very, very, very mindful. And, and in actual fact, um, if you look at it, why are we doing this? Because we've said our main objective is to manage inflation. And we believe that with increased interest rates, we have a situation where the foreign exchange market becomes a lot more lively. We've had um, relative shortages in foreign exchange over the recent past. We're now seeing more activity in the foreign exchange market, which in turn is reducing the exchange rate and is also reducing costs. Okay, so it's not a one-sided affair that the increase in interest rates is, is, um, is strangulating the economy. While it may have those tendencies on one side, with the foreign exchange rate coming down, that also helps to moderate the overall. And as I had said earlier, we would expect that this would not be too long drawn, at least I would hope so, that it would not be too long drawn. We are getting towards a situation where on the exchange rate it is moderating and we are expected to continue to moderate. And then it finds a level which, quite frankly, very, very important, is sustainable 
that's very, very, very important, a level that is sustainable, which obviously will involve huge, um, huge collaboration with the fiscal side, because a lot of that cannot just rely on the monetary side alone. So whatever we see on the interest rate side, which is being used to help to moderate prices, buys us time to ensure that the fiscal side, you know, is able to do all the things that it is already doing and ensures for a more sustainable um, economy where the need to depend too much on hiking interest rates is considerably reduced. Let's try to unpack all of this now with economist Dr. Moda Yusuf, who is also the chief executive of uh, the Center for the Promotion of uh, Private Enterprise. Uh, Doc, thank you very much for coming on the program. Uh, listening to the CBN governor there, uh, you, 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 one tends to get the impression that, look, th there's just no other way than to continue to tighten, especially with inflation uh, at above uh, 30%, and then you have uh, this big elephant uh, in the room, the volatility in the exchange rate, the, 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 the exchange rate crisis. W what do you make of his explanation there? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I agree with his explanation to a large extent. But again, just as he said, there is need for a careful and strategic balancing act between the desire to moderate inflation using monetary policy tools and the desire uh, to also achieve growth objectives and to also ensure that those who are investors, particularly those who are indebted to the banks, are not strangulated in the process. So our concern is that of ensuring that balance. For now, uh, there seems to be a disproportionate emphasis on monetary policy tools to achieve the objective of taming inflation. Mm. And just as he has also agreed, uh, there are many drivers to inflation. You know, quite a lot of issues coming from the cost side. Uh, foreign exchange, of course, is an issue. Cost of logistics, cost of diesel, cost of power, you know, insecurity and so on. You know, these are factors that monetary policy instruments may not be able to readily tackle. Which is why I agree with his position that it is very important that we urgently also bring on board the fiscal authorities. But in all of this, we need to determine the limits at which we go in terms of tightening and the pace at which we are going in, ter in terms of tightening. I say this because for investors that are already owing the banks, mm. now many of them will have to be uh, interest rates at about 25, 28. For SMEs, you'll be talking about even over 30%. For those who intend to take facility from the bank, that is completely out of it. Because no same person, you have put the bank at this time to take a facility at about 30%. To do what? How are you going to pay back? So that is the major concern. So that is why I think we need to have some moderation in the degree and the pace of the tightening of monetary policy. And, and I'm, uh, uh, let me just ask you this. H how do you expect manufacturers to cope at this time? Because before now, manufacturers had actually been complaining, uh, uh, they'd been complaining about the difficult business environment. Um, the last time we saw the manufacturer, uh, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria report uh, saying that over 700 uh, uh, manufacturing outfits have actually shut down in the last one year. And I remember when the central bank, I mean, the, the MPC now increased rate the last time uh, by 400 basis points. Um, you know, this manufacturer shouted themselves to us. And now we have 200 basis point increase. And, and there's still no certainty that this is the end of the road. We might still see another uh, tightening. We might still see further tightening now down the road. Uh, at least the CBN governor gave that indication. I'm just wondering how, how should manufacturers deal with this? 
Well, uh, obviously, it's, very, it's a very difficult time for manufacturers. And not only manufacturers, practically all investors that are interfacing with the credit market, with the financial markets. It's an extremely difficult time. Because when you take this issue of interest costs, you take the issue of energy costs, which the monetary policy instrument is not likely to bring down immediately, you take the issue of uh, the, the logistics, you take the issue of the import duty payment, which again has a lot to do with some of the CPN policies. And you also, on top of that, take into account the fact that the purchasing power is getting weaker by the day. So there's a whole lot of headwinds against manufacturers and other investors. Take a typical example of even maybe the hospitality industry, uh, the you know, hotels, for instance, or supermarkets, or even broadcasting. Yeah, you have to run the business 24-7. Most times, 80%, 70% of the time, you're running on diesel. Diesel is now 1,500, 1,400. How many businesses can survive that? You know? So if you have recourse to now fall back to say, okay, you want to take credit, how are you going to pick that back? And if you are not taking credit, what other source of financing do you have? Do you have the savings? Where is the savings? Do you have equity investors you can bring into the business? So it's, it's a quandary for many investors. But again, I'm more, I see the point that the CBN governor was making. And he emphasized the point that he was also aware of the impact of this hmm. on the real sector of the economy and other investors in the economy. But perhaps this is a price we need to pay in the short term. But in doing that, because it's only a business that is alive that can come back to reap the benefits of whatever you are trying to do. So we need to ensure that these businesses remain alive. So that is why I think that we need to moderate this. I mean, take the critical sectors, for instance, that create the jobs. You mentioned manufacturing. Take agriculture. Take construction. Take real estate. Take mining. How many of these sectors can survive with an interest rate that is close to 30% or even more? Even trading that people just look at as mm. if you can just make quick money. Even as a trader, can you make a return of 30% on, on investment? So if you are not careful, we'll be decoupling or disconnecting the real economy from the banking system. That is what is happening. And this is also affecting financial intermediation. It's affecting the quality of loans, the capacity to pay back. You know, non-performing loans is also likely to continue to increase. People are likely to be losing their collaterals. So these are the challenges that, that some of us are worried about. But if we do not so be... So I agree with that, him, there mm. has to be some balance between this tightening and also bringing in the, the, the fiscal policy component of the policy. So, so if we do not begin to see inflation moderate, what would you expect uh, the, 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 the CBN or the Monetary Policy Committee to do? Because, you know, as we speak, uh, inflation rate is still higher than the benchmark interest rate anyway. It's, it's still far higher, over 30 percent. And we're looking at um, an interest rate of just around 24.75 percent. So, so what then would you expect the bank to do? Well, there's a limit to which we can continue to pursue the orthodoxy of monetary policy in the sense in which some proponents are saying that you have to get interest rates to surpass inflation rates. We need to be very careful about that. The objective of all of this is to ensure we moderate liquidity. The CBN can look at other options of moderating liquidity apart from tightening interest rates. You know, for instance, I mean, we have seen an improvement in the yield on, on treasury base, mm. interest rates on treasury base increasing, and some other financial instruments. If you see an improvement in that, yes, a lot, of, a lot more people can begin to invest in that. And that is another way of, of moderating liquidity. Then, of course, we need to look at the fiscal side. Because in the last couple of months, we have seen an increase in liquidity in the public sector as a result of the reforms and as a result of the impact of the reform on government revenue, which is a positive thing. But we also need to be careful not to allow the improvement in revenue to create a liquidity challenge, which, will upset, which is upsetting 
the macroeconomic environment. So we can see how we can also sterilize some of this, uh, some of this revenue that is coming from government, so that these things are not feeding into the financial system or into the economy in a way that will be compelling the CPN mm -hmm. to be now be tightening monetary policy, which invariably will be affecting those who are investors. Because those who are in the public sector, they are not borrowing money as such. Their revenue is increasing. They can spend it. So they are liberty to spend it. Mm. You know, so these are these, these are some of the, the, the concerns that I think uh, we need to worry about. How, how would you assess uh, the, the measures now uh, the, the, the bank, uh, the, the, the CBN has taken in, in, in bringing some semblance of stability in, in the uh, forex market. Uh, at least we can see that uh, the Naira has been gaining strength uh, for a while now, and uh, somehow that uh, crazy volatility we had in, in, in the immediate past uh, is no longer there. So, so what would be your assessment of, um, you know, th the measures that the CBN has taken? Would, would you say these measures are actually responsible for the semblance of stability we're seeing at the moment? And where would you want to see, wh what more do you want to see? No, I think uh, we should, uh we should commend the CBN on what has been achieved so far. Uh, because the stability or the improvement, the appreciation of the exchange rate in the last one to two weeks is something that is commendable. And it's also an indication that the CBN is doing something right. So we must commend the CBN for that. But what I want to caution against is to ascribe this improvement exclusively to the tightening of monetary policy. Because if you look at what has happened in the last one month or so, there have been a rash of circulars, you know, coming from the central bank, yes. uh, targeting all the malpractices that are taking place in the foreign exchange markets. You know, apart from these fundamental economic issues, there are also people issues. There are malpractices, there are all sorts of manipulations, there are all sorts of speculative activities which the CBN has been trying to deal with. Mm. And that is also giving us some, some results. Because some of those activities are also creating distortions in the system. All manner of flows, all manner of demands, all manner of pressures on the on the foreign exchange market. So it's a combination of factors that has brought us or that has led to the positive outcome that you are seeing in the area of uh, the exchange rate. So I think I can sustain that, but not to come to the mindset that everything here it's about just tight monetary Tightening. policy. I think we need to decelerate the tightening of monetary policy and now see what you can do to scale up production, you know, through uh, some fiscal policy measures like, you know, import duty, like the cost of duty exchange rate, like uh, tax reliefs, and things like that. I think those things can also do a lot in terms of reducing the cost of production. I think that is very important. And, and speaking specific, specifically now, the customs, uh, customs duty exchange rate, I mean, it's, it's a big problem. It, it, we, we can't deny that it's also partly responsible for the inflation we have at, at the moment. You, you go to uh, the poor, importers are complaining that, look, the, the rate is too high that um, you know the, the central bank uses uh, what you call the black market rate now. Um, for, for, for estimating customs duties and all of that. And, and that import has actually come down, I mean, come down as a result of this. What, what do you think needs to happen? Because there are those who have suggested that, look, maybe we should have a, a completely different rate for, um, you know, for, for, for estimating customs duties now, so, something probably different and, and much lower than than um, you know what you have in the official window and, and even uh, lo much lower than what you have in the parallel market yes i align myself with that uh, with that position uh because at a time like this we also need to be thinking outside the box you know we think out of the box we cannot stick strictly to the orthodoxy of policies we need to recognize the peculiarities of our environment and uh, make the policies also reflect these peculiarities without necessarily upsetting the fundamental principles of the reforms that are ongoing. So I'm a believer in the fact that we need to have a special rate 
for the computation of import duty, which will be fixed possibly for the rest of the year. Because there are two issues about this customs duty exchange rate. Mm. There's the issue of the volatility and uncertainty that is creating in the international trade process. That is not good for international trade. It's not, we don't, we don't find that anywhere. Where the custom duty will be is changing from week to week, from day to day, from, you know, it doesn't happen. So because of the peculiarity of our environment, we should have a fixed exchange rate, maybe a thousand uh, naira to the dollar, maybe 900. That will help first to bring stability, second to reduce costs. And it is not going to upset the economic reforms in but, any but way. Won't that, so, so sorry to interject, but... What I think, yes, so, sorry to interject, but won't that be like going back to uh, this... Uh, re, uh, the regime we're trying to move away from. We're, we're trying to achieve convergence of, of uh, the, the, the rates now. Wouldn't that be like going back to that period when we had different rates for, you know, different sectors and, and, and essentially not making sense, something that we're trying to correct? No, 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 this one is different. We have to distinguish between the foreign exchange market itself where you buy and sell foreign exchange at a prevailing rate. We are talking about exchange rate for the competition of import duty. The whole idea of having a concessionary exchange rate for import duty is to bring down the cost of imports, the cost of production, the cost of raw materials, the cost of machineries, which the administration is trying to do. They are completely different things. Hmm. This other option does not offset anything it's, it's a level playing field, and whatever you are importing, you import at an exchange rate of uh, maybe a thousand naira, maybe nine hundred, exclusively for the import, for the competition of import duty. That does not apply to the foreign exchange market. So mm. they are completely different things. And if you need to reduce the temperature now, as far as inflation is concerned, these are some of the measures that we need to take, and this will require, you know some kind of coordination, because I know the administration is very strong on coordination. This will require some coordination between fiscal and monetary, you know, to think out of the box and do some extraordinary things to be able to deal with the crisis of uh, the cost of living. It's extremely very important. Just before I let you go, let, let me get your comments on this um, new um, capital requirements now for um, for the banks in the country, uh, deposit money banks, merchant banks, non-interest banks, what, what's your take? I mean, uh, you, you must have heard, of course, uh, it, it's something that you know. Uh, are we likely with, with, with the requirements now, are we likely to see uh, some banks actually merge or you think um, they'll be able to raise um, the, 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 the new capital requirements? Say, for instance, for those with uh, international authorization now, uh, the capital requirement of 500 billion, you think they'll be able to meet that? Well, even as we speak, uh, there, are, there are banks, about five of them, that already have hmm. a capital base in excess of, of a trillion naira. So some banks have gone beyond even this new capitalization. And this capitalization is necessary in order to strengthen the capacity of the banks uh, to be able to support their exposure. You know, that is very important. And this is also related to financial system stability. So it is necessary because the last time we have this major minimum capitalization uh, uh, requirement rule was in 2004, hmm. 2004, 2005, during the Soludo era. And at that time, for National Bank, I think it was 25 billion naira. Yes. 25 billion naira at that time. It's about $190 million. $190 million today is about $250 billion naira. So when you look at the relativity of it, really nothing has changed in terms of the real value of the capitalization. So if you need to preserve that value, you need to make this adjustment. Hmm. The only issue is that we are not making those adjustments as we are progressing. But it's something that we needed to do. So when you look at, at the value of the 25 billion at that time, or the value of 50 billion at that time, it's almost the same thing as 200 billion or 250 billion. 
you know, I'm talking of the 25 billion mm. today. So for me, I think it's in order, and some banks are already even above the one trillion threshold in terms of capital requirements. And the good thing about this new policy regime is that it's given 24 months. Yes. So there's enough time either to raise capital or to arrange a merger or to go for acquisition, whatever it is. So we are not faced with a stampede. People can take their time to do it. And I also need to caution that we also need to manage this information carefully so that we don't create problems for the smaller banks. Hmm. All our financial soundness indicators show that all our banks are stable, they are sound, we don't have any problem with them. Because when you have this situation, people in the process of competition, they could begin to demarket their competitors. All our banks are safe, and I think the city needs to send this message out loud and clear that there should be no panic as far as the status of any banks are concerned. One more question, Doug, before you go. Uh, at this time, many Nigerians, the majority of Nigerians actually want reassurance that, look, things are going to get better, that the economy is gradually moving on the right trajectory, and that it's just a matter of time, things would be better. Of course, that's, that's the assurance that the, gov the government has been given for quite a while now. But as an economist, as someone who sits on the sidelines, you know, to just watch, do you think Nigerians should be rest assured that with what you see, that things are going to get better? Yes, I believe. I believe that things will get better. Uh, I believe there is light at the end of the tunnel. And we are beginning to see evidence of that anyway. Uh, the reforms have been have been very painful. Uh, it has been very difficult for us to, to, to absorb. Uh, again, the reforms were inevitable reforms. But we are beginning to turn the corner. That is my sincere view. You can see now that the CBN is in a better position now to begin to intervene in the market, which is part of what is bringing about this moderation. The CBN said it has cleared all the backlogs. That is some relief. By the time we begin to reduce our importation of petroleum products, that will also bring some stability. The fiscal consolidation position in terms of fiscal revenue and all of that, that is also improving. We just hope and pray that the managers of our resources will manage those resources well. Because across all levels of government, there is more, much more revenue to be able to do something to push in the effects of all these challenges. So I, I think that we are on the right path. But it's also important, and the president is already, already doing that, to ensure that we bring on board as many perspectives as possible. Hmm. And we properly coordinate policies, and we take on board the perspectives of operators in the economy. Because we cannot leave the economy entirely to technocrats. Hmm. We should be engaging those who are operators in the economy so that if there are loose ends in the policy process, we can tighten those loose ends. Okay. Things that will make us reckon with the realities of our economy. That is extremely very important. Dr. Muda Yusuf, thank you so very much for your time. Thanks for coming on the show as always. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We'll take a short break now and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Don't go away. Opinions are free, facts are sacred, the truth is universal. How, in practical terms, can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. On DG360, we give you a complete dose of everything. I have not believe what politics are saying in this uh, part of the world. The new Nigeria is possible, a future is possible. We delve into the issues. Dissect it so that you can understand it. Use it to take action. DG360, dissecting the issues. Welcome back. Now, one of those declared wanted by the military in connection with the brutal murder of 17 military personnel at Okwama Community in Delta State has turned himself in to the police. Clement Ikolo Ogene Rukewe, traditional ruler of Ewu Kingdom, Unugeli South local government area of Delta State, reported to the police hours after the military published the list of wanted persons. The Delta State Police spokesperson, Bright Edafi, confirmed Ogene Rukewe's surrender now on Friday and said the monarch turned himself in on Thursday. 
The defense headquarters had Thursday declared Ogene Rukewe among eight persons wanted in connection with the murder of the military personnel. Now, here is what the newly installed monarch said after turning himself in. Based on the, the uh, news I came to say I'm wanted, I know nothing about this heinous crime. Uh, I'm the traditional ruler, yes, I'm the traditional ruler of a Buruvo kingdom. However, I know nothing about it. Now, the development comes shortly after President Bola Tinubu gave the Nigerian military full authority to bring those behind the killing of the 13 soldiers and four military officers to justice. Now, the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa, vowed that those behind the death of the military personnel in Delta State would be hunted down. The slain military personnel have since been laid to rest at the National Military Cemetery in Abuja. And may God rest their souls. Let's discuss some of the fallouts from the sad and unfortunate incident now. Joining me on the show is uh, Temi Tokpa Olodo, who is a preventive terrorism consultant. And also joining me, uh, joining us, I should say, is uh, Oluwashi Fadaini, security analyst. Now, both men, of course, are joining us from uh, the United Kingdom. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the program. And um, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Olodo. Um, uh, how significant is it that uh, one of those declared uh, wanted now has turned himself in? Hey, at the end of the day, they would definitely have to turn themselves in anyway because there is no place to run to. Actually, the whole Nigeria has become a prison. I think it's significant um, that the individuals have, you know, put themselves forward, you know, handed themselves, you know, to to the appropriate authority and he's not being hunted down and killed, so that at least we could know or hear his own side of the story, which of course is what is now happening. But he's not the only one. We also have a professor of physics, yeah. and this more or less illustrates the kind of challenges and complexity that goes with security issues and security operations in Nigeria at the moment. My hope and prayer is that, um, I'm, I was a bit concerned. I know the military have already illustrated and explained that they wanted they, they will hunt the individuals down but in line with the nigerian constitution you know the only authority or enforcement authority that has the power to prosecute this kind of you know incident mm. is the nigerian police so for the individuals to to hand themselves over to the nigerian police and then nigerian police hand them over to the military is a bit of a concern for me you know i would have thought that the police in conjunction with the military, we conduct the interview. The individual will have his lawyer, and then he will be detained by the police and then presented before the court. Maybe the military still has to conclude its own investigation. Maybe the military still has to conclude its investigation before handing back to the police for prosecution. But that's just by the way. Um, uh, let me come to you. Um, I, I, I'll come to you, Fadani. You, you look at, are, are you surprised? that up till this moment as we speak that professor because it, for me it's a big surprise that a, a professor was named among those wanted but are you surprised that up till this moment the professor has not turned himself in yeah well when i saw the the list um, and i saw a professor of physics i was like i was surprised myself because one would expect that the um, professor would be the first person to surrender himself in and, and say his own side of the story. But as it is, nobody is above the law and crime is, like anybody is prone to crime. So, I, so I'm not really surprised about this. Truth is, you, you look at all of this, all, all of the people who were, who were listed, you, you look at all of them, and let's not forget there's also a female among them. You look at all of them, there are some you could, one could say, may not turn themselves in when you look at that list for instance say for instance the suspected chief mastermind of of this attack do you expect that uh, at some point he will turn himself in uh, well as it is now there is no hiding place so i believe um it might take a matter of time he will surely turn turn himself in because the the monarch has actually turned himself in and I expected the, 
the monarch to have like immediately the issue happened like it should be the first person to go to the police station and say look this uh, this is what is happening mm. in my domain and this is what i know these are the people i know that that are involved but instead of him to ru run away and after some while after after he has been declared wanted, coming back to say his own side of the story, like nobody we we want want to believe him because in the first instance he should be the person to to like call the police. Like this is what is happening in my domain. This is what has happened. What can we do? What is the way forward? You understand? But immediately this thing happened, like everybody disappeared, and when when he, he has learned that uh, they they've declared him wanted, and that is when like he, like he started coming out and said his own side of the story so as it is it is very hard to believe him though uh, i'm not saying um he, he is guilty like or if he has committed any mm. any crime but this thing happened in your domain like you you should be the first person to to, to like take responsibility and call the appropriate authority like this is what is happening what is the way forward what can we do Timmy Tokwa, you, you would expect that when things like this, you know, when things go wrong in a community or when there's a crisis, the elders, the traditional leaders of that community should be able to intervene and resolve the problem. Uh, why, could, could you help us understand why it was difficult, for instance, for the elders of this community, the leaders, the community leaders of this community, why they were unable to even stop this from happening in the first place? I think the reason is, is the Nigerian factor. The way it has happened, the Ife Modern Keke incident, incident in Guzo and other places. There is this impunity in Nigeria that, you know, we either have the ears of the army, we have the ears of the police, we know a big man, we could do whatever we want to do, and nobody, you know, will face justice. And that has always been the challenge. In the challenge. And we know, even though, you know, some of these Individuals are running helter skelter to run away from the from the environment because of the history of Nigeria. Again, the Nigeria factor. It's always presumed that um, the minute we come in to take revenge, but of course, we need to promise the nation that they will not take the law into their hands. They are law abiding, and we've seen that at least so far. You know they've. Con they con conduct themselves in a professional manner and they're handling the issue. And my hope is that that will be taken forward. I'm hoping mm -hmm. that community leaders across Nigeria will use this as a test case to know that when incidents are happening, you know, and things like this are happening, they need to work across parties. And I don't see why land dispute issues of com community concerns re, re, leads to people killing each other. It doesn't happen anywhere else. It should not happen in a democratic society. And we need to put a stop to it. And that's the reason why I'm pleased that these individuals are coming forward. And I'm pleased that they're not being hunted out and killed, but they rather, you know, they hopefully one after the other, they'll start giving themselves up. And then we could know the true story of what happened. Because what we have is one side of the story, an unfortunate incident that led to the death of 17, you know, um, gallant soldiers, you know, and may their soul rest in perfect peace. But it's our hope that we'll be able to un you know, unloose this, you know, this whole incident or mask it and know exactly what happened and what led to their timely death. And the individuals involved should definitely face the justice in line with the Nigerian constitution. And, and we're not just talking about just, just killing here, uh, Fadani. We're, we're not just talking about, you know, it's not as if these this military personnel were, were shot and just killed. But they were decapitated as well. Decapitated. Heads chopped off, stomachs uh, torn open and all of that. The, the question you begin to ask yourself is, why would anybody go to that extent of carrying out that kind of brutal murder? What exactly, what exactly could push people to go to that level? Oh, it is so barbaric and I, th and, and I hope one or two lessons have been learned from this incident because at the end of it all, like what lessons have been learned? So over time and uh, for years uh, before now, the issue of land dispute has been like a common common thing all over the world and mm. as we 
we are well aware of the issue of um, uh, Israel and Palestine and all of that. So the issue of land dispute has been a matter of concern over the years, all over the world. But then, when there's issue of land dispute, who are the people involved in the resolution? So then we talk about the uh, community leaders, um, the religious leaders, the, the state government, and that kind of cases have been handled by the court. But now, involving the military is like is a discussion for another day because looking into their rules of engagement, the military are not versatile, they are not trained in that aspect of uh, uh, dispute resolution, especially that relates to land. So that is a lesson to be learned for another day, and I hope one or two lessons are learned, like I've said. So, but killing a military men, 17 for that matter, to the extent of uh, decapitating their bodies, like it's very barbaric, and, and I never wish this to happen to my enemies, not to talk of the people that are like, um, like putting their lives on the line to save um, of the masses, like for the nation. So it is really, really, really terrific. And we're talking about military personnel with, with families, with wives, children, brothers, sisters. Uh, it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. Uh, Timmy Tokwe, uh, we, we, this, this uh, heroes, uh, because as far as I'm concerned, they are heroes. They've been buried. And of course, you, you heard uh, the president. How important is it that uh, the, the president would, uh, you know, make that, that announcement, uh, not just, you know, ask, uh, uh, for instance, awarding scholarship to, uh, uh, to all of their children, uh, providing houses for their family members anywhere at all in the country that they want, uh, also conferring uh, posthumous national honors on them and asking the military authorities to ensure that their entitlements are settled w within 90 days. H how important is that, especially for morale, uh, for, for the morale of uh, the, the, the officers that we have? It's very profound. I, I felt like crying when I actually had you know, those words being um, pronounced. Uh, the reason being that uh, I'm one of those very strong critics of the Nigerian state in the way in which we handle our fallen heroes. I, I, I'm one of those that believe that the flag in Downey, uh, not Downey Street, sorry, the flag in Asurok should actually have been brought down, you know, pending when those guys were buried. That's my personal belief. It happens all over the world. If a soldier is killed in the UK, everything will shut down. There will be no party. There will be no one base. All the meetings will shut down until this uh, incident have been, report, have been resolved. And that was what we saw, even with the Chibo girls, mm. where some people were still partying, even when the Chibo girls were gone. And even with other kidnapping incidents, the train, you know, the train kidnap, incidents were still going on as if nothing has happened. We need to start becoming human. We need to start becoming our brother's keeper. And what the president do, has done is commendable. I appreciate him. I respect him for that. And I know many Nigerians have joined me in doing that. And I'm hope, my hope is that, um, unlike the incident of the past that we've heard of, where the military are quick to kick people out of the barracks, that will not be the case with, this, um, with the families of these fallen heroes and that um, we will set a good example. Because the bottom line is, if an Israeli soldier dies, you know, he, he, go, he, he goes to his death smiling, knowing full well that um, the area where he's been killed, we know or felt hmm. the, 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 the forces, the, the power and the might of the Israeli army. And that is what I feel should be happening in Nigeria's situation, where if anything happens to our soldiers, our, our men, and they are within... They are working within the rights of what was given to them in the Constitution. Then let people know that this is not acceptable and it's not going to happen. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with what Mr. President has done, and I'm happy with the way the, the military have conducted themselves on this manner. And it's our hope that we will not have a repeat of this again, and that our people will start honoring you know, our soldiers like we do here in the UK. You know, People should open up their restaurants, give them this card, this can't for entering into cars because they are they are doing the ultimate price. They are actually going out there to put their life down for us. And we should be appreciative as a as a society, as a community, as a nation. We should honor people that are living you no know, living their life 
just to keep us safe. Fadani, what have you got to say about that? Because this must be very important for uh, the remaining military uh, personnel who are out there uh, trying to keep us safe, who are out there in the northeast, all over the country, at trouble sports and, uh, you know, sleeping in, in the trenches and all of that, because most of them would have been watching to see what the Nigerian uh, government was going to do over this. Well, um, uh, I will commend the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for, for, for what he has done, especially conferring the national honor on the fallen heroes. So this will be a moral boost out to other, um, other military personnel in the field and is a great gesture, which I really, really appreciate uh, personally. So, and I hope um, like the people of Nigeria respect the military, give them the respect that they fully deserve because like it is not easy putting your life on the line for others while, while others are like sleeping, hmm. sleeping with their two eyes closed. So it's a lot of sacrifice and I understand how devastating it can be for the families. Like it is very pathetic. Uh, pathetic. Uh, and of course, there's no question at all that the highest gift that you can give to the souls of this uh, falling heroes will be to ensure that those who committed this heinous act are brought to justice. So how important is it, Timmy Tokwe, how important is it to ensure that those behind this are brought to justice and, uh, and that justice is served openly for everyone to see? I think it's very important, and I think we need to use technology to aid you know, the, uh, the quick apprehension of these individuals. They use their phones. They will need to use their phone. They will need to use their ATM. So these people can be tracked. They can't, it's either somebody is helping them or they have enough cash uh, to do whatever they want to do to escape. And it's not possible. If their faces have been flashed all over, people should come out and, you know, identify them and report them to the appropriate authorities. But can I also use this opportunity mm. to say to Nigerians, we know that there are some people out there, some officers, who will not act in the appropriate manner. No matter what an officer does, obey first and then lay your complaint at the appropriate, with the appropriate authority. Mm. If a, police, a policeman stops me here in the UK and is doing it illegally, I would comply with whatever he says, but I would then go to his authority, to the appropriate authority and report him. But don't slap policemen, don't hit policemen, don't jack their jackets or their, their uniform because that's the Nigerian uniform they are wearing. If they've done something wrong, go to the appropriate authority, we see the police doing it, they derope them, they ensure that they are disciplined properly. But we need to stop all these fighting policemen, fighting our soldiers, slapping them on the street. We need to stop all this behavior. Let's behave like a civilized nation. We, before the Europeans came, are a civilized nation, and we should remain civilized. What will be your final word, Fadani? For, for the families of the bereaved, for them to be fully compensated, I think and I believe that justice must be served. Like, what, like whatever it takes, and no matter how long it takes, they must get justice, and that is when they will be fully rest in peace. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on the show, and thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. I thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. All right, that's it. Uh, that's how much we can take this week. But thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.
Nation viewed from the news of yet another harrowing kidnapping of school children in Kaduna State. A stark reminder of the persistent danger posed by armed groups targeting vulnerable communities. Under my leadership, no child will be left behind. All of them will come back home by the grace of inshallah. These events, coupled with the ambush and killing of several soldiers by unidentified gunmen in Delta State, has amplified concerns about the effectiveness of the administration's security apparatus. President Bola Tinubu, who campaigned on promises to enhance national security, has faced criticism for the continued prevalence of such high-profile attacks within the first few months of his tenure. Security and politics who brought in you know, non-state actors into this country. Most important thing is to implement the revived National Security Strategy 2019. Uh, change the current state-centric approach to security to a human-centered approach. The citizens' patience is wearing thin as they demand immediate and visible changes. Community leaders and civil society organizations have called for more proactive measures including the need for collaboration with local stakeholders to strengthen on-the-ground intelligence and preemptive actions against potential threats. If we honestly investigate uh, this issue, you will find that it's an issue of uh, attack and counter-attack, attack or reprisal. What policies, what, uh, uh, what relationships, what uh, expressions did we not make that has brought this thing on our faces? We've seen cases where villagers harbor criminals, offer them food, give them water, welcome them. It's not a us in any way. Yet you're not going to inform the, the police or any security agency. It's very easy for us to blame people. They are very, very easy. But when you go through what they've gone through, when they report it, Welcome to the program. In Nigeria, six Labour Party lawmakers in Enugu State House of Assembly have defected to the People's Democratic Party. Also, the Senegalese president, the newly elected one, that's Basiru Dumaye, uh, who promises to promote economic patriotism and renegotiate foreign contracts, may face many challenges in restoring investor confidence and also stabilizing the economy and keeping growth on track. Welcome to The Conversation. I am Dakbo Adigboye. Let's talk. We will start in the program of today from Nigeria, where six Labour Party lawmakers in Enugu State House of Assembly have defected to the People's Democratic Party. Now, Uche Ugu, the Speaker of the House, announced the defection of the lawmakers while reading their letters at the plenary on Thursday. The lawmakers said the Labour Party had evolved into perpetual discord with various factions and broadened in legal battles, which uh, undermines its ability to effectively serve the interest of the people. Well, to make sense of this, I'm joined on the program by Dr. Abayomi Arabambi, the National Publicity Secretary uh, that uh, Alaji Basiru Lamidia Papa led uh, National Working Committee of the Labour Party. Thank you for your time, uh, Dr. Arabambi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank I, you for inviting me. I mean, interesting times again uh, within the Labour Party. Uh, let me start by getting your reaction to a part of what the lawmakers who defected said. According to them, they said that uh, the Labour Party, which was once considered a beacon of hope for progressive ideas, has uh, regrettably become synonymous with internal squabbles. Uh, what's mm -hmm. your reaction to that? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think they were just being economical with the truth. A lot of them, they were in PDP, uh, had been issued before they came to the Labour Party, and all of them voted for that governor. In Enugu. So we are not part of we are not part of You said all of them voted for the governor of Enugu State. I said Labour Party of Peter Obi supported the governor of Enugu against our governor. Against our governor candidate. Do, uh, 
I mean, we cannot be controversial on that. They already, they came with him from PDP. Can you back that up so in they any way? Already, they already have, you know, I mean, this player for PDP in Ebony. They supported PDP. In New York, they supported PDP. In River, they supported PDP. In Plato, they supported PDP. In Quelga, they supported PDP. So we are not new. They are just PDLP. They are the PDP, I mean, PDP party in the Labour Party. So we wish them well in their soldiers. And uh, I mean, uh, th this, of course, uh, is, is uh, uh, quite a, uh, much of a surprise. So are you saying that you are not surprised, you know, at the defection of some of your card-carrying members? I said they are just, uh, let me say, temporary card-carrying member of the Labour Party. They mm. came with Peter Kobe from the Labour Party, from PDP to the Labour Party. And like I started this task now, in Oyo, Rivers, Plateau, Enugu, Eponyi. The Peter Obi directed them to go and vote for PDP. So we are not surprised. In you fact, said Peter Obi directed them. Do, I mean, you, you, you keep making reference them. to Peter Obi. Do you have exactly. evidence to this? No, it's all over. It's all over. We supported. Gogu State supported by Labour uh, the Labour Party in the last election. You you see them. Peter Obi was on air about Enugu. He was there. In the river state, all of you saw him now when he was in river asking uh, uh, the governor then that give him the presidency. Let me give you every other thing. It's not covered, it's not covered. He was in New York, you saw the altercation, you know, they, I mean, he has there. He was in a point, you know, no, I don't want that one, it's just a new thing. Peter Obi is a PDP member in Labour Party, a pure PDP member in Labour Party. So we are not surprised, even if he choose to go back to where he comes from, we are not going to be surprised. That's the fact. Okay, I mean, because right now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you, how deep, you know, is the division within the party right now? Because we know that there's the Apapa-led faction, there's the Buri, and uh, of course, uh, there's the OB movement. I mean, the Labour Party just looks like a hotbed of uh, political uh, division right now. I mean, how, how deep, you know, is, 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 this, is this problem? Well, I've been issue, we thought they came to rescue Nigeria. But later, we found that they came to rescue their pockets. They came to rescue their, most of them, their business, you know, that, that was dead before. They came to rescue it. A lot of Peter B supporters came with two legs to the Labour Party. Some of them went with six legs. Some of them are private jets now. So we are not petrol, we are not border. They didn't come to the Labour Party because they wanted to rescue Nigeria. But now, what is the cause of the problem? Joe Ajero himself, as an agent of destabilization, wanted Labour Party to be used as a party for insurrection. You saw all this plan, every little thing, they want to make the government, I mean, the, the government ungovernable. And we told them, please, you cannot use that party for insurrection. They should go back to Afghan, or they go back to PDP. They, we don't want them to come and destroy the Labour Party for us. And that was why every action, you know, has shown that tendency towards them using the Labour Party for insurrection, to overthrow democracy. But again, you, you, I mean, you would also not want to undermine the contribution or the impact uh, Peter Obi has made when it comes to, number one, the status of the party. I mean, uh, since his entry, he has been uh, able to, or his influence has successfully positioned the party as a strong or contending opposition uh, within, uh, I mean, uh, the political space. And uh, more often than not, even with all of the you know, rancor happening within the party has tried to distance himself. So why do you keep pointing fingers at him? If President Bola Ametinubu did not distance himself from APC crisis, if Atiku did not distance himself from APC party, what qualification did I mean, will be have? Let me tell you the fact. He knew why he came to the Labour Party. They want to institutionalize our party as a regional party. He has his own mindset. And the mindset is not in tandem with our own belief. Now I'm going to put a poster. When Abure was arrested in Benin, Obi came out to condemn the arrest and said the chairman cannot be treated like a common criminal. Joe Ajero, when a resident order was handed over, they said it was a forgot judgment. They said we are frivolous and we have no document, all our documents are fake. But today, all of them, you see them on here, holding the same document. 
Why will anybody approbating and reprobating? They have their reason why they are calling Aburi. And when the center can now, when the center can no, no, um, can no longer hold, they now backtrack. This is why you see Obina saying chairman should go to the north. You see Tanko is saying chairman should go to the north. But when we complain in 2022 that we cannot have a candidate, national chairman, the DG, the secretary of the campaign council, all from the south, they said we don't know what we are saying. It shows that they have something that united them before, but that's all, I mean, that same thing are now separated them. Until when they explain to Nigeria, Joe Ajaro cannot pass vote of confidence on Julius Aburi just in April 17 last year. And to come back and pass vote of no confidence on him, he should apologize to Alaji Davide Papa because he's very sure that what we told them about Julius Aburi is a fact that he was involved in forgery, federal and criminal conspiracy. This is what, what they are saying. Peter Abi cannot call Aburi a criminal because as at that time, when we have your plan, they said no court of public jurisdiction are convicted Aburi. And that we stand upon. But now, I said it will be to have at least turned down his apology to Alaji Labidia Papa. I expected Joe Ajero, who is behaving like nothing but a political terrorist, to have turned down his apology. Because how can you, as a chair, I mean, president of a labor union, come into the court on every 8th to even bully the judge, Joseph Mohazu? All of them were inside the court. I tell you that they were receiving court inside that court that day. Joe, Joe, I mean, Comrade Buaja, General Secretary of Energy, were receiving court inside the court all that day, just for them, you know, to cause confusion before they now proceeded to the Secretariat, where they found vote of confidence on Aburi. Because according to them, they said no court of confidence jurisdiction has convicted Aburi. And today, I don't know which court convicted Aburi. But the center no longer old, and now they are having issues. So I expected them to turn down that apology to Nigeria because Elijah Nigeria Papa is like a man who has seen tomorrow that where all of you are, you have no choice that to come back. But today, Elijah Nigeria Papa is fully in charge of you the said, party because you, we have you five. You said Elijah Nigeria Papa is fully in charge of the party. Yeah, because we have five motions for state of execution before the Supreme Court. Over the over the mass judgment, and we have also filed an appeal. And most of us stay, meaning all of them, everybody involved, as I when we started, they need to maintain status quo anti anti -bellum. And this was reason why we are telling N N the NSC that they cannot ambush the judgment of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court is the final habitat of any issue. Now that we are placed ourselves before them, and they are not a party before the same court, he need to. So, Peter, us will be calling for his arrest. You'll be, calling, you'll be calling arrest. for you'll be because calling for the arrest of who? Of Joe Ajero, because you, he must not be conducting himself in an act that is not to accomplish your peace, you know, to Nigeria. Up to today, Joe Ajero has not commiserated with the federal government, with the Nigerian military and the Nigerian people over the death of those 16 Galan soldiers. There were more than gruesomely in a in a in a delta. But you can see today, you can write letter to proclaim an unknown person as the BOT a national chairman. That was what concerned about because you were planning. I'm sorry, to I, I, I'm sorry, Doctor Do Do Arabambi, you, you, you're making quite a lot of uh, you know allegations, and uh, I must just uh, clearly say that this, of course, doesn't re uh, represent uh, the views of New Central. I would it love if you can it you know, back it. You don't want to run for president. It is my view that you are general planning insurrection. Because everything that I've been doing in this country constant and are allowed to accomplish your peace. That is your general. When we have a matter in the Supreme Court, why would he now go and be, you know, putting himself to ambush that judgment? If not for that, he just, he just because of his own selfish desire, his inordinate ambition and especially tendency was the reason why he was just facing that, that crisis. Okay, so let, let's backtrack a bit, right? Um, during the last elections, who did you work for? I voted, unfortunately, for Peter B. Why I did voted you? Unfortunately. I never knew. Okay. I never knew it was parading a false humility. I voted for Labour Party presidential candidate. So, so, so you vote? Then it was, of course, uh, it was a unified agreement that he was the leader. Of so course, I voted for Labour Party. 
Okay, and that was uh, Peter Obi who was on the ballot, right? Of course, of course. Okay, what, what, if I may ask, why exactly did you vote? On what grounds? What, what ideology did you see? What were the things you were looking out for? So as, a, as a party man, I can't vote against the, in the election. I get it, me. I okay. knew that election is not going to take us anywhere because we failed to punish INEC with the list of over 45,000 police unit agents. I knew even in my police unit, I was the one that paid for the agents. They, are, they didn't pay any agents. But you know, to fulfill all that just then, I voted for the Labour Party. Okay, so, so I, I, I'm sorry to cut in. I'm sorry to cut in. So you said you voted for uh, your presidential candidate then, that's Peter Obi. And at the opening of your statement, you said some of your party members, including the six you mentioned, worked against the party. So I, I'm just trying to you know, make sense of this. No, I said for governorship, for being directed. It is not an allegation. I have videos on the rise on, on channel where he said the obedience to go and vote for PDP. He said it. I, I am not the one that said it. You I said you have videos of that. I said I have his video where he said we Mapel Gum, Miss Mapel Gum Yusuf. On channel, where Miss Mapel Gum you challenge him that are you not are you sure these people, this thing is not an antipathy? He said it's not an antipathy, it's about character, competence, and integrity. And the PDP has that more than Labour Party. But he came to tell us that he has integrity to the present election. But we don't have present election, but we put his gear into reverse. And now directed Labour Party members to be voting for PDP. And in Enugu, I, I'm sorry in that, Rivers State, you are I'm, I'm sorry that cannot be substantiated, but but I'm still going to go back no, to that. It's in Rivers, you saw him with Wicked. You saw him with Wicked. In New York, you saw him with Makide. In Cross River, you saw him with Otu. In Enugu, you saw him. In Ebo, you so saw him. So when you, I'm sorry, when you saw this, um, what I call it, division right now, what did you do as a uh, loyal party man? No, at that time, immediately after the present election, now he began the division. That, oh, now that his election is, uh, has come and gone, they should now go and vote for PDP. Don't forget, I said he came from PDP. So his loyalty is it here. Are you getting me? So even if he chooses to go back, we don't care. Revert, I mean, with reference to what is happening now, the only status quo we have in the Labour Party now is Aladdin Abidia Papa. They can continue their rough, rough, rough fight with Abure because they were the one that said he's the same, Saint Abure. Mm -hmm. They cannot come around now to say, oh, Abure is a criminal. For us, we are not interested in that. We are not interested. All we are interested in is that they should always maintain status quo antebellum until when Supreme Court takes its final decision. Because the crisis we have is between Allah and Media Papa and Julius Abure, and Julius Abure has the Taubi on his side, Julius Abure has the NSC on his side, Julius Abure has the obedience on, 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 on his side. So on so whose si who, sorry, so on whose side is Allah Media Papa? Allah Papa is on the side of the Labour Party. And who are those attracted or who are those he's attracting? You said uh, uh, that Abure is attracting the NLC, is attracting Peter Obi. Who is Alaji Alamidia? What, what level of influence yes. is he exciting in the party? Labor party? When I say Labour Party, I mean the entire Labour Party structure. Today, the question you asked me was that he attracted NLC. Where is NLC today? The, the, the power vote on no confidence on him. He attracted Peter Obi. Your, your, your yes, the Takoji said that Obi said he should resign. But the Tommy said he should resign. Obi said he should resign. So what has he attracted? He has not attracted anything. They were united by a common goal of political insurrection. So whatever the matter have between them now, they need to go and explain why last year, like I said, why last year they passed vote of confidence. But today, they passed vote of no confidence. That should be a reason for it. They should explain. But I know there is a lot more, you know, than me the high. There is a lot more. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Arabambi. Uh, just permit me. Uh, the way you, you know, uh, sound uh, is like uh, someone who lost out, you know, of a contest. And, and you appear pretty bitter. I mean, permit me. Um, how bitter are you? No, no, no. You see, the governor of Imo, no, the governor of Kano and Plateau State, they lost at the Electoral Pension Tribunal. They lost at the court of appeal. That doesn't make them a bad loser. They still went to court 
on the day to call the federal judgment. We are in call with Aburi. We are not in call with NFC. I want to say that. I mean, I want to say that part clear. We are in call with Aburi. We are not in call with NFC. NFC is not the owner of the Labour Party. NFC registered Labour Party does not make them the owner. And I'm going to start two instances for you. In Section 77 1 of the Electoral Act, says if, if a party wants to register, are you getting me? I'm with you. As, yeah, once to register as a political party, has now become a corporate entity that can be sued and that can sue. And in the Electoral Act, I mean, uh, Section 22. Now, in the electoral, as I say, I mean, chapter, I mean, uh, section 77, sub 1, says that any political party that will register must have membership. Their constitution must be submitted to the principal office, which is the INEC. The list of their national visa must be submitted to INEC. Then this is you go and submit it. So when you register a company, it, it has a life of its own. Once they generated the constitution, we they now submit it. Like your TV station now, if there's any infraction, nobody will take your MD to court. Join with the company. The company is separate, your MD is separate because it is not an entity that will guide them. Your constitution guides your TV station. Dr. Arabambi. The constitution you operate upon is not the constitution your MD will operate upon. Dr. Arabambi. So, the party has not become an entity, a corporate body. Mm. Register that now has a life of its own because that's the constant provision upon which we are operating. All right, Dr. Arabambi, I'm sorry. I might just need to cut in. We need to go on a quick break. When we return, of course, we'll pick up from where we stopped. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every race, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. You're still watching the conversation on New Central Television. We are talking about matters arising within the Labour Party, where a lot of squabbles, you know, is ongoing. And of course, uh, joining me to make sense of this is still Dr. Bayomi Arabambi, the National Publicity Secretary of Alaji Basiru, a Pampa led faction of the Labour Party. Uh, Dr. Arabambi, thank you for your time. Um, and of course, I, I will still stand on my previous question before we went on that break, talking about what exactly is the objective of the mm -hmm. APAPA-led faction? What do you want uh, as regards mm -hmm. the Labour Party? What exactly the is the motive? of our APAPA faction is that no hijacker, no democracy assassin will take over the Labour Party. We will not allow... All these political vampires. Why does the but why does the Apapa led faction consider itself the bona fide uh, or regional or real members? I that is talking to you has spent 16 years. Apapa has spent 22 years. Obi has not even completed two years. Everybody will be talking. Peter B, Peter B. Was it the one that brought in Mimiko as a governor? Was it the one that brought Yamagege as a senator? Was it the well, well, well uh, yeah. We have won so many senators now. Was a uh, uh, was a uh, Mimiko not the governor in uh, in Labour Party? You said you said okay, the party. You said proud to be sorry. You said proud to 
Obisa involvement, as the Labour Party has produced not quite a number of senators, would you like to give a list of when, of course, uh, uh, I mean, Apapa was in charge and uh, the senators or officials that produced? No, it was during the election. We are saying they are contending until when we finish from the Supreme Court. Everything that was done was everybody joint effort for the 2023. It doesn't to be that did it because, number one, there was no fund for Mr. Peter Obi campaign to the Labour Party. Our National Secretariat, we, we, we contributed money with Aburi to sort that other Secretariat. That was our Secretariat. All our Secretariat, we paid for it, not Peter Obi or any of his colleagues. During the campaign, no cobble was released to the Labour Party. Our agents were not paid. Or should talk was on air sometimes ago where we were unable to pay agents. Tanko said where we were able to pay agents. So wherever they, whatever they use the money for, we don't know. But as I speak, I know Peter B is still with Labour Party $15 million as he's saying it, and I know Peter B is sorry, with Labour Party $20 Sorry, million. those are pretty weighty. You said Peter B is still with Labour Party's $15 million. $15 million, money from the dashboard, because when that, he presented his do account... You, do you have Nigeria, evidence? I'm coming. I'm coming. When he presented his account, did you see any $1 there? Uh, I'm, I'm, sorry. No I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dr. Arabambi. These are pretty I'll easy allegations. You um, would have you know, appreciated it if you can substantiate it with it is my, physical evidence. No, let them come out to deny it. They have an account with Fidelity Bank. You saw? Maybe you are not even following Akashi. Please go and read what Oduchi said. Go and read the letter he wrote to EFCC. I will send you a certified copy. You know, they are in court now. A lot of our money have been mismanaged. How can we go to an election and no agent will be paid? Is there an explanation for that? You are going to an election with people that are principality in the election process. You want to do an election with Tinumbu? You want to do an election with Atiku? You are not playing with it. You, you, don't, you don't pay agent. You don't upload the needs of the agent. And you said you want to win. I, I'm, sorry. To I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, 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 I might just need to come in here. Dr. Arabambi, I, I might just need to come in here. I mean... Popular knowledge, right? Um, I mean, before the uh, last election, the Labour Party was largely seen as a, you know, regional party. Yes, uh, quite a uh, relative not success. Uh, that, please, let me, let me, this was prior to the, of course, uh, entry of uh, uh, Peter Let me, let me get you. Before it became, you know, a major thought force. So, my, okay, let, let, let's hear you. Let me tell you, Omar Gege was a senator in Labour Party. If you buy the owner of uh, the, I mean, the, this, uh, this, this oil, Mimiko was a two-time governor in Labour Party. When Obi was not minding the business, what should anybody now say oh, because of Obi? We have won as of rep in 2015 in, in, in Benue. We have won as of assembly you know, in New York. We have won local government election in some other states before Obi, Obi came. Now, what do we have from Obi? Obi? They came. Do you know what they call Badwe? They came to Badwe. Doctor, do, do, they came Doctor, to, Doctor they came Arabambi, to I'd like to say a big thank you. I'd like to say a big thank you for your time on the program. Um, I mean, uh, thank you once again for being a part of it. Just in 30 seconds, what exactly do you want? Cons I mean, for the Labour Party, according to you, to be unified, what needs to be done in 30 seconds? Now, if people that are supposed to settle a crisis are unable to settle it, we want them to go back to Afghan. Let them go back to the original party. Our party is not meant for the Igbo. Look at you, Ajero. So are you... Announcing who? You, 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 our, you just our, made a statement here. You said your party is not meant for the Igbo. Yes, of course. Because so are you the saying the Labour, Labour Party... party your faction, the lead faction no, 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 of the no, no, Labour no. Party is, our, is, a, what, is, a, is, a, is meant for no, what exactly? The, no, we have the north in, in Labina Apai WC, we have the southwest, we have the George. But in their own, it is all about Igbo Nines. So what is your own about? What is your own faction about? Nigeria. It's about Nigeria because we are all complete. In but our you Nigeria. appear to contradict yourself in a way. I'm sorry. But, but uh, Abura, by the way, is, is from a do state and is not even... Uh, no, I drive with myself. But thank you so much for your time, Dr. Arabambi. Thank you. Thank we you very much. I appreciate your time on the program.
And of course, uh, you've just uh, had the voice of Dr. Abayomi Araba, the National Publicity Secretary, Al Haji Basiru, La Media Papa led faction of the Labour Party. We'll go on a quick break. When we return this time around, we will be going to Senegal, where they are having a new government. Stay with us. Africa needs its own storytellers, people who understand the continent because they are from it. People who know that news is more than just a conversation starter, it's our stories. Because these stories run deeper than headlines and segments. It's about digging deeper to get the facts and telling the human side of every single story. Not just the echoes from foreign headlines and perspectives. It's time to take back our narratives and share them in our voices. The birth of Africa's new age reporting and this is where it begins, right here at New Central TV, the stories that put Africa first. As reporters, we don't just gather new stories, we experience them daily. So join us on Report Desk Africa as we share these experiences and review the top African stories. only on New Central. And of course, uh, this is still the conversation on New Central Television. And this time around, we will be going straight to Senegal, where, of course, uh, there is a new uh, president uh, talking about... Uh, 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 of course, Faye Wu has, uh, was elected over the weekend as the new president of Senegal. And this time around, he has promised that he will revive the country's economy. Now, the new Senegalese president, Basiru Adeomoye Faye, who promises to promote economic patriotism and renegotiate foreign contracts, will face many challenges in restoring investors' confidence and also stabilizing the economy and keeping, of course, a track of growth of the economy. Now, the economic consequences of the political crisis in the country has been felt throughout uh, the entire country. Amongst the major economic uh, sectors affected is tourism. Now, some 25% to 30% of tourist bookings have been cancelled since the start of the crisis. Now, the big question is this. What lies ahead for the new president, particularly as regards the economy? Now, to make sense of this, I'm joined on the program by Dr. Pape Sharif Bassene, Senior Lecturer, University of uh, Shea Anta Diop from Dakar, Senegal. Thank you for your time, uh, Professor, sorry, Dr. Bassene. Thank you once again. Thank you for having me, sir. Yes, uh, let me start off by saying, um, I mean, it's a new dawn for Senegal. A new president, uh, the youngest in the history of the country. And of course, uh, for many, the future looks uh, promising and bright. My question to you is this, how bright and promising is the future of Senegal with the new government? Oh, here is my perspective. Uh, there is the promise that the alliance is waiting for, you know, and on the other side, you have the youth, and the youth is not well educated. So the debates that the alliance will be having sometimes will be out of touch with the need of the youth, because the youth, they want to be occupied. And to be occupied, you have to find them jobs. So the kind of jobs that will be available will not be the jobs that well-educated people will have. So you have to create kind of job that they can apply for. So those are the things we have to take into account, you know, and to pay attention about the elitist debate and the non-elitist debate. What do they need that youth? Because even our education system is not good to train enough qualified people to cope with or to satisfy our market in terms of you know future development in the industrial or mineral resources so we have to pay attention about this mm. 
Now, let me, of course, uh, read out to you a particular survey now. According to the Africa 2050 survey, recently, of course, conducted by the Institute Council Europe, uh, it remains that Africa, of course, uh, still remains a favorite investor destination. Now, the survey polled the opinions of our 300 leaders across 34 countries of the continent. Now, some 53% of these leaders ranked the European Union at the top of their trade preference, while Europe, of course, uh, retains its crown, uh, thanks to, of course, particularly countries like Germany and the likes. But we are beginning to see an influx of investors, particularly in Africa. In the case of Senegal, the tourism sector, uh, due to the recent political impasse, has suffered a lot. What do you think the current uh, president can do to revive that sector and turn around the economy, given the fact that we know of uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, amongst other issues globally? You know, what, what, this is quite interesting. You have to, you have to understand that. It was the Minister of Tourism who was, you know, I mean, can I say plotting, you know, those trials, the last trial that forbid Usman Sonko for being a candidate was a trial against the Minister of Tourism. And then it is very particular that a Minister of Tourism spent all of his time, you know, bringing someone into trial, and those trials are the causes of the political instability in Senegal. So this is the cure thing that we have under this regime. And I think that the next minister of tourism won't be the one who is bringing, accusing political you know, contenders in order to avoid them to be you know, political leaders or whatever camp. So this is the thing we have to take into account. The reason why we failed our tourism you know, policies is that it was the Minister of Tourism who was you know, taking an, I mean, the, the, the country into turmoil. He was the one who was accusing, I mean, I mean, who bring Usman Sonko to trial, knowing the instability we are going through after the first, you know, trial for, you know, for, I mean, I mean, how can I say it, for rape. And after that, when it failed, it was the Minister of Tourism, without calculating the consequences of those, you know, accusations, who brings those trials. And he spent all his time in the couch instead of thinking about, you know, tourism policies. So I don't think we are going to have this same situation in the next years to come. Or if it must come, people are already analyzing the main cause of this tourism failure, this tourism economic failure was done by the Minister of Culture and Tourism. I'm so, no, no, of Tourism, I'm sorry. All right, now let's talk about, um, of course, uh, the, the, the political uh, situation right now uh, within the country, particularly within the political space. Uh, we know that uh, prior to the elections, uh, the former president uh, did make some uh, moves that initially were not, you know, didn't sit well with the people. There was resistance. And of course, to pacify the people, he had to release some political prisoners and all of that. What do you see the current president doing to the former president? Do you see a situation where uh, maybe Faye would uh, sort of uh, take back a pound of flesh, you know, on uh, Macky Sall, or, you know, just for peace to reign, you know, I I allow the status quo to remain? You know, um, something interesting to follow is that they are saying that we are not going to do what they call chasse sorcière. You know, we are not going to target in terms of revenge against the harm doing gang they, are, they did to us. But however, people are asking for justice. Mm. So, so this we have to take into account. People are asking for justice. So in this context, really... what exactly would you consider justice? Oh, which is quite interesting. You, you know, uh, we don't think that the, I mean, the, the interior, I mean, internal affairs, the Minister of Internal Affairs, Interior, uh, will be go safely along after the deaths, you know, the number of deaths that we have counted. We don't think that uh, people will keep quiet and say that, let's forget it and go forward. I think these forced commended, you know, um, 
you know, forgiveness will not happen. I, I don't think they will force us to accept what happened. So for that, Senegal is, uh, need to do their, uh, I mean, there must, be, there must be someone to take responsibility. And for this one to take responsibility, this amnesty, amnesty is not going to work as far as we are not asking, you know, those who were running this country uh, to tell us what really happened. And if really in Senegal, the accusation that turns toward the youth is true or not. We need that kind of justice, you know, not reconciliation, but we need to know if the wrongdoing must be punished. They have to be punished. Otherwise, people won't, you know, there won't be the possibility of forgiveness. Okay, so are you saying part of uh, justice could mean the former president doing time? <laughs> I feel that people are talking about negotiation, you know, between, you know, the former president and uh, this coming regime. But, you know, in the Senegalese constitution, the president can be safe and his family. But people around him, will have to pay, if I can say so. Mm. All right. Now, let's uh, talk about, um, of course, uh, the youth in Senegal. We know that a bulk of them really did support Faye, you know, getting into power. Um, what plans do you think or uh, that the current president has, particularly for the youth population, to ensure that they are better employed, uh, better standard of living, they are able to take care of themselves and project, you know, into the future? So this party run under something they call a project. It's not a program, it's a project. And what it means, the project was supposed uh, to elect Usman Sonko. So now, two things we have to look at. I mean, being a good manager is to be able to choose someone and to make him succeed. So I think that it will depend on the responsibility Usman Sonko is going to take which is how he, could he be, be, I mean, side by side with uh, President Fai and help him succeed because he is the one who trusts him and who tell people that he's a good one, he can replace me. And then add to that, this party used to have agricultural project that they hold during the rainy season. And those projects, small projects, are uh, financed by the party itself Knowing that the youth is not well qualified to occupy, you know, standard, high standard position, maybe they will, now that they have the state means, they will help develop those projects that they started to develop as a party. And I think that the best way to cope with the need of the youth in terms of, you know, employment was to develop those policies they tried as an opposition party like in the agricultural sector. And I think that they are going to follow those steps now that they have the state's means. I mean, uh, since, uh, of course, Faye became president, he has uh, received quite a lot of congratulatory messages across the world. And of course, from international organizations, we have the AU saying uh, congratulations, countries across the world congratulating this young president. Uh, some. However, I'm uh, asking, do you think he has what it takes, given his age, right, and uh, his level of political exposure to manage, you know, a country as uh, diverse and maybe complex as Senegal? That, that, that's why I have anticipated this question, because <laughs> for me, uh, it was Usman Sonko who, I mean, who told Senegalese, I trust him. He will do better. So now, if you have the possibility to choose someone, because the Senegalese were waiting for Usman Sonko, but he tell them, he told them, no, I'm not be going running because it, it won't be possible, but I'm asking you to vote for this guy. So this is management. Now, the success of FI will depend on the engagement of Usman Sonko. And knowing that Usman Tsonko don't want to lose or to lose the face because he promised that this one is going to be a good president, they will find a way to team up and to work together. This is what I'm looking forward. I mean, I don't know how they will implement it, 
but I'm sure they will try to be, we did not elect one person who is fine. We have elect two person. So how will it be organized in the system? Let's see. But I'm mm. sure five is not a law. We have two presidents, at least, if I can say so. Sorry, you said you have two presidents. Yes. Mm. Who's the second? Usman Songo. Oh, wow. And that takes me to my next question. Uh, the, of course, active involvement of Usman Songo. Quite, uh, you know, a lot of experts are also asking the question of uh, the issue of the president having autonomy. Because we know, I mean, throughout the entire campaign, Usman Sonko's influence was really felt. In fact, it was his influence, the shadow, that allowed Fire to become president eventually. Uh, and so uh, questions have been asked as regards, will the president have the autonomy to really make decisions, you know, without, you know, undue influence from Sonko? Do you think the president has what it takes to stand alone? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, uh, how can I say it? You know, first, as I say, it, I said it formally. Usman Songo has to choose someone. So now it's his responsibility that this someone succeed. It's just like when you hire someone in your office. If he fails, it's because you have paid. You don't have, you know, the vision to hire the good person. So now what will you do? You have to accompany him. You won't let him alone. This is what I'm thinking in terms of management. So I think he has choose someone. He won't let him alone. He will be beside and give recommendation when needed. So how will they implement it? Let me tell you something. In Senegal, we used to have in our constitution the vice president. Maybe let's see. By July, there is a possibility, you know, to run again the national parliament, you know. I mean, I mean, to end this going, the term of this going parliament and to renew it. So I don't know, maybe we will need to change the constitutions and bring the former constitution. Who, who, that constitution allows Senegal to have a vice president. It's only Makisal when he came who ended that, you know, that, that, that article in the constitution. But I think there is a possibility that we bring it back so that we have a vice president who may play the role of the management or the core management who will team up with the acting running president because he is the one who chooses it. So he has no right to make him fail. So I think that these two guys will team up. They understand each other. And I believe, I trust they will succeed. All right. Uh, I mean, talking about uh, teaming up and understanding each other, it's politics. It's all about interest. And uh, we've also seen... <laughs> Uh, I mean, in the past, trends where you have two individuals who are strong players, you know, in the political space. Uh, they are sort of intertwined, and at some point, they fall apart, right? Yeah. And from there, it goes downhill. Do you see that happening with Sonko and Faye? Uh, let me bring our culture. I mean, I, I still defend it. We have to bring our African heritage, you know, and we have that joking relationship between Fai and Saab. And I trust it. You know, I even published a paper talking about how, you know, Osman um, Songo's grandfather, who is from Casamance, a region where they resisted the colonial power, what he did. You know, knowing that his own people, the ethnic group from Casamas, the Jola, refused the presence of the colonial power, what he did, he hired people from the north, from the Jomai ethnic group, the Serer, he hired them, gave them his family name so that they, they are accepted in the Jola region, and then he appointed them as the chief of villages. This is how it helped him implement school in the region of Casamance. So we have between the Serer, this is a very good heritage we took from Senghor. The Serer and the Jola, they have a relationship, heritage, cultural relationship that make them uh, think that culturally you have not to betray the other one. I think we are going to play on that role. It played a role. People tend to forget it. But we have some African, um, you know, uh, magic powers. I don't know how to define it, that we can still use in Africa and forget some European conceptions. Mm. 
Hmm. The reason why I trust they will have a good team is because I believe that they have a cultural heritage that they can use to help themselves. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Dr. Pape Sharif Basene, Senior Lecturer, uh, University of uh, Sheikh Anta Diop, uh, Dhaka, Senegal. Once again, thank you for your Thank time. you for having me. All right. And that's a wrap on today's episode of uh, today's program. Thank you so much for staying tuned. Uh, it's also important that I emphasize that uh, all the opinions of our guests remains theirs and not that of News Central. My name is Dakbo Adigboi. Stay safe. Bye for now.
the only man I envy is the man who has not yet been to Africa, for he has so much to look forward to. On today's NC Top 5, we'll be talking about the five longest rivers in Africa. Starting off at number five is the Orange River, which is a river from Southern Africa. It is the longest river within the borders of South Africa. The Orange River Basin extends from Lesotho into South Africa and Namibia to the north. It rises in the Drakensberg Mountains in Lesotho, flowing westward through South Africa to the Atlantic Ocean. The river forms part of the international borders between South Africa and Lesotho as well as between South Africa and Namibia. The Orange River plays an important role in the South African economy by providing water for irrigation and hydroelectric power. The river was named the Orange River in honor of the Dutch ruling family, the House of Orange by the Dutch explorer Robert Jacob Gordon. Next on the list is the Mbezi River, which is the fourth longest river in Africa. It is the longest east flowing river in Africa and the largest flowing into the Indian Ocean from Africa. The area of its basin is 1,390,000 square kilometers, just slightly less than half of the Niles. The 2,574 kilometer long river arises in Zambia and flows through eastern Angola along the northeastern border of Namibia and the northern border of Botswana. It then flows along the border between Zambia and Zimbabwe to Mozambique where it causes the country to empty into the Indian Ocean. Straight to the third river which is River Niger. River Niger is a principal river of West Africa extending about 4,180 kilometers. Its drainage basin is 2,117,700 square kilometers in area. Its source is in the southeastern Guinea Highlands near the Sierra Leone border. It runs in a crescent shape through Mali, Niger, along the border with Benin Republic, and then through Nigeria. In Nigeria, it discharges through a massive delta known as the Niger Delta or the oil rivers into the Gulf of Guinea in the Atlantic Ocean. Its main tributary is the Benue River. As we head to the longest river on the continent, we have just one more stop. The second longest river in Africa, which is the Congo River, formerly known as the Zaire River, which is only shorter than the river holding the first place. The Congo River is also the second largest river in the world by discharge volume following only the Amazon. It is also the world's deepest recorded river with measured depths in excess of 220 meters. The Congo Lualaba Chambeshi system has an overall length of 4,700 kilometers, which makes it the world's ninth longest river. The Chambeshi is a tributary of the Lualaba River, and Lualaba is the name of the Congo River upstream of Boyoma Falls, extending for 1,800 kilometers. Measured along with the Lualaba, the main tributary, the Congo River, has a total length of 4,370 kilometers. It is the only major river to cross the equator twice. The Congo Basin has a total area of about 4 million square meters, or 13% of the entire African landmass. And drama, please, as we learn at our number one spot. The longest river in Africa is the Nile, which is a major north flowing river in northern Africa. It has historically been considered the longest river in the world, but is also among the smallest rivers in the world by measure of cubic meters flowing annually. Its source is found in Uganda. At 6,650 kilometers, the River Nile drainage basin covers 11 countries, including Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kenya, Ethiopia, Eritrea, South Sudan, and the Republic of Sudan and Egypt. The Nile is a primary water source of Egypt and Sudan. That is all we have for you on the NC Top 5 this week. Catch us next week for more interesting facts about Africa only on News Central. Welcome to the program. 
In Nigeria, six Labour Party lawmakers in Enugu State House of Assembly have defected to the People's Democratic Party. Also, the Senegalese president, the newly elected one, that's Basiro Domaye, uh, who promises to promote economic patriotism and renegotiate foreign contracts, may face many challenges in restoring investor confidence and also stabilizing the economy and keeping growth on track. Welcome to The Conversation. I am Dakbo Adigboye. Let's talk. We'll be starting the program of today from Nigeria, where six Labour Party lawmakers in Enugu State House of Assembly have defected to the People's Democratic... ...work in the English language. Known as the mother of African literature, Mwapa taught at several universities, including New York University, Trinity College, the University of Minnesota, the University of Michigan, and the University of Ilori. General Aderonke Kale is the first female army major general in Nigeria and the first female major general in West Africa. She enlisted in the army after becoming a medical doctor and rose to command the Nigerian Army Medical Corps. Professor Deborah Enilo Ajakaye is a Nigerian geophysicist. She is the first female physics professor in Africa. Her work in geophysics has played an important role in mining in Nigeria. She has also created a gravity map of the country. Grace Alele Williams was one of the first Nigerian women to obtain a PhD in mathematics. She is also the first female vice chancellor in Nigeria. Sarah Nanzwa Jibril was Nigeria's first female presidential candidate both at the primaries and main elections. A politician, author, and psychologist, she has run for president four times. Zainab Alkali is a novelist, senior lecturer, educationist, writer, and professor. She is regarded as the first female novelist from northern Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in the presence of this new economy, a lot of things might be changing. You might want to change your environment, you might want to change your lifestyle, your habit, and things like that. And I don't need to remind anybody in Nigeria right now what the economic situation is. So today we're talking about dealing with change. The process of change can be challenging and overwhelming. It can be an experience for many people, especially when it involves significant life transitions, like moving to a new school, transitioning to college or university, or dealing with challenges within the family. It can also be particularly difficult when it comes to moving to a new country. That's what we call Jakba, especially for you who may experience what is known as the Jakba syndrome, a condition that affects individuals who have recently arrived in different countries and are struggling to adapt 
to the new culture and the new environment. And you would agree with me that in the last one, two years, there's been people jackba in every single day, if there's any word like that. But adapting to change and transitions require a great deal of mental strength and resilience. It's important to recognize that when you feel anxious, stressed, or even overwhelmed during these times of change, it is a normal part of the human experience. However, there are strategies that individuals can implement to help them cope with transitions and, of course, maintain their mental wellness. Now, that will be one of our focuses for our conversation today. Let me officially welcome you to Fafanua Africa. And, of course, I'm Blessings Mosugu, your host on the show. You don't want to miss this conversation, so stay with us. back now one of the most important strategies for coping with transitions and change is to focus on self-care now this includes making sure to get enough sleep eating a balanced diet engaging in regular physical activity but for a lot of people these are not enough it's also important to make time for activities that bring joy and relaxation whether it's spending time with loved ones, engaging in hobbies, or practicing mindfulness and meditation. But this becomes especially hard when you're not even around people that you love. And that is where Jackpot also comes in. Now, seeking support from friends, from family, or mental health professionals can also be incredibly beneficial during times of change. But not everybody wants to go to a therapist. To be honest, now talking about your feelings and experiences can help to alleviate some of the stress and anxiety associated with transitions, and it can also provide a sense of connection and understanding. Now, these are my own view about how you can deal with change, but we have a professional in the house, someone who will help us understand better what ways, what mechanisms can be adapted in dealing with change, whether it be change of environment, change of habit, change of anything, workplace, whatever. And I'm talking about none other than author and mental health coach, Olua Tumishe Oladapo Kuku. Hello, Tumishe. Hey, Miriam. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. I love the hair, by the way. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, so we're talking about change, right? Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of things have been changing for everybody lately. And uh, we see what's happening in the economy. So it will be unfair of me not to start off by asking, how are you doing? OK, so I never answer, how are you with fine? And I don't allow people to answer, how are you with fine either? So presently, I am transitioning, right? Um, from a place of, from, from a place of mental chaos to a place of accepting. So yeah, I'm transitioning and I'm living with that and trying to embrace that. Mm. I think that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do you think that there are people who are willing to accept the, the current economic situation? Okay, so first things first, change is crazy. Any change, any change that you want, whether you want to start a habit or you want to, whatever thing you want to do, that is different than your norm, that's change. And that will definitely unsettle you. Um, the, the economy as it is, of course, is a, is a whole narrative, is a whole story. It just didn't start with the floating of the dollars or floating of Naira and mm -hmm. all the economic policies. It started way before that. It started during the campaigning. It started during the election. So it's for me, it feels as if Nigerians are on a complete depressed panic button. Right, right. <laughs> the, yeah. the panic button was mm -hmm. pressed and spoiled. And, you know, <laughs> completely, you know. Yeah. And we're still trying to get over the heartbreak of the elections, we're still trying to, there's a bit of PTSD. I swear, every Nigerian <laughs> is, has some post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. I, nah, I'm just being facetious, sir. please don't quote me on that being mm -hmm. facetious, but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that's why you see us, you know, angry, we're upset, a little thing upsets us and all that. And that is fair, giving, you know, what the economy is saying. Yeah. But I have to bust some bubble. It is global. Mm -hmm. It is global. 
Uh, and because as Nigerians we are such resilient people and we have a generation who's not willing to be silent, mm -hmm. we have a generation who think that things can change by policy. News flash, no policy is going to change anything that way. Okay, so yeah, the economy is, uh, <laughs> but we also need to approach it yeah. and respond to it as against reacting to it. Um, I know that I, I read, I, I went, I read through social media and I'm like, okay, are we being facetious? Are we being, oh, are we really sitting down to take care of ourselves? And taking care of yourself goes beyond, um, it, it could be as simple as buying yourself a candy. Yeah. Yeah, I told someone I gave to myself on Valentine's Day. They were like, "What? Yeah." Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't give myself my on my birthday. I actually got it delivered. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> I got it delivered. I want. I knew what I wanted. I saved for it. Mm -hmm. I got to deliver it because my loved ones would give me gifts, yeah. but it probably wouldn't know the exact thing that yeah. would give me the that joy would make you happy at the time. At the time, and and I got myself that. So it, it's a question of a person. Um, responding to a situation as against reacting to it. Mm -hmm. Guess what? We were raised to react to things and not respond to things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that would make, you know, accepting change and leaning in, leaning into change acceptable, you know, because we were raised to like fire, you know? Yeah, yeah it's okay to fight. But sometimes also it gets to just leaning to it and be like leaf from water, raging sea for that matter, and see where it takes you. Right. Um, a lot of times people don't understand that there's also resilience in adaptability. Oh, yeah. You know, resilience doesn't mean always fighting the circumstances because the truth is there are certain things that you can't control. Mm -hmm. And we hear a lot of times where we say, um, God, give us the grace to accept what we can't control mm -hmm. because you can't control everything. Everything. Let's be honest. Yeah. Now, um, they say that change is the only constant thing. Mm -hmm. So... What do you think is the reason that people are always scared of change? Self-awareness. Regardless of the... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was direct. <laughs> self-awareness. So you see, um, when we hear self-awareness, what we hear is how I do this. I, but what it is, I believe, is how you think, how you respond, how you live, not just with other people, mm. but with yourself first because when you can you, when you understand how you to live and respond with yourself yeah. and to yourself with and to it'll be easy to understand that no matter what the other person does it is not about you it's mm -hmm. about them right yeah nothing anybody does is about you and we're if we're being honest nothing i do it's about me, right? it's about the other person I'm trying. We're all selfish, that's how we're created. But when you are, when you're going through a change and you know that this change has come to stay, whether you like it or not, and you sit with yourself to ask yourself, what energy am I going to face this with? What strengths do I have in my kitty? What weaknesses is this change? Are these, oh, is this change? Are these changes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't complicate it. Yeah, yeah, yes. you, know, yeah. you know, what weaknesses will they meet in me? How am I going to mitigate that? It is hard work. It is hard work to live in your head and try to relate with yourself and other people. It's hard work. But trust me, it's one of the best things you can do for yourself, for your health, for your, not just for your mental health. Then again, mental health is not just what you're feeling here. Is the is the unity yeah. of everything that goes with it. So self-awareness. If you're self-aware to know exactly what, how you will respond to a thing, again, we can't control anything, but you tell yourself, okay, it has come. You would react at first. I'm not saying you're going to be superhuman, but you will react at first. But if you get to the point and say, okay, it has come, I have reacted, what next? Yeah. Slow down and then reevaluate. Get back to your personal drawing table and like, this is how I'm going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some specific coping mechanisms in navigating transition? 
I'm a firm believer, this is personal to me, I'm a firm believer of mindful techniques, meditation, exercise, um, journaling, all right? It has, if you don't, you don't have to get, I, I, I would love to say everybody should get a pen, and, but everybody, but I still use a pen and paper, I get a journal and just pour yourself there, you find out that when you're writing to yourself, for example, and then, oh, you, oh, Miriam, is that you? Mm -hmm. And then you can look back at yourself and you're like, okay, and then begin to pick up personal tools. I'm not one of those coaches that would say, okay, this is what you do, but you have your inner wisdom. Tap into that inner wisdom. Why are we running away from our wisdom? Why do we? It is a mix. There's nothing you can do about it. It's God gave it to you. Mm -hmm. Tap into it. Tap into your inner wisdom. And one of the ways that you can tap to that is just write it. Write it. Read it back to yourself. And then understand that adaptability is a resilient powerhouse. You know, anything can come at you. How ready are you to adapt? You might have, you might have a story you've been telling yourself all your life. Okay, the story is changing. Yeah. Okay, what are the things I'm bringing from the stories of my origin to the story that is presenting itself to me? How can I marry these two? to birth a new to a new Mariam, a new Wale, a new Shalai, a new Kaide, to the next level, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I'm, I'm in a session and I just don't want disturbances, you know, but... <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, so you talked about mindful techniques, mm -hmm. but let's face it, sometimes, or in some regions, people are either too busy to, you know, indulge themselves in things like this, journal, the people who are, you know, in transit from morning till night, you know, mm -hmm. trying to work to make ends meet. They don't want to skip ev any hour because there's no money. So they're trying to make up for, you know, the time. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. There are also people who, though not too busy, they're very distracted. Mm -hmm. Right. I'll use myself as an example. Sometimes I've, I, I've tried to journal, mm -hmm. but I get so distracted by my own thought mm -hmm. and I'm like, you know what, I can't do this. But one thing that works for me a lot of times, and this sounds really ridiculous, but I talk to myself. Good. So as opposed to writing it down, I feel like when I'm writing down, it takes time and I'm getting distracted by so many thoughts. I just want to let it out. So I just start talking and express myself. Sometimes I run and I realize that I feel You're better. Quiet. Right. Because I was going to ask, what hit, other measures? Hit record. Okay, now, I will go first to the business. What makes it difficult for us is because we're busy. Mm. You have, there's, nothing is going anywhere. Mm. Nothing, absolutely nothing is going anywhere. So there's this thing I curated. Stop, breathe, notice, reflect, respond, and then resolve. Uh, it sounds... But when you get yourself into a situation... Why is the situation triggering you? Stop. Breathe through it. Okay, this is why. I found out why. Notice the things within that event that is making it trigger, be, be a trigger. Reflect on where and why it's triggering you. When was the first time that happened? And then resolve. It's something, I have, it's something I do, like I get into, okay, when we got in here, I, knew, I know I don't like makeup, for example, like I don't <laughs> like to make up. And in that short space of time in the green room, I was like, okay, Tumisha, why don't you? You're here to serve. You're here to serve. You're here to, and I kept telling myself that. You're here to serve, that's being mindful. I told myself, the reason I allowed this makeup is because I'm going out there yeah. to serve someone. Even if it's just one person, that's fine. I've fulfilled a part of my purpose. Okay, so a lot of people think, and I'm glad that you said it, that meditation is about emptying the mind. Mm -hmm. No. It's about allowing the thoughts go through, pick them, drop them, pick them, drop them until you can focus on one. And that's why you will hear when, if you've been in guided meditations, and I see people come to my side, like, we're doing guided meditation. They're like, oh, yeah, if your mind is busy, take a pen and write it. 
if just do it. And then before you know what is happening, you're finding yourself in that place. So for example, just if your mind is quite busy and there's something, and I'm going to use you now, and I'm, that's because she told me your mind is busy. Please go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. For example, when your mind is shouting, there's one that is shouting the loudest. That is what your soul needs at a time. Attend to it. Right. Attend to it. Talk to that particular one. If it is gratitude, if it is, just talk to it. Without judgment. What kills us the most here is judgment. We're judging ourselves. Oh, Miriam, you should be better than that. She should have known better. Guess what? You only acted with the capacity that you had now. So why are you judging? Now that you know better, you should do and will do better. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I, I know. <laughs> I, I know. No, it's fine. It's gonna fix it. Yeah, so I know we're still talking about change, yeah. but I can't help but we just we've fine. gotten. Just, I, yeah. I feel like yeah, I'm in class right now, guys. So we have gotten into this, and um, you have said that it's about allowing the, the thought to see through, you mm -hmm. know. But so, what is the aim if, at the end of the day, there's no solution? I give an example. Um, what you said, I think the, the way I do it sometimes, I realize that there's one thing disturbing me the most. So most times I get in my car and I'm like, I'm, I'm mad about something, but I don't know what it is. But things was stressing you. And then I, I finally, you know, narrow it down to something. I'm like, oh, this is why I'm angry. That's meditation. Yeah, but sometimes the reason I'm angry is not something I can control. Mm -hmm. So how do I get myself to a point where I've realized what is getting me mad, but there's no solution? Mm -hmm. But I've just, you know, what, what is the result? Let me borrow from Don Miguel Ruiz's Four Agreements. It says the Four Agreements of Life is be impeccable with your words. Do not take anything personally. Do not make assumptions and always do your best. In this case, it's assumption. It's assumptions that make you feel like, okay, nah, let it go. Let it go is, trust me, is one of those things that run, like, let it go, is it that easy? Yeah. Come on, you know. But the truth also is the moment you understand that whatever it is that is happening is not about you who hurt you. That bus driver, um, that thing that happened at the office, that thing that happened when you were sleeping, you, the moment you understand that it is out of your control and you may or may not, Get resolution. The greatest concern, and this is go this is also going for change, especially for those who have jackpot and who are thinking of jack mine. Um, the first thing I would say is have healthy expectations of yourself, of the people you're going to meet, and you know whatever changes have healthy expectations. Dream big, yeah. fine. But let your expectations of each of the pro these steps in the process be very, very healthy. And tell yourself that, okay, if I don't do it now, I'll tell you that. I'll give you an example. I don't know how to write goals. Coming from a coach, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I didn't know how to, because I felt like, because because I'm a mindful person, I know for a fact that things will happen, life will happen, a curveball will come. And again, I'm a process person, near perfectionist. If I write a goal and I say 10th of January, oh, Mahala. <laughs> you know, so I learned question thinking from Mary. I can just ask yourself the questions. I can't remember her name question thinking just ask yourself certain questions give yourself time limit but also tell yourself that if this doesn't happen on January 10 it will happen because I'm still working at it life happened it slowed me down doesn't mean that you cut yourself some slack it means yeah. that you should work hard but if it doesn't happen be ready to forgive yourself right. and move on so adaptability um, um, Getting to the point where you let yourself understand that you're impeccable to yourself, 
you don't take anything personally, but it does to you, or you do to yourself. Yeah. You know, you don't make assumptions. And the fourth one that ties everything together, of course, is doing your best at every time. Do your best. Forgive yourself. All right? Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Like, forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. It's hard to do. Forgive yourself. And then one thing I would say, though, is that give yourself a target of 30 days. If you want to start something, especially when you've seen that the change has come. Yeah. Okay. Oh, 30 days. How do I? 30 minutes for 30 days, I'll sit with this thing. What is it teaching me? What is upsetting me? Why are we afraid of the work, though? <laughs> 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 I guess if somebody say, hmm, that's work. We have to make money. They got traffic. <laughs> you know, right? I can't hear. Yeah. Eh? But I know for a fact that when you sit down to do this exercise, it's going to make it easier for you to navigate because you are empowering yourself and tapping into your inner wisdom. Wow. Okay. I feel like I'm being hypnotized into <laughs> just letting go. <laughs> I feel so light. <laughs> I always feel like, you know, taking you through a guided meditation, but it's okay. Okay, um, so very quickly, I, I would want us to touch a little on the whole Jack Bear thing, because there are a lot of people who are battling loneliness. Yeah. You know, a lot of people go there and then they realize it's not all rosy. Yes, the education is good. Yes, maybe the economy is better, but my people are not here with me. Mm -hmm. There's nobody to talk to. Mm -hmm. it's, Instagram is not enough. WhatsApp is not enough. What do I do? I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. How would you advise such a person to go about things? First things first, let's start, Miriam, from the fact that we have a silent culture. We grew up with a silent culture. The people who are supposed to be your teammates, you have not told them before you left. You get there, and you're like, I need a friend now. Mm -hmm. And these teammates of yours, your tribe people that you have not told, that you tell them, that's base one. Yeah. Right? That's base one. Base two is expectations. People travel and think that, I don't know, maybe they think money is on the ground or they think they're going to get, do. you know, you they know or, they <laughs> think, or, or they think that employment is just going to come this way. And then the reality hits. Mm. And you begin to think that, yes, Nigeria is not working, or I don't like to say that, so this is just part of my positive prophecy. I don't like yeah. to say Nigeria is not working, yeah. but for the sake of this conversation, you know, yeah, Nigeria is not working, but now when you find yourself in that place, one, forgive yourself. Forgive yourself, yeah? Two, begin to build your own tribe. You cannot build, um, I don't know, I think, I think it was Maya Angelou who said some people are letters and some are sentences, old friends are letters they used to form, whatever the anecdote is, <laughs> you get it. Yeah. You know, begin to um, build your own tribe in your new place. But remember also that you will have culture shocks. Embrace it. Why in Rome, Canada, Japan, whatever? Embrace the change. Yeah. Embrace it because it's the, the, I, for the pe for most of my friends who have jackpot, and it, it's it's I've always been it's always been about a culture shock. And I'm not talking about whether you should kneel down and greet someone or no. Yeah. I'm talking about even things as mundane thing. yeah. as food, mm -hmm. things as mundane as you wake up and you see somebody running and you're like. Going on. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. It is going to take a complete neuroplasticity rewiring. You know, allow yourself. Don't think it's going to happen in a year, in two years. You uprooted a 20 year old. You uprooted a 25 year old. Yeah. You uprooted a 45 year old from a culture into another. Oh, come on. It's going, so the first thing first, like first of all, I was in the UK. Mm. I was just like train. You don't say it's small. I was like train. And I was, and this mother and daughter comes in and she go, the daughter goes, shut up. So I was like, this on my, like, <laughs> What did I just hear? <laughs> like, you know, my friend, who's your sat beside me, I said, all right, sit down. <laughs> 
calm down, you know? So you will see things like this. Yeah. And I, in that culture, I cannot show expression. Yeah. Because that is the mother's business. That's, exactly. You know? However, my friend, mm -hmm. she's Yoruba. She would, she's with her daughter when, when we, we are in, in, in the supermarket. And the daughter is misbehaving, and she's smiling. Mm. And they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know? And they're both smiling. Right. So we, you will adapt your reality again, your story right. of origin with yeah. the story that you're trying to recreate. And right. OK, uh, I, I would have loved for this to continue. Trust me, if anybody's enjoying this, it will be me. Oluwatu Michelle Adokokuku, author and a mental health coach. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure that they, w those watching have learned, but I I'm certain that I've learned something. And I'm so grateful. Thank you for your time. Yeah, the power in me, boss, the power in me. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know that's a, is that a quote? Namaste. Name? Okay, namaste. <laughs> All right. Um, well, you're still watching for Fano Africa, and uh, we just talked about how to deal with change. And it's not just a jackpot thing. Everything changes around us. So we all needed this information, and I'm glad that she was able to deliver. Of course, she's a coach. That's what she does. <laughs> but when we come back, we're definitely going to be looking into our creativity series, and then we're going to be looking at it this time from the lenses of a visual artist. Again, you don't want to miss it. So stay with us. Welcome back to Fafanua, and uh, our discussion continues on the importance of creativity for the youths in this generation. Now, creativity is not only a valuable skill, but also an essential aspect of personal and professional development. In a world that is constantly evolving and seeking new innovations, nurturing creativity in youths is more important than ever. From visual arts to music to literature and beyond, creativity knows no bounds and has the power to inspire and drive positive change. So let's dive into a conversation about the role of creativity in shaping the future and the impact that it has on the lives of the young people today. We want to shine the spotlight on our guest now. I sat down with Clark Torishiju Favor, aka Toji Clark, an S graffito artist who gave me an insight into his style of art and what inspired it. Enjoy. Joining us to have this conversation on creativity is none other than a visual artist for excellence. And I'm talking about Clark Torisheju Favor, he is also known as Toju Clark. He's a visual artist in Nigeria. Thank you so much, Clark, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I like your name, first of all, to start with. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I know. Okay, so um, visual artistry. Um, give me a brief understanding of what brought you into visual artistry in the first place okay so um starting off um, my dad was a painter um wasn't was a visual artist so um having been around him while growing up i wanted to do more i wanted to be like him and so after he died i mean the focus just that came and then i decided that i wanted this is what i wanted to do so um it all started in 2004 and then the interest kept on building. Yeah. And then in 2017, I decided to take it up professionally. That's beautiful to know. OK, uh, we're talking about creativity. We've been on a creativity series for a while now. And um, I want to know what you feel, what your perspective is about the term creativity, especially in the 21st century, uh, where youth are trying to find their path, youth are trying to harness their God-given talents. What do you think about creativity and, and youths in general? Basically, I feel like um, for everyone who wants to go into the creative space, yeah. you need to be able to stand out with something. And that's like the unique selling point if you're going to enter the market, whichever industry you find yourself in. So um, I feel like for everyone to, or for anyone to find their voice, you need to find that unique selling point first. Mm -hmm. what, what are you offering? What value do you want to bring? What value do you want to give people? 
And that's where creativity lies in. So if, for instance, for me, for instance, I'm, I'm not just an artist. I'm an ex graffito artist. So in that space, I... What's that about, though? So basically, um, I scratch on canvas. Oh. So instead of me painting like every other artist, mm -hmm. after painting, I scratch off the paint off. Oh. So it's, it's like drawing in reverse. So every artist would want to put their pencil on paper. Mm -hmm. And then while putting your pencil on paper, you are most likely drawing from dark to light, whereby I lighten the highlights and everything. Yeah. But I, I went the other way. Yeah. So instead of me drawing from dark to light, I draw from light to dark. Wow. So I paint, let's take for instance, I'm painting the wall black. The wall is initially white. Mm -hmm. If I paint it black, I would now etch on it, like scratch off the black paint and then the highlights, the, the color that is underneath the paint would reveal the highlights right. of whatever image I want anybody to see. I see. So in terms of appreciation now, I mean, as graffito artistry is not something that is um, common for yeah. a lot of people, you yes. know, we're just used to the, you know, pen on paper, pencil on paper, but I now so. you're basically doing the opposite. So in terms of uh, appreciation, do you think that in this part of the world, right, on the continent, Africa, and even Nigeria, enough people know about you to appreciate what you do? Or do you get a lot of, what is this, what are you doing? Okay, so because it's a very unique um, style of art, it yeah. is not broadly known. Mm -hmm. So it, w it takes time. And over time, when I when I when I first started, yeah. it was very difficult because, I mean, people did not like the fact that I wasn't using enough colors. Like in mm -hmm. my work, it was just basically black, yeah. and then probably an, another color enti entirely. But over time, when I started infusing colors into my work, it kind of like drew more attention mm -hmm. to it. So. Right now, I'm only exploring all the options I have with it. But yeah. then I just keep on doing and then doing it. So do you think that people's perspective of your artistry influences your level of creativity in the sense that, you know, you didn't used to add a lot of colors to your work, but then people didn't understand that. And then you see that now that you're adding a little bit of color, people appreciate it more. So will you now um, gravitate more towards using more colors because people like it or just doing you and then allowing people to get used to it? Okay, so um, I'm a very stubborn artist. <laughs> so I usually do not like to be told what to do. Mm. And that's the main reason why I decided to study art because it's a free world where yeah. you tend to express yourself however and however you want to. Yeah. So... Um, I tend to want to do me in most cases and in most case scenario and I don't care. So as long as I'm trying as much as possible to express myself, yeah. I've been able to gain that attraction to my craft mm. and I've been able to also add value to it as well. Mm. So. And um, yes, that's helped me. We've seen how a lot of people feel like, you know, when you're doing something, it's all rosy for you, you know, you're doing what you love and all that. But what people don't see a lot of times is the challenges that come with it. So in your line of work, in, in art, in this artistry journey that you're on generally, um, have there been major challenges that you've experienced, you know, maybe in terms of people appreciating your work or um, creativity block or anything like that? Have you had any major challenges? Yes, there are a lot of challenges as an artist and that's why we are we are all artists. We tend to provide solutions to all of these things. Mm. But there's what there's numerous challenges, but I'm just gonna highlight a few. The first one is funding. Mm. Um as an artist when you start when you start up you most likely find it difficult to mm. get funding. Yeah. Um not everyone might buy into your idea. Mm. Um it's left to the artist to decide on how he or she wants to go about it. I'll use myself as an example. So in 20, there about like a few years back, um, I knew for a fact that I wanted to be an artist. But I knew for a fact that in Nigeria, you have to be able to not put all your eggs in one basket because the country isn't like economically wise yeah. it's not favorable to mm -hmm. anyone mm -hmm. who decides to want to be an artist mm -hmm. so i decided that i would instead study graphic design and 
while doing whatever menial jobs I could do, I'll be able to use the funds to fund my craft. Mm -hmm. And I did that over time. I did that for like a few years and then I decided that, you know what, I want to just be a full-time artist. And that's one, that's funding. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's you being able to stand out mm -hmm. um, in the outside world. So let's take, for instance, you want to apply for a visa. They would most likely not rate you because you would find it very difficult to even get a visa application mm -hmm. if you do not have enough resources yeah. so that's another challenge as well because as an artist you would have the freedom to move around mm. but you're also restricted as an as a nigerian because yeah. your, your passport cannot really take you places um i think another one is um residency opportunities because uh, as an emerging artist not everyone will buy into your idea mm -hmm. and you know for a fact that you have to be able to find the network and the connections that you need. Yeah. So I feel like if, for anyone watching this, if you're able to find the connection and the network, you would be fine. Mm. So I think anyone watching this should understand that um, finding the network first would help you push your career to whatever heights you want to. Okay, I was gonna go to that. So I think since you, you already hinted at that, I'm just gonna ask like, if you were to advise young, uh, you know, and uh, upcoming artists who want to do what you're doing now, yeah. but they don't exactly feel motivated because of the situation surrounding it. What would you say to them? It takes courage to want to stand out. Mm. And as long as you have that mindset and that determination, yeah. I feel like they should stick to it. And as long as you're determined, like me. Mm -hmm. So if you're determined <laughs> I like, like me, that. I mean, you'd regardless of whatever obstacle that comes your way. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. So I have this mentality that if I approach someone for something mm. and I'm not being heard, it doesn't mean that someone else won't hear me if mm. I speak. Yeah. And if I get a no, I almost likely gingers me to want to like move on to the next person. Mm. So I don't take no for an answer. And if at all like, I get a no, it doesn't bring me down it doesn't bring my morale down yeah. it's more or less like an encouragement to you know keep on pushing there's someone out there this is not the person for you there's yeah. someone else there for yeah. you so that's the that's all i can say i think i would like to repeat what he said about if one person doesn't hear you it doesn't mean that other people won't hear you. it's a very it's very important for the youth to know that because sometimes when you get a no from one person you just get discouraged yeah. and you want to stop yeah. but um you also did talk about funding and i think that's going to bring me to asking um in terms of recognition or acknowledge acknowledgement of you know art in africa or let's even narrow it down to nigeria how do you think the government is doing do you think that they're um, paying enough attention to art general, generally now in Nigeria and especially the youth like you who are doing it. Are there any, you know, um, is there any support from the government, so to say? I will say this because I've been privileged to go out of the country to see things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a whole lot to, to be done. Um, and I'll, on an average, I think, I think the government is trying. They're mm -hmm. trying their best because I know for a fact that they started the renovation of, I think, the National Theatre. Mm -hmm. And they started putting some things in place mm -hmm. to be able to push the art world here in the country. And yes, um, to an extent, but they should do better, I beg, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the I beg, I beg, please. They should do better. They can do better. Um, now, so many people would want to ask, like, how important is art in the scheme of things? Like, what is even art for? Um, can you tell us the power that art carries, you know, in terms of unifying, in terms of representation of imagination, how important would you say art is in our society, in our daily life? Okay, so um, art is in everything. Mm -hmm. We do practically everything we do. Yeah. But you wouldn't see it until you sit down and someone probably tells you that this is it. So I'll take, take for instance, in architecture, it's also part of art. Yeah. Um, that, I mean, what you're doing, it's part of art. Art. <laughs> Everything you know, is art. Basically. Speaking is art. Yeah. You know, writing is art. Um, so it it doesn't... I need people to understand that art is not just about drawing. It's about creating. Mm. It's about content creation is also art too as well. You know, so it is a very broad space. And for a matter of fact, it is very important in the society. Mm. 
So you just need to find your niche and then find your voice. And if you're able to communicate that to people, that's fine. You also need to be able to add value with whatever you're doing. So I think the present society where we're in right now mm. is that and the problem we have right now is the fact that a lot of youths coming out of school do not focus on creating value. They focus on going out there to seek for jobs. Yeah. And I think that's like the major problem we're having right now in Nigeria. Mm. Because if we have a productive mindset and entrepreneurial spirit, an entrepreneurial well. spirit will know that oh, you're coming out there to give to the society and not just take. Yeah. And that's why we have the unemployment rate is really, really increasing. Mm. So if you know you have like a talent, it could be cooking. Cooking is art. Like this, yeah, lots of chef, mm -hmm. and I've been able to make one even in Ivory Coast. You know, so you could have a career in cooking, in your hobby. Um, sports is also part of arts as well, mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's a very broad space. You just need to pick one niche and then focus on it. Exactly. And um, speaking of broad spaces, um, uh, you talked about content. You did mention content creation in in passing, and I want us to bring that back. Um, how would you say that social media has helped? Because like it or not, we are in a digital age, right? So. Um, you know, be, sometime before now, people would even know what S graphic is. Yeah, <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is you know, so many people won't even know what um, what art entails. But now, thanks to social media, we are seeing pictures, we're seeing your works, we're seeing you know things that you're doing. And um, for a lot of people, that's a way of you know publicizing their work. That's the platform that they need. So, how helpful would you say that social media has been for you for your art um, in general? Okay, so. Um I'd have to take you back. Um, I think in 2002, um, that was when the phone thing came into, yeah. like internet came into Nigeria. And I can tell you for a fact that for my dad, it was extremely difficult because I could remember when he would take his paintings around, if he's going to Ghana, for instance, he would have to roll his paintings up in the tube mm. and then take it to Ghana just to have his show. Yeah. And the thing about art in creation is the fact that people will not be able to enjoy what you create except if they see it one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. But with the use of internet, you could see yeah, the world. Yeah. You know, so um, I think for for me, it is a very good thing and it's, it, it has been able to help we um, in this present generation to be able to upscale and then move faster in life. Um, I also know for a fact that Instagram, for instance, that for instance, it has helped me in some kind of way yeah. pushing my craft. Yeah. We have Twitter too as well. We have YouTube where there are tons of ideas. So um, it has played a vital role in this present generation. And I think yes, for anyone who wants to be able to break bounds, should make use of the internet mm -hmm. and whatever social media space they find themselves in. Right. Facebook started. I know there are lots of people on Facebook other than Instagram and Twitter because I started with Facebook. Mm. But I don't use Facebook like that anymore. Yeah, I don't yeah. even have Facebook anymore. Exactly. <laughs> so um, there are lots of space out there to be able to put in your craft there. Yeah. I think Twitter is also one of the fastest. I'm sorry, X. X. Formerly <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. X. Yeah, formerly Twitter. So, you know, if you're good with all of these social media platforms, you'll be able to push your craft higher. Yeah. And the world will be able to see what you're doing. Mm, true. Now, um, another important um, phenomenon in this uh, age and time is the concept of collaboration and partnership, right? That's why you see a lot of businesses, you know, hopping on the trends of using influencers, for example, to yeah. sell their market. You see uh, different brands coming together to create magic, and then you see that they're making huge sales. So um, in your field in art, uh, is there an opportunity to to collaborate and partner with other artists like yourself, you know, and what are the benefits of that? Okay, um, collaboration goes a long way for any artist in my field, um, because at the end of the day, you tend to be able to penetrate into wherever, wherever you're collaborating with your market space. Yeah. You tend to be able to get clients from them. They also tend to be able to get clients from you. Mm -hmm. Also, the idea of what you want to create, both of you want to create, is also also very important. Well, have you benefited though from partnerships? Yes, I have, I have. I've benefited from partnerships in different ways. Um, I remember for a fact in 2020, during the pandemic, mm. 
um, I was able to collaborate with, that was the first time I, I explored a scrap it on wall. Mm -hmm. I'd never scratched on wall before in my life. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do it and I knew for a fact that I needed to be able to get in the same space with a graffiti artist. Yeah. All right, um, uh, told you, Clark, this is the most we can take, but I really, really did enjoy this conversation. And I do I do much. know that some young folks out there who want to go into, say it again, S. Graffi? S. Graffito. <laughs> S. Graffito artistry, or even artistry in general, would have benefited something, uh, you know, from what you said. And I really, what you said was spot on about, um, you know, you selling your idea to one person and not stopping at it. Yeah. You know, you have to keep, you have to believe in yourself, first of all. Um, thank you so much, uh, Toji Clark, for, much for joining me. us. And of course, I've, I'm sure you're seeing his works out there, so do also follow him. He's an amazing artist. <laughs> this is where we draw the curtain on for Fano Africa. Thank you so much for watching. It's been a beautiful episode from the first segment to this. And of course, do well to join us in our, our subsequent episodes as we discuss issues that affect the African youth. And of course, we're still on our creativity series, so watch out for who next. I'm Blessings Mosugu, and it has been Fano Africa. As the golden sun rose over the ancient land of Israel, casting a warm glow over these historic streets and bustling market in Jerusalem, the heart of Israel, where history and beauty intertwine. I became so eager to explore the beauty and history this country holds. So I embarked on a journey to explore the land where faith and miracles convene. My path led me to the very birthplace of Jesus, a site where echoes of the past whispered tales of timeless grace. And the streets of Jerusalem are, are, are really, really beautiful, bustling with people from all over the world, pilgrims that come here um, to be in the sites that have to do with, for Christians, with Jesus, for Muslims, with Muhammad ascending to heaven, and for Jews, the place where Judaism was created. Now called the Church of Nativity, here I was met by Christians exercising their faith, tourists and explorers like me. It's, it's a miracle place. I'm very happy to, to be here. Because it's a holy month and hopefully uh, everything goes uh, as we, you know, we want to. Next, I visited the Christian's holy sites, the shrine that, according to tradition, houses the tomb of Jesus, a place of profound significance for Christians around the world. The atmosphere here was solemn, yet uplifting, as people went inside this cave to pay respect at this sacred place. My curiosity to know more about this land took me to the Western Wall in the city of David. I was moved by the favored prayers of the faithful who come to seek solace and guidance. The ancient stones echoes with the hopes and dreams of generations past and present. I also joined and left my prayers at this sacred place. In the heart of old city, I encountered a man whose striking resemblance to Jesus Christ took my breath away. His gentle smile and kindness seemed to hold the wisdom of ages, leaving me with a sense of wonder. So I stopped him just to quench my curiosity. Why I dress like Jesus? Yes. So it, it's very simple. I live a simple life. Now, I do believe in Jesus, and I do try to follow him. But I feel called in my conscience to let go of all the possessions, the, the worldly things, and just the simplest clothing possible, the simplest lifestyle possible. Walking through the streets of Jerusalem, I was captivated by the diverse tapestry of people who call this city home. From the devout pilgrims to the spirited locals, each person I met tells a unique story of faith and resilience and the story behind the city. This is the place where 
the binding of Isaac by Abraham took place 3,500 years ago. This is a place where King Solomon built the house of God, what we call the Jewish temple, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, um, right over here. The second Jewish temple was built over here. Um, the Christians have a connection to this place as well. And there's sort of like a universal holiness to this place. And I pray that one day all of us will be able to pray over here, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, without the tension that we have. My adventure also took me to Tiberias, the largest city around the Sea of Galilee. On arrival at the Cyrene Sea of Galilee, I was struck by the peacefulness of this sacred body of water. Here, I reflected on the miracles that are said to have taken place on these shores, as I felt a deep sense of connection to the past. This is a place where Jesus performed many different miracles, feeding 5,000 people with only two fishes and five loaves of bread, taking demons out of people, uh, walking on the water, of course, stopping the storm on the sea, um, um, the famous Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. All of these stories actually took place here. In Peking, I had a stop at the cave of Rashbi, walking in the footsteps of history. I also left my prayers and devotion. In this small village of Pekin, there is a cave, which is a traditional place where a famous rabbi called Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who lived 1800 years ago, he hid from the Romans after they saw him as a rebel. And God did a miracle and gave him a tree of um, um, a carob fruit and a water spring. And him and his son stayed inside this cave for 13 years. And while they were there, he wrote a very famous book called the Zohar, which is the base to all Jewish spirituality. As my journey through Israel came to an end, I carried with me the memories of the land steeped in history, beauty, and spirituality. In every place I visited and every person I met, I found piece of the sacred mosaic that makes this country so uniquely special. Israel, with its vibrant culture and timeless landscapes, will forever hold a place in my heart. In the northern Israel, Pekini, for New Central, Wangani, Sisi. In attendance were fashion and arts enthusiasts, entrepreneurs, designers, and makers of African crafts. We are the creative industry. We believe that over 70% in the continent and even the country is of youth within the ages of 12 to 35 years. So this is the age bracket for creativity. So this summit is for us to converge in one space. But the creatives, the emerging fashion and art entrepreneurs, successful business owners in the private sector, the public sector leaders, we need to hear from the mouth of authority. We need to hear from the mouth of people who lead the creative industry. Participants at the summit say the African fashion and art subsector remains untapped, and through investment from government can live up to its potentials. They say through collaboration, creatives, including fashion and arts lovers, can become a force for good in the country. Together we can create a vibrant ecosystem that foster creativity promote sustainability and drive economic growth across the continent. Today we invite you to join us in this remarkable journey. Together let us celebrate the richness and diversity of African fashion and art. The, the movie industry is generating over $600 million. You know, not talk about the comedy, not talk about the music, Afro British getting popularity uh, across the continent. And I, I bet you this is one thing uh, I always look at the government should invest in things like this that not only promotes young people but brings about productivity. Experts here are saying that investment in the fashion and art subsector can help Nigeria harness available potential and solve the nation's unemployment challenge. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi.
the team had visited from the Center for Media and Society in Abuja. After commending the Minister of Information and National Orientation for visible reforms in the ministry and amongst its agencies, they made several key demands, including creating a conducive environment for the press to thrive by pushing for amendment of available laws relating to press freedom. We request that you also push for amendment of section 39, which provides for freedom of expression to include specifically, why that section remains, but to include specifically freedom of the press. This has come from the challenges we have seen even in the courts, that what we have in section 39 is a right you know, that goes to all citizens and does not specifically, not specifically for the press. Honorable Minister, sir, colonial era laws such as those on sedition and criminal defamation should be removed from the static books. They have no place in today's international standards. Indeed, the court, or since 1982, the Court of Appeal already expunged, already struck the laws of sedition dead, but it remains in our statute books, and no effort has been made you know, to remove it from there. The Minister of Information and National Orientation assured them of government's commitments to ensure press freedom in the country. I want to reiterate the commitment of government to ensure that there is press freedom in this country, uh, the press is even freer. But like I always say, uh, freedom is not free if it does not have responsibility. So as you have press freedom, you also have responsibility. He says President Bola Tinubu has given his word to Nigerians and will not renege on his promises. His message consistently to Nigerians is that uh, uh, everyone will breathe. The poor, the rich, everyone will have to breathe. And it is the media that will create that envir environment uh, for that uh, uh, freedom to, to... The minister, however, urged citizens and members of the press to practice their profession responsibly. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi.
a warm welcome. We appreciate that you're here. I am Felicity Ezewike. Our slot topic for this segment has been described as the eighth most common cause of cancer-related deaths among women. Cases are predicted to increase by 42% globally and by 86% in Africa alone by 2040. And there is real fear a diagnosis is as good as a death sentence. But should it be? I'm talking about ovarian cancer. While the rate has significantly reduced globally in the last 20 years, recent trends suggest a rise, especially in Africa, with the possibility of figures doubling by 2040. As of 2020, over 17,000 women had died in Africa due to ovarian cancer. The death toll is predicted to increase by 51% in the world and 92.3% in Africa, also by 2040. This means that by that year, around 15,694 more women who could be dead, almost double the present figures. Should an ovarian cancer diagnosis be feared as a death sentence for women in Africa? To help us with some perspective about the cancer, awareness level, challenges and treatment options, I'll be joined after the short break by Dr. Noye Okoye. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. I'm now joined live in the studio by Noni Okoye, consultant, obstetrician, gynecologist. She joins us from Lagos. She's here with me. Thank you very much yeah. for giving us your time. Thank you for having me. Let's start with a basic understanding of what ovarian cancer is and why this seemingly palpable fear that a diagnosis is synonymous with being given a death sentence. Yeah, I think, um, thank you so much. I think it's really um, applaudable that you're, you're bringing into fore this kind of talk. So um, ovarian cancer, as um, you may know, it's a cancer that affects the ovary. So the ovary are just, you know, structures. If you see, if you watch on Instagram, you see people, when they see babies, they say, oh, my <laughs> ovaries, yes. <laughs> they say my ovaries because, you know, it's, it's because of it's, uh, it's, it's there for reproduction. So you have actually two you know, ovaries seated in the pelvis, that's just down um, around between your thighs, that's where the pelvis is. So ovarian cancer affects the ovaries, and it's, um, there is a palpable fear. Yes, it's true, but you have to ask some questions. Why is there a palpable fear? Is it because um, people have lack of information, awareness? Do they have relatives that probably the present leads to the hospital? And how do they feel? How are they managed? What is the information that they have? Could it be because of affordability, accessibility? So all of those things could contribute to why there might be a fear for ovarian cancer. I guess we will come back to that. Like every other when cancer. We, okay, yeah. when we have maybe a little bit of uh, understanding of mm. um, where we are at. So you, you highlighted a couple of things that could trigger people thinking that a diagnosis is a death sentence. One mm -hmm. of them is awareness. What would you say we are in Africa, mm -hmm. and specifically in Nigeria, um, mm -hmm. This is where we're domiciled. Yes. So um, coming to the awareness aspect of it, if you do look at, like, like in Nigeria here, where I am in Africa, if you do look at um, the awareness, the awareness in Nigeria, uh, even in African countries, is like low to average. People don't really, um, they, yes, they, they do know that there is cancer, there is ovarian cancer, but most of them don't even have the knowledge of the symptoms, of the risk factors. So even in developed countries, you see that um, one of the challenges in managing this condition has to do with presentation. So that's, that's, the, 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 that's the, the, the main challenge we have, which is linked to awareness and knowledge. And so it's really a good thing, because if you're talking about prevention of medical conditions, even cancer, one key in management of these conditions, it would really be attributed to creating more awareness. So people could have more knowledge about this, what causes this, the risk factors, how can this be prevented, how can this be managed, and then you, you could see that you would ultimately reduce 
the death rate or fatality rate. Um, I know there's a couple of issues associated with this. I'm not, um, yeah, uh, yeah. just basically from the little things I've read. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned uh, risk factors. Uh, before we talk about prevention, uh -huh. what I did see was that the, it's not quite easy to uh -huh. identify when someone has ovarian cancer. Uh -huh. um, I, I hear is it, it, is, it mimics other symptoms. Uh -huh. It is not just one thing. Now, maybe you have headache or you feel feverish, people automatically just diagnose themselves with malaria, for instance. So um, is that true, that the symptoms may make different ailments that you might not be able to pinpoint that you have ovarian cancer? And if yes, are there specific tests maybe that can um, show you that you have this cancer? Yeah, so I'll just take these questions one at a time. So you're asking about the, the symptoms. Yes, one of the problems, one of the challenges we do have um, from my experience with management of ovarian cancer, it has a lot to do with um, the symptoms. Now, if you, if you also know that um, just if you compare that to um, other cancers, like ovarian cancer is the second most common gynecological cancer. I don't mean overall it's like the seventh, but I'm talking about genital cancer. After cervical cancer, you have, genet uh, you have um, ovarian cancer. Then firstly, apart from that, um, overall for women, the commonest is breast cancer. Now, the difference between ovarian cancer and these other two cancers I mentioned has to do with you know, accessibility. The organs like the breast is easily accessible. You could if easily, if you have a lump, you could easily feel that. Even at such, like for instance, I went for a program um, like two weeks back on a modern Sunday, and I had to talk to a population of women about breast and um, cervical cancer. So after that, I had to screen some women, and I just choose five, chose five. And out of those five women, like three women had lumps on their breasts. And, and one of those three women, I'm coming, one of those three women, she had um, a family history of breast cancer. So it, does it make sense? So that's where awareness comes in. And this is about, you know, organs that are accessible. Even the service, which is the neck of the womb, is quite accessible as well. Yet there are issues with presentation. Talk more of ovaries that are located, you know, right. in the pelvis. So that is the, the issue. And adding to that, the you, we have um, concerns about the symptoms are vague. Um, so most of the times, women could sometimes women would even have no symptoms. Some would present with symptoms like abdominal pain, abdominal discomfort, bloating. Some women would present with satiety. That means early satiety. That means you eat a little um, kind of food and okay. you feel you know, full and bloated. Some women could have pelvic pain. And at the late stages, they could have weight loss. So when they do have these early symptoms, over the past, in the past few years, they, they did say that um, these symptoms of ovarian cancer is really present when it's advanced. But it has changed because even in early stages, these symptoms are there. So um, that is where the issues are with regards to knowledge, awareness. You see some of so these as, as a doctor, as a doctor, yeah. what, would, what would make you ask somebody to go um, have a test, maybe, to Fine. confirm if they have ovarian cancer? And um, are there, that's part of the question I asked you, okay, are there yeah. specific tests that will confirm that somebody has it? Definitely, there are some um, diagnostic tests for that. But the, but the thing about ovarian cancer is that, you know, we are talking about um, screening. Like um, other health conditions or other cancers, there could be a pathway to screen for, <coughs> sorry, these health conditions. For ovarian cancer, it depends on what the patient presents with. Like I said, these patients could present late. So when they present late, by the time you subject them to have some tests, you know, some scans, special kind of scans, MRI, most times it may be too late. So when the patient comes to me, I would first of all ask the patient a couple of questions, ask them about their history, what they're presenting with, ask them about risk factors. Now, if you do tell me that you have a family history, if you know about um, a celebrity, Angelina Jolie, you know about her? Yeah, the, yes. yes the, she had the, breast cancer. Yes, not just that. She didn't have breast cancer. She had a family history of that. Her oh, mother okay. died of breast cancer. She had a her grandmother was affected. So she just went to the, uh, you know, she was just being assessed. That was about 2015. And she had a couple of tests done and a genetic test done, which um, one of it is called, we call it BRCA gene, which is an abnormal kind of gene that if you do have that, there could be a high chance that the person could have an ovarian or breast cancer. So because of that, she was offered some treatment options, which included to remove, you know, her breast, breast and, and the ovaries. I think that's, that's the part that I'm yeah. aware of, that she removed her breast. Yes, 
So part of this will be assessing you, asking you a couple of questions based on your symptoms, based on your family history, some kind of lifestyle measures that you have. And then based on that, the, the doctor would refer you to do some couple of tests. And then from there, you could make the diagnosis and offer treatments to the yeah, patient. You, you, you talk about family history, um, yeah. um, uh, life experiences. What mm -hmm. are these factors, aside the two, that increases a woman's um, probability of getting ovarian cancer? Yeah, so surely, so for every um, kind of cancer, really, the cause is not clear. But yeah, like every woman, as long as you have an ovary, you have a lifetime a risk. Yes. So there is a one in 70 background risk that every woman would have ovarian cancer um, as, she, as, as she is advancing in age. But then there are some things that increases a woman's risk. First has to do with um, some, like I've mentioned about genetic factors, which is very, very necessary, family factor, familial factors. Now 10 to 15% of ovarian cancers could be linked to this. So you and I, every human being has, you know, you have trillions of cells, you have genes that carry the information about how your cells work. So for any reason, if there is an abnormality or a damage to any of these genes, actually these genes should protect someone. But if there is a damage to any of these genes and this gene is being inherited from either of the parents, then you stand to have a risk of having ovarian or breast cancer. So we call some of these genes, one is BRCA gene, there is BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. So those are, in, they, those are you, know, you know, they are implicated in such cancers. But another thing has to do with, you know, having someone being, or the, you know, having a high BMI, body mass index, obesity. So um, also early, some things that can be modified, like your age, as someone is advancing in age, there is a risk to that. Then um, elements, when a woman sees elements, because what happens is that the ovaries are egg baskets. They release eggs every month. So there's some theories, when this kind of thing happens, you know, researchers tend to, you know, research to find yes, what are the likely yes, factors. Yes. And then the factors that have been there has to do with what we call incessant ovulation. When a woman keeps on releasing eggs, now when you release eggs every month, there are some damages that could occur to the lining of the cell. Ah, it sounds really complicated. I'm sure somebody <laughs> watching for the first time might be wondering, yeah. Yeah. Ah, this sounds really scary. So we've yeah. talked about the risk, the factors that may make somebody predisposed to ovarian cancer. So what are those factors or those lifestyle changes that could we want to maintain Good. to reduce the risk of yes. ovarian cancer? Fine. The, 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 the reason is not to scare anyone. Uh, that's the, the, the issue is that you need to give people the information yes. so that they make informed choices. So it's not about scaring people. It's just to give you the right information. Now, um, there are some things that you cannot change, like your age. You can't change that. If you do have a family history of breast cancer, that can be changed. If you have a sister or a brother, uh, if a sister that had a breast cancer or ovarian cancer or a mother, you can't change that. But what you could do is that what are those risk reducing strategies? So now coming to generally, like I said, lifestyle measures. If you do go to developed countries, if someone has any medical condition, the first thing they talk to you is about diet and exercise. So those are very important. So you have to watch what you eat. And that's where you have to go to maybe dietitians. They talk to you about if you have issues with maybe weight gain, exercise. It helps. It helps in the functioning of the body. Then for women, it's, it's you advise them to breastfeed. Breastfeeding is good because when you, there are some factors that interrupt ovulation process. So when you're pregnant, you have a lot of time. The ovaries are not releasing eggs. So it keeps the ovaries to some kind of resting phase. And that reduces the risk of ovarian cancer. So you exclusively breastfeed. If you are a woman and you, you have babies, so if you don't so have... Let, let's pause and emphasize it. If you're a woman <laughs> and you are having babies, please, mm -hmm. please do exclusive if you can. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any reason mm -hmm. not to or you don't have any medical challenges, if you can, please. Mm -hmm. So those are, those, are, um, those are the ones that... Then contraception, those, some, some women... Like um, if you do use some kind of contraceptive pill, like if you use combined contraceptive pills, yeah, they have, I, I read that as well. Yes, yes, it does. If you use that for over five years, five to um, ten years, so studies have shown that it could reduce the risk of ovarian cancer to over twenty percent. But then you have to be careful because the COCP as well would increase the risk of you know cervical <laughs> cancer. Yeah. So you have to <laughs> balance all of that and, and get um, the right information. And then there are some factors like um, you know some endometriosis which is when you have an abnormal cells that is meant to be in the lining of the womb, it's, um, you know, in the ovaries, and use of some fertility drugs. So these are, you know, modifiable risk factors. So when you are exposed to such kind of risk factors, of course, you need to pay more attention to your health. 
you need, you need to think more of if you have symptoms like bloating, abdominal pain, you know, symptoms, right? insistently, like you're having three or four episodes of that in a month, of course you should be able to go and see a doctor. Don't right. go over the counter, take some medications. Uh, by doing so, because part of, you know, reduction of this risk will be early detection and treatment. I was just about to go there. So that's the, the, at mm -hmm. the beginning, we talked mm -hmm. about uh, the fear that once you get an ovarian cancer uh, diagnosis, you're almost as yeah. good as dead. No. And then there is the prediction that you, the, the, you have like a five years um, survival rate, survival rate mm -hmm. and all of that. So, um, no, no, let me what? come to that. People read a lot of things in the internet. Now, it, it, now, no, but there are research that, I, yeah, that, that yeah. I understand that that gives you. So, okay, I, basically, what I want to ask is: Is it treatable, and uh, is there a possibility that after treatment, the person can go on to live uh, the the full span of their life? And what's at what stage? Because I know it's in stages. Mm -hmm, stage yeah, one, stage one two, two, three, four. Yeah. What stage is it? Um, if you catch it, what stage will you catch it and you can have that chance? Yes, for every cancer, once it's um, the cancer, most of the, all the cancer stages usually are from the way it's being um, called. We have what we international staging system we call FIGO, is from stage one to stage four, right? So for every cancer, once you come around, once you're in stage one, it's an early cancer. So those are really uh, amenable to treatment, cure, and the survival rates are higher. So when you do, when you're making all those um, research work, works like in Africa, we do have survival rate for stage one cancer. That's the early cancer. It's over 80 to 90 percent because most of these researches they don't go further than five years, right? So overall, it's about 40 percent. So that means that if these women they have the treatment, they are staying in five years during the research period, they are doing fine as long as there are a lot of factors that affect the treatment. It's not just about treatment. It's about the age of the patient. Does the patient have any medical condition? What are the kind of risk factors the patient has? At what time is she presenting? What the team of experts managing the patient? What kind of facilities do they have? Those are the questions that you have to ask, and yeah. those are the factors that affect the treatment outcome for every kind of cancer. Okay. And of course, the patient's outlook. Yes, yeah. that's the mental state as well. Very that's important. why you, you always have on mental health and Very how important. it impacts on healing. Yes. I, I want you to yes. speak on. Uh, we talked about, I asked you at the beginning about awareness. What level of awareness do we have? Um, how do you think we can improve on awareness? Because when we do that, the diagnosis might become easier. More women will be more conscious of needing to check themselves and know that there's a likelihood you could have this. What can we do to improve? What you're doing now? <laughs> But this is, the, the, yes, the New Central is Pan-African, yes, but yeah. there could be more. It's not everybody that has a television. Now, let me tell you something. There was a study that was done in Luth, I think 2018, and they tried to assess the knowledge of the participants, over 400, and to find out the knowledge and awareness of, you know, they have about, what, well, um, um, ovarian cancer. It was done in Nigeria. So about 19% of women had the knowledge, you could see how poor it was, had the knowledge of the risk factors and symptoms of ovarian cancer, and then the sources of the knowledge. Like about 33% of such women had the knowledge from mass media. Okay. Television. So we're doing a work. Instagram, work we're doing a good work. <laughs> so it's like, um, you, know, you know, Instagram, social media. And about, I think, a, a, about 30% also had knowledge from just discussion with their... Fellow women. Fellow, no, doctors. Oh, okay. So they come to the hospital, they ask a couple of questions, they talk to them about... Um, ovarian cancer and they get to know about that or from relatives you know just social media they have a relative that had this kind of condition they had to read it up but mostly from health professionals just like i'm doing now so that's a, a very important way of spreading awareness you just have to go through a mass media disseminate the information and, and and also if you do have survivors you know because there is this stigma people have about social cultural region, region, um, you know factors that could affect them you know some people when you have a family history of cancer they, they don't want to talk about it. So if we do have uh, like celebrity survivors, people that people look up onto, and they have this kind of condition, or they have a relative, they could just you know do a campaign. Do we talk actually about still it. have cultural stigma about things like this? Absolutely, we do have. May not be in some part of um, you know African countries, even in Nigeria, like in remote in the northern countries. Yeah, yeah, we Why have, is that? What, what do you think? Yeah, it has to do with development. Okay, it has to do with education. A lot of things that has to do with socio-cultural factors has to do with education. 
you, although if, if you do conduct a study in cities like Lagos, where I stay, you would find out that over 50% or 70% of women, they have tertiary education. And those are people that have less chances of having this condition. Now, if you get to the north, southern part of Nigeria, you, you will find out that a lot of women, there is this issue of you know, patriarchy where they have, to, uh, they have to take permission from their partners to come to the hospital. Even now, you would see women who have medical conditions, they do not have money, they are not working. The poverty, it plays a huge role. It works hand in hand with sociocultural factors. Some people, okay, talking about um, these um, factors as well, some people who have this condition, you would see some women who are learned, they get to the church, they believe, they, they, they keep on praying. No, I'm, I'm telling you what I, I see from experience. They get to the church, they keep praying, they, this happens for like a year, the letter comes to you, some would take some supplements, GN, G, GNLD, GNLD products, because some would go to take over-the-counter medications, treating ulcer and all of those symptoms. By the time they come to the hospital, it's, it's really, you know, too late. What more can we do? What more can we do? How can we reach these people in the hinterlands who might not have better access? Is it maybe, you, you talked about something about husbands who stop their, who might not mm -hmm. give permission. Is it not possible to also educate the men to be aware that if you have a spouse who might not be as, um, as exposed as you, you need to help them to make this check? Yes, what we can do generally, like you said, for um, every medical condition, like you start, you could start from the grassroots. If you have the information about any condition, you educate somebody with, uh, around you. The person educates somebody around him or her, and then we have we have issues with um, you know I, political. I, I, I was actually looking more specifically at spouses, partners, men, men in in particular who may have. Um, partners who are not as enlightened as they are. Uh, yeah. So what can be done to those? What, like, uh, how can we educate these people? Because sometimes some men don't know about this thing. Why yeah. others educate themselves? There are those who don't. They are the only. The, what we can do is that we try as much as possible to involve men in issues of women. Like when you are a woman, they, like you see some women, they, um, when they come to me, they have a health condition or even pregnant women or any issue. They want you to. Their husbands probably don't want to come with them. So you have to actively get. The husband involved you have to tell the person or you have to take the phone um you tell the husband see your wife she has a serious condition i want you to come and when they listen to your voice they come so in any way you can you just actively get their partners involved, involved. Okay. and then we need uh, then political will is also very important because one challenge that we also have has to do now if we do have um you know politicians you know because a lot of they are so distracted with a lot of things happening the um, issues about security, political instability, and less attention is paid to, um, you know, cancer. So if we do have them trying to, or even NGOs sponsoring campaigns to enlighten people, even in such remote areas, it will go a long way to drastically reduce the burden of. I wish we could continue the conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll just give you like thirty minutes yeah, to. Yeah. Um, it's okay. What would be the key reminders you would want our viewers to take away from this conversation as we wrap up? Yeah, the key reminders I would want them to take away is simply that, you know, health is wealth. Um, you have to be healthy to live long. You, you have to be healthy to achieve anything you want to, to be in life. Ovarian cancer is real and is becoming a scourge. And um, uh, patients are being lost because of lack of awareness, um, lack of knowledge. And so trying to educate patients, anybody who is listening to me, um, try to um, pay more attention to your health. If you do have um, such kind of symptoms, or if you do have a risk factor, we even have genetic testing where you could approach the oncologist and they could talk to you about you know, genetic testing where um, you could be tested to find out if you have these abnormal genes that could increase the risk of you having a cancer. Yeah, yeah. So, at, at the heart um, of it is try as much as you we, can to be aware uh, yeah, and yeah. live a healthy life. Yeah. Thank you very much. For <laughs> we Thank you. Your Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. All right, thank you for staying with us this long. We're not done yet. We'll go for a very short break. And when we come back, we'll be going to Security Matters, taking on the situation in Niger and the U.S. concerns about a recent decision by the Junta. Stay with us.
Thank you for staying with us. So, on Saturday, the Niger Republic junta announced it is suspending military cooperation with Washington and that U.S. flights over the country's territory in recent weeks were illegal. It's been a marathon of discussion since, as Niger plays a central role in the U.S. military operations in African Sahel region and is home to a major air base. Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh said Monday that the U.S. officials had lengthy and direct discussions with the junta officials that were also in part spurred by concerns over Niger's potential relationships with Russia and Iran. According to her, the U.S. is troubled on the part that Niger is on. In October, the U.S. officially designated the military takeover in Niger as a coup, which triggered laws restricting the military support and aid that is, it can provide to Niger. But in December, the top U.S. envoy for Africa, Molly Fee, said the U.S. was willing to restore aid and security ties if Niger met certain conditions. But the Niger Junta spokesman said the U.S. tone was condescending and threatened the uh, Niger Republic sovereignty. Since the July coup, the country has ended its security partnerships with the European Union and France, and had they have withdrawn and have withdrawn their troops from the country. To share informed views on this, I am joined by David Otto, Director, Geneva Center for Africa Security and Strategic Studies, Nigeria. It's good to have you on one slot. Thank you for giving us your time. It seems Niger oh, thank you for having me. It, it seems Niger does not want the U.S. military on its soil. Summarize for us your view of Saturday's events and why it is significant? Well, I think from what we know so far, uh, the Nigerian junta has revoked uh, the military accord, uh, which was signed uh, between 2012 and 2014. Um, effectively, that accord allowed uh, the United States to build one of its most valuable, uh, from a US perspective, uh, military base, um, which of course, uh, this is a military base that focuses on intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, it's a base that, you know, can fly C-19 uh, cargo jets, you know, uh, I mean, I'm talking about very large uh, military aircraft, uh, but it's also one of the very few bases uh, that the U.S. deploys, you know, what we call armed drones um, that are remotely controlled. So the U.S. had struggled uh, initially to find any country that would allow, and I'm talking about the uh, U.S. African Command, the U.S. African Command, they call it U.S. AFRICOM. They had actually struggled to find any African country that would allow them to have this military base. And they struck gold uh, in 2012 and 2014 when the then uh, Nigerian government allowed them to build that military base. This is a base that uh, is estimated to cost about 110 uh, 220 million U.S. dollars, and it's, it's about uh, the equivalent of uh, 13 million uh, being spent on a daily, sorry, on a on a yearly basis to uh, actually keep this base running. So for the United States, um, you know, this was one of the most uh, valuable bases. You know, it actually uh, uses that to conduct strikes uh, around Niger, um, as far as Somalia, Libya. Uh, but even as close to Nigeria. So it actually targets seven terrorist organizations, including the likes of Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, uh, the Islamic State of the, the Greater Sahel, um, you know, uh, Islamic State in Libya. So there are more than seven terrorist designated organizations that the U.S. You know, um, goes after using this military base. So fast forward, uh, the, the military coup that occurred uh, in, in Niger, Initially, the U.S. distanced itself uh, from the, the French, you know, because, of course, the toxicity that the French brand uh, in terms of uh, its uh, uh, neo-colonial and, you know, uh, you know, during the colonial period, that uh, rhetoric of uh, the French has to go um, was something which, you know, the U.S. tried to distance itself from. Um, when the French and the Nigerian uh, were having issues and the French were pushing for some kind of uh, 
uh, an intervention through ECOWAS. Um, the U.S., you know, tried to, first of all, did not acknowledge uh, that, that uh, this was a military coup. Um, it waited until, you know, very, I think, I think it was December or something, that's when the U.S. said, uh, you know, did uh, agree uh, that uh, this was a military coup. So, effectively, the U.S., you know, wanted to continue to do business uh, with Niger because, of course, that's a very expensive military base. But it does appear uh, that the conditions uh, under which, you know, the U.S. has set, you know, has some kind of, you know, triggered, um, you know, this, uh, uh, the military junta to say to the U.S. that, of course, um, you know, this is not going to happen. Uh, and it has given them the ammunition uh, to say to the U.S. that it has threatened its territorial integrity. Perhaps the U.S. may have suggested uh, that uh, the Nigerian uh, junta should uh, discontinue any relationship with um, other strategic partners, for example, Russia. And maybe the Nigerians saw this as some kind of condescending in, in the terms that they described. Okay. So um, here we are uh, in a position where, um, you know, the Nigerians have kicked out the French, uh, they've kicked out... Uh, the, uh, you know, the, well, uh, the, the, you know, actually established what you call the Alliance of Sahelian States. All right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, and, and, you, you've clearly established that it is a significant development that we're dealing with. And that's yeah. why everyone is talking about it. But before we move on, let me quickly um, clarify something you said. You, you, you were um, a bit unsure if it was December or October. I think it was in October that they accepted that it was a coup. And then in December, they said there's a possibility they can still have uh, relationships. Uh, back to the conversation, um, uh, there was, from everything I've seen online, there, there was no clear reason given for the decision by the Niger um, uh, Junta. They only made the announcement that they don't want them there. Is there a background that could give insights as to why they chose to ask the U.S. to leave? I think time is everything, and everything is about timing. Um, you know, so why now? I mean, that's the question you're asking. I think the possibility, uh, from what we know, is that the United States, um, you know, had a visit, uh, and a very high-profile visit, um, uh, which, you know, was uh, led by the envoy Modipi. And, and, of course, there is a possibility that, you know, the envoy, one, according to the Nigerian junta, did not, did not uh, kind of inform uh, them of the composition of, of that envoy, uh, of that delegation. Possibly they were not informed of the uh, discussions that were supposed to be had. And, and I think another reason uh, is that, you know, I think there may have been some kind of a suggestion. Remember the U.S. said in December that it will continue to give aid to Niger, um, but subject to conditions. So I think perhaps one of the conditions that the U.S. may have proposed, or the U.S. envoy, or the delegation may have proposed is that we can continue to give you aid as long as you do not um, maybe you know share the the country or you know have any partnership with Russia or or some other partnership with um, Burkina Faso or Mali. We don't know. Um, you know these are very secretive discussions. But for the Nigerian government or the junta to have said that they are re revoking without any warning. Um, the military uh, alliance, uh, well, the military um, agreement between the uh, 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 United States and, uh, and Niger with immediate effect tells you that, you know, something went wrong which was not expected. And the only thing I can think of is perhaps the fact that maybe the U.S. may have said to the Nigerian junta that, you know, one, perhaps you have to hand over power immediately to um, you know, a civilian government, or maybe you do not have to have any uh, kind of relationship with Russia. I mean, bearing in mind uh, that yeah. this was at a time when Russia election was going on. Uh, yeah. So there could be some links there. Um, but, you know, I think the big question uh, that the United States Congress will be asking Africa and the State Department is, was this one of the scenarios that was figured out when this military base was being established? Or... Uh, does this come as a surprise uh, even to uh, the U.S. State Department and Africa? So I think Congress would want to know you yeah, know, I if think this was money well spent. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I quite agree with you because what the statement that the spokesperson made uh, simply alluded to the fact that some of the um, tone was disrespectful. The tone was um, 
um, mm. you know, sort of disrespectful to their sovereignty. So basically, one would assume that there are instructions that they were not uh, comfortable with. Then again, it, uh, mm. the uh, Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary um, did say on Monday that they had discussions with officials. Uh, the, 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 their discussion was spurred by concerns over Niger's potential relationships with Russia and Iran that you've mentioned. Um, scholars like yourself are saying it's more America-centric than anything else. It has nothing to do with what benefits Africa and Niger in particular, really. What's your view on that? I think from a Nigerian point of view, um, they would be asking the big question. Uh, the US base 201 um, in Agadex, you know, has been there since 2012. They would want to see the report card. I mean, they would want to see how effective uh, that, that US base has been in terms of providing uh, safety and security around the region. And if you look at that, you know, from a, a scholar's perspective or from an outsider's perspective, or from an analyst's point of view, um, you can simply tell that, you know, there hasn't been much progress uh, in terms of the counter insurgency operations. Yes, the U.S. has deployed uh, its drones from that region the right down to Somalia. And as I mentioned, there are seven terrorist designated groups that these particular bases is meant to deal with. But for the Nigerian, there will be concern about the insecurity within the region, not just Niger, uh, but of course within Mali and Burkina Faso. So... For the Niger uh, um, junta, they would think this has not been effective because, of course, uh, there are still issues within uh, their region. And, and they would think, well, if this is just not benefiting us, why do we have to continue to have it? From the U.S. point of view, um, the U.S. would want to not just look at Niger as a country on its own in terms of you know, how effective it has been, uh, but it would want to look at other regions like Somalia, uh, you know, areas like uh, um, you know, Chad, um, which of course, you know, the French has interest in, um, areas like Libya, uh, they would want to look at it as an overall operation. Um, but mind you, not just for the rest uh, of uh, the region, you know, insecurity. I think the U.S. Uh, placing itself in a position uh, in, in geopolitics which would interest, you know, its, um, its outpost. So, um, yeah, so for the Nigerians, if it's not an effective uh, 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 deployment, if it doesn't serve the purpose of, you know, uh, bringing stability within the region, then why continue to have it? Good. For the Americans, they want to have it because, of course, it does serve their interests. Okay, uh, I'm told um, we have the... less than two minutes to wrap up. I'll, I'll just quickly ask, how does this um, decision, uh, the withdrawal of the U.S. military presence, impact security situation regionally and the junta's uh, control in the country? I know it's, I, I thought we had more time. Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, the junta has, you know, made an alliance with Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, to uh, have some kind of uh, a defense pact to fight against insurgency. Any counterinsurgency operation that is ended abruptly will leave a very huge gap. Um, how does the Nigerian government, how do the other countries want to fill this gap? Um, is now left to uh, perhaps, you know, the likes of the multinational joint tax force, um, what, else, what else is remaining of G5 Sahel? Uh, and perhaps, I think, uh, to conclude, I think, Maybe Niger is looking at bringing in other partners. You know, it could be Russia. Um, it could be um, expanding the confederation or the federation of states between Mali and Burkina Faso to uh, cover that gap. But for now, uh, I believe that um, it's not yet over. Uh, the U.S. Right. may try to negotiate. It's too expensive for the U.S. to just let go. All right, David, thank you so much for speaking with us. It's always a pleasure to have you on one slot. I appreciate the insights that you give to us. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap on one slot for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you join us again next week for conversations like this. Take good care.
she's not only young and breaking the norm, she's setting a new record. Olaide Sophia Urola, popularly called Ayora, holds the remarkable title of being the world's youngest talking drummer. She began playing the talking drum at the age of four, and today she has performed in various festivals and stages far and wide, including the inaugural ceremony of the current president of Nigeria. I'm six years old. I've been drumming since four years old. My favorite place to drum is America. I've drummed in Ikeja, Ireland, Ikorodu, Abuja, I've done so many places. <laughs> The talking drum is indeed a fascinating and important instrument with a rich history in various African cultures. It has been used for centuries as a means of communication, storytelling and cultural expression. Ayobu Miodrayo is something of a rarity. She's a female talking drummer. Not only has she mastered the craft, but she's also trained in manufacturing and repair of different percussion instruments. When Odrayo is not playing for different audiences, she's in a workshop making new instruments or servicing people's faulty instruments. I started playing uh, this instrument at the age of 16. 16. I started playing at the age of 16. What really drew my attention to talking drum is that um, I attend a white garment church, which is well known as Cele Celestia. So anytime I hear the sound of drum in church, there is this thing that is always happy inside me, like this joy always coming from within me, like this instrument is always making me happy anytime I hear, even if I'm not in a mood, if I hear this, this sound, I will just, everything will just come up in me and started giving out the joy from nowhere. So I, that was what drew my attention to talking drums. I was like, let me just give it a try. I discovered her talent when she was four years old. Then I noticed she loves to drum with the plates and the spoon in the house. Then I took her to the training center and she said she has interest in it. So she started learning since then. If you job a lorry, you're not going to be a little bit of 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 a little When she started drumming, then it was not in support because it's always like, uh, my daughter is just back from school, they are taking her to drum. And sometimes it was just like, uh, no, I don't want my daughter to be exposed to all those kind of things. So I, I just stopped arguing with him. So once he's not around, I would rush and take her to the training. And before he gets back, I'll bring her home. Not until when I've noticed that she can now start drumming little by little. So then I got, no, I didn't, I, I didn't get the drum for her then. It's like she came with one drum that particular day. So I thought I'd go and bring the drum and come and drum for her dad. So it was when her dad was listening to her. When her dad was listening to her, like, he was so amazed. He was so happy. He was so glad to see that her daughter can now true it was then that i now started supporting us as in i can't even lie about it it's my great after god is our greatest supporter now thank you my lovely husband <laughs> I graduated four years ago, so um, on the long run, I, I was able to practice it just once while I was doing my IT. So after then, I just, I have more interest in music. I have more interest in music, so I've, ever since then, I've been, even before going to school, I've, I've, I've been into music, so I just, 
come back to my music and enjoy myself in music. When I told my mom I want to learn talking drum, my mom is this kind of person that she won't tell you to stop anything you want to do if she knows it's something that will add value to your life and something that will be positive at the end of the day. So when I told her I want to learn talking drum, she was like, okay, no problem. Since it's what you want to do and what you love to do, you can just go forward and give it a try. So my family is, ever since I've been playing drum, they have, my family have been so happy with me. So there's nothing like, don't do this, don't do that. They always encourage me. go on stage, ah, people used to like her, oh, hey. You would definitely like herself. Because is it the intro to call her in on stage? Ah, the intro is always that. The intro is always it. And we have performed for so many, so many people, even King Seth. I know that. There are a lot of challenges in playing this instrument because we all know that the foundation and like the origination of this instrument is mainly for guys, for men. So being a lady playing it requires a lot of strength, a lot of focus. So I've encountered so many things, a lot of challenges. Is it the, the strength while playing it at times or there are some times where I'll go to occasions and the person there will be like, who want to play this instrument? I'll say, like the kind of expression the person will be like, you, can you play this instrument? But at the end of the day, they will love the outcome. At times when I go for occasions, when I go for events, and most people around look down at me like, what did she want to play? What did she, what did she want? So, that one alone gave me the, 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 the strength, the motive to say, okay, I'll play this. And almost in all cases, at the end of my performance, they'll be like, wow, 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 we never knew she could do this. So I'm always excited anytime I play because I'll be like, hey, hey, you get that kind of thing. So they always enjoy my performance anywhere I play. Anytime, like when people see you outside, the intention is that you are rich because your daughter is not talking trauma and they are seeing her here and there. Like, sometimes I don't even know how to put it. Now the issue I'm having is, although it's not an issue, it's normal. It's the way people price when they call for an event. And you can't say because of the money she won't go. Some people might just, you know, you understand what I'm saying? You can go to one event now and the next one you're going, they'll pay you very well. At the end of the day, they want to collect the money before you give it, to, before you share it to the band members, before you costume her, uh, the band costume, you understand? The transports, everything, the money is gone already. And once people say they feel like maybe you are not managing, managing her uh, enough, that's very challenging I'm having. But I know with time, everything will be perfect. By then, she'll be, they'll be giving her millions to come and perform. So I'm missing. The talking drum continues to be an essential part of many African cultures today, and its significance extends beyond its role as a musical instrument, serving as a symbol of cultural identity and heritage, connecting communities to their traditions and history, while also adapting to modern musical and social contexts. I want every little child to follow that dream like me. I like to jump, but I will not stop. I will continue and continue. Thank you. Bye-bye. More and more young women are venturing into professions and roles that were traditionally considered the domain of men. One thing is clear. People are chasing their dreams, regardless of the times, their age, or gender. I'll never drop the stick.
Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every raise, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, and a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. Africa needs its own storytellers, people who understand the continent because they're from it. People who know that news is more than just a conversation starter, it's our stories. Because these stories run deeper than headlines and segments. It's about digging deeper to get the facts and telling the human side of every single story. Not just the echoes from foreign headlines and perspectives. It's time to take back our narratives and share them in our voices. The birth of Africa's new age reporting. And this is where it begins. Right here at New Central TV. The stories that put Africa first. Doctors in Nigeria commenced a five day warning strike. Queues have hit the major cities in Nigeria, bringing you authentic stories as they happen. I am Adesha Waldishoga. This is News Central. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every raise, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, and a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. It's a Monday morning and we are back here live and ready to roll on Breakfast Central. And it feels really good, even though Olive thinks uh, quite otherwise, that it doesn't um, look like it's a work day. 
I know in your mind. Something. In my mind, I want to be in, in bed. Mind. I want to be sleeping, but I really love our audience so much that I thought if I'm sleeping, wow. my heart to be broken at the thought Ooh. that we wouldn't be here to bring them some of the Ouch. latest on Nigerian news. Jay. So I figured that my sleep is not as important mm. as coming here to do mm. my job, mm. which mm. gives me Word. immense joy. Word. Yes. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us. We, of course, are excited, very excited to be here with you on uh, Easter Monday. Happy Easter. We hope that you've had a wonderful celebration. And uh, it's interesting to see here in Lagos that the roads are not as choked oh, as they typically will yeah. be. The traffic will resume again tomorrow. Mm. But it's great to have this mini break that we're exper experiencing. For the next two hours, we're looking at some of the biggest stories here in Nigeria, looking at the political landscape and some very interesting uh, points to highlight. My name is Olive Emodi. And I'm Joe Hansen. And no doubt, uh, this uh, Monday morning, um, it's going to be a mix of uh, a mixture of um, the big stories, what's really happening, and uh, things that affect you as a Nigerian, or better still, as one who lives here in Nigeria. Um, some of the biggest stories uh, this past weekend had to do with the fact that a lot of people came out to celebrate um, Easter and then there were conversations over the cost of living. Um, if you took a trip down to the market space, regardless of the cost, you still see cars parked. People would always find a way. And um, someone then said, it is because of this act of wanting to find a way that makes the government feel, don't worry, they will cope. Yeah, I completely agree with you because during this Easter celebration, a number of people still, I mean, it, it, it's, I think this so far has been our hardest Easter yet. Our, our hardest Easter because we're still buying fuel at over 600 naira, which we've never bought before. And that has, of course, reflected on the price of goods and services. It's also our hardest Easter yet because of the cost of the exchange rate. Yes, good news, the naira had gained some strength. Mm -hmm. Um, at the time, at my last check, I think it was about 1,200 and yeah, something, yeah. which is record breaking with what we've been seeing in the past few months. So, uh, uh, one thing is, we don't expect that there'll be an automatic reflection of the strength of the Naira in goods and services. It will take a while before that can be translated down yeah. to smaller uh, units. So, yeah, it was really an expensive Easter. Not a, not a lot of people had food to eat, but somehow. The Nigerian people have a resilient spirit, such that when things are hard, it almost feels like you push Nigerians back. They're like, okay, there's space behind the wall. We just find a way to adapt. We find a way to, to feed them, you know, and I just hope that one day the people will not, you know, revolt. That, that, that's a wish that many people also wish doesn't happen. But then again, uh, the heat wave in Lagos, oh my in Nigeria, is a conversation everyone has been talking about. I don't know how, if you're feeling it from where you are, Olive. It's terrible, Joe. Pathetic. I don't think that I've ever felt this much heat in my entire life. Too much. I know what's sad. What's sad is, as I'm speaking with you now, I have somebody servicing my ACs at home because the ACs at home don't seem to be cooling anymore. It feels like I turn it on in the daytime and the air is hot. So it's just a, it's a very tough time. And, you know, the annoying thing about this heat is that it makes me start to feel 